am the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the whistler's strange story. So soon. Ted Gray had music in his heart. He heard a melody in the rustle of every leaf, saw a song in the bend of every river. A few years ago, Ted teamed up with lyric writer Al Wilson. And now Ted Gray and Al Wilson formed one of the most successful songwriting combinations in the profession. As Ted played for the hundredth time his latest composition titled So Soon, his mood was one of major harmony, except for one thing, his partner. For months, his dislike for Al Wilson had been growing. And now you almost hate him, don't you, Ted? You hate him because of his slow, methodical, painstaking rhyming, his even disposition. But most of all, because you're almost certain he's captured the love of the only girl you've ever truly cared for. Corinne Mitchell, once your copyist and part-time secretarial helper, now the head of her own publicity bureau. Hi, Ted. Sorry I'm late. You're always late. Did you finish the lyrics? Yeah, all but a couple of lines. Well, you've been playing around with them for three weeks. Oh, I know, but you knocked out a great tune this time, kid, and I want to be sure the lyrics are just as good as the tune. Eh, that would be a novelty. I don't know. You've done all right with me. I know a couple of composers who've done just as well and paid a lot less. You're getting 50% of the royalties. Why, Regan only gets 20% of the lyrics he writes for Joe Winslow's tunes. Well, then, why don't you get Eddie Regan to write your lyrics? He's under contract to Winslow. Oh, we got a contract, too, 50%, remember? And it's that or nothing. Any time you want to call off the whole thing, well, all you have to do is say so. Incidentally, mentioning our contract reminds me of a change I want. What kind of a change? Well, that clause that if one of us dies, the other gets complete ownership of all of our numbers? How come you want that change all of a sudden? Neither of us has any near relatives, nobody close enough to leave anything to. Well, I expect to have a near relative soon. A very near relative. A wife. Who's the lucky girl? Corinne. Corinne? Yeah, Corinne. You're engaged? Well, not yet, but I'm going to ask her as soon as I see her. And uh, you think she'll say yes? I think so. Oh, you slay me, Al. What's so funny? Well, I got news for you. Corinne's going to marry me. Funny she didn't say anything to me about that last night. Oh, not so funny. I asked her not to say anything until we got so soon rolling. Well, I'll believe that when she tells me. <laughs> She'll tell you, Al. She'll have a chance when she gets back from that publicity trip to Seattle. Well, that's all right with me. Meantime, how about finishing those lyrics? With Corinne out of town, there's nothing to distract you. And Marsha Wallace promised she'd sing it at her opening at the Club Rio a week from Saturday night, if we finish it. All right, Ted. I'll try to finish it. Well, I wish you would. Once we get the song going, we can go into that contract thing. Only be a week or ten days. By that time, Corinne ought to be back, too. That I'm not forgetting. Okay. It's a deal. Good. I'll drop by your place in a couple of days. By then, you ought to have the lyrics finished. Okay? Right. As the door closes behind your partner, you realize for the first time how much you really hate him. How easy things would be for you if something happened to Al. You would be sole owner of all the songs you now own jointly, wouldn't you, Ted? And with Al out of the way, you're certain Corinne would marry you in a moment. Then it hits you. Something must happen to Al before Corinne returns and before your royalty contract is changed. You're startled as you realize you're thinking of murder. You've never even imagined yourself as a killer. Neither has anyone else, have they, Ted? No. And you're certain they never will. That's why you feel sure you can uh, remove Al and get away with it. You think about it for a couple of days and then uh, phone Al. Hello? Hello, Al. Ted. Oh, uh, how are you coming on the lyrics for so soon? 
Oh, I think I'll finish it tomorrow. I only need one line. So I'm going to stick here all day if I have to. I won't even answer the phone. Good idea. Now, let's see. Tomorrow's Friday. I'll take it out to Lou late in the afternoon. He'll get the lead deed out Saturday morning. That'll give Marsha time to learn it before her opening at the Club Rio. Plenty of time. I think I'll have it tomorrow, Ted. Well, hop to it, kid. Phone me when it's finished. <laughs> When you hang up the phone, you realize the time has arrived, don't you, Ted? You pace the floor of your apartment most of the night. And by morning, you're satisfied your plan will succeed. At ten o'clock, you pick up the phone again. Central Publishing? Hi, Gracie. Ted Gray. Hello, Ted. Is the boss in? Not yet. How about Frankie? Nobody here but me. They're both tied up until after lunch, about three. Three it is. I'll run by Al's place, have lunch with him, pick up the lyrics of So Soon if he's finished them. That'll make Lou real happy. Me too, honey child. See you around three. Because everyone believes you're the closest of friends, you're certain you can kill Al Wilson and get away with it, aren't you, Ted? You won't make the mistake most criminals make. Prepare a perfect alibi, make elaborate plans, and then trip yourself. No, your alibi will actually be imperfect. But you'll plan your day hour by hour. Your routine will be the average routine of a normal day. Yes, your every action will be the very opposite of anyone planning a crime. The simple audacity of your act will be your uh, insurance of success. You'll simply kill your partner as close to three o'clock as you can. Go straight from his apartment to Central Publishing, where you'll wait your usual 20 minutes or more for Lou. When news of Al's death breaks, you will be as surprised and shocked as anyone. You finish dressing, eat a leisurely breakfast, read the paper, and then take step one in your plan. Three hours before you plan to kill him, you drive over to the drugstore next door to Al's apartment building around lunchtime. Hi, Mr. Adams. Oh, hello, Ted. Just missed your partner. Al? Mm-hmm. I was on my way to Al's. Hey, you said he had to work all afternoon in the lyrics to your new number. Well, then I guess I'll take him to lunch. Huh? Give him strength for the job. <laughs> oh, uh, you better let me have a carton of cigarettes, too, Mr. Adams. Yeah, uh, check. Well, Ted... You now have at least one reputable witness who, if needed, will testify you are on the way to Al's place to take him to lunch. You leave the drugstore, and just in case the druggist is watching, you enter Al's apartment building, then walk straight through the downstairs hallway to the rear entrance. You hurry down the alleyway to the boulevard where you've parked your car. Drive aimlessly for an hour or so, then return to your own apartment building, where you make certain another reputable witness will be able to testify that you were at home after your midday visit to Al. Come in. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Gray. Oh, hello, Mrs. Carter. I, uh, I was just wondering if you might have a larger apartment vacant, uh, one with an extra bedroom. Well, I will have on the first of the month. Do you have some friends? No, who... no. Al and I thought we might get more work done if we lived in the same place. I just had lunch with Al. Oh, this will be perfect for you two bachelors. I can't show it to you right now. But oh, that's soon... all right. It's all right. I want Al to see it anyway. Uh, besides, I've got a little copying to do. Then I've got to get out to Central Publishing. I just wanted to make sure you had one. We'll take a look at it Sunday. Well, Ted, your plans are now complete. You have witnesses as to your whereabouts at two highly important times. You pace the floor of your apartment, watch the clock. Finally, the minute arrives, and at ten minutes before three, you walk down the alleyway in the rear of Al's apartment building. Hurry upstairs to the second floor. Oh, hello, Ted. Come on in. Well, how are you coming on that line? I got it. Well, let's hear it. Why must I end my dream so soon? I get it. Why must I end my dream so soon? That's okay. 
Just can't figure out how it took you so long. Well, you see, Corinne and well, I... Well, I don't want to talk about Corinne now. Well, Corinne well, and... Forget Corinne for now. Uh, look, I'll take this lead sheet out to Lou North right away. He'll get it to Marsha Wallace. Okay, Ted. Uh, uh, look, Al, I, uh... I had to skip lunch today. Uh, have you got anything to eat in the kitchen? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's some cheese and bread back there. Well, that's enough for me. But it isn't food you're after, is it, Ted? No, you know exactly what you're looking for. And you find it in a drawer of Al's kitchen cabinet, the bread knife. Then you return to the living room. Find anything? I found what I was looking for, Al. What do you mean? What's the matter with you? Wait a minute. Listen to me. Ted! It's done, isn't it, Ted? Now you must be careful to establish the one important time factor of your day's activity. You drive quickly to an outside phone booth half a block from Central Publishing. Operator. Hello, police headquarters. Just a moment. Police headquarters, Sergeant Quinn speaking. Uh, hello. There's a... There's a dead man in apartment 203 in the Cheswell Apartments on Los Palmas. Who is this? Who's talking? That's something you'll never know, Sergeant. Ted, it's going beautifully, isn't it? You've removed Al Wilson, and you're certain you'll never be suspected, aren't you? It's all been timed so smoothly. Within a minute after your call to the police from a public phone booth, you're at the central publishing offices. You planned things perfectly, didn't you? Your innocent actions throughout the day, your purchase of cigarettes before noon, your inquiry about the apartment after lunch. Yes, Ted. All that's required now is a quick finding of the body, which, of course, your phone call is taken care of. You're confident as you stroll into Central Publishing, almost on time for your three o'clock appointment. Hello, Angel. Boss here? Always on time, Teddy, they call him. No, Lou's not here yet. Well, that's all right. How about old Tennessee Frankie? He's here. Frankie? Yeah. Ted Gray's here. Be right out. Hi, Ted. Hiya, boy. What you got? Oh, just another moneymaker for Central. So soon? Yep, so soon. Did you tell Lou about it? No, you did. Thirty or forty times. Come on back. Let's take a listen. It might go. Well, is that the best you can say about it? That's the best I can say about any song. You never know. Well, look, how about getting a lead sheet on it right away, will you, Frankie? Sure. You know, I put on that line Al was having so much trouble with myself. I saw him just before lunch. He was still having trouble. So I knocked it out myself. Why must I end my dream so soon? You like it? Sounds all right. Well, I'm glad you like it. I'll pick up the lead sheets tomorrow, hmm? Okay. You want it on the phone, Ted? Okay, why all the excitement? It's the police department. Well, okay, take it easy. I haven't robbed any banks. It's about Al. Al, what's the matter with him? I don't know. The officer found out you were Al's partner. He wanted to know if you were here. Maybe he's had an accident. Accident? Oh, no, not Al. He's too careful. Hello? Yes. Yes. What? Couldn't be. Murdered? Oh, no. Uh, no. No, I'll be right down. Al's dead. Al? Yeah. But how? The, the cops say he was murdered. <laughs> You 
say you saw your partner this morning, Mr. Gray? Yeah, that's that's right, Lieutenant. I got over there about, oh, about 11.45. Mm-hmm. He was all right? Oh, fine. Mm-hmm. Fine. He was trying to finish the lyric to our latest number. We needed only one line, so we made a couple of sandwiches and ate them in the apartment and worked on it. Uh, can you prove you were there at that time? No, I can't prove it, but I think Mr. Adams, the druggist, will tell you I bought some cigarettes just before I went to Al's. I see. How long were you in Al's apartment? Oh, not very long. A few minutes after we finished eating, the line came to me and I went home. Mm -hmm. Typed out the complete lyric and took it to Central Publishing Company. You can prove this? Well, no, Lieutenant. After all, I wasn't planning on having to account for my time. But wait a minute, I, uh... Yeah, I can prove I came back to my apartment after I had lunch with Al. I talked with Mrs. Carter, the apartment manager, about a larger apartment. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll check in your statement. The important thing is, uh, where were you at 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock? Uh, Central Publishing, yeah. I, uh, well, I guess there's no way I can prove it, unless the receptionist, she (laughs) remembered I, I... We'll question her, of course. Oh, you're not under suspicion, Mr. Gray, any more than anyone else. I... I realize that, Lieutenant. But we do have to investigate every angle. Well, thanks for your cooperation. If we have any more questions, we'll phone you. And if I think of anything important, I'll phone you. Anything I can do to help catch Al's killer will be a pleasure. You return to your apartment. Certain you're beyond the slightest suspicion. Next day, you phone Central Publishing... Learn that the police have double-checked your statements. And smile when you realize that Gracie, the receptionist, verified that you were at Central Publishing at the time Al Wilson was killed. Two days later, you receive a shock. You phone Corinne's office. Learn she returned from Seattle the morning Al was killed. That she tried to phone you. And then left for San Diego the same evening. You get her San Diego address. Send her a telegram. Tell her to be sure and be back in time for Marsh's opening at the Club Rio. The following Saturday night finds the two of you sharing a table there. You know, Ted, it seems... Well, I don't know. It was only last week that Al... Don't worry about it, honey. Al and I both promised Marsha she could sing it the minute we finished it. He wouldn't have it any other way, believe me. No, I suppose not. Now, look, Corinne. Al was the closest friend I ever had. We both agreed that, well, if anything ever happened to either one of us, well, the other go right ahead. I know. Sure you do. Naturally, you feel low, honey, being in love with Al and... No, Ted. I was fond of Al, but I'm surprised you thought that. I thought you knew how I felt. Well, you mean... Me, Corinne? Let's talk about it some other time. Oh, but I... Please, Ted. Well, of course, honey, of course. Only I... Well, you've made me happier than I've ever been. Ted. Yeah? When did you tell me you finished that lyric? Why, just after lunch, the day I was killed. The line just came to me. Why must I end my dreams so soon? Uh, Look... Here's the original typewritten copy. I got it back from the publisher a couple of days ago. He sent Marshall a lead sheet. Ted, uh, I... Huh? Listen to me a minute. Now, look. Honey, we'll talk radio. E- You're all excited now. So am I. And, uh, look, you stay here. Catch things from out front. I'm going backstage to see Marshall for a minute. Well, do you mind? No, Ted, I don't mind. Good, good. I'll be right back after Marshall finishes. Okay? <laughs> okay. Oh. What's so amusing, Ted? Nothing's amusing, honey. Only it's just like you said. Okay. After what you told me a few minutes ago, I'm sure everything's going to be okay from now on out. Well, Ted, you're certain you've won, aren't you? You have complete ownership of So Soon and all the other songs fashioned by you and your late partner. And you learned just a few moments ago that lovely Corinne Mitchell, the one woman you've ever really loved, feels the same way about you. Standing in the wings of the semi-dark stage, your pulse quickens as the spotlight reaches Marsha Wallace and the orchestra goes into the introductory bars of So Soon. Thank you. 
Honey, it went great, didn't it? Say, did you... Oh, I'm sorry, Corinne. I, uh, I was so excited, I didn't notice That's that you... That's all were... right, Ted. This is Lieutenant Roberts, homicide. Yeah, we've met before. Well, I knew Marcia was going to slay him tonight, but I didn't think she'd be arrested for it. She won't be. I called the police, Ted, just after you went backstage. You? But why? Because you killed Al Wilson. Me? Oh, you're crazy, Corinne. It Al, was but... you. It had to be you. Now, look, That Corinne. new line you said you wrote... Why must I end my dream so soon? That was the tip of Ted. You said a little while ago you wrote that line right after lunch the day I was killed. That's right, I did. You're lying, Ted. When you handed me this typewritten copy a few minutes ago, you told me the whole story. That line wasn't even Al's line. It was mine. It came to me about 2 o'clock the day Al Wilson was killed. Two hours after you say you saw Al for the last time. I typed it on my portable. Then I took it over to Al. You? You went to Al's apartment? Yes, I called you earlier. Couldn't get you, so I drove over to Al. Well, maybe I did lie about the song, but that doesn't prove it that I It proves can... enough that I'm arresting you for the murder of Al Wilson, Mr. Gray. You see, Ted, I reached Al's apartment about 2.30 and left about a quarter of three. The coroner says Al was killed around three. Well, maybe he was, and at three o'clock... You I were in Al's the... apartment. You had to be. Only two people besides me could have possibly known that line, Ted. Al Wilson and the man who killed him. I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now to Whistler's strange story, The Glass Dime. stepped out of his office on the third floor of the Drake Building, and his mood was anything but cheerful. Locking the door behind him, he stopped for a moment, gazed at the lettering on the glass panel. Walter Layton, theatrical agency. A frown crossed his features. 
And then, shaking his head sadly, sighed and started down the corridor toward the elevator. You whirl at the sound lock and then see a tall, heavy-set man rush out of an office at the end of the hall and come running toward you. Hey, what's the idea? What's going on? Get out of the way, you... <laughs> Catches you on the point of the jaw, sends you sprawling. And then, as you manage to get to your feet again, you see that he's reached the head of the stairs. He turns and levels the gun at you. The bullet whistles past you as you drop to the floor. An instant later, the man disappears down the stairway. Mr. Lake, are you hurt? No, no, I, I guess not, Doc. What happened? I heard the shots from my office. Well, it beats me. I heard some shots. Then a guy came charging out of the coin dealer's office down there. Rentworth? Yeah. I tried to stop him, but he bowled me out of the way. Took off. Come on. We'd better see if Rentworth's all right. Yeah. Mr. Rentworth? Mr. Rentworth, there. Oh, Miss Martin, are you all right? Yes. Yes. What happened in here? I... I don't know. I was in the back room. Mr. Rentworth was out here talking with someone, and well, then I heard the shots. I rushed out and... Hey, uh, now, steady. Where's Rentworth? Over there, behind the counter. Let's have a look, Clayton. Well, Doc, Mr. Rentworth dead, I... I think you'd better call the police. And you say you didn't see this man, Miss Martin? No, Lieutenant, I, I didn't. Uh-huh. Now, tell me, was Mr. Wentworth expecting anyone? Well, not that I know of. Oh, I'm sure it was an attempt at robbery. As a matter of fact, we were about to close up the office. I see. We'd been in the back room checking the catalogs when the front door buzzer rang. Mr. Rentworth went out to see who it was. Uh-huh. Uh, Lieutenant, yeah. if I may interrupt. Oh, certainly, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Layton here got a good look at the killer. Uh, is that so, Mr. Layton? Yes, I ran into him in the hall right after it happened. He took a couple of shots at me, too. All right, what did he look like? Oh, tall, rugged, around 40, I'd say, dark. Square jaw. Uh huh. Not much of a description. Well, that'll do fine for now. Oh? Got somebody in mind? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Miss Martin, I don't suppose you've checked to see if the killer took anything? No, I'll have to take inventory. He couldn't have stolen anything of real value, however. You see, all the rare coins are kept in the safe, and it hasn't been opened. Uh huh. However, Several trays out here on the counter were upset. Coins scattered all over the floor. But I'll let you know if anything's missing. Oh, fine, fine. I'd appreciate that. Now, Mr. Layton, I want to keep in touch with you in the event we line up for a man. Identification. Oh, sure, sure. I have a theatrical agency on this floor. Only I might not be around much longer. Business isn't so good. Well, do you live here in town? Yes, 37 Oakwood Place. Apartment B. A seven Oakwood Place, Apartment B, right. Now, if you're finished with me, Lieutenant, I'd like to run on home. I've had a rough day. Oh, sure, Mr. Layton, sure. Hello, Mr. Layton. Well, well. <laughs> Miss Martin from Mr. Redworth. This is a surprise. Not disturbing you, am I? No, no. I'm just having a quiet drink all by myself. Come in. Mm, nice, cozy little apartment you have. Yeah. And the nicest thing about it is the uh, rent's paid for another whole month. Here, sit down, sit down. Thank you. How about a drink? 
I could use one. It's been a rather hectic day. Yeah. It's too bad about Wentworth. Poor old guy. Shall I come right to the point, Mr. Layton? Oh, take your time. It isn't often I have such charming company. What have you done with the glass dime? The what? The glass dime. D-I-M-E. What is this? A gag? No gag. It's a rare collector's item. Once belonged to the collection of the late Justin W. Glass. Hence the name. Glass dime. <laughs> Cute. So what's it to do with me? You picked it up at the office tonight. I did? Oh, quite by accident, of course. The coin was on the counter near the telephone. I saw you pick it up, toy with it while you called the police. And uh, without thinking, you must have dropped it into your pocket. Why don't you look? Your drink, Miss Martin. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers? Well? Hmm? Oh, the coin. Try the right coat pocket. Well, what do you know? This it? That's it. Look, if you saw me take the coin, why didn't you tell the police? Well, that would have been most embarrassing for you. Even though you had taken it by accident. Yeah, the lieutenant might not have believed it. I believe it. Those things happen. Mm. What's this glass dime worth? A couple of bucks? Ten, maybe? Five thousand dollars. Five thousand? As I said, a rare item. Well, well. Hey, wait a minute. I thought you told the lieutenant that all the expensive stuff was kept in the safe. That's right. And yet this coin worth five grand was in one of the trays on the counter. Mr. Rentworth had been showing it to a customer this afternoon. I uh, forgot to put it in the safe. Really? That was sort of careless of you, wasn't it? Very. Maybe you had plans for the glass dime, huh? Maybe. All right, Edith. It is Edith, isn't it? What do you say we stop playing games, huh? We can make $60,000 if you're interested, Wally. It is Wally, isn't it? 60000 I thought you said it was worth five. That's right. But 12 times five is 60. I can have a dozen copies of the coin made, and we can peddle them in different parts of the country and abroad. Oh? I know the man who'll do the job. I met him through Wentworth. Oh, he's a real artist. He keeps the original, and we get the dozen for you. Sixty grand, huh? We uh, we split fifty-fifty. That's right. Huh. What's the matter? I'm just curious about something. Why cut me in on this? Two reasons. First, I don't feel safe with the man who's going to do the job. He uh, might double cross me. He wouldn't dare try anything if I brought my uh, partner along. One with broad shoulders. Okay, that's the first reason. What's the other? Uh, well, let's say I enjoy the protection of a handsome man with broad shoulders. Well, is it a deal? <laughs> it's a deal, sweetheart. because of the glass dime, a rare collector's item you picked up in Amos Rentworth's office shortly after the coin dealer was murdered. You've made a deal, agreed to a partnership with the exciting, attractive Edith Martin, the dead man's secretary, a deal you hope will net the two of you $60,000. You don't bother to go down to your office the following day. No, you sleep late. And then put in a call to Edith at the coin dealer. Morning, sweetheart. Hey, you mean afternoon, don't you? Just get up? Yeah. Thought I'd take a well-earned rest. I oh, wish I could. I've been busy checking accounts and taking inventory with Mr. Redworth's lawyer, Beady Eyes Burson. Can he hear you? <laughs> no, he isn't back from lunch yet. Going to be tied up with him all day? Oh, afraid so. 
Mm. How about dinner with your new partner? Oh, love it. You name it. Plus Getty's. It's in the commercial district. You know the place? Right. Seven o'clock? Seven o'clock. I'll... Oh, someone at the door. I'll see you tonight, huh? Bye. Yeah, what are you... Hello, Mr. Layton. Uh, you're Lieutenant... Uh... Lieutenant Conlon. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what can I do for you, Lieutenant? You can take a ride with me down to police headquarters. What? <laughs> no, no. No need for alarm, Mr. Layton. Just like to have you look over some photographs, that's all. Uh, After all, you're the only person who got a good look at Brentworth's killer. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, wait a minute. Didn't you say last night you had an idea who the killer might be? Yeah. Yeah, but that was last night. We checked on the man. He's back east. Well, then he's not the murderer. Nope, he's not. All right, Lieutenant. Oh, uh, come on in. I'll be with you as soon as I get dressed. You spend the rest of the afternoon at police headquarters looking over the photographs in the rogues gallery. But you fail to recognize the man you saw running from Rentworth's office. Leaving headquarters, you head for your rendezvous with Edith. Arrive at the restaurant at 6.30, a half hour early. To kill time, you saunter down the street, looking into one shop window after another. Finally, you stopped in front of a sporting goods store. When you're suddenly aware that someone is standing close to you, you turn and stare and your knees almost buckle. Yes, Wally. It's the man who killed Rentworth. You surprised, buddy? You? I've been tailing you ever since you left police headquarters. I figured them cops should call you to get a look at the mug book. But what do you want? I'm sorry, buddy, but you're the only guy in the world can put a finger on me for killing an old rent. With. So with you out of the way, I got nothing to worry about. Oh, now, wait a minute. I, I I'm won't... sorry, but I can't take no chances. Come on, we're going to take a walk. And remember, one false move, I'll let you have it. I ain't got my hand in my coat pocket just to keep it warm, you see. Let's go. You'd like to run, wouldn't you, Wally? But you can't. You seem rooted to the spot until you feel the gun dig into your side, and then somehow your legs respond. As you move down the block, the killer at your side. You want to yell out to the people in the street. Your throat is dry, paralyzed with fear. And then as the killer leads you into a dark alleyway, you see your chance. A stack of piled up crates nearby. You step aside quickly and shove him into the building. As they come toppling down on him, you start running down the alley. cab to police headquarters. Police headquarters? Why? Look, my life isn't worth a plug nickel with that killer on the loose. I'm the only one who can identify him. I want protection. Wally. Uh, well, Wally, you can't go to the police. What are you talking about? You want me to get killed? No, no, of course not. But going to the police would ruin our plans. What do you mean? Please, Wally, I'll explain everything when I pick you up. Listen, Edith. Stay I... right where you are, darling. I'll be there in ten minutes. <laughs> Wally, if you go to the police for protection, they'll put a man to watch you. Us. And we can't have him follow us to Sully's place. Sully? The contact I told you about. The man who's going to make the phony dime. Uh, I need you with me, Wally. 
He won't try anything funny if you're around. Yeah, so in the meantime, I'm a walking target. Sit and duck for a killer. Not for long, Wally. I've made arrangements to see Sully tonight. Tonight? I thought we decided to wait till things cool off a little. We can't wait. Mr. Burson knows that last dime is missing. What? You told him. I had to. He asked me about it while we were taking inventory. Look, you said it hadn't been listed in Rentworth's catalog. That's right. But Rentworth must have told Burson about it when he bought the coin a few days ago. You see, Burson's sort of a silent partner. Do the police know? Well, with Burson knowing, I had to tell them. Last Dime is already getting a lot of publicity. I heard the story on the radio an hour ago, and I'm sure it'll get a big play in the morning paper. The early editions are probably headlining it. They're on the streets by now. Yeah. All of which means we have a very hot dime on our hands. Look, how will that affect your contact, Sully, or whatever his name is? It won't affect Sully if we get it to him tonight. We'll probably have to give him part of our profits on the phony dimes on account of the additional risk, but don't worry, we'll come out all right. Okay, okay. But what about this killer on the loose? What are we going to do about him? Listen, Walt. After we've set the deal with Sully, you can go to the police. Get all the protection you want. How soon can we talk to him? Well, he lives just this side of Santa Barbara. We can drive up the coast highway and be there in two hours. You, uh, you do have the coin with you. Yeah. Okay, you Let's get going. <laughs> Kind of quiet, Wally. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Look, uh, you thirsty? No, I can wait till we hit Santa Barbara. Well, why wait? Life's too short. And who knows if there'll be a cocktail bar as inviting looking as that one up ahead. Huh? <laughs> All right, you've twisted my arm. I'll swing in. Park in the back. All How about the booth in the corner? I'd rather sit at the bar, do you mind? No, I'm not choosing. I, uh, I can get a better view of the highway. What? What'll it be, folks? A pair of bourbon and sodas. Okay, Edith? Oh, fine. That's easy. Wally. Yeah? What you said about watching the highway. I, I don't understand. There he is. Wentworth's killer. I knew it. Wally. Here you are, folks. That'll be, uh... He's pulled in. Sitting out there waiting for us. Huh? What'd you say, mister? Is there a back way out of here, Max? Back way? Sure, mister. Only what about these drinks? I, I only... Here, just... here. This will cover the drinks. Come on, Edith. We want the back way. But Wally... You heard me. Go on. The killer's getting out of the car, heading in here. Get going, Edith. <laughs> What was it all about, Wally? Why'd we run out like that? That guy who killed Rentworth picked us up again. We didn't get enough of a start. Are you sure? Yes. I passed his car in Santa Monica. He's been trailing us, Edith. That's why I pulled up at the bar. I wanted to be sure. Maybe we can lose him this time. Step on it. I'll turn on the radio. It's time for the news. See if there's anything more on the glass dime. And that's about all on Korea for the moment. And aside from Senator Watson's speech, which we've already covered, everything was quiet on the political front. The murderer of Amos Redworth, coin dealer, is still at large, but as announced earlier, a famous ten-cent piece known as a glass dime worth thousands of dollars is missing from the Redworth holding. A bulletin just received offers a reward of $1,000 for its recovery. And now, let's take a look at the sports That's enough. That dime's plenty hot, Edith. It? it won't make any difference once we get it to Sully. If we get it to Sully. That killer's with us again. He's quite a ways back, but he's gaining on us. Look, look, there's a side road up ahead. Turn into it. All right, Bobby. Now drive on up the road away. We'll see what happens. 
Well? He's turned off the highway, too. He's on our trail again. Come on, you just step on it. Come on, come on. Can't you speed this crate up a little? But look, the road's narrow, full of curves. I can't go any faster. Well, you got to. He's closing in on us. Only a few more turns, baby. Road straightens out after that. And we... Look out, Edith. The curve up ahead. Cut in. Cut in hard. Edith. Edith. You, you okay? Yes, I, I think so. Come on. We'll have to leave the car. We can't possibly back it out of this ditch. But I can try. No, no, no. We haven't time. Come on. We'll head down the ravine. Try to get back to the highway. <laughs> the car stalled in the ditch. Hurry down the ravine. And a short time later, you approach the highway near a cluster of buildings at the intersection where you turned off. You're in luck, Wally. Yes. The small diner across the highway is open. Wally, well, we'll stick close to the buildings on this side of the road until the traffic thins out. And then we'll duck across. Wait a minute, Wally. Yeah. What's the matter? Look, up ahead. He's come out of the side road. Yeah. He doubled back. Probably figured we'd try for the highway. You'll see us. Not if we can duck into one of these stores. There's a little hamburger hut. Yeah, it's closed. Let's go around the back. This door isn't heavy. We'll force it open. Oh, hurry, Wally, hurry. I'll get it. him? Yeah. Driving past. I don't think he... No, wait a minute. He stopped the car. Must have seen us stuck in here. Oh, Wally, we're worse off in here than we were before. No, no, we're not. Look across the road. Where? A police car. Parked alongside the diner. Yeah. The two highway patrolmen inside that diner having dinner. Look, we got to get word to those patrolmen. We've got as long to live as it takes two cops to finish their dinner. Yes, Wally, the two highway patrolmen in the diner across the road are a welcome sight, aren't they? You're certain that as long as they're in the diner, Rentworth's killer will not make a move to eliminate you, the only witness against him. And then the blood almost freezes in your veins as you see the killer step from his car and start walking slowly toward the hamburger hut where you and Edith Martin have taken refuge. Suddenly you realize that the two highway policemen, calmly enjoying their dinner, are no hindrance to the killer unless you can somehow get word to them before Rentworth's slayer reaches you. He spotted us, Edith. He's coming toward the hut. But the policemen... They don't know who he is. They're not even looking this way. We ought to phone that diner. Talk to those cops. There ought to be a phone. There's a pay phone. Over there, behind the counter. Oh, good. Uh, You got any change, Edith? No. No, I left my purse back at the car. Don't you have any? Uh, Just a four-bit piece, two pennies, a couple of bills, and... Dime. You mean the glass dime? Yeah. Oh, no, Wally. Not the glass dime. Not after all we've gone through. Well, it's said I get killed. Besides, we can get it back when they open the coin box. With a thousand dollar reward offered? And all the publicity about it? Oh, never, Wally. We'll never get it back. Think, Wally, sixty thousand dollars. You think. I want to live.
Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The Whistler will continue in just a moment, but first this message from the United States Air Forces in Europe. And now, The Whistler's strange story, Ticket to Nowhere. Passenger in the privately owned car for hire was talkative. And to the driver, Lee Corby, the things his passenger was saying were more than interesting. Lee didn't exactly hate his work, because owning his own car and operating it as an individual, he was in a position to take advantage of certain situations. That's why the rambling chatter of this particular passenger hit him so strangely. Yes. You just listen closely, don't you, Lee? Without a thought of interrupting as he prattles on. And when you feel like talking and there's no one else around, you've got to talk to a stranger, huh, driver? Yes, sir. I've got the key to a new life. A fortune. Yes, driver, a fortune. Something I've waited for for nearly 15 years. <laughs> oh, it isn't just that I've had a few drinks, driver. I, I've just got a howl tonight, that's all. It's my night. Oh, Hey, are we, uh, we heading the right way? You said Cypress Lodge, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did. I thought the lodge was closed. It is. But I arranged to keep my bungalow for an extra week. That, uh, briefcase have anything to do with it? Briefcase? Now, look here. This briefcase doesn't concern oh, you. Oh, quiet to... down. You've been yakking like I'm your long-lost buddy, and you've been hugging that briefcase like it was a baby. Forget it. Don't make any difference to me. Do you know something? You talk too much. <laughs> I'm sorry, fellas. Skip it. Just makes a long day, that's all. I said I'm sorry. And I'll make it a shorter day for you, Mac, when this runs over. Sure, sure. No, no, I mean it. Now, we get to the depot. Right now, we're at Cypress Lodge. Oh? Huh? You, uh, want me to swing in? Uh, yeah, yeah. And wait for me. I'm just got to pick up a couple of things, and then we'll go to Union Station. I'll, uh, park right over there. Yeah, fine, fine. You wait for me now. I'll be right back. I can't miss that train tonight. You watch him walk away toward the lodge in its row of bungalows, disappear into one. He's only gone a few minutes when you're suddenly startled at the sound of a shot. You freeze listening. When you get out of the car, run to the bungalow your passenger entered, and you look through the window. You can't see very well, but the lone court light enables you to discern a man's body on the floor. It looks like your late passenger, doesn't it, Lee? Lying inert and still, apparently dead. You hurry back to your car, begin the U-turn to take you back to town. As you finish, a woman emerges from the shadows of the bungalows. A woman carrying a briefcase you're certain is the same briefcase your late passenger carried. Can I drive you somewhere, lady? This car is for hire. That's right. See a sign? Yes, I do. My, I'm lucky, aren't I? Yeah. Sure, lady. You're lucky. Get in. Where to, lady? Union Station, please. Union... Uh, Union Station. Right. Almost there? Sure, almost there. 
It's these traffic lights that's holding us up. Ah, there's another. Um, uh, lady. Yes? I guess this is what I've been waiting for. What are you talking about? Right next to us at the curb. A squad car, two policemen. So? So, do I yell for help? Or do you toss your purse with a gun in it up here on the front seat? What are you trying... Make up your mind, lady. If you blast me here, you're as dead as I am with those two cops sitting there. If you cooperate... Well? All right, here. <sighs> Thanks. Not a briefcase. No. Lady, I guess you don't hear so good. I said... Take it. <laughs> a ticket to nowhere or anywhere. You know, I'm uh, burning up with curiosity about that briefcase, lady. So, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to find a nice, quiet little cocktail bar, and you and me, we're going to talk, talk. I'll miss my train. Maybe. But I won't miss mine. <laughs> Relax, sweetheart. I may even pay for the drinks. This diary is what it's all about, hmm? I think I read about a missing diary in the newspapers. I read the papers a lot. How educated you must be. No. Just curious, like I said. Oh, all the luck. Picking a privately operated car when there's a legitimate cab stand a quarter of a mile from the lodge. I should have walked. You didn't pick me, sweetheart. I picked you when I saw you carrying your uh, late boyfriend's briefcase. I didn't kill him. No? No. I took a cab out there, then waited for him. I only wanted to talk to him. Yeah, talk him out of running out on you. And when he argued... I said you... I didn't shoot him. Somebody shot him through the window. There wasn't anybody else around, sweetheart. But let's forget who killed him and talk about this diary. It belonged to Paul Winslow, the newspaper reporter whose body was found in the bay. I guess you think Frank figured on turning this diary over to the police... Collect a reward, maybe? I don't know. Well, he didn't. The reward would be peanuts. thousand dollars, maybe. That's a lot of passengers. But you know something, sweetheart? I've been reading this diary while you were enjoying your drink. This stuff could put some big racketeers behind bars. That was reporter Winslow's idea. He was going to stop a whole crime syndicate all by himself. Yeah, only he got stopped and... Ended up floating in San Pedro Bay. Mm. You do read the papers. Look, I'll give you $2,000 cash right now. Just forget me and let me take this diary. <laughs> well, what's so funny? What's your real name, honey? Elaine. Elaine Brandt. I'm Lee Corby. All right, what do you want? Half of what it's worth, sweetheart. Stop calling me sweetheart. I said my name is Elaine. Okay, okay. What's the next move, Elaine? I mean, uh, our next move. Our next move? Yeah. I'm the driver, remember? And uh, with this diary in my hands and your gun, I'm in the driver's seat, too. Now, what's our next move? San Diego? Ooh, chair car stuff, hmm? Well, I guess the luxury travel can wait. Remember I told you I didn't kill Frank? Sure, sure, I remember. Well, whoever did kill him may be following us. That's a chance I'll take. Also, when we get to... to the people we have to do business with, well, they expected Frank. They might take a dim view of what happened and blame us. Another chance we'll have to take. Bye, Lee. Like you said, you're in the driver's seat. something you've thought of many times, isn't it, Lee? But you didn't expect it the way it happened last night. The man in your car, his talk about the key to a fortune, his unexpected death, then Elaine Brandt unwittingly stepping into your car carrying his briefcase. She has to deal with you, doesn't she, Lee? She doesn't like it, but you have the diary prepared by the dead news reporter, and you don't intend to give it up. 
until Elaine contacts the underworld people who will pay off for its return and destruction. The next day in San Diego, Elaine is even more annoyed at what you tell her in the cocktail lounge of the Carlin Hotel, where she is staying. You put that diary in the mail? Lee, you're a bigger fool than I thought. What if it gets lost? Don't you realize its value? Why did you do such a stupid thing? Because I'm not stupid. I got thinking about what you said. Maybe we're being followed. So what? Nobody's going to hurt us if we haven't got the diary, Elaine. They're going to treat us real nice till we tell them where it is. I see. Good. <clears throat> Finish your drink, sweetheart. Relax. The first mail tomorrow will bring us exactly what we need to collect. <laughs> I talked with our man over the phone half hour ago. He'll accept delivery of the diary tonight. Where? At a bar called the Starboard Inn. What's the payoff? Well, he won't go over five thousand dollars. Five thousand? Oh, I figured on more too. Well, didn't Frank tell you how much he was going to get? No, but from the way he talked, I think it was going to be a hundred thousand. Well, I'm not going to let this book go for any five grand. We've got to leave. Why? Because they know I was Frank's girlfriend. We've got to play ball with them, or the same thing will happen to us that happened to that reporter. Us? They don't know a thing about me. Well, don't be too sure. Like I told you, we're probably being followed. I doubt it. Look, Elaine, if I was to handle it... Oh, no. You already have the book. If I was to give you the name of a contact, well... Afraid I'd skip out on you? Exactly. Besides, half of 5,000 is much better than nothing at all. Ever think of this, Elaine... Maybe I don't need you. What do you mean? Maybe I can locate the contact myself. How? Run an ad in the newspaper? Murdered reporter's notebook for sale, a pie, Lee Corby, box XXX. Okay. Five grand isn't what we expected, but I suppose we can't do anything about it. What time do you meet the boy with the money? Eight o'clock. You'll be there. Starboard in bar, you said. Yes. He said to come alone. Okay. But I'll be in the bar, too. All right. As long as you don't interfere. I'll just sit close by and watch. I'll, uh, have to have the diary. You get it. When? When you reach the starboard in bar this evening. I'll be waiting at the entrance. I'll give it to you then. Just like I was telling you, mister. I didn't doubt you should have won. You know that. It's like, you know what I'd done if I'd have been dressing? Huh? Hmm? Oh, oh. Excuse me, bartender. I I wasn't listening. Oh. All right. <laughs> she a friend of yours? Who? That doll back there in the booth. The one with the red hat. Oh, yeah, yeah. Slight acquaintance. Well, you've been looking over that way ever since that fat boy sat down next to her. Maybe I'm jealous. <laughs> you, uh, know him? Oh, he usually drops in for beer before going to work. He's a night clerk over at the Carlin Hotel. Night clerk? Yeah. That guy? Sure. Something wrong with that? No. No, I, uh... Just figured he was a big shot. Mm. How about another drink? Yeah, a scotch and water, huh? Right. And you'd better bring a martini for the lady, too. Huh? Her, uh, fat friend is just leaving. I'm gonna join her. <laughs> sure thing, mister, Sure. Hello, Lee. Hi. Everything went okay? Hmm? Perfectly. You saw it. Satisfied? What about your fat friends? He satisfied? He has the diary. We have the money. Here, I've uh, already taken my share. 2500 Your half is in the envelope. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Aren't you going to count it? No. I trust you, sweetheart. What's more, I've ordered you a drink. Thanks. No. Oh, why don't you de-ice a little, honey? What's the good of being sore? We've made a few bucks and I'm looking for some laughs and maybe see the town. Then you better buy yourself a comic book and a ticket on a sightseeing bus. You'll have a ball. So long, Lee. You don't think it hasn't been charming. Why, my dear Miss Brandt, do you mean to say that this is goodbye? Exactly. And when I get back to L.A., I'll make it a point never to ride in any car but my own. <laughs> Oh, 
Hello, Phil Carlin. Yes? For a moment, I'll connect you. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, sir. No, that's all right, Clerk. I just wanted to leave a message. Uh, very well, sir. The message is for... I'll leave that up to you. Up to me? I'm afraid I don't understand. It's about that envelope you picked up at the starboard bar 20 minutes ago. I, I picked up an envelope? Yeah. And you can relax. I'm not the law. Now, about that envelope. You handed the lady another envelope containing $5,000. That's a lot of money to pay for a blank diary. What? The diary was a blank buster. But I know where the real McCoy is, and uh, I'll make a deal. I see. You can uh, relay that information to your boss. I'm going back to my hotel now, the Alton, room 612. I'll expect a call in an hour or so. And remember, no rough stuff, or the diary goes straight to the cops. It's all arranged. <laughs> Oh, it's you, Elaine. Mind if I come in? Surprised to see me? Only disappointed. You were expecting someone else? Yes, I was. I'm surprised you'd try and pull a stunt like you did. Set up a phony contact to get that diary away from me. And what about that trick you pulled on me, handing me a blank diary in a sealed envelope? Okay, we're right back where we started. Except that I've racked up a profit of 2,500 bucks. Your money. Thanks, Elaine. That's all right. You see, you still don't know who the real contact is. And I do. And you don't have the diary. And I do. How much is it really worth, Elaine? Fifty thousand. Fifty thousand? No wonder you were so willing to shell out twenty-five hundred bucks to get your hand on it. Look, Lee. Let's play this straight from now on. Okay. We go on double-crossing each other, we'll die of old age before we collect any money. Now, the head of the syndicate that wants this diary is waiting just across the border, Tijuana. He called me 20 minutes ago. I told him I would have to call him back. Go ahead now. I'll get it for you. Well, he called me at my hotel. I told him I'd call him from there. What difference does that make? He won't know where you're calling from. What's the number? Uh, Tijuana, 3741. Get me Tijuana 3741, will you please? Tijuana 3741. Very well, sir. I'll call you back in a moment. Thank you. Uh, who is this guy? His name is Sanchez. He's top man in the syndicate? Well, as far as I know. Huh. That must be your friend. Answer it. Hello? Oh, that's all right. I'll talk to him. Hello, Sanchez. This is Elaine Brandt. Elaine. Just a moment, Sanchez. What is it, Lee? Hold the receiver to one side so I can listen in. Uh, Sanchez? Say, si, Senorita Brandt, I have been waiting for your call quite anxiously. Uh, everything's arranged. I can be at the Cafe Ruiz with everything you want by 10 o'clock. Is that agreeable? Very. The Cafe Ruiz, 10 o'clock. I will be waiting, Senorita Brandt. Adios. Well, Lee... You heard? Yeah. Yeah, I heard. Satisfy this time? Really satisfy. Well, I'll go back to my hotel. You check out, rent a car, and pick me up out front in about a half hour. We're due to meet Sanchez in Tijuana at 10. I'll be there. And remember, Lee, no more tricks. Neither of us can afford them. <laughs> You know just what you're going to do, don't you, Lee? The moment Elaine leaves, you go downstairs, check out, and rent a car. Then you hurry over to her hotel and take the stairs up to her room. Lee, what's the idea? Inside, Elaine. You said you'd pick me up downstairs. What's the idea of the gun, Lee? You've been picked up for the last time, Elaine. But why? I haven't... I don't trust you. 
You double-crossed your other partner and killed him, and you'll do the same thing to me the first chance you get. You're wrong. I'm not taking chances. You'll never get away with it. Somebody will hear the shot. Sure they will. That won't make any difference. You see, the first thing I'm going to do is lock your door. And I'm going to leave by that fire escape outside your window. By the time they force that door, I'll be in the car on the way to Tijuana. Well, they'll see you. No, it's pretty dark. Besides, they won't be thinking of that. So long, Elaine. No, no! With Elaine Brandt dead in her hotel room, and nothing to connect her with you, you're certain you're in the clear as you drive across the Mexican border in the car you've rented. Now you're certain you only have to meet the man named Sanchez, deliver the diary you're carrying in your overcoat pocket, and receive $50,000. You arrive at the cafe right on time, and a waiter points out Sanchez sitting at one of the rear tables. What is it, senor? Mind if I sit down, Sanchez? Should I, senor? I don't think so. You're expecting Elaine Brandt. Si, I am. She won't be here, but uh, I have the diary your syndicate wants. That's all you're interested in, isn't it? That was part of the bargain, see. Si. Part? Part of it? What do you mean? When the senorita Brandt arranged this transaction a week ago... A week ago? She promised to deliver two things. To me, as representative of the syndicate, the diary. Second, she was to point out a killer to the police. What? The killer of the newspaper reporter Paul Winslow. He would, of course, be unaware of the fact he was walking into a trap. Wait a minute. This doesn't make sense. You're trying to tell me your syndicate would allow Elaine to put the finger on, on one of their own killers? A moment, senor. I am afraid you are confused. I should explain that I represent a newspaper syndicate. The syndicate that Paul Winslow was working for when he was murdered. What? I would advise you to remain seated, senor, and to keep both hands on the table. The police are sitting all around us. They uh, are planning to question Senorita Brand very closely. They are anxious to know how she got possession of the diary. She's the one you want, not me. She killed Frank, too. Uh, who is this Frank? He's the one that killed your reporter, Winslow. Elaine Brandt double-crossed him and killed him. Frank was the killer she was going to turn in. Perhaps. And then again, perhaps the killer has delivered himself. You, senor. Me? Now, wait a minute. I didn't kill that reporter. That remains to be seen. The senorita Brandt should be able to tell us. We shall go with the police and call on her together at her hotel. If you are not the killer, I am certain she will clear you. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Impulse.
crowd in the waiting room of the New York airport hardly noticed the small, slender man in the trench coat standing near the magazine counter. The few who gave him a passing glance certainly had no way of guessing what was going through his mind at the moment, for his face betrayed no sign of the struggle that raged within him. Christopher Daniels, professor of English, was striving to reach a decision, a very important decision. At this moment, he had reached the crossroads. He had a choice to make. He could go on living his own dull life, or a new life, the life of another man. Mr. Neil Baldwin. A man whose name was now being called over the public address system. Mr. Neil Baldwin, please report to the reservation desk immediately. Mr. Baldwin, please. Suddenly, Christopher Daniels shivered. This unbelievable, unexpected chance had come so suddenly it almost seemed like a dream. Yes, a dream which had reached its climax that afternoon in his room at the hotel. Perhaps it had really started this morning at his home in New Haven. That unpleasant scene with his wife, Blanche. He'd forgotten what had brought it all on. Money, his job, didn't matter really. The scenes with Blanche always ended the same way. Blanche, please. We've been over all this time and time again. Now. Yes. Yes, we have, Chris. And what good has it done? You never think of me, really. What I gave up to marry you. I know. I could but... have had a lot of things, Chris, but no. No, I had to marry an unambitious English professor. Blanche. A professor who writes second-rate poetry on the side. That's enough. Is it? Every time I've suggested that you give up this this dreary little job of... Blanche, you... leave me alone. Please. Yes, Chris. Perhaps it was then the bad dream had started. That unpleasant scene with Blanche. Like so many that had gone on before. Scenes that left you empty, miserable sitting in your study oblivious to everything except the vague wish you usually had at times like this, that things would somehow straighten themselves out. You hadn't heard the doorbell. And then you saw Blanche and your old friend, Neil Baldwin, standing in front of you. <laughs> Hello, Chris. Neil! This is a surprise. How are oh, you? Fine, fine. Well, it's good to see you again, Neil. Sit down. Come on, sit down. Thank you, but just for a few minutes. Well, let me see now. I haven't seen you since the class reunion, have I? No, no, I guess you haven't. What are you doing down here in New Haven, Neil? What's wrong with New Haven? <laughs> Nothing. Chris thinks it's the world's most fascinating metropolis. Oh, Blanche. Actually, no. we've practically been neighbors for quite a while. Oh. I've been working back and forth between here and Boston for an investment house. And in fact, I had an apartment just a few blocks away. I forgot to tell you, Chris, I ran into Neil about six months ago on the street. I told him we'd both love a visit with him. Oh, you should have known that anyway. Chris, I did. It wasn't that I didn't want to see you. I've, I've been busy. Now I'm just stopping in to say goodbye. Goodbye? Yeah. I haven't seen you in nearly a year, and you're saying goodbye? Where are you going? Well, New York right now, and then South America. South America? Oh, that's wonderful, Neil. Business trip? No, Chris. No, I guess my business days are over. I had a talk with my doctor last month, and it's either take it easy or else. So, I'm going to take what little money I've saved, go down to South America where I don't know a soul, and loaf for the rest of my life. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your health, Neil, but the trip sounds wonderful. When are you leaving? Plane leaves late this afternoon. No. A sudden impulse, wasn't it, Chris? Perhaps you hoped that would straighten things out between you and Blanche, just getting away from her overnight. Quickly, you run upstairs to throw a few things in your bag. And later, as you're driving Neil down the coast toward New York. Cigarette, Chris? No. No, thanks. Uh, well, how have things been going for you, Chris? Oh, pretty well. Pretty well. Hey, look, old man, I know it's none of my business, but, you know, you seem quite worried. Worried? Well, no, I'm not worried, not... Not really, I guess. Not really. You can't very well tell Neil the truth, can you, Chris? Tell him that you and Blanche are unhappy. That you haven't done anything about it because you're sure she needs you. No, you can't tell Neil you'd like to call it off. Because you hardly dare tell yourself. Later... After you park your car in the garage and check in at the New York Hotel, 
You leave Neil stretched out comfortably on your bed. Cigarette smoke curling from his nostrils. You go on to the quaint little restaurant in the village. But that doesn't seem to help. You sit there, hardly touching the food or the wine. Finally, you leave, drive back to the hotel, park your car, and start down the block with Neil's briefcase tucked under your arm. It isn't until you're almost to the hotel entrance you notice the white ambulance driving away, the excited crowd milling about, the policeman keeping them back. Here, here, here. Where are you going? Go to my room. I... uh... What's the matter, officer? Uh, there's been a fire upstairs in the hotel. A fire? Where was it? Seventh floor. Seventh floor? That's right. Lieutenant said a man went to sleep while smoking in bed. He's dead. All right, folks. Now, let's clear the entrance. Come on. Come smoking on, Smoking in bed and he's, he's dead? Uh, uh, officer? Huh? Was who that? was it? Huh? I, I, well, who was he? The, the, the man who... Oh, well, the clerk said it was a man named Daniels. Christopher Daniels. I just checked in a couple of hours ago. It's a terrible shock, isn't it, Chris? Your friend, Neil Baldwin, burned to death in your hotel room. And you stand in the street with Neil's briefcase under your arm, staring emptily at the window on the seventh floor. They all think you are dead, don't they, Chris? Yes. Christopher Daniels no longer exists. Somehow you find your way back to your car. You remember opening the briefcase, looking at the papers. The ticket is for Bermuda instead of South America. Bermuda, flight 11. And you have Neil's papers, his luggage. A reservation at the Crystal Beach Hotel. And there's something else, too. An envelope with money in it. A lot of money. Mr. Neil Baldwin, please report to the reservation desk immediately. Mr. Baldwin, please. The next thing you know, you're at the airport. Standing in the waiting room by the magazine counter. Flight 11, leaving for Bermuda. All aboard, please. Mr. Neil Baldwin, please report to the reservation desk immediately. Mr. Baldwin, please. Name, please. Your name, sir? What? Your name, please. Baldwin. Neil Baldwin. It's a long way from New Haven to Bermuda, isn't it, Chris? And it's too late to turn back. And now you don't want to turn back. No, you've managed to put your past out of your mind with the help of Dorothy Gilbert. Yes, it was on the plane trip to Bermuda that you met her. And the two of you hit it off right from the start. You sensed instinctively that the two of you had a lot in common. You felt a pleasant glow and she smiled. Finally, there's the arrival itself. The beautiful green island of Bermuda looming up in a turquoise sea. You check in at the Crystal Beach Hotel, register as Neil Baldwin. And later, in one of the quaint horse-drawn surreys, you ride over to Belmont Manor, where Dorothy is staying. You're excited, aren't you, Chris? Like a schoolboy on his first date. I... I didn't expect to see you so soon. <laughs> I couldn't wait, Dorothy. You ready? All right, I'd love but to. Then come along. My... my carriage awaits out. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm? Oh, yes, that's me. I was just thinking. I can see already I'd like to stay on here a lot longer than a three-week vacation. Uh, I think I'd like to stay here for a long time, Neil. So would I, Dorothy. A long time. It was like a faint discord. A cloud passing over the sun when she called you Neil, wasn't it, Chris? It seemed so unnatural. It made you realize you were really Chris Daniels from New Haven, an English professor with a wife named Blanche. 
Yes, for a moment, Blanche is back in your mind, but it's only for a moment. She fades out again, and you're busy showing Dorothy Crystal Beach, the pink sands, making plans for the future. That evening, you're dancing at the Ace of Clubs. Wonderful idea to come here, Neil. You like it? Really? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Love it. Mm. Why didn't you tell me you'd dance like this? Oh, I guess I didn't know I could. <laughs> Neil? Hmm? Do you know that man over there? Near the bar? Mm. Man? Hmm? Mm, which one? The short, heavy set man. He seems to be looking at us. Oh. And I don't know him. Neither do I. Well, he's probably not looking at us. <laughs> he's looking at you, Dorothy. I don't blame him. <laughs> you're talking mighty pretty, mister. Maybe that's because you're so pretty, miss. Oh, Neil. You are, Dorothy. In fact, you're beautiful. No, I'm not. But I'm glad you think I am. Well, Chris, there's no doubt in your mind about what's happening to you and Dorothy, is there? It's all very simple. You're certain she's in love with you. And you're in love with her. Yes, for the first time in your life, you're in love. But the cloud's over the sun again. This time it won't go away. This whole thing is unfair, isn't it? Unfair to Dorothy. Unfair to Blanche. Now you've got to make another decision. You're still thinking about it as you take Dorothy back to Belmont Manor and return to your hotel. Then as you walk into the lobby, the desk clerk gives you something else to think about. uh, Mr. Baldwin, Mr. Baldwin. Uh, Yes, yes, what is it? A message for you, sir. Came while you were out. A message? Telephone call from New York. I took it myself. It was from your wife, Mrs. Baldwin. Said to expect her sometime within the next few days. You hadn't counted on anything like this, had you, Chris? Neil had never mentioned his wife to you. You had no idea he was married, but you're not too surprised. Neil was always close-mouthed, seldom talking about himself. Yet it does seem strange he didn't mention his wife, doesn't it? But now it's past wondering about Neil is dead, and you're using his name. And Mrs. Baldwin will be arriving in a few days. You're trembling as you turn away from the desk clerk and start for the stairs, and then... Oh, Mr. Baldwin, uh, one more thing. Yes? I almost forgot to tell you. There was a man here early in the evening asking about you. Oh, well, what did he want? Well, he didn't say. I thought you'd gone over to the Ace of Clubs, so I... What did he look like? Oh, wore a blue suit, rather short, heavy set man, as I remember. Yes, Chris, it's the short man again. The man who was staring at you tonight when you were dancing with Dorothy at the Ace of Clubs. You're certain he's following you, aren't you? Perhaps he's from the police. And you wonder if he knows the truth about you. Hurry up to your room. There's little sleep for you that night. Pressure is building, isn't it, Chris? And the strain on you begins to show the next evening at dinner. What's the matter? The matter? Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing, Dorothy. Yes, there is. All evening you've been acting so... Oh, so strangely. You're worried. What is it, Neil? Dorothy, I... Now, you'll have to trust me. Although you've no reason to, I must admit... I do trust you, Neil, and I've got a good reason to. Being in love with you is a good reason. Let's get out of here, Dorothy. All right. Neil. Huh? There's that short man again at the table near the wall. He seems to be... Don't look around, Dorothy. Just keep walking. Uh, yes, Neil, of course. But if you don't mind, I think I'd better take you back to your hotel. Neil, that man... Huh? Is he what's bothering you? Well, he's he's part of it. He's been following you, hasn't he? Uh, Are you in trouble, Neil? Yes, Dorothy. I'm in trouble. Uh-huh. 
You take Dorothy back to the Belmont Manor and leave her with that hurt, puzzled look in her eyes. The look you'd give anything to smooth away. Then you go back to your hotel. And as you enter the lobby, the desk clerk calls to you. Oh, Mr. Baldwin. Yes? There was another telephone call for you an hour ago from New York. New York? Yes, sir. From Mrs. Baldwin. What did she say? Well, she was able to get plane reservations. She'll arrive at the airport tomorrow morning, 8.30. You run blindly out of the hotel into the night. Finally, you find yourself on the road leading to the Belmont Manor. Yes, the Belmont Manor and Dorothy. Because you've finally made your decision. You've decided to tell Dorothy everything. And you do. Your life with Blanche, your unhappiness... The madness that seized you when you discovered Neil was dead and that everyone thought it was you. How you struggle with your conscience and how your conscience finally won. Yes, you pour out the whole agonizing story to Dorothy there on the beach. And the sun has come up before you finish. Chris. Ah, I like the name much better than Neil. It, it suits you more, darling. I'm going back to Blanche, Dorothy. I should have known I couldn't leave her. I know. You're just not built that way. I guess that's why I feel as I do towards you. It isn't that I want to. It's just that... Well, I know she needs me. Of course she does. Now, don't worry about it. Yeah. Just remember how nice everything was for a little while. Things we want, we just can't have. Why did I have to hurt you, though? You didn't hurt me, Chris. I... When, when are you leaving? Right away, I guess. I, um, <laughs> I don't know how I stand with the law. Well, I'll find out when I get back, I suppose. I don't think I've done anything criminal. I've just been a, a fool. What about Mrs. Baldwin? I don't know, Dorothy. Well, when I get back to my room, I'll write her a letter telling what's happened and leave Neil's money and papers with it for her. It's not exactly the brave thing to do, I suppose, but... I just can't face her. Well, Chris, I... I guess you better be going. Yes. Dorothy, I can't ask you to forget or forgive. Too much has happened, I know, but... I hope that... Well, time... Time, will... yes. Ta time will help a lot, Chris. It always does with everyone. And someday, who knows? Perhaps things will be different. Oh, Dorothy, I... I do love you, Dorothy. I always will. I know you do. Goodbye, darling. It's all over now, isn't it, Chris? And there's nothing left to do but go back to your hotel, write the note to leave for Neil's wife, and then buy your ticket back to the United States, back to New Haven and Blanche. But it's not as easy as it sounds, is it? Writing the letter to Mrs. Baldwin is not easy. There's a lot of explaining to do. You're so engrossed in the letter that you don't hear the door behind you close softly. You don't see the short, heavy-set man walk silently across the room and stand looking over your shoulder. Hello. Huh? What? what are you writing, a confession? Who are you? What do you want? I'm Jim Mason, private detective, and I think you know what I want. You and I are going to have a nice long talk, brother, because right now you're looking an awful lot of trouble right in the eye. Well, Chris, they finally caught up with you. Your little adventure is at an end. Your first decision to use Neil's name, run away from home, was a bad one, wasn't it? And your second decision to go back. Looks like you made that one a little too late. Because now no one will ever believe you really were going back. There's only one thing to do. One thing you know how to do. And that's to tell Mason the whole story just as you told it to Dorothy. And that's what you do. You give Mason the whole story. It's sort of a wild tale, ain't it, mister? I know it must sound so, but... You, uh, uh you can prove you're not Neil Baldwin? Oh, yes, yes, of course well, I can. Well, then you're a lucky guy. Lucky? What? That dough Baldwin had, that 12000 he told you he saved up to retire on? Yeah. He embezzled that from a company he worked for. They sent me down here after him. 
Hey, you still have the dough? Oh, yes, it's over there in the briefcase. Uh, I haven't touched it except for what I've spent since I've been here, which I can replace. Yeah, you are a lucky guy. Getting the dough back's all the company's interested in. So far as I'm concerned, you can go your way. Oh, thanks. Now, what are you going to do? Go back? Yes. It's the only decent thing I can do. Uh, well, you're not quite out of the woods yet. Oh, I guess you are if Mrs. Baldwin backs up your story that you're not Neil Baldwin. Wait a minute. She's right outside. All right, Mrs. Baldwin, you come on in now. Neil, darling, why didn't you meet me at the airport? I... Chris. Blanche. But I thought you... I thought you were... I was... What, Blanche? I thought... You thought that I died in that hotel fire instead of Neil. You thought he'd be here waiting for you with the money he stole. Now, you had it all planned, didn't you? You, you knew he stole it, didn't you, Blanche? Yes. Yes, but... You've been meeting him for a long time, haven't you? Well, I... And and all the time, I was torturing myself, thinking that you needed me. Oh, Chris, we... Our life was so drab, I I couldn't help it. I wanted to travel, enjoy living. Neil offered me these things. So you decided to run out on me and meet Neil down here on stolen money? It it wouldn't have been running out on you. You would have been happier, too. You could have gotten a divorce, possibly found someone you would have been happier with later on. Yes. Yes, that's true, isn't it? (laughs) You know, your coming down here to meet Neil kept me from making an awful mistake. Losing something that means more to me than anything in the world. I I don't understand. You don't have to, Blanche. It doesn't concern you anymore. Just me. And someone over at Belmont Manor. I'm going over there right now. Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Fading Star. At 43, Don Carlton knew his popularity as a romantic motion picture star was waiting. That he was on the way out. He knew that he must do something, something spectacular, ensuring national publicity and a sympathetic reaction by the public. So you decide on marriage, don't you, Don? Marriage to lovely young Dulcie Winslow, whom you're certain will soon be a top star. You're equally certain that marriage to Dulcie will be a great boon to your box office value. You decide to begin your campaign immediately to spend the next four weeks in romantic courtship. Dulcie's already fond of you and grateful to you. You helped her to her first part, introduced her to the right people. And now, enjoying a leisurely breakfast in your own apartment, you smile as you recall her affectionate attitude of the evening before, when you took her to dinner to celebrate the final day of shooting of her first big part in a major picture. You're still smiling as you enjoy your final sip of coffee. Hello? Don? Don't see, darling. I'm just finishing breakfast. I just got a couple of minutes between some publicity shots, but I forgot to tell you something last night. Really? What? Jack Webster's throwing a party for the whole cast this evening in the commissary. He told me to be sure and ask you to come. Well, but uh, I wasn't in the cast. I know. 
but Jack wants you to come anyway. So do I. Well, in that case, I'll be there. I'll be watching for you. Bye for now. <laughs> well, it's quite a party. Everyone's saying you stole the picture. Oh, I wish I had. <laughs> Who's the guitar playing cowboy? Wally Varden. He sings the title song in the picture. Easy on the eyes, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's got a nice voice. I have an idea this picture will be a big break for him. Really? Mm-hmm. Come on. I'll make him sing for you. Oh, no, no, Dulcie, please. I'll take your word for it. If there's one thing I'm allergic to, it's a cowboy singer. Well, he's a little more than that. Anyway, I want you to hear him. Come on, please. Okay. Uh, Wally, I want you to... Well, hello, gorgeous. I was just thinking about you. And I was just talking about you. You've never met Don Carlton, have you? Never have. Seen him often enough, though. How are you, Mr. Carlton? Fine, thank you. Dulcie was just telling me that sing you... Sing that number you did in the picture for him, will you, Wally? Ah, oh, he, he don't want to hear me sing. Well, then sing it for me. Oh, whatever you say, honey child. For you, I'd do anything. In the West, most men are young men. Adventurous, ruthless, and bold. They fight for their fun and live with a gun. Just a few ever live to be old. Some men come west to forget what they've been. Some come to look for gold. A man named Slade shot his way to good pay. But I hear that he's getting old. He's always been smart and quick on the draw. Laid lots of bad men out cold. But there'll soon come a day when they'll cart him away. Cause I hear Jack Slade's getting old. Oh, that's <laughs> Well, was I right, Don? Yes, I'm afraid you were. He's really quite good. Thanks, Mr. Carlton. Look, Dulcie, this party's nearly over. How about you and me going out in the town and celebrating? Well, I'm sorry, Wally. Don's taking me out. How about tomorrow night, Dulce? I'd love it. It's a date. I'll pick you up about seven. Take it easy, Dad. But there'll soon come a day when they'll cart him away. Cause I hear Jack Slade's getting old. <laughs> Wally Barden's needling you about your age was a jolt, wasn't it, Don? Dulcie's obvious interest in him jolts you even more. In the days that follow, Dulcie often speaks of dates with Wally, and you'd like to settle things with her right now, but something tells you the ideal moment for your proposal is days, if not weeks, away. You wish you could find some way to break up their friendship. And a week later, at a party in the home of producer Jack Webster... An unexpected opportunity presents itself. Just before Martha South, famous singing star of Edco Films, takes a position at the piano to play her own accompaniment for some of her old favorites, you see her remove one of her famous diamond rings, wrap it in one of her gloves, and place it on a chair beside her fur coat. As the 40 or more guests, spellbound by her charm, edge ever closer to the piano, it's a simple matter for you to remove the ring unobtrusively cross the room to the side of Wally Varden and drop it into the side pocket of his coat and then drift quietly into the group. When Martha takes her final bow, things work out exactly as you'd planned. Just wonderful. Just wonderful, my dear. Oh, oh good heavens, my ring. My ring. Huh? What about it, Martha? My ring's gone. Just before I went to the piano, I put it inside my glove. And it's not there. The glove is empty. Oh, oh you must have dropped it there. Oh, it isn't on the floor. Anyway, it couldn't have fallen out of my glove. I... I hate to be nasty, but I'm afraid someone has taken it. Oh, come now, Martha. This could easily be a gag. Oh, now, come on. Whoever has it, speak up. <coughs> I'm afraid it wasn't a gag, Don. I'm sorry, my friends, but you leave me no choice. I must phone the police. Oh, I must ask all of you to remain in this room until the police get here. Mr. Webster, I, I'm sorry, but I just can't stay. I told you that when you invited me. I'd uh, have to leave early, don't you remember? I'm booked open at the Quadrangle Club tonight. I'm due on stage in 40 minutes. Sorry, Wally, but I can't make any exceptions. You'll have to wait like everyone else. Uh, 
Operator, give me the police department, will you please? Well, Mr. Webster, we've got our man. You sure, Lieutenant? I don't see how we could be any more sure this young fellow had the ring in his coat pocket. Wally, no! I didn't steal it. Somebody else did, then dropped it in my pocket. I don't know why, but they did. Oh, but why, Wally? What could they hope to accomplish? I don't know. Maybe they got scared, changed their mind. All I know is that I didn't steal that ring. I know it's hard to believe my saying I had to leave to fill that club date just when I did. It makes me look bad. I'm afraid it does, Wally. Very bad. Oh, wait a minute. You mean this man wanted to leave before we got here? Yes, Lieutenant. Said he was due on stage at the uh, Quadrangle Club. I am. You better get your hat, Varden. Things worked out even better than you'd hoped, didn't they, Don? Suddenly you get another idea. One you're certain will endear you to Dulcie forever. As Wally and the police lieutenant start toward the door... Just a minute, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, you too, Jack. Let's not act too hastily. Now, this young man could be telling the truth. I believe he is. I'm sure he is. I haven't known Wally very long, well, but That's I... the whole trouble, Dulcie. None of us have known him very long. He's the only person here we haven't all known for years. Mr. Webster. Hmm? Excuse me, Mr. Webster. Can I say something? Yes, of course. What is it, Bill? This young fellow never took that ring. Oh, wait a minute. How can you be so sure? Because I saw him the whole time Miss South was singing. He was standing right over there against the wall. Never moved once. You're positive of this? I sure am. I opened a little crack in the door and peeked in. Saw the whole thing. Did you see any of the other guests near him at any time? Three or four of them. A lot of them was kind of walking around between songs. But you're sure this young man, Wally Varden... Didn't leave his position on this side of the room. Positive. Well, thank you, Bill. You can go back to the kitchen. You've kept us from making a bad mistake. Yes, sir. Shall I go back to my work? Yes. Unless the lieutenant has some further questions. No, nothing more. You're excused, Bill. Thank you, Captain. Well, it looks like we're right back where we started from. How about me? Does anyone still think I stole that ring? Oh, of course yeah. not, Wally. Gee, I nice never did think so, Wally. I heard you say so, Mr. Carlton, and I sure appreciate it. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Is it is it all right if I leave now, Lieutenant? I think I can still make it on stage in time. Oh, certainly. We've no evidence to hold you. Well, then I think I'll be going. Good night, everybody. Good night, Wally. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, I might as well be leaving, too, Mr. Webster. There's nothing more I can do. Good night. Good night, Lieutenant. And uh, thank you very much. I think I'd better go, too, Jack. I've sort of lost my party mood. We all have, I expect. Well, we'll start over some other night real soon. Shall we? Sure, yeah. Jack. It's a good yeah. idea. Can I, can I drop you off at your place, Dosa? You surely can. Come up for a nightcap if you have time. I want to talk to you, Don. I was proud of you tonight, Don. Oh? What do you mean? Hmm? The way you stood up for Wally when they found that ring in his pocket. Oh, that. I just wanted to be sure he got a fair deal, that's all. He struck me as a clean-cut young fellow. He is, but... Quite talented, too. As a matter of fact, I'm going to see that he gets a nice break tomorrow. Really? Yes. The young fellow playing the part of the racing driver in Silver Road, the picture I'm doing now, mm -hmm. was stricken with appendicitis today. I'm going to ask Jack Webster to replace him with Wally. They'll only have to reshoot a couple of scenes. I've never known anyone quite like you, Don. I'm glad you said that, my dear. Because, well, I've never been in love. You mean you... I mean I love you, Dulcie. I want you to marry me. Oh, but I... Well, you never said anything before. I didn't know. I... You should have. I've loved you for a long time. You should have told me. Now it's too late. You mean someone else? Yes. Wally Varden? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Don. I didn't know how you felt if, if you told me earlier, even a month ago. You'd have made me the happiest girl in the world. But now I... Now it's Wally. Tell me, how long have you felt this way? Well, I, I've liked him all along. 
But I wasn't sure how I really felt till tonight. Tonight? Mm -hmm. When they found Martha's ring in his pocket, he said he was innocent and nobody believed him. I knew he was telling the truth. And I loved him. I see. (laughs) Strange how things work out sometimes, isn't it? Uh, Better be running along, I guess. But be sure before you do anything rash. Let this new romance jell a while. Mm -hmm. Don't rush into things. Huh, baby? Mm -hmm. I won't. Your attempt to frame Wally Varden Boomerang didn't it, Don. And you curse yourself for your stupidity. At long last, you realize you're in love with Dulcie. That marriage to her means even more than the money it would bring you. Though that's still important, too, isn't it? And you're sure you can still win her if you can just eliminate Wally some way. Anyway, your jealousy toward him has turned into a murderous hate, hasn't it? And time is now a vital factor, isn't it? Even though Dulcie assured you she wouldn't rush into things, you learned long ago that women often change their minds. And whatever you do, you must do before Dulcie decides the time has come to marry Wally Varden. A few evenings later, in the living room of Jack Webster's, you're certain you see a sure and simple solution. Don, this is going to be the greatest chase you ever saw. Now, you'll be chasing Wally along that cliff road where we shot those scenes from the big car a couple of years ago. You remember the spot, don't you? Oh, sure. I've passed it a hundred times since. I know every foot of it. Well, then you won't have any trouble finding it. I'll change the shooting schedule so you and Wally can drive up tomorrow, okay? Sure. sure. Yeah, Fine. That's good. We can use a couple of foreign cars, convertibles. Now, that stretch of road's pretty dangerous. It'll be a cinch. I know every turn. Well, you'll have a few hours tomorrow afternoon for some trial runs. That's why I'm sending you up early. Good. <laughs> we'll be able to run it blindfolded, huh, Wally? If you say so. <laughs> I'll have the cars checked from A to Z tomorrow morning. Put on special tires and tubes. You and Wally can pick up the cars any time after 11 tomorrow. Uh, 11.30 okay with you, Wally? Sure, fine. I'll bring the crew up early next morning. We'll be set to shoot at 9. You'll be there at 8. Mm-hmm. And use the trailer for a dressing room. 8 it is. Oh, you better stay at that little place we stayed in last time, the uh, Casa Lodge. I might want to get in touch with you. It'll be simple, won't it, Don? Jack Webster unknowingly gave you the answer to your problem of Wally Varden. You know that cliff road, and you know cars as well as most mechanics. All you'll need is a hacksaw and five minutes alone with Wally's car. You know exactly how to do it, don't you? The rod connecting the two front wheels and the steering arm. You'll saw through just enough to be sure it will hold through normal driving, but come apart after one or two curves at high speed. And once Wally loses control of his car, there's only one way he can go, isn't there? The following evening, after hours of driving over the scene of the next day's shooting, you and Wally arrive at Casa Lodge. Yes, sir, double room? I think we'd better have our own rooms, don't you, Wally? Oh, anything's okay with me. Well, you'd better give us singles, I guess. Right. Now, let's see. Um, how about parking space? Oh, uh, there's a private lot in the rear, sir. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess that's safe enough. What about dinner? Well, there's nothing wrong with the Haviland Grotto. About a quarter of a mile north. Nice bar, too. Oh, sure. I remember it. Yeah, it's okay, Wally. Fine. Mm -hmm. After we clean up a little, I'll drive you over. We'll have a couple of drinks before dinner. Celebrate, huh? (laughs) You're due to go a long way in this business. Barring accidents. But accidents happen, don't they, Don? And when you and Wally return to Castle Lodge at a little after 11, the accident you've planned has driven everything else from your mind, hasn't it? After a few minutes of idle chatter and a cigarette in the now deserted lobby, Wally Yawn says good night and goes to his room. A few minutes later, you return to your own room, where you soon put out your lights and wait nervously in the darkness until nearly 2 a.m. Then you quietly leave your room and use the rear entrance of the lodge. Start towards your car parked right next to Wally. The cat, for a moment, panic seizes you. You stand frozen with fear for several seconds and... Then return to the rear entrance of the lodge. When minutes of silence finally convince you no one was awakened by the noise, you decide to go through with your plan. You walk rapidly to the rear of your car. And just as you're about to lift the lid of the turtle deck... Get away from that car! Well, Wally. Oh. Oh, it's you, Don. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are you doing out here? Well, something woke me up a few minutes ago. I happened to look out the window, saw a guy walking towards the cars, and figured he might be an auto thief. <laughs> I didn't know it was you. Uh, what's wrong? Oh, uh, nothing. I, well, something woke me up, too. I, I got a crazy hunch somebody was after the cars, so I came out to take a look. Well, I'm going back to the hay. 
you'd better do the same thing. We only got a couple more hours. No, oh. no, I, I'm going to stay up, Wally. I couldn't sleep anyway. All I do is toss around and worry about the cars. Not me. I'm catching some more shut eye. You know what I think I'll do? Run these hacks around for a few miles. I've got a feeling about them. I think you're nuts, but it's okay with me. Here's the keys to mine. Thanks. I'll see you about 6.30, huh? Yeah, sure. Now it'll be easy and certain, won't it, Don? As soon as Wally re-enters the lodge, you take your toolkit and your flashlight from the rear of your car, slide behind the wheel of Wally's, and drive quickly away. A half mile or so from the lodge, you turn into a quiet side road. And in a matter of minutes, your mission is accomplished. At a little before nine next morning, after some friendly kidding from Wally about your worries of the night before, you're sitting tense and nervous behind the wheel of your own car. Your motor racing, about ten feet behind Wally. After what seems like hours, Jack Webster finally barks the cue you've been waiting for over the loudspeaker. Roll up! curious crowd at the base of the cliff where an unexpected tragedy had ended the filming of an exciting motion picture sequence and the life of a gifted actor pushed forward to listen as the highway patrolman questioned a more fortunate actor who had miraculously escaped a similar fate. You say your car went out of control, huh? Yeah, officer, just after I made that last turn. I was straightening out the wheel and all of a sudden I was in a spin. Why I didn't turn over, I'll never know. What I'll never know is how you kept from going over that cliff. Uh, probably the rod connecting the two front wheels and the steering arm. When it breaks, it often causes a spin. Well, I would have at that, I guess, if Don Carlton hadn't sideswiped me when he tried to pass me while I was spinning. He knocked me over against that boulder, but he bounced off my car, and that was it. The greatest guy I ever knew, too. Uh, that's too bad, but these things happen, you know. Don't let it get you down, son. Just remember your own good luck. I do, but, well... Don Carlton was such a great guy to me. I'll never forget how he spoke up for me at a party a couple of months ago when everybody else figured I was a thief. He got me my part in this picture. Don helped my wife a lot, too. Your wife? Since when? Since Tuesday, Mr. Webster. You weren't shooting any of my stuff that day, so we drove down to Mexico and tied the knot. We were keeping it a secret, but from now on, I want everybody to know about it. Maybe you've seen my wife on the screen, officer. Her stage name is Dulcie Winslow. The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. The Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I'm the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. There was a girl at the wheel of the big convertible alongside the harbor warehouse.
Frank. Uh, good girl, Doris. You're right on time. Oh, Frank, it is you. Safe and Yeah, safe. not quite. Get going. I'll leave the lights off. Where to? Uh, somewhere where we can talk. My place? Oh, no. No, turn here. Right. The uh, captain of the Malaga said Pier 12 would be deserted. We can drive out to the end of it and talk there. You are being careful. Well, I have to be. I trust you and Ben Watson, Doris, that's all. Anybody else would just love to know that Frank Gentry was back from Manila and back in business. You're taking quite a chance, Frank. You're high on the government's undesirable aliens list. Oh, this is a big deal, sweetheart. It's worth a chance. Oh, here's Pier 12. Uh, now, right out to the end. <laughs> Great place for a conference. Safe place, anyway. Yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Now, now, oh. Doris, we got time for a kiss, huh? It's been a long time, baby. Yes, it has. Was the trip all right? That was okay. Just a handful of passengers. Only one of them worried me. Well, the captain didn't know you. No, the captain isn't a worry. He makes a business of getting people where they want to go. There was another guy on board. Well, you've certainly lost him now. The signals worked. Everybody did his part. Uh, including you, baby. I won't forget it. I don't think you will, Frank. I won't let you. Well, what's the plan? Like I said, Doris, lots of people will be watching for me. That's why you'll pick up the plates. Plates? Well, I always said a quick way to make money is to print your own. Yeah, this will be perfect stuff. Garando did the engraving. Garando? I thought he was deported, sent back to Mexico. That's our deal. We're getting them back in the country in exchange for the plates. Just how is this little miracle to be accomplished? Simple, sweetheart. The modern medium of flight. Oh, sure. It'll work. It happens tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? Look, Frank, I'll help all I can, but I'm not taking the chance of walking into an airport and be... Airport? You think I'm crazy? He's landing in Morristown. Morristown? An abandoned mining town in Nevada. Oh. Then Watson found it. Nobody's been there in years. Oh, here. And a map. You'll need it. I'd go up there myself, but like I said, there was one guy on the boat that worried me. I'd rather lay low for a while. Now, I just go there and, and wait? Right. At the Buckhorn Hotel. Name's still in the front. And you'll be okay. I wouldn't let you take any chances. Tell um, him. Yeah. Hmm? What's this? Money. Real money. You'll have to pay the pilot 500 get Garando into a motel someplace outside of Vegas. Frank, you're quite a guy. You really know how to set things up. Uh, this time I'm going to make one big killing and then stay clear of this stuff. What's the matter? Don't go getting sore. Where are you going? Well, I just... Just want a breath of air, that's all. Hey, now, baby. What's wrong? Look, I appreciate how you feel. I mean, thinking I might get hurt. Frank, I, I do worry about you. Oh, good, baby, good. Only... Frank, please... Hold me. Sure. Hold me tight. Yeah. That better... That's perfect. Doris. Doris, what a... I've just made sure, Frankie. Made sure of a hundred thousand dollars just for me. Occasional stabs of lightning silhouetted the abandoned mining town of Morristown against the darkening skies. The deserted Silver Slipper Saloon and other skeleton buildings are still there, but leaning against each other for support. Inside the Buckhorn Hotel, you feel comfortable and safely alone as you cross the wooden floored lobby. And then... Well... What? Hello. Who? Who? Up here, lady, on the balcony. I don't know what's left of it. Well, who... Who are you? 
Name's Rick Carlin. I'm not the hotel detective. Tough place, huh? I'll be right down. It's a shock, isn't it, Doris? Finding someone else here in the old hotel. You thought you'd be very much alone and wanted to be. It's so necessary to what's ahead, isn't it? But now there's this stranger, Rick Carlin. You wonder what he wants, what he might know. You wonder about Frank's remarks, about the man on the boat who worried him. There. Uh, the old fireplace seems to draw just fine. Yes. You know, you're not the most talkative person in the world. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. You see, I... What's that? Sounds like a car stopping. That is. Station wagon. We're going to have more company. Funny, isn't it? Funny? This little burg's been a ghost town for years, and then all of a sudden something brings it back to life. Well, I, I don't know what you mean. It seems to me it's just... Coincidence. Sure. Coincidence, that's what it is. Well, come in, folks, out of the storm. Come on, come on. Come on. Warm yourselves by the fire. Oh, thanks, <laughs> mister. Sure looks inviting. Come on, Sally. Uh, we're the Masons, Mac and Sally. <laughs> the tourists. Mac and Sally. Nice to know you. I'm Rick Carlin. Hey, How Carlin. do you do? And uh, this... Uh... Uh, Doris Evans. Oh, God Hello. Hello. Oh, now, this is real chummy, huh? What brought you folks to the party? Party? Uh, oh, <laughs> sure, party. Yeah, we were probably just like you. Wanted to wait to see if this storm let up. We saw a car in front. Figured somebody knew something. I mean, about the right place to stay. Uh-huh. Well, this is the right place, right, Miss Evans? Well, it's very quaint. Golly, this fire sure helps. All we need are the hot buttered rum. Hey, how about that, I... I got a little something out in the car. No hot buttered rums, but uh, hang on, folks. I'll see what I can share up. <laughs> yeah, like I said, things are sure getting chummy. Yes, something. It's sure nice of you people to let us share your fire. Oh, anything to help in a storm. Hey, how do you like this? Now we're five. What did you say? Got another guest coming. Can you imagine? If the buckhorn's fancy enough. This fellow looks like kind of a jet. Where is he? Across the street, just got out of a big Cadillac. You were right, Mr. Carlin. This is a party. Well, Doris, now you have other visitors to worry about. You wonder how much each knows or how little. You're only sure of the latest arrival, who turns out to be Frank Gentry's mouthpiece, Ben Watson. You appear not to recognize one another before the others. Wait for a chance to talk privately. But that chance doesn't come immediately. The, uh, Buckhorn Hotel's okay, isn't it, Mr. White? I should say so. Imagine all of us selecting the very same spot. Yeah. Chummy. Real chummy. Mm. Well, the storm seems to have let up. Heck, I see nothing wrong with getting out the old sleeping bag, staying the night anyway. What do you think, Sally? You're the boss, Mac. Sure, sure, the big boss. <laughs> uh, but uh, you'll be staying on a while. Check. <laughs> How about you, Miss Evans? Well, I'm not in a hurry, Mr. Carlin. No, no, I thought not. Look, let's stop the kidding, huh? All of us. Maybe we didn't figure there'd be such a crowd calls for a five-way split now. But we're here, we're stuck with each other. What are we going to do about it? Mr. Carlin, why don't you climb down from your soapbox? Leave us alone. If we all know why we're here, you don't have to remind us. A good suggestion, Miss Evans. Okay. Okay. Sounds like it's time for me to take a walk. But don't go far. Oh, don't worry, sweetheart. Huh. Hey, what's eating the guy? What's it all about? I'm sure I don't know. Do you, Mr. Watson? You haven't an idea in the world. Oh, well, let's get some shut-eye, Sally. Well, I'll help you get the sleeping bag. By the way, this time you're taking the one that doesn't inflate anymore. <laughs> oh, all right, honey. Well, Ben, 
Rather a surprise for each of us, wasn't it, Doris? Where's Frank Gentry? Now, never mind about that. This Rick Carlin could spell trouble for us. I was thinking the same thing. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to get rid of him. It won't be easy. A rugged individual, I'd say. And there's a lot at stake. Frank told you everything, didn't he? He told me enough. Mm-hmm. Enough to cost him his life, hmm? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, you're safe with me, darling. Maybe. As long as I'm useful. Look, what are we going to do? Well, what did you say to the Masons? Why? They took off in their station wagon. (laughs) Probably what you said when you made that crack about a five-way split. You mean they really were tourists? Just happened to drop in here? Of course. And that split crack of yours naturally frightened them. Matter of fact, Mr. Garlin, you frightened me. A little. Oh, sorry, Miss Evans. Don't don't let me frighten you too much. Oh no. Don't worry, I won't do that. You're not as worried about Rick anymore, are you, Doris? Ben is proving useful to you. Very useful. But Rick is dangerous, and you've got to have a plan. You want to talk it out with Ben alone. Your gaze wanders over to Rick, standing in the doorway of the hotel. Calm, relaxed, a cigarette dangling from his lips. Weather's cleared up nice. Real nice. Wouldn't you say, Watson? No, uh, yes, yes, it has. Still kind of cold in here, though. How about uh, stirring up the fire? Oh, of course. Uh, not much wood left. There's plenty around in the building. Uh, try the back rooms. I, I broke up some old furniture before. I'll need the flashlight. Oh, it's uh, right there in the bar. Help yourself. Well, here you are, Mr. Watson. Thanks. Got to see you outside back of the building, please. No, oh, I don't know. Easy. How about letting me in on the secret, huh? Well, I was just asking for a cigarette. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm all out. Uh, excuse me, Miss Evans, while I uh, get some wood. Then I'll, I think I'll get... If my... it is a smoke you want, Miss Evans, I'll be glad to oblige. <laughs> well, thanks. But I prefer my own brand. I have some in the car. You stroll casually down the boardwalk. And then once around the corner, you hurry along the building to the rear of the hotel. As you'd hope, Ben is there waiting for you. Well, Doris, what have you in mind for Mr. Carlin? Along the corridor, Ben, leading to the back door, about halfway, I noticed a trap door. Now, go on. It leads to the cellar, but the steps have rotted away. It's a long drop, and there's no way to get back. I see. You can set it up now. Then come back out here and wait. I'll take care of the rest. It's all set, isn't it, Doris? You know exactly what you have to do. When Rick notices that Watson hasn't returned, he'll go down the corridor to investigate, and you'll be close behind to give him the necessary push at the right time. You go back to your car, pick up the cigarettes, and stroll around to the front of the hotel. Rick isn't there. You hurry forward. And then as you enter the hotel, you breathe a sigh of relief. Rick is standing by the fireplace, staring into the dying embers. I have trouble finding your cigs. What makes you think that? You were gone a long time. A few minutes. My, my. You uh, missed me? Yeah. I missed you. Trouble you for a light? No trouble. Thanks. Fire is getting low, isn't it? Yeah. Watson not back yet? What's keeping him? Watson. Oh, uh, he won't be back. He what? He's gone, sweetheart. Now that leaves just the two of us. (laughs) What's the matter, baby? You disappointed? Disappointed? About what? Watson is leaving so suddenly. Doesn't mean a thing. Sure. He wasn't your type anyway. Guy like Watson's is it? Uh oh, car coming. Better dodge these candles. They 
went by. That's a relief. Yeah. Glad they didn't decide to park here for the night. Might have made things awkward. Well, guess we can light up again. There we are. Look, Miss Evans, relax. You don't have a thing to worry about. Really? You got me figured all wrong, sweetheart. Oh, then I had you figured wrong, too, when you first showed up. Is that so? Yeah, I figured you didn't have the nerve that you'd beat it first chance you got, but you didn't. <laughs> so, I like a dame with nerve. Sure, you're scared, but you're still here. That's right, Rick. I'm still here. And I'm glad you are, because I have a deal to offer you. Uh a deal. Mm-hmm. Surprise. A little. I've decided to cut you in. Cut me in? On what, Rick? Little deal's going to be dumped into our laps right out of the sky. Garando, the counterfeit plates. I see. <laughs> and wondering how come I'm so well informed? You're kind of. Yeah, well, I get around. See? I, I get around a lot, and I generally keep my eyes and ears open. Pays off. Mm. Only a month ago, I happened to be in Manila. You ever been there? No. Oh, you liked it. I, I did. I hated to leave. But I just couldn't pass up a certain opportunity that came my way, so I hopped aboard a freighter for the state. The SS Malaga, perhaps? Well, it's nice. Nice mm-hmm. guess. Meet some interesting people aboard? Oh, very yeah. interesting. Especially a guy named Frank Gentry. Sort of a shock to read in the paper that he was fished out of the bay. Who dunked him? You or Watson? Does it make any difference? No. No, I guess it doesn't, sweetheart. So now, what about that deal I'm offering? Well, naturally, I'm interested. I'm curious, too. Oh, what about? You say you want to cut me in. Why? Let's just say because I like you. Oh, that's sweet, Rick. But let's say there's another reason. Sure. You were pretty close to Frank Gentry. He had a lot of good things going. You know all about him, his connections, everything. I guess I do. Almost. Right. Well, me, I'm sort of new in this counterfeiting racket. But you know the ropes, so I'm offering you a 50-50 split. (laughs) I can hardly refuse such an offer, can I? Unless you want to wind up in the cellar with what's... But the cellar? Yeah. I caught him messing around a trap door back there in the corridor while you were out getting your cigarettes. He won't bother us anymore. Rick. Rick, listen. Yeah. The plane and our friend Garando. Right on time. Come on. The two of you hurry outside. See the light of a plane circle overhead and... Here it land. Then the figures of two men approach, walking toward you down the main street of the old town. You know that one will be Garando with the precious plates. His companion, of course, is the pilot. Hiya. Hi. I'm Hal Williams. I guess you know who my passenger is. Yeah. Hello, Garando. Well, I just wanted to be sure I delivered my passenger safe and sound. Now, how about my money? Frank Gentry said 500, right? Right. Here. One, two, three, four, five. Thanks. Guess I'll be heading back now. Good night. Good night, Williams. Well, Mr. Garando, shall we go inside? Uh, Okay. Sure, sure. Have a nice trip? Yeah, fine trip. No complaints. You have the plates. Sure, I got the plates and the package here. Only I was told to turn them over to Frank Gentry. Oh, Frank Gentry's out of the picture now. Miss Evans um, eliminated him. We're running the show now. How I know that? Because I'm telling you, Garando, I did eliminate Frank Gentry, and I wouldn't hesitate to eliminate you. Might even be better that way. I'll give you just five seconds to hand over those plates. No, put away that gun, please. Here. Take them. Well, Doris? These are the plates, all right, Rick. They're real thing, I know. Okay. 
Now it's for you, Garando. No, wait. Put away your gun, too, please. I don't like your attitude, Garando. You sound like a guy who'd kind of like to make trouble. And I don't like guys who give me trouble. No, don't! <laughs> You've been afraid of Rick Carlin from the moment you stepped into the old Buckhorn Hotel in Morristown, hadn't you, Doris? You even thought he might kill you before the arrival of the plane, bringing the forger Garando and the counterfeit plates. But the unexpected happened. Rick had asked you to be his partner. Then when Garando arrived and turned the plates over to you, Rick had leveled the gun at the little counterfeit. Then something even more unexpected had happened. You heard a shot. But it was Rick who crumbled to the floor. And the man who had fired the shot was standing in the doorway. Hal Williams, the airplane pilot. You sure had me worried, Mr. Williams. I was outside that door all the time, Garando. Heard everything. Wait a minute. What's the idea? Is this a double cross? The idea, lady, is that you're under arrest. Arrest? You can't arrest... But I can. I'm with the Immigration Service. Immigration Service? Yes. We nailed Garando and his original pilot when their plane was forced down just inside the border. We made a little deal with Garando, and I took his pilot's place. A deal? Yeah. We promised to go easy with him if he'd lead us to the man that wanted these counterfeit plates. Garando thought it would be Frank Gentry. But since he and I both heard you say you killed him, it looks like we found his murder as well. Wouldn't you say so, miss? The Whistler. Listen next week when, once again, the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Lady on a Yacht. A beautiful woman rapidly losing money at the gaming tables attracts attention in any part of the world. Anna's Goethe Infante rose from the table at the resort of San Bresano in Argentina and left the room with a tall, dark Spaniard. All eyes were upon it. You wish to speak to me, Carlos? Yes. Yes, little sister. I am not your sister, Carlos. You are my sister-in-law, the widow of my dead brother. It is the same. As the head of the family, I must take care of you. You must not be careless, Goethe. Do not forget there are places in Europe where you are badly wanted, where you would face certain imprisonment and possible execution. I took care of myself before I married your brother, before I came to Argentina. I knew the signal. Now you are a member of our family. As the oldest son, I have the authority to demand that you come home with me before you lose the, the little fortune that my dead brother left to you. It is too late for that. It's gone. It's gone. All of it? Every peso. Then I am too late. Well, you must not worry. I'm not worried, Carlos. I have lost money, yes. But I have been playing for bigger stakes. I do not understand you, Gert. I have never understood you. It is the rich American. 
You mean Senor Philip Collins? Yes. For weeks I have been gambling. So has he. While losing at the tables, I attracted his attention. He has fallen in love with me. And I with him. A North Americano. I wonder, does he know? That I am the widow of your brother, of course. But before that, if... Before that, before you came to Argentina. No, but there will be plenty of time to tell him. I am marrying him tomorrow morning, sailing from Argentina about his yacht. Yes, your gamble paid off, didn't it, Goethe? You realize just how well when the big yacht sets sail. It's been a long time since you've enjoyed such luxury, hasn't it? You're deeply concerned, however, when your new husband insists on a cruise to the Mediterranean before going to the United States. You have a strong fear of many European authorities. Yes, you are one of those listed for questioning regarding certain wartime activities. You never want to see Europe again, do you? Or have anyone in Europe see you? For there are many who hate you and would like nothing better than to turn you in. If any of them saw you, it could mean death or life imprisonment to you, couldn't it, Goethe? You persuade Philip to agree that you will never leave the yacht. But when you reach the southern coast of Italy, he insists that you go ashore with him to a small island where you visit a rather deserted outdoor cafe overlooking the water. What do you think of the view, Goethe? Oh, it's lovely, Philip. Perfectly lovely. Mm -hmm. You are happy, aren't you? Very happy. Let's sit here, shall we? <clears throat> oh, it is a nice, peaceful spot, isn't it? Mm -hmm. mm. An artist making sketches and trying to sell the paintings. No, no, look over there. Oh, yes. <laughs> the quiet type with that beard and the... I'm going to call him over. Uh, how do you say artist in Italian? Pittore, I believe. Uh, Pittore! Si, Will you come over here? At your service, senor. You wish to make a sketch of the lady? Yes, but first let's have a look at your paintings. Of course. Please step over here. I am honored, senor. Ah. Yeah, these are very pretty, aren't they, Goethe? Yes, Philip, they're very good. Hmm. Which one would you like to have? Oh, that landscape, I believe. All right, then that landscape it is. Uh, how much is it? Oh, you name the price, senor. Oh. Well, uh, never mind. We'll talk about that later. Uh, what do you mean? Conrad Marlin. Marlin, how about doing a sketch with Mrs. Collins? With the greatest of pleasure. If Madame would remove her dark glasses. I'm sorry. I'm afraid the sun is too bright. Oh, but Goethe, he can't sketch you. I'm so you. sorry, uh, Philip. Oh. Well, never mind. Now, wait a minute. I have an idea. Marlin. Yes? I'll have you brought out to our yacht tomorrow. You can sketch Mrs. Collins there, where she'll be more comfortable. Now, why don't you sketch Miss Collins uh, here, Mullen, on the deck standing against the rail? Well, that will be very nice, Mr. Collins. What do you think about it, Gerda? Whatever you wish, Philip. Good. Well, I'll leave you two alone. Come down and have a drink with me when you're through, Marlon. Thank you, Mr. Collins. You are most kind. Now, Mrs. Collins, if you will raise your head a bit. Like this? Perfect. Lovely subject. <clears throat> I uh, am aware, of course, that Madame is not an American. I see. My accent. I'm from Argentina. I know. You went there early in 1945. From Germany, Frau von Reckenwitz. Why do you call me that? That is the way I addressed you when I painted the wedding portrait of you and your illustrious husband, General von Reckenwitz. Why, I don't understand. I have changed a great deal, have I not? This beard. I am Kruger. Kruger? At one time, the most popular portrait artist in Central Europe. Unfortunately, those days are gone. Now one must disguise oneself, carry papers under a false name, beg from tourists. No one can understand my position better than Madame, who is also concealing her connection with the past. What do you mean? What makes you think that? Americans do not know the wits of our famous leaders, like General von Reckenwitz. 
If they know. You think not? No, not even when they are as lovely as Madame. I need money badly. Say that you like the sketch so well that you want to engage me to paint your portrait. Mr. Collins will agree, I'm sure. But why is the portrait necessary? I have money. I would be glad to help an old friend. No, no, no. You can help me best through the portrait. Why? Take it to America. If you hang it in your fine living room, Mr. Collins will show it to his friends. Tell them that Conrad Marlin painted. There will be commissions awaiting me when I arrive there myself. You, you plan to go to America? Oh, yes. With the rich husband of my good friend, Goethe von Reckenwitz Collins, to help me. Why not? Well, Goethe, it's infuriating, isn't it? You're anxious to get to America. And now the yacht remains anchored off this Mediterranean island while the artist Kruger, now known as Conrad Malin, paints your portrait. But you know one thing. You'll see that the portrait never reaches the United States where it could be used to further his interests. The sittings for the portrait seem endless and you're constantly on your guard, concealing your dislike for the artist and making a pretense of friendliness. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm afraid I moved. Oh, that's quite all right, Mrs. Collins. Turn your head a bit more to the left, please. Like this? Ah, yeah, that's fine. I oh, noticed Mr. Collins is not here today. He went to the mainland to see someone at the American consulate. Oh, then you plan to leave here soon? Oh, yes. As soon as the portrait is finished and my papers arrive from Argentina. Oh, about the portrait. It will be finished tomorrow. Tomorrow? Really? I can hardly wait to see it. I hope that Mr. Collins will like it. I'm sure that he will. This painting, your portrait, has all been very fortunate for me. I have enjoyed our chats together. It is good to be able to talk to someone who understands. He's been good for me, too. But uh, we must both remember, I am married to an American now. Ah, there you are. Get her. I brought a gentleman from the American consulate back to meet you. His name is Beardsley, an old friend of mine. He's staying for dinner. Oh, well, that would be nice. Uh, how much longer is it going to take, Marlon? Oh, the sitting is nearly finished today, Mr. Clinton. Good, I'd well, hurry along. And when you're through here, you'll find Beardsley in the lounge. That was a narrow escape, wasn't it, Goethe? Suppose Philip had returned a few minutes earlier and overheard Marlon's remarks. It's very dangerous having him around, isn't it? But at the final sitting tomorrow, there will be no reason for him to return to the yacht. Later, when you go into the lounge, you see Philip and his guest at the far end near the bar. They don't notice you as they're looking at the landscape you bought from Mullen the first day at the island. Oh, very nice. Where'd you get this, Collins? From an itinerant artist in the island. You like it, then, huh? Oh, yes, very much. Happen to know the name of the artist? Yes, yes, it's Marlin, Conrad Marlin. Marlin. Uh-huh. Well, I never heard of him. Got a lot of talent. Yes, I should say so. He seems to be down and out. Well, that frequently happens in this part of the world. You know, I've got an idea. Hmm? Hey, why don't I take him to America with us? He could make a good living there. Could that be fixed up? You mean about his papers? Yes. Oh, perhaps. If he's already applied for a deal, there wouldn't be a wait. What would have to do with you, uh, Sonny? Sonny, bring him over to the consulate to see me in the next day or so. I will. Well, this calls for a drink, Beardsley. Ah, yeah. Scotch? Uh, yes, thank you. Good. And how about one for me? Huh? Oh, good. There you are. This is Gordon Beardsley, dear. Come out, Beardsley. How do you, Mr. Beardsley? Come. Would have you the usual? Yes, please. Beardsley and admire Marlin's landscape. Oh. You like it, Mr. Beardsley? Oh, very much indeed. I'll tell you what. We'll get you one of his pictures as a present. Goethe, you see about it tomorrow when Marlon comes out to the yacht to work on your portrait. He's painting your portrait, Mrs. Collins, huh? Yes, he is. Uh, how is it coming along? Oh, very well, I believe. Now, that's interesting. You know, there aren't too many men who do both portrait and landscape equally well. Is that right? Yes. There was one in Berlin, though, named... Uh, uh, Kruger, he did landscape, but also painted all top political figures. What became of the artist? Hasn't been heard of since the war disappeared oh, like yeah. so many others. He was wanted by the authorities. Oh, he's probably dead now. Or in South America. 
A lot of those political refugees went there, you know. Is that so? Oh, those people are scattered to the four corners of the globe. Mm. Doesn't matter much to us where they are until they try to enter the United States. Then, of course, it's different. That's pretty closely watched, isn't it, Beardsley? Oh, yes. Of course, there are certain cases where we're virtually helpless, where certain beautiful women are concerned, for example. Some of these women were close friends or were married to key figures of the Nazi regime, and after the war, these women simply uh, attached themselves to other important men. And in that way, they entered the United States, huh? At times, yes. Well, I don't like that. I don't like it at all. No, nor do I. (laughs) But before turning down an application for a visa, I have to find some proof, you know, something concrete. And in the cases of many of these women, especially when they've been away from Europe for some years or married prominent citizens of other countries, such proof is difficult to get. That's interesting, isn't it, Goethe? You're confident that if you're not recognized as a widow of the infamous General von Reckenwitz... The woman who was his willing co-worker in his ruthless and cruel atrocities against countless helpless war victims. You have little to worry over. And once your husband's yacht sets sail for America, there won't be anyone who could recognize you, will there, Gerta? Except the artist Kruger, now known as Malin. You decide you can't let Malin join you and your husband on the yacht. No. You must get him out of the way on some pretext while Philip is in Rome. But the next morning, as Philip prepares to leave, he suggests you go with him. Philip, darling, that's impossible. Marvin will come this afternoon to take the portrait. Oh, yes, right. Tell him I want to see him to get back. Of course, yes. And don't forget about that painting for Beardsley. Get something really interesting and have it sent over to the mainland with a nice personal note. <laughs> Now, Mrs. Collins, you may look. Your portrait is finished. I am very proud of it. It is nice. Very nice. You are pleased? I'm sure it will look very well somewhere in our house. You will see it there when you come to America. Oh, you have spoken to Mr. Collins about that. Yes, and he plans to bring you into the country. He will start arrangements as soon as he gets home. Oh, madame, I I, I cannot express my gratitude. It's nothing. But uh, I have a suggestion to make. Hmm? Perhaps you should leave Italy by another port. Another port? I I, I do not understand. I believe Mr. Beardsley from the American consulate suspects who you are from something he said last night. That would make things bad for you, wouldn't it? Worse than you know. If it is learned that I am Kruger, my, my life will be in danger. I would never live to reach the United States. I must go somewhere else to, to Genoa, perhaps. I'm sure I will be able to get new papers there, but, but that will take money. I'll help you. I have a considerable amount with me here in my bag. Here, take it all. Oh, there, there is no way to thank you, Mrs. Collins. It is very little to do for an old friend. And I have nothing to offer you in return, except here. Here is a painting. I brought it for you today as a gift to celebrate the completion of the portrait. Thank you. Oh, it's lovely. It is the famous Blue Grotto, Capi. The Blue Grotto? Yes. It has great sentiment of that for me. I would not give it to anyone but you, and I want you to keep it. It will make me very happy. And now, if you will excuse me, I must hurry. Of course. Goodbye, madame. You are a very gracious lady. Please be assured of my undying devotion. <laughs> It was simple, wasn't it, Goethe? With Marlin out of the way, there's nothing to prevent your sailing as soon as you get your visa. And you feel sure that later, after you get to America, you can tell Philip of your wartime marriage to General von Reckenwitz. Convince him it was the impulsive act of a young, naive girl that you didn't know what you were doing. Yes, things are working out well. And although you forget to purchase a painting for Mr. Beardsley, as your husband requested, the painting of the Blue Grotto, which Marlin gave you, will serve equally well as a gift for Mr. Beardsley. By the time Philip returns from Rome, you're in excellent spirits. Philip, I'm so glad you're back. Did you have a nice trip? Yes, dear, and a profitable one, but over a big deal. And I've got good news for you, too. Yes? I stopped at the consulate and saw Beardsley. Your papers have arrived from Argentina, and everything's fine. Your visa will be ready any day. Oh, that is good news. Oh, by the way, that picture you sent Beardsley made a big hit with him. 
demonstrate it. Yes, he said to compliment you on your good taste. How nice. Bisley says it's the blue grotto at Capri. He's already got it framed and hanging in his office. You know, he's very enthusiastic about Mullen. Oh, did you tell Mullen I wanted to see him today? Yes, but Philip, he's left the island. He's left? What for? I don't know. Oh, but good heavens, why would he leave? The man hasn't a cent and he knows I'm going to do big things for him. I don't understand it either. I begged him to stay. You have no idea where he went? No, Philip. I hope you don't blame me. I did everything I blame could. Oh, no, no, of course not, dear, but he can't have got very far. I'll have the police pick him up and bring him back. Bring him back? Oh, sure. He'll come back fast enough and he knows what I want him for. I'll have his description wide through every corner of Italy. But is it really worth the trouble? It is to me. The man's a great artist. I want Mullen in America. He goes to America with us no matter how long it takes to find him. You mean we won't sail without him? Goethe, this yacht doesn't budge from this spot without Mullen aboard. It's infuriating and frightened too, isn't it, Goethe? If Marlon is brought back, he'll know that you lied to him, and instead of a friend, he'll be a dangerous enemy. If there's nothing you can do, wait and hope that the Italian police can't locate him. Next days pass slowly. You feel trapped in this corner of the Mediterranean. Pace up and down the deck of the yacht. The bright sun's annoying, and you get into hate the Italian coastline. Then one day, Philip gets a call to come to the mainland at once. When he returns, his face grins. Philip, what's wrong? Has anything happened? Yes, plenty. Malin, he's been found. Where? In Genoa. I'll give the attendant police credit. Didn't make them wrong. And uh, he's coming back? No, he's not coming back. Wh- why not? He's dead. Dead? Yes. Killed in a gun battle with the police. He fired first. But why, Philip? Well, it's a long, unpleasant story, and I hate to upset you with it. Goethe, his name wasn't Malin at all, but Kruger or something like that. Anyway, he was wanted for looting some art galleries during the war. Had the stolen paintings in his possession. And so when the police went to pick him up, he thought his identity was discovered and they were going to arrest him. And, well, the gun battle followed. How horrible. Yes, yes, it is be gruesome. But you can put the whole thing right out of your mind. We're getting out of here. You mean going to stay? Just as we can. Your visa's ready. We'll run over to the mainland and pick it up tomorrow, then get underway the following morning. You're certain now that everything has turned out very well, aren't you, Gertha? Yes, at last you're free to leave for the United States with your wealthy American husband. There's a lot of activity aboard the yacht next morning, preparations for sailing in and you're in state excitement when you order the mainland with Philip to get your visa from the American consulate. You're quickly shown into Mr. Beardsley's private office, where he greets you warmly and tells you your visa will be ready in a moment. Oh, I hate to see you leave, Collins. I'll miss you and Mrs. Duncan. Personally, I can hardly wait for you. Mom and the business was pretty embarrassing for me. I made a fool of myself. No, you didn't, Philip. Well, I... How could you possibly know that Marlon was a thief? It's quite sad in a way, too. Marlon had a great talent. That blue grotto Mrs. Collins gave you was one of the nicest pictures I've ever owned. Certainly, where is that blue grotto? It was hanging here in your office yesterday. Oh, it's in the next room. An art restorer is working on it. An art restorer? What for? Well, he's taking the blue grotto off. There's a painting underneath. How do you know? I had it x-rayed. You see, Kruger had painted new scenes over several of the paintings he had stolen. Stolen masterpieces are often hidden that way. Yes, but that makes no sense. If that picture had another valuable painting underneath... Kruger wouldn't sell to Mrs. Comp. He did sell you the picture, didn't he, Of course he did. Well, anyway, I called the store, and he's been working on it all morning. Well, I'd like to see that. Do you mind? No, of course not. I'm in here. Oh, won't you come along, Mrs. Collin? Of course. Well, sir, how is the restoration coming? Oh, I have just finished, senor. Really? That was quick work. The top picture was easily removed. The underpainting was heavily varnished with the idea of keeping it intact. And the underpainting, do you think it's a masterpiece? Oh, no, I don't think so, senor. It is a portrait, a wedding portrait. Oh, what do you know about that? Let's have a look at it. Very good, senor. I will place it here where you can see it clearly in the light. It is a picture of the notorious Nazi general von Reckenwitz. 
and his beautiful wife, Goethe. The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, The Whistler's strange story, Generous Host. The evening shadows were lengthening as Steve Neal's jalopy coasted to the curb and came to a stop in a quiet outlying district of Silverton. His eyes surveyed the high wall surrounding the Jameson estate as he wondered if the stories about the eccentric Gerald Jameson, the millionaire ex-silver miner who lived in this huge mansion, were true. Rather interesting stories, too, aren't they, Steve? Suddenly, in the shadows across the street, you see an elderly gentleman facing you, his hands high in the air, and a short, masked man holding a gun on him and rapidly going through his pockets. You jump from your car and race toward the two men. Hey! Hey, you! What are you trying to pull? Put down that gun! The highwayman whirls as you near, hesitates a moment, and then starts running. Hey, you! Stop! You follow, and he turns and then fires. Just over your head. You jump behind a small tree as the man turns and... Runs rapidly away. Then you walk back to the elderly gentleman. Are you you all right, sir? Oh, yes, thanks to you, young man. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry I couldn't catch him. I'm but... glad you came along just when you oh, did. Well, I didn't. Well, the man was angry because I had no money with me. Why? Then he, he didn't take anything. Only a few huh? dollars. I didn't have much with me. Oh, that was lucky for you. Yes, it was. Young man. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Neil. Steve Neil. Traveling artist. Oh, What's your service? Mr. Neal, more than glad to meet you. Jameson's my name. Jameson? Uh, yes, I, I was just taking an evening stroll. I live here in the house behind these walls. How about joining me in a drink? <laughs> I can use one. Well, uh, if you... No ifs about it, young man. I insist. Come along inside. <laughs> You are soon seated in the large library of the Jameson Mansion, aren't you, Steve? Listening to Gerald Jameson praises of your heroic rescue as the very sincerely concerned servant, Henry, brings you a drink. Your eyes survey the luxurious surroundings, and you smile to yourself as you realize the possibilities of your new position. You um, introduced yourself as a traveling artist, Mr. Neal. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, I just decided to see the world, Mr. Jameson. Rigged up my jalopy and set out to paint my way around the U.S. Portraits, landscapes, anything. Anything that sells. Hmm. Well, I owe you a lot for what you did a few minutes ago. Oh, not at all. I'm glad I happened along when I did. Then perhaps you'll honor me by painting something for me. Well, since you put it that way, of course. sir... Uh, consider yourself spoken for, for, uh, let's say, two landscapes and, uh, well, one portrait. Well, you may not like my work. You better check some... I like you, young man. And I know your work will be good. Shall we seal the deal at, uh, uh what is your price? Uh, not so good lately. Last one sold for 50. Would, uh, 600 be satisfactory for the three? 600? And room and board while you're working. We have ample room here. Oh, this is my lucky day. Sure, sure, it's a deal. <laughs> Just when I didn't know where my next meal was coming from, as the saying goes. And then on back, Steve. <laughs> for a few weeks, at least, you'll know where every meal is coming from. Your quick, daring action on Mr. Jameson's behalf solved all your problems, didn't it, Steve? At least temporarily. 
you decide to take your time on your painting assignments. And as the days pass, you hear some interesting stories about Mr. Jameson, especially the ones concerning his habit of keeping large amounts of cash in his safe at home. You decide your opportunities are greater than you realize, and you make it a point whenever possible to watch Mr. Jameson or his trusted servant, Henry, open the safe in the library where your easel faces the wide French windows. After a couple of weeks, you're certain you have the combination. But you're in no hurry, are you? No, you plan to continue your work. Wait for the ideal moment. Then one afternoon, as you're putting the finishing touches on your second painting, Mr. Jameson stands and surveys it approvingly. I hope you're as good at portraits as you are at these other things. Portraits? Yes. You see, I had it in mind to have you do a portrait of my niece. Your niece? My sister's girl, Ruth Royce. Oh. She's arriving by train tonight. 24 years old, quite beautiful. Well, if she's coming tonight, I'd better doll up a little for a change, huh? Well, you look okay, except for a shave and a haircut. Oh, I'll get a haircut this afternoon. Here we are, over here. Uncle Jerry, you look wonderful. You too. You're more beautiful than ever. Uh, Ruth, this is Steve, uh, the Steve Neal I wrote you about. Hello, Steve. Nice meeting you, Ruth. Well, what do you think of your portrait so far, Ruth? I like it. So far. Just reflecting a charming subject, that's all. Well, thank you, sir. Oh, uh, Mr. Steve. Yeah? There's a telephone call for you. Oh, for me? Uh, yes, sir. Didn't give his name, though. Oh, thanks, Henry. <laughs> Telephone's always interfering with pleasant moments. Don't go away, Ruth. I'll be right back. Hello. Hello, Steve. Yes, who's this? Frankie. I told you not to call me here. You've been paid. Yeah, but not enough, Steve. I gave you what you asked for. We're finished. That's what you think, Steve. What would happen if old man Jameson found out we framed that phony holdup you rescued him from? I could tell him all about that, Steve. And some other things, too. You'd better reconsider, friend, and fast. My bankroll's getting low. Real low. The unexpected phone call from Frankie Bixton is more than disturbing, isn't it, Steve? As a guest in the Jameson home, you've not only learned enough about his habits to help yourself to the contents of his safe and make a getaway into Mexico whenever you decide the time is right, you've also found what you think might be the answer to your financial problems for the rest of your life in the person of Jameson's only living relative and heir, his attractive niece, Ruth Royce. But winning her affections will take time, won't it, Steve? Ruth is an intelligent girl and fully aware that you have nothing to offer her other than yourself. Yes, you'll need time. And Frankie is a dangerous threat to such time, isn't he? You decide you've got to find a way to get rid of him once and for all. Meantime, you decide to see more of Ruth. You're certain she finds you attractive. And one evening in a quiet little cocktail lounge on the outskirts of town, you make your first move. Well, now that your portrait's about finished, it won't be long till I'll be on my way. Gonna miss me, Ruth? Probably. It's more than probably with me. I'm gonna miss you plenty. Really, Steve? Really. Hey, excuse me, sir. Yeah? What is it, Wendy? I'm sorry to interrupt, but a gentleman asked me to tell you he'd like to see you for a few minutes privately. Me? You must be mistaken. I don't think so. He pointed you out. The name is Neil, isn't it? Oh, yes, but... Well, uh, t tell him I'll see him some other time. Well, he says it's very important to you, sir. Oh, all right. I'll see him. Excuse me a couple of minutes, will you, Ruth? Of course. Uh, this way, sir. There's a gentleman. There. Thank you. Frankie. You fool. What's the idea of trying to see me here? Mr. Jameson's niece is with me. Yeah, I know. So if I were you, I'd quiet down, get this over with quick. Okay. Make it snappy, will you? Sure, make it real snappy. I need some dough. So do I. Jameson's only paid me for one painting. Yeah, half of that'll do for now. You're out of your mind. Yeah, I guess I'd better see Mr. Jameson. Yep. Okay, okay, Frankie, I guess you win. Will a hundred hold you for a while? 
Yeah, a little while. Say till you get paid for another painting. Well, it might be tomorrow. It might be next week. Next Monday will be fine. Let's say a hundred then and a hundred the following week, okay? Uh, guess it has to be. How long do you expect this blackmail to keep paying off? <laughs> Not too long. Just till you're all finished with Jameson and his niece. Incidentally, you better be getting back to her, hadn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I had. Oh, wait a minute. See you Monday night, 10 o'clock. Here. Uh, sorry, Ruth. That's all right. Business? Mm, yeah, sir. The fellow heard about my painting and made me a pretty fair proposition. I guess I got to think it over, though. Mm, that's always a good idea. Look, uh, Ruth, how about getting out of here, huh? I can't even build up to a romantic conversation without a waiter button in to tell me some guy wants to talk to me. <laughs> all right, Steve. Anywhere you say. Well, I thought we might drive out to the lake. Kind of... I could finish that conversation we were having when that waiter interrupted us. I would too, Steve. This is a lovely spot for a talk, Steve. Beautiful moon, rippling water, everything. You were saying something about if you'd met me under different circumstances. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Well, I just meant that if I'd met you and I didn't know anything about you, uh, before I knew your uncle was a rich man, you might believe me if I told you how I felt about you. If I were to tell you now, you'd just think I was an adventurer after your money. And you wouldn't be? No. In my present situation, I, I wouldn't expect you to believe that. There's more to it than your present situation. Steve, there's something strange about you, something that doesn't quite ring true. But what do you mean by that? Well, those phone calls you get every now and then, for instance, and refusing to answer them in a town where you're supposed to be a stranger. And tonight, when you came back to our booth from your business conference, you look worried, almost frightened. Oh, well, you just imagine that. I was just thinking, that's all. And as far as those phone calls are concerned, I can explain them, too. Uh, it's just someone I met here in town that I didn't want to talk to. <laughs> You'd laugh if you knew why. I hope so, Steve. I truly hope so. Ruth, you mean I've got a chance? You know you have, or you wouldn't have even brought it up. All I want to know is that you're on the level. What do I have to do to convince you? Oh, that's your problem. But if you really feel about me as you say you do, it shouldn't be very difficult. It'll be easy, honey. <laughs> But it won't be easy, will it, Steve? No, it'll be almost impossible. And you wonder whether Ruth is worth the effort. That night, you lie awake thinking about it. You decide your first problem is Frankie. Toward morning, it suddenly hits you the perfect solution. A solution that will give you time to decide exactly how to make your opportunity with the Jamesons pay off. And the additional time to carry out your plans. The following Monday evening at 10 o'clock... You're sitting opposite Frankie in the cocktail lounge where he asked you to meet him. All right, you got my hundred? No. Jameson hasn't paid me for any more pictures. Don't try to hand me that. I'm not handing you anything. Anyway, I've figured out a deal that'll make these hundred dollar shakedowns of yours look like chicken feed. We can both get enough out of it to go to South America and retire for a couple of years. <laughs> Where's the catch? No catch. Now look, Frankie. Jameson keeps him twenty to fifty thousand dollars in his library safe all the time. What about it? I know the combination. Oh, uh, yeah? What else do you know? There's French windows in that library. I can unlock them for you, give you the safe combination. Just be a robbery by a person or persons unknown. Maybe. What about the split? 50-50. You can mail my half to a guy named Joe Wells, care of the Mid-City Hotel, Bay City. That's me. Mark it hold till arrival. Now, I don't want any part of that dough. Near me till the heat's off. Probably frisk me, turn everything I got inside out. Someday next week, when things are cooled off, I'll drive over, pick up the dough, and powder out of here. Hey, you figured things okay. Except one. What's that? I don't get this big trust in me. Suppose I go for this setup. It wants to stop me from grabbing the dough and running out on you. In that case, it won't be a robbery by persons unknown. It'll be a robbery by Frankie Bixton. And I got a hunch the cops will find you real quick. With a little help from me. Yeah, I guess that adds up. When do you figure on pulling this off? Tomorrow night, 11 o'clock, right on the dot. Mr. Jameson, Henry, and I will be playing billiards upstairs in the billiard room. Ruth will be in bed. She's getting up at 5 the next morning to go horseback riding. You can't miss. 
Eh, guess it's worth a chance. Now lay it out for me, huh? Okay. I'll lay it out step by step. Now look. Well, nice shot, Henry. Oh, just luck, sir. Oh, luck, nothing. You handle that cue like a professional. Another? I see what you mean. Uh, wait a minute. Quiet, everybody. What's wrong, Steve? I think I heard somebody in the library. Oh, I didn't hear anything. Neither did I, Mr. Steve. It must be your imagination. No, I don't think so. Anyway, I think I'd better investigate. Uh, do you have a revolver, Mr. Jameson? Why... Yes, in the top drawer of the dresser in my bedroom. Good. I... I'll get your gun and sneak downstairs. Now, you and Henry keep right on playing billiards as though nothing had happened. If anyone is down there, I... No, just a minute, Steve. That's dangerous. Don't, don't worry. I'll be careful. A and keep the game going. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, Frankie, keep quiet and keep your hands where I can see them. Steve, that's right. How much did you get? Around 20 grand, I think. What's the idea? Now, pull that plant out of that pot there by the roots, and all you have to do is lift it. I loosened the dirt and it wet it down an hour ago. Now, wait a minute. All right, now, come on, move. I can let you have it, and you'll be another dead burglar. Double cross, huh? I said move. Okay. Now, out those French windows, Frankie. Look, Steve. Come on, get going. Hey, you! You, you, stop! Stop or I'll shoot! Oh, Steve! Steve, what happened? Are you hurt? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Jameson, but he got away. Well, you did your best, Steve, and I won't forget it. Oh, thank you, sir. Ruth, you'd better phone the sheriff while I examine the safe and see what's missing. When the sheriff and his deputies arrive... You spend some anxious moments as they question you and examine the premises. But everything worked out exactly as you planned. You breathe a sigh of relief when they ignore the wet flower pot and leave. You're sure that by morning no one can tell the plant was tampered with. By one o'clock you've retired for the night. But you're worried and a little frightened, aren't you, Steve? You know that Frankie knows you tried to kill him. And you know that he'll be around again and soon. You decide to stay close to the estate until you're ready to take the stolen money, forget about Ruth, and leave Silverton. A few days later... That uh, about does it, Mr. Jameson. I can't polish it anymore. The portrait's excellent, Steve. Oh. You have real talent. Well, I'm glad you like it, Mr. Jameson. What about you, Ruth? Satisfied? Yes, I like it. Well, then I do, too. All right. I guess it's goodbye. Well, goodbye? Goodbye? I'm afraid so. My work's done. It's time for me to move on. But there's no hurry. I'm afraid there is, sir. Say, I've been offered a job on the coast as a commercial artist, and I've decided to take it. I'll be leaving day after tomorrow. Just before dinner that evening, Mr. Jameson calls you aside, and as a reward for your bravery, tries to persuade you to accept an additional $500 for the paintings you've completed. When you decline... You're certain from the expression on his face that he's pleased at your decision. Jameson treats you almost like a son, doesn't he, Steve? You spend most of the next day in your room, ostensibly writing letters and packing your few belongings. That evening after dinner, you chat pleasantly with Jameson and Ruth until nearly midnight. When they finally decide to retire, you tell them you're going to enjoy a midnight snack and then check your car. As soon as you're sure they're asleep, you go into the library... Remove the stolen money from the flower pot. Go outside to the garage and stuff the bills under the cover of the driver's seat. Then as you turn around... I'm going somewhere, Steve. Huh? Frankie. Yeah. You're not such a good shot. Well, I, I was just putting on an act. You know that. Your act was too good this time. You were trying to knock me off. Oh, no, no, you're all wrong, I've been Frankie. waiting to get you, Steve. And this is it. As Frankie starts towards you, you see a knife blade flash in the moonlight. You're standing with a car door open, and your hand closes around a wrench in the front seat. You lunge directly toward Frankie, and your surprise attack throws him off balance. As he stumbles, you strike him on the head and watch him fall forward and lie still. After what seems hours, you realize he's dead. For a moment, you're panicky, and then relieved to know he's permanently out of the way. Quickly, you open the trunk lid of your car and place his body inside. 
and then lean against the car and light a cigarette. Who's that? Who's there? It's me, Steve. Ruth. What are you doing here? I couldn't sleep. I thought I might take a little drive. Oh. Oh, I... I I couldn't sleep either. Steve. Yes? I'm kind of glad you're out here. I wanted you to know something before you left. I... I think you're on the level. Ruth, you you mean it? I mean it. Well, thanks, Ruth. I... It's all I can say right now. Just... Just thanks. Do you still want to leave? Take that job on the coast? I have to, Ruth. But I'll be back, honey. Soon. Well, Steve, your mission in Silverton is accomplished, isn't it? You have $20,000 under the seat covers of your car. And when that's spent, you're certain you can come back and marry Ruth Royce the niece and only relative of your wealthy benefactor, Gerald Jameson. And even though the body of the man you killed, Frankie Bixton, is in the trunk of your car, you're not worried, are you, Steve? No, you're certain that once you're on your way, you can find a lonely stretch of road where you can easily dispose of this important link to your part in the successful robbery of the Jameson safe. Next morning, after a lengthy breakfast, Mr. Jameson and Ruth accompany you out the front door and around the house to the drive. Well, who does this belong to? You, Steve. It's all yours, fully equipped. When you refused to allow me to pay you what I thought your paintings were worth, I decided to make it up to you in some other way. The uh, surprise part was Ruth's idea. Uh, certainly surprise, all right. As soon as you sign these transfer papers, it'll be all yours. You like it, don't you, Steve? Oh, sure, sure. But what about my old jalopy here? Where is it? Uh, Mr. Burke drove it back to the garage when he delivered this new station wagon for you early this morning. Well, how could I? It was locked. I, I still have the keys. Uh, Henry had an extra key made when you let him drive your old car into town yesterday. Well, what's the matter, Steve? You look so strange. Oh, nothing, nothing. Except getting a new station wagon is quite a shock. Besides, I had so much personal stuff in that old jalopy of mine, I, I think I'd better check on it before I leave. Where is it? At the Main Street garage. Uh, but it looks like it won't be necessary for you to go after it, Steve. It's uh, turning into the drive right now. And Sheriff Wilson is driving. Now, what do you suppose the sheriff's doing in that old jalopy of yours, Steve? The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present... The Whistler. United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, The Huntress. Beautiful, with a cool, precise mind. Anne in her late twenties. Anne Barry was unhappy with her position as private secretary to Roger Newhouse, elderly owner of Classics Publishing Incorporated. But three months ago, an unexpected opportunity arrived, didn't it, Anne? Your employer, whose confidence in you has increased with the years, departed on a long-delayed six-months vacation in Europe and left you in charge. 
with full power of attorney to transact business. But things haven't worked out quite as you planned. And one afternoon, after a three-day absence at a publisher's convention, you're surprised when you open the door to your office. Hello, Anne. Well, Mr. Newhouse, I thought you were in Paris. I was, but Mrs. Newhouse wanted to come home, so we planed in yesterday morning. Well, I suppose being home has its advantages. It does, indeed. I, uh, I did my best to take care of things while you were gone, Mr. Newhouse. You certainly did. What do you mean? I examined our accounts yesterday, and bank statements, canceled checks, everything. I see. Now I'd like to know what you did with more than $9,000 of the firm's money. Well, I bought stock. For the firm? Yes. No, no, not exactly. You see, I... I'll... Sell it in the morning. I can't. Why not? Because, you see, the stocks turned out to be bad. I, I thought... You mean you took advantage of my trust in you to use the firm's money for personal stock speculations? Yes, but I'll pay you back, Mr. Newhouse, if you just give me a chance. Oh. I'll, uh... I'll go back home to California. I have an aunt there. She's she's always planned to leave me her money. I'm I'm sure if I can talk to her, she'll help me. Besides, I have friends there I'm sure will help me. Just give me two months. That's all I ask. I shouldn't, Anne, but I'm going to. I'd like a ticket to Las Vegas on the 11 o'clock flight. Yes, ma'am. exactly why you chose Las Vegas yourself, do you? But you had to go somewhere. And there's something about Las Vegas that intrigued you, especially its atmosphere of chance. You hope to meet some of your former husbands, old friends there who might help you. Perhaps find a new and wealthy romantic interest. Possibly even find luck at the table. You have nearly $1,800 you managed to scrape together before you left the East. And if necessary, you'll risk it all. A little at a time. Won't you, Anne? For a few days, nothing of importance happens. And then one night in one of the casinos, as you're sitting at the bar... Here you are, miss. Got you over ice. But I haven't ordered another. Compliments of the gentleman at the end of the bar. Oh, which one? Wearing horn-rimmed glasses. Oh, the young man. Got anything against you? Too much, yes. Anyway, thank him for me. <laughs> you better do that yourself. Good evening. But you don't waste any time, do you? Not if I can help it. Thanks for the drink. That's okay. <laughs> Aren't you going to ask me to sit down? All right, but you can't stay too long. I'm expecting someone else. I wish you were waiting for me. Do you? Yeah. Well, to you, the mysterious lady in black. And to you, the very young man in the herringbone tweed. Tell me about yourself, eh? Something about you... Now, you're trying too hard, Herringbone. As I told you, I'm expecting someone. I had kind of hoped... Well, never mind. Guess so I'll toddle along, huh? So long. Goodbye. Mm, another drink, miss? No, I'm still on this one. Well, who was that young man, anyway? You don't know? No. He's Mark Bradford of Los Angeles. He's only got a couple of million. His mother left it to him. His father, Anthony Bradford,'s got plenty too. How interesting. Thought you were waiting for a guy. Oh, oh it's you again. Don't you know better than to startle somebody like that out here in the dark? I'm sorry. Sorry if I seem rude, but I guess you have to take it out on somebody. What do you mean? Well, nothing. It's an old story. I don't want to bore you with it. <sighs> don't worry about that. Well, I was in love. I wanted to get married. Have a home and children. He just wasn't interested. Maybe you're better off. Oh, why do you say that? Because I know what the other side of the coin looks like. I'm getting married next month. You're not in love with her? No. Never was, really. Well, then why in the world? Oh, 
Because I can't tell her, that's all. Not after all these years. It would kill her. Let's skip it, huh? What what about doing this town? Forgetting it all. What do you say? Well, I don't know. We we don't even know each other's names. Well, let's keep it that way. We can pour out our hearts to each other. No harm done, huh? Come on, let's go. Two little black sheep off on a spree. All right, I'm on. This time it is our last night, Lady in Black. I've got to leave in the morning. So you said. I hate leaving you. Oh, if I could only tell Cynthia. Hey, excuse me. Uh, I'm Joe Bartlett, West Coast news columnist with Bradford. I know who you are, but I uh, don't know who the lady is. The concern you, Winnie? When a young millionaire whose engagement to the very social Cynthia Van Runkle has been announced and is seen as often as you've been seen around Las Vegas with a beautiful and mysterious lady in black, it's a legitimate interest to a newspaper man, Mr. Bradford. Forget it. We're just chance acquaintances. And the lady doesn't care to divulge her name? The lady definitely does not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll just call you the uh, lady in black. I asked you to forget it. Sure, 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 Mr. Bradford. It's forgotten. <laughs> But it's not forgotten as far as you're concerned, is it, Anne? Nor is it farewell. No, you're certain that if you handle things wisely, you can become Mrs. Mark Bradford. That some moonlit evening before too long, the stage can easily be set for a quick elopement to Arizona. You remain in Las Vegas for a few days after Mark leaves for Los Angeles. And then you do likewise. On your arrival, you register at the Mid-City Hotel... And a few days later, as you're glancing through the newspaper... Cynthia Van Ronkel, to be chief hostess at annual charity fair, urges public to attend. Next Tuesday. Thanks, Cynthia. It'll be nice seeing your boyfriend again. Oh, Mr. Well, of all people, hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> Good to see you again. Yeah, Mark. Mark, I don't think I've ever met this lady. Is our man Barry? Oh, sorry. I'd like to present Carl Van Ronco, Miss Barry, my, my fiancé's brother. Oh, oh, I am do. pleased. You know Cynthia? I'm oh, sorry. I've never had the pleasure. Oh. Well, haven't I seen you someplace before, Miss Barry? I don't think so. Ever been to Europe? No. Oh, oh. The, the orchestra, Carl, you will excuse us, won't you? I'd like to dance with Miss Barry. Oh, surely. Go right ahead. I know. So your name is Anne Barry. Mm-hmm. You haven't been out of my mind, Anne. Seeing you again makes everything even tougher. You're going through with your marriage? Yes, Anne, I have to. Oh, good luck. But I think you're being unfair to Cynthia. Well, I'm trying not to be. That's why She'd I... prefer to know now rather than after the wedding. She'll survive. I did. You know, Anne, I believe you're right. Of course I'm right. But can only tell Cynthia right away tonight. You've got to tell her pretty soon, Mark. Or I'll make up your mind to marry her and forget everyone else. Including you? Including me. Uh, I'll try to tell her this evening. If you succeed, Mark... You can find me at the Mid-City Hotel. In spite of what he told you, you're not at all certain that Mark will break his engagement to Cynthia Van Runkle, are you, Anne? No. Mark is very susceptible to his companion of the moment. And you feel sure that once he's with Cynthia again, he'll soften and lack the nerve to break off with her. But you're still confident, aren't you, Anne? And the following afternoon in your hotel room, you get what seems like an unexpected touch of good fortune. Hello? Miss Barry? Yes? This is Joe Bartlett, news columnist. Remember me? I met you in Las Vegas as the uh, lady in black. Yes, I remember you. How did you learn where I was staying, Mr. Bartlett? Easy. I just asked Mark Bradford. I see. Well, what is it, Mr. Bartlett? 
I'm uh, still wondering about uh, you and young Bradford. We're just good friends, that's all. Oh. Real good friends? Well, uh, yes, you could say that, I suppose. What about his uh, fiancée? Well, what about... I've uh, heard rumors that Mark was breaking his engagement to marry another woman. How interesting. Any idea who the uh, other woman might be? Oh, now, really, Mr. Barnett, I don't even know that Mark is breaking his engagement. But if he is, if the rumor is true, could the other woman be you? It could be almost anyone, couldn't it? <laughs> could it that? Well, uh, thanks, Miss Barry. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Bartlett. You smile to yourself as you sit back and wait for developments. And they're not long in coming, are they? Exactly as you hoped, Joe Bartlett carries a big story in his rumor column next morning. And late in the afternoon, you get a phone call from Mark and arrange to meet him at a small, out-of-the-way cocktail lounge. A few minutes after your arrival, you learn that the reporter, Joe Bartlett, accomplished even more than you'd hoped for. So you told Cynthia... After that newspaper story, what else could I do? She asked me point blank how I felt about you. How did she take you? Terribly. Cried like a child. Not the worst of it. Our, our friends are off of me. My father was so shocked he could hardly speak. Sorry? No. No, now that it's out, I'm, I'm glad. I'm in love with you, Anne, and I intend to marry you soon. <laughs> oh, incidentally, Dad wants to talk to you. I, I told him you'd come to the house and see him late tomorrow afternoon. Is that Okay. Uh, okay. said you wanted to visit with me, Mr. Bradley. Yes, I do. Naturally, I'd like to get acquainted with a young lady my son thinks he wants to marry. Thinks he wants to marry? Let's say he's sure he wants to marry you. But you're not sure he should. I'm open-minded, my dear. Well, I'm ready for the cross-examination. Shall we proceed? Oh, oh, oh. We've plenty of time, my dear. First of all, I'd like to show you the house. I'm especially proud of my gun room and quick freezer. Uh, quick freezer? Yes, I bought it after the war. Surplus. I do a lot of hunting, like to freeze my birds, wild game, and so forth. Eat them when the mood strikes me. As Mark told me, you were quite a hunter. One of my two pet hobbies. Shortwave radio is the other. Oh, incidentally, it's almost time for McTavish's call. McTavish? Yeah. They're all Scotsmen and far away Zanzibar. We contacted each other accidentally some years ago. Been kidding each other ever since. Oh. Come along, Miss Barry. I'll even show you Mark's old nursery. Hmm. Six o'clock. I use the clock radio to turn on my short wave set. McTavish will be on any second now. Calling W6XBY USA. This is VQ1XR Zanzibar. Calling W6XBY. Excuse me, those are my call letters coming over the short wave set. Calling W6XBY. This is VQ1XR Zanzibar. Over. VQ1XR. This is W6XBY calling. Standing by. Come in, Mac. What in blazes took you so long to answer your call letters, Bradford? You getting deep in your old age? I can hear your creaking well enough. You're broadcasting on the wrong frequency, McTavish. Why don't you fix your set? Over. It's your receiver that's off. How's your reception? Clear as crystal. How's mine? Ah, I can hear you fine. If you only had anything to say. Well, I'm not saying much to you tonight. I'm busy. I've got a visitor. She's young and pretty, too. Mull over that, McTavish. W6XBY signing off. And clear. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> For two men who've never met, McTavish and I are great friends. Well, let's be serious for a few minutes, shall we, Mr. Barry? Of course. I, uh... Well, 
Carl Van Ronkel, Cynthia's brother, you know, seems very certain that you are not all you seem to be. Frankly, I'm checking into your background. I'll have your full history in a week or so. You have to move quickly, don't you, Anne? It's now or never, isn't it? The time for the moonlit tete-a-tete and elopement can't be postponed any longer. Not even another day, can it? That evening, you suggest a long drive and finally park high in the hills, a myriad of lights dancing beneath you. It's beautiful down there. It's almost sad, isn't it? Yes, it does seem sort of sweetly sad. Mark, are you... Are you sorry about us, I mean? Of course not, darling. Are you? In a way. Why? Because I don't like this having to justify my existence. Your father investigating me, all that sort of thing. Oh, darling, it's only natural that dad It's only can't... natural to want to be trusted by the man you love, too. But the way things are, I feel like a slave on an auction oh, block. Dad, you, you either can't... love me and want to marry me, or you don't, Mark. Now, which is it? You know I love you. Then you'll marry me now, tonight. Well, then it's yes. We'll fly to Yuma tonight. next morning you're married by a justice of the peace in Yuma. That evening you write Mr. Newhouse, telling him of your good fortune and assuring him you'll soon return the $9,000 you embezzled. Now you're certain you've won your biggest gamble, aren't you, Anne? On your return from Yuma, you move into Mark's apartment where you plan to remain until you find just the house you want. But late one afternoon, a few days after your return, Mark phones you that he's attending the annual dinner of his college alumni and won't be home until late evening. A few minutes later, his father phones and asks most urgently that you drive out to his house. I appreciate your coming in. It's the helps out right off. And it's just as well that what we have to say to each other be kept strictly between us. I have some correspondence in my desk drawer. I haven't shown it to anyone yet. I hope I don't have to. But I'd like for you to read it. I'll get it for you. Can't you just tell me what it's all about? If you prefer. It seems that the things that Carl Van Ronkel said about you are all true. And many other things. And what do you plan to do about it? I'm going to give you a chance to exit gracefully. How much money does exit gracefully mean? Not a cent. Oh, you forget I'm Mark Bradford's wife. And when a man of his wealth wants to... uh dispose of his wife, the courts usually make him pay rather heavily for that privilege. Not when the marriage is fraudulent. Fraudulent? Exactly. You made the mistake of lying on your marriage license. You swore that you'd never been married before. That's perjury. And I'm sure the marriage can be quickly annulled. I don't think Mark will want the marriage annulled. After all, he is an adult. After he reads these reports, he'll never want to see you again. <laughs> He's not going to see them, Father Bradford. He what? You shouldn't have opened that desk drawer when you picked up those reports. I noticed this revolver, and I decided to use it if I had to. You're mad. Give them to me, please. You'll never get away with it. I'll get copies. I doubt it. Now start walking toward the rear of the house. No, not a step. Would you rather I pull the trigger? You wouldn't dare. Everyone would know it was you. I don't think so. You see, it would be an accident. We were here alone. You thought you heard someone. You grabbed the gun out of the drawer, tripped over this footstool. I tried to keep you from falling, seized your arm, and... The gun went off accidentally. With the evidence that would come out against you, no jury in the world would believe you. I think they might. Where are you taking me? To that quick freezer behind the house you showed me. I noticed it was a walk-in. You were considerate enough to explain that the lock was automatic. But there's an emergency button inside. Elston, my button... Won't hear it. He isn't here. Neither is the cook or gardener. This is their night out. Then, please, I... I'm sure they won't be back much before midnight and... It's only a little after six o'clock. Just a few hours will be up. Yeah, news to me. You don't realize... I realize that if you'd stayed out of Mark's affairs, we'd have all been quite happy. Well, now it's too late. You got trapped in your freezer while you were alone at home. It happens occasionally. I've read about it in the papers. Once the freezer door closes on the elderly Mr. Bradford, you breathe more easily, don't you, Anne? You remain outside the freezer for nearly an hour, but as its poundings and entreaties grow weaker and finally stop entirely, you decide to return home. 
As the hours pass and nothing happens, you're certain your problems are solved. You smile as you await Mark's return from his college dinner. Then, at a little before 11 o'clock... This is Ann Bradford? Yes. I'm Detective Lieutenant Graves of Homicide. Homicide? That's right. Won't you come in? Thank you. Why the late visit, Lieutenant, has anything... I'm sorry, Mrs. Bradford, but you're under arrest. Arrest? What for? For the attempted murder of your father-in-law. He didn't die in that freezer, Mrs. Bradford. We got to him in the nick of time, and he told us the whole story. How how did you... We got a tip from Washington over our teletype. Sounded like a joke. Would we decided to search the premises anyway, and we heard that freezer buzzer. Washington, I, I don't see how... The radio Washington. monitor there picked up a short wave message from abroad. Yeah, I'll read it to you. W6XBY, Anthony Bradford, has just missed his first short wave appointment in many years. The old buzzard must be either sick or dead. Please investigate immediately. Thank you, VQ1XR McTavish. Zanzibar. The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadow. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Lonely Highway. the lights of the heavy truck pierced the darkness, illuminating the lonely highway far ahead. The driver watched the rearview mirror almost as much as he did the road. The car, far back, was now gaining and honking its horn strangely. And as the car drew alongside, there was sudden recognition. The truck slowed down, ground slowly to a halt at the crest of a hill. The truck driver climbed down, and a tall man, Ted Mallory, stepped from the car that had been following You are tall, aren't you, Ted? Tall, easy to look at, and ruthless. You walk forward to meet your partner. Because this entire matter has to be handled quickly, doesn't it, Ted? Glad I caught up with you, Harry. What's up, Ted? Uh, I have to talk to you, Harry. Well, would you keep till tomorrow? I didn't know what to think until I recognized the car. No, no, it won't keep, Harry. It's too important. Something on the holdups we've been having? Not exactly. Frankly, I thought that was just what was happening. I guess you know that's why I took this run out myself tonight. Sure, Harry. I know all about it. Well, it's got to stop, Ted. We're losing drivers. We're losing our, we'll lose our insurance next. I know, Harry. That's why I want to sell. Now, look. We've been all through that. If you chase me out here tonight, no, just... No, no. The arguing's over. As a matter of fact, Harry, the partnership's over, too. What are you talking about? Just this. I'm tired of it. Tired of the business. Tired of you calling the turns. So, like I said, it's over. What are you... Hey, where did you get that gun? Never mind that, Harry. The important question is, how do I expect to get away with shooting you? It's simple. Just another gang robbery. You thought that's what it was yourself when I started honking the horn and waving it out. Yeah, but what's that got to do with it? Look, Ted, you can't pull off a thing like this. Oh, yes, I can. I got it all figured out, partner. Simple arithmetic. First, this.
That was your first move, wasn't it, Ted? And it's over. Now your second move. You lift your partner's body back into the truck cab, release the air brakes, and leap clear as the huge vehicle begins to roll forward and start down the hill. You watch, almost fascinated. The truck's running lights clearly visible as she rushes headlong toward a curve below. And then you gasp in surprise as she rounds that curve. Perfectly. You run to the crest of the hill and look down. The truck is making every curve perfectly. With your murdered partner at the wheel. You hurry back to your car, get behind the wheel and race down the highway. But it's no use, is it? There's no sign of a crash. No truck. It's disappeared. Vanished into the night. There's nothing you can do but head back, fast, to your apartment. Hello? Ted? Oh, Ted. Hello? Hello? Who is this? Ted, I... I'm sorry, it's Helen. Helen Murdoch. Helen? Uh, what's the matter? It's, it's Harry. The police just notified me. Well, now, 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 please, Helen, pull yourself together. What happened? They, they found his body a few hours ago by the side of the highway. He's dead. By the side of the highway? You mean he went off the road or something, crashed his truck? No, Ted, there was no sign of the truck. They just found Harry. I'll, I'll be right over, Helen. I'll be there in ten minutes. Your careful plan went wrong, didn't it, Ted? The truck at the side of the road. The shooting of your partner. Then watching the heavy vehicle start down the curving highway. And take every turn as though perfectly driven and controlled. Next morning, you'll hear the newsboys shouting the story of another hijacking. The disappearance of the truck owned by your freight line. Your mind whirls as you wonder what could have happened. If it was the work of a gang with a member hiding in the back of the truck. If so, there was a witness to what you did, wasn't there, Ted? Someone who saw you kill Harry Murdoch. Late that afternoon, you receive a police report. The truck has been found. Parked near the Hilltop Cafe on Highway 101. You take a driver with you, hurry to the spot. Find a highway patrolman waiting there for you. Good afternoon, officer. I'm Ted Mallory. Well, there it is, Mr. Mallory. There's your truck. Well, the cargo, uh, I don't suppose... Clean. They took everything. 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 Including my partner's life. I don't think they planned to do it, Mr. Mallory. But what makes you think that? Well, up to last night, they'd steered clear of murder. Usually knocked the driver out, tied him up, and left him in a truck. I see. Last night, someone in the gang had a nervous trigger finger. Murderous rat. We'll get him, Mr. Mallory. Don't you worry about that. I know, officer, I know. It'll be easy, though. After what happened, the killing, the gang will probably lay low for a time, even break up or move on somewhere else. You uh, think they'll move on? My guess is they'll move on. But as I said, Mr. Mallory, we'll find the man who killed your partner. You can count on it. We'll get him. You turn, nod to your driver, and wait till he drives the truck away. Then with a the police officer, you walk back to the cafe. A few moments later, he too drives off. Inside, you sit at the counter having a cup of coffee, thinking over what the officer said... And then a man sits down next to you. Very unfortunate, Mr. Mallory, about your partner's death. Yes. Thanks. It was unfortunate. Work of a gang, they say. That's right. Only we know different, don't we? What did you say? Don't get excited. Better put your cup down, Mr. Mallory. You're spilling your coffee. Much too good to waste. Uh. What are you driving at? Just this, friend. I was in the back of that truck. Oh, sure, sure. It was the work of a gang, all right. The hijacking part. Nice haul. Only... Only what? 
I just get a small share, you know, and it's a risky business. So? So now I'm in a new business. Legitimate. How do you figure? You worked it out for me, Mr. Mallory. Simple arithmetic. One, you kill your partner. Two, I see you do it. Three, you are going to take over the lines yourself. Buy off Harry's widow for a song. And four? Four? I'm going to let you do it. Only one little bit of addition there. You count me in, too. A silent partner in exchange for silence. Well, I guess I really haven't much of a choice, have I, Mr... Uh, Phillips. Uh, Lenny Phillips. Okay, Phillips. I'll talk to Harry's widow tomorrow. Make a deal. I thought you'd see it my way. Ted, I do hope you understand why I don't want to sell. It all came so suddenly. I want time to think. Well, whatever you say, Helen, I... I must admit it surprises me a little. I'll be at help, too. Really, I will. By the way Harry used to talk, you men have needed someone like me around that freight office to take charge of the account. Never and... mind, Helen. I said I understood, didn't I? We'll find something for you to do. Again, the unexpected has happened, hasn't it, Ted? Helen Murdoch has turned down your offer to buy her out made it clear she intends to remain with the freight lines as a partner. And you wonder why. You can't quite accept her explanation, can you? No. You feel certain there's something else behind her move. Her decision complicates matters, doesn't it? It's definite cause for alarm. And there's still Lenny Phillips to think about. The following morning, Lenny walks into your office. Morning, Teddy. I just dropped in to see how you made out with uh, Harry's widow last night. I didn't. What do you mean? I thought you had an appointment. Oh, I saw her, Helen, but she wouldn't sell. What? She turned down my offer. It's too bad. Maybe you'd better make her a more attractive offer. Huh? It won't do any good. Maybe you'd better be a little bit more persuasive. Listen, Phillips, I tried my best. Try again. I will, but you've got to give me time. What for? Well... Right now, Helen's sort of at a loss. Doesn't know what to do with herself. She wants to work around the office here, tight, do some filing, anything to occupy her mind. I figure she'll get tired of the routine after a while and bow out. Meantime, what am I supposed to do? Sit around while she cuts into my profits? Not me. That's not the way I got it planned. This partnership is just between the two of us. 50-50. But I told you, she won't sell. Like I said, you'll have to be a little bit more persuasive. You get rid of her. Hold it, hold it. Someone's coming. Morning, Ted. I... Oh, I didn't know you had anyone with you. Oh, that's okay, Ellen. Uh, Mr. Phillips is just leaving. Uh, come in. Uh, Mr. Phillips, Mrs. Murdoch. How do you do, Mr. Phillips? Mrs. Murdoch? I, uh, sorry to hear what happened about Harry, your husband. He was a real guy. Real. Thank you. I, um... Understand you're going to take up where Harry left off. Stay with the line. Yes, I really don't know too much about the business, but I'm willing to learn. I do hope Ted will be patient with me. Oh, of course, Ellen, of course. Uh, well, <clears throat> I've got to be shoving off, Ted. I got an appointment. Uh, nice meeting you, Mrs. Murdoch. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Phillips. See you around, eh, Ted? Uh, yeah, sure. I hope I didn't rush him away. No, no, no. He uh, just dropped in to say how sorry he was about... about what happened. Was he a friend of Harry's? Yeah. Well, Ted, where do I hang my hat and coat? I'm ready to go to work. Well, sure. Uh, you can use Harry's desk over there. I didn't know you'd be in so soon or I'd have straightened things up. Well, I'm rather anxious to get started, Ted. I hope you don't mind my moving in like this. I won't be much of a problem, really. If I do say so myself, I do catch on to things quickly. Very quickly. You spend the greater part of the morning going over the office routine with Helen. And as a week goes by, you notice she seems to become more and more interested in the work. You begin to wonder if perhaps you haven't been wrong about her. 
and the pressure on you lessens. But there's still any Phillips to deal with, isn't there, Ted? Yes. Day after day, he telephones you, becomes more insistent that you get rid of Helen, buy her out, and you plead for more time. And then, Lenny's calls suddenly cease. Two weeks pass, and you wonder why you don't hear from him. Then one afternoon... Shall I get that, Ted? Uh, thanks, I'll now get it. Hello? Hello, Teddy boy. I want to talk with you in private, right away. I got news for you, and you won't like it. Oh? There's a bar not far from your office, Frank's place. I know, uh, but look, it I... can't wait, partner. Come on over. Now. Helen. Yes? I've got to go out of the office for a while. If I don't get back by 5.30... I'll close up. Okay. Oh, and uh, about dinner tonight. All right if I stop by to pick you up around 7? Well, that'll be fine, Ted. 7 o'clock. Good. That'll give me time to see the party you just phoned. Okay, Phillips, what's on your mind? Sit down. Look, if it's about Helen, I'm taking her out to dinner tonight. I'm going to ask her again about something. Sit down. All right. Let's have it. Are you trying to pull a fast one? What do you mean? Your partner's widow. What did you tell her about me? Well, I didn't tell her anything. Why should I? She's been asking about me. What? Yeah, in that little coffee shop across from your office. Guy runs it as a pal of mine. He told me. What? Why would she do that? I thought maybe you might know. No, no, I don't know. She must have had some reason for asking. Yeah, she... Wait a minute. The day you met her in the office, she asked me if you were a friend of Harry's, and I said you were. Maybe she asked about you at the coffee shop just out of curiosity. Maybe. But I don't like curious women. You better see to it that this one doesn't get too curious. You'd almost made up your mind about Helen, hadn't you, Ted? Yes, you were finally prepared to accept her explanation. The reason she gave you for continuing as an active partner in the freight line. It was something for her to do to occupy her time. Something to help her over the shock of Harry's sudden death. But now she's inquiring about Lenny Phillips. And you don't like that, do you? No. And you've got to do something. You think about it as you hurry to your apartment and pace the floor. And then finally an idea occurs to you. It's a way out, isn't it, Ted? And you decide to move fast. Hello? Hello, Phillips. Ted. What's on your mind? Look, uh, I think you're right about Helen. She's getting too curious. When I got back to the office, she started asking me questions about you. Something's got to be done about that. Right. And I have an idea. Suppose we meet and talk it over. Frank's place will do, say, in half an hour. I'll be there. You've thought it all out very carefully, haven't you, Ted? Yes. But it isn't Helen that worries you, is it? Lenny presents a more serious threat, doesn't he? If Lenny Phillips were out of the way, no one could prove anything against you. Ten minutes later, you stand in the shadows across the street from his apartment building. When he comes out, you follow him around back to a small garage. As he opens the door, you move in quickly behind him and bring the gun butt down hard. And then you carry Lenny inside, prop him behind the wheel of his car, and then start the motor. Then you hurry out, close the garage doors behind you. Ted, come in. I'm sorry if I'm a little late. It's quite all right. Oh, I fixed some drinks. Fine. We thought it'd be nice if we had our cocktails here. Besides, I wanted to talk to you, Ted. Good. I hope it's... Sit uh... down, please. Oh, sure. Oh, well, what's on your mind, Helen? It's about Harry, and... Well, it's not going to be easy for me to, to tell you this, Ted. Well, what is it? I know how close the two of you were. You started in together, built up a fine business. Harry was the best friend I ever had, Helen. 
He really wasn't, Ted. What? He was mixed up with a gang of hijackers. Getting a cut from them. Harry? Yes, when I found out, I threatened to tell you about it, but he just laughed. He knew I wouldn't say a word. I... I can't believe it. Harry mixed up with that gang? It's true, Ted. And they killed him. Remember that man I met in the office some time ago, Lenny Phillips? Sure. What about him? I'm pretty sure he's the man who used to telephone Harry. Thought I recognized his voice. He's one of the gang. Phillips, one of Harry's hijacking gang? Yes. He probably knows who killed Harry, too. Maybe he did. Maybe that's why he came to the office to see you. What do you mean, Helen? To find out if he could how much you knew. If you suspected Harry was involved with the gang. You mean he was afraid Harry might have told me something about them? Yes. Have you seen him since? Uh, why, no, I haven't. Ted, I think this is a matter we should take to the police. Don't you? I think you're right. I think you should tell them what you know and what you suspect. We've got to do all we can to find Harry's murderer. I'm glad you feel this way about it, Ted. We'll talk to the police in the morning. In the morning. All right, now you said something about drinks. Oh, of course. All right, we'll drink a toast, Helen. To us. To the continued success of our freight line. You're certain you're in the clear now, aren't you, Ted? Helen Murdoch doesn't suspect you of being involved in her husband's murder. And you're glad you moved as quickly as you did to eliminate Lenny Phillips, the one and only witness to the slave. In the morning, Helen will tell the police what she knows about Phillips, and they'll find him. But too late. Yes, even now as you dine with Helen in a famous downtown restaurant, you're certain your troubles are over. Shortly after 11, you return Helen to her apartment, and she invites you in for a final nightcap. A few moments later... Well, I wonder who that could be. Rather late to be calling. I'll get it, Helen. Yes? This is Mrs. Murdoch's apartment, isn't it? That's right. I'm Lieutenant Emerson. Homicide. May I see you? Uh, of course. Come in. Thanks. I'm Mrs. Murdoch, Lieutenant. What is it? You know a man named Phillips? Lenny Phillips, Mrs. Murdoch? Why, yes. Someone tried to kill him tonight. Fortunately, the attempt was unsuccessful. Phillips is at the emergency hospital now, but he's in no shape to talk, at least for the moment. That's why I'm here to ask a few questions. Someone tried to kill Phillips. Do you have any idea who? We know who, thanks to the private detective you hired a few days ago. Private detective? You hired a private detective, Helen? Yes, to follow Phillips. I'm sure he was a member of that hijacking gang that killed Harry. I wanted to find out everything we could about him before they got to you. Your private, I found out plenty tonight. He gave us a complete description of the would-be killer and the number of the license plates on his car. According to the Motor Vehicle Bureau, the car is owned by a man named Ted Mallory, your late husband's partner. Now your partner, Mrs. Murdoch. Know where we can find him right now? The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. The Whistler has... by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Fatal Fraud. The questioning by the Hong Kong police was brief. The suspect's guilt was clear. But even though conviction was a certainty, the motive and circumstances behind the crime were considerably more complex. It had started more than a week ago, 
at a fashionable gathering across the city. A swank social affair with smartly dressed ladies in evening gowns and jewels and gentlemen in dinner jackets. And the precise moment might have been when most of the guests adjourned to the library and listened to a well-known voice and stared at the man who spoke. In my life, it's already been long and eventful. I have seen many changes, political, geographical, and social. I have seen tyrants rise and fall, traitors live and die. And through it all, I've seen the British Empire there remain the British Empire. England, there remain England. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, Chris. A perfect impersonation. Oh, that's Churchill, all right. You could sure fool me. Oh, that's what he's famous for, isn't it, Chris? Uh, thank you, but not quite famous. Uh, you should be, young man. All those voices are fantastic. Uh, it's practice, that's all. And a living. Is it a good living, Mr. Holmes? Huh? Oh. Oh, oh Catherine, you haven't met our clever young man. Chris Holmes, Catherine Dawn. How do you do, Miss Dawn? Fine, thank you. And you do very well, Mr. Holmes. Oh, you like the impersonation? Very much. That routine of yours must be quite tiring, though. Don't you think you've earned yourself a cocktail? Oh, it certainly has. Run along, you two. Can you join me, Miss Dawn? You know, Mr. Holmes, that's exactly why I came over. I hate to drink alone. Alone? You? <laughs> Don't tell oh, me. I'm not really an invited guest. Just part of the help. A secretary. I'm here with my employer, Albert von Leuven. Oh, the importer. Know him? Uh, the very nice little Dutchman, the rosy cheeks, bald head, eyes that sparkle. He holds his head to one side like this when he talks. Oh, not impressed, Miss Dawn? You don't think I did him rather well? You were excellent, Mr. Holmes. Excellent. Uh, come along before the martinis get too wet. <laughs> You dance as well as you impersonate. <laughs> sure. Been copying Fred Astaire. Oh, no, I mean it. Oh, you mean a lot of things, Catherine. Or is it the cocktails? How many have you had? Well, I did become a bit impatient waiting while you were talking to your boss, Van Leuven. You shouldn't have. I was acting in your behalf. Oh? You're invited out to his home for a few days. What? Well, whose idea? Mine. I thought it might lead to something for you. Lead to something? I think your talents are wasted on nightclubs. Oh, well, thanks, but the importing business isn't something one picks up overnight. Oh, Catherine, I'm afraid... Oh, now relax. You're not going to turn Mr. Van Leuven down. He wouldn't like that. <laughs> Catherine is an interesting girl, isn't she, Chris? And you're pleased with her interest in you. Pleased and a little flattered because she's easily the most attractive girl you've seen since you left America. And the following weekend at Van Leuven's, you're even more impressed. Her uh, friendliness puts you perfectly at ease. And you feel almost a part of this way of living. It's a very pleasant way, too, isn't it, Chris? Dinners on the terrace. Brandy in the drawing room. Excellent company. And later in the evening in Van Leuven's private office, Catherine again. She's standing by a recording machine this time. Oh, what's this going to be, darling? The Hong Kong lullaby? You'll see, Chris. Manila office. Attention, Carter. Regarding back orders on shipments of oriental rugs. Cancel and hold in warehouse until further instructions. Please notify us immediately regarding jade and artwork. Regards, Van Leuven. Catherine, why did you have Mr. Van Leuven ask me here? I'm just a guy kicking around. I know. Maybe better than you think. I'm not so sure you do. Oh, I'll admit I might have been in a few deals that were a little shady. Sure. That's what I said. Two odds make an even match. You still haven't told me why you asked me here. I want you to help me do something. It's simple. He's bringing in some money in a few days. Lots of money. The kind we can keep up with. What are you talking about? My boss, Van Leuven, and his manila office. The details don't matter. All that I'm interested in is the money. And me. And you. You know I'm interested in you, Chris. Uh, draw the pictures, honey. The bright boy's a little dazed right now. 
We're going to get that money. Oh, Chris, it'll be easy. Oh? Uh-huh. Simono will help us. Simono? Who's he? He operates the radio shack here. Don't you want money? Sure. There's plenty, Chris. And it's all coming in by plane. Von Leuven's plane, in currency. And it will land only where he directs. Simono? Mr. Van Leuven. He's going to direct his pilot over the radio. You could change those directions, Chris. You're good Hey, at... now, wait a minute. Chris, there's a hundred thousand dollars in cash. A hundred thousand? A third of it can be yours. Oh, Chris, tell me you'll do it. Take this record. Practice Mr. Van Leuven's voice. Oh, it's a breeze, that part of it. Manila office, regarding back orders, oriental rugs, cancel... Oh, Chris, telling you marvelous. You... You really think we can get away with it, Catherine? We can and we will, Chris. We will. You'll do it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Well, the money, Chris, it's real, not an imitation. You'll see... <laughs> decision, haven't you, Chris? Yes, you've decided you're going to help Catherine with her plan to hijack her employer's plane arriving from Manila with almost $100,000 aboard. And your part in it is all so simple. You've only to impersonate Albert Van Leuven's voice. Order the pilot to land his plane at another field where Catherine wants it to land. It seems the opportunity of a lifetime, doesn't it, Chris? And the future grows brighter and brighter as you think about it the following day. Then that evening, Catherine takes you across the back gardens to a low, rambling building, a good distance away from the house. You find yourself entering the radio room, where you meet Rene Simono. Uh, Rene, this is Chris Holmes. So, so this is the famous one, eh? The one with the voices. Hi, Simono. He's going to help us, Rene. Is he? Oh, you don't seem enthused, old boy. I am not. He's afraid our little scheme won't work, Chris. There are other ways, better ways of doing this, Catherine, if you would only listen to me. Then must we go through all that again? With Chris to help us, we can't fail. I do not like it, that is all. There are better ways. Uh, maybe it's the money that bothers him, Catherine. Getting only a third of the loot instead of half. A third? Catherine, did you tell him... Yes, I think he's entitled to a third. Uh, I see. Don't look so glum. Third chair will buy you a lot of scented hair oil, Simono. Oh, by the way, what's that you have on now? Eau de Wallet? Listen, smart boy. If you know what is good for Stop you... Stop it, Renee. You're acting like a child. Let him go. Yeah. That's better. We have more important things to do than quarrel. What time do you expect the plane to arrive here in Hong Kong? Around 11 tomorrow night. Good. We'll be ready. Won't we, Chris? We will be ready, Katrina, my dear. You see, Rene, he is good, isn't he? Excuse me, Katherine. I have things to do. No, uh, excuse me, Katherine. I have things to do. <laughs> Darling, you sound just like Rene. <laughs> well, at least we get along, don't we? Mm-hmm. Come along, darling. Catherine, can you trust him? Simono? Yes, yes, I can trust him. What makes you so sure? Oh, I've known him a long time. He, uh, he's in love with you, isn't he? <laughs> He'd do anything for you. I suppose. Were you in love with him once? What difference does that make? I just asked. He, uh, could make trouble for us later. You leave him to me. I know how to handle him. And I love you, Chris. Remember that. I love you. You sure? I'm sure. Now, come along. The guests are on the terrace. We don't want them to miss us. No, particularly Van Leuven. Jack. Well, you must talk to him, Chris. Keep studying him. Now, uh, Mr. Holmes is a very, very clever young man, is he not, my friend? I dare say there isn't one of us here in this room he could not impersonate. You, uh, Major Ritten, for example. Uh, what's that? Uh, me? Oh, my daughter. Oh, oh, I say now, really. You think so? Eh? <laughs> uh, but that would be perhaps too simple for a young friend. Perhaps we should have him try someone else. Oh, right, that's good. Perhaps, Mr. Holmes, you would care to impersonate 
Me? Oh, oh, no. oh, he's good. Uh, 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 sorry, I make it a rule never to subject my host to that sort of punishment. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, then I am most disappointed. I was certain you were planning a little surprise for me. Oh, what? Surprise? A surprise, Mr. Van Leeuwen? Oh, come on, my boy. Don't try to get out of this one. <laughs> my records, Mr. Holmes. I overheard you playing several of them. I thought you were studying my voice. Well, I, uh, I do have a confession to make, Mr. Van Leeuwen. I did try to imitate you, but I have to admit defeat. I'm afraid I couldn't quite come up to it. Oh, no, no, really, I'd rather not. But how about someone else? Oh, Mr. Holmes, you could try to impersonate my husband, Edgar. Uh, His voice is rather unusual, you know. Say something for the man, Edgar. Go on, say something. Go on, what's the matter, darling? You oblige her, don't you, Chris? And your impersonation of her husband goes over very well. Then you're called on to do others to the delight of the assembled guests. But through it all, you're a little on edge. You haven't forgotten Van Leuven's request that you try to impersonate him. And the rather strange expression on his face when he mentioned having overheard you playing his records. Finally, you manage to break away and look for Catherine. But she's not in the house. And so you wander outside into the garden for a quiet smoke. And then near the radio building, you hear voices. I'm sure this Catherine is a mistake. Oh, and Simon But I don't like it, Catherine. I do not like it one bit. Rene, darling, I told you not to worry. But what do we know about this Chris Holmes? How can we trust him? Please, let's not argue. I know what I'm doing. Believe me, Rene, I know what I'm doing. He's important to us now. Without him, we haven't a chance. Yeah, all right. All right, Catherine. We will do it your way. But once this is over... Yes, darling, once this is over, then we'll see. We'll see. One moment. Oh, Catherine. I want to talk to you, Chris. Inside. Certainly. Chris, last night I... I know you overheard us. Overheard. When I was talking to Simono, I saw you walk away. I've got to handle him in my own way. You do believe me. Was there any reason why I shouldn't? I wanted to talk to you at breakfast. I didn't know of Unruven's plans for his guests, I mean. Oh, it was fun. Motorboating, lunch at the Hotel Royale, the races. Oh, I get quite used to this life, Catherine. Well, you might as well. You're going to have it. And soon now. Oh? There's been a slight change in plans plane has already left Manila. Already left? Yes. Simono just told me. It's scheduled to arrive here shortly before nine. Nine? We'll be right in the middle of dinner. I'll tell Van Leuven that you're not feeling well. You won't be down. Huh. All right. Now, here's the message. Study it. Be at the radio room in an hour. I'll meet you out there. Right. The radio room. In an hour. Contact with the plane. You know the message? Yeah, perfectly. Jake the microphone. Oh, thanks. Wait. W682RC. This is Albert Van Leuven. You will disregard previous instructions to land. Proceed to the emergency field and Perlang Road for landing. Repeat, please. Disregard previous instructions to land. Proceed to emergency field on Palang Road for landing. Got it, Mr. Van Leuven? This is the place. We ought to be able to hear the plane's motor soon. Right on schedule. Let's get out there for the landing. You wait here for us, Chris. Renee and I will meet the pilot. Uh, okay, but go easy on him. I won't hold still for murder. Don't worry. He won't be harmed. We'll just tie him up. Chris! Oh, 
everything go all right, Catherine? Perfect. Here, Simino, I'll take the briefcase. Ah, feels nice and full. You better let me take care of the briefcase, gentlemen. Oh, it's okay with me, Simino. Uh, what can I say but yes? I'll take good care of it. Get in, Renee. Right. Well, now what? Back to town. I've made arrangements for us to leave by boat tonight. I'll drive you back to Von Leuven's, Chris. What about you, Rene? I would rather not go back. Drop me off at the little cafe near the waterfront. I like their food. All right. Wait there until you hear from me. I think I'll try Simino's waterfront cafe, too. It's all right with him. Maybe it would be better for you to go with Simino, Chris. Yeah, let him come along. It makes no difference to me. Good. Let's get started. Come on, relax, Simono, relax. I enjoy the piano music. I do not like this waiting. Catherine should have been called by now. We we have been here nearly three hours. Uh, Forget it, enjoy yourself. And this brandy's wonderful. Hey, where are you going, Simono? To get another drink. Our waiter seems to have too many tables to take care of. After Simono leaves the table, you're suddenly aware of someone staring at you. An old man, standing a few feet away. A look of uncertainty on his face, indecision. Then swiftly he moves towards you, hands you a slip of paper and darts into the crowd. You unfold the paper and read. We will leave on the 2 a.m. plane for Singapore. The two of us, darling. It's been just the two of us from the beginning. Come at once. I'll have the briefcase. Catherine. You stare at the paper in your hand. The carefully drawn diagram of the meeting place. The rendezvous where Catherine will be waiting. A quiet side street. Then suddenly it hits you. The original plan had been for you to go back to Van Leuven's home. Simono to come to the cafe. You're sure the old man made a mistake, aren't you, Chris? That the note he gave you was intended for Simono. You're certain that it's been Simono and Catherine all along. That they've been just using you. You should have suspected that after what you overheard in the garden last night. You slip the paper back into your pocket as Simono approaches. Uh, did I miss anything? Huh? Oh, no, not a thing, pal. Hey, uh, you got a cigarette? Uh, here, here. Help yourself. Oh, thanks. Oh, this all you got? You do not like our local brands? Sorry, I always like the best. There is a tobacco shop down the street on the other side. Um, do not get lost. I'll try not to. Shall I draw you a diagram? Diagram? No, thanks. I already have a diagram. Waiting here in the shadows for Catherine. You feel a little foolish about the way you've been used, don't you, Chris? Only the money matters to you now. And you're sure you'll be able to take it for yourself and leave them. Catherine and Simono. That's the way it is, isn't it? The way it's been from the beginning. You're certain of it. You were just a puppet who could help you. The man with the many voices. Especially the one that sounded exactly like Albert Van Leuven. Well, it's all over now. Your foolish dream that there was anything more to it than a coldly calculated hijacking job. As you stand in the darkness waiting for Catherine, it becomes annoying. The way her words come drifting back, mixing you up, challenging your judgment. Two odds make an even match, don't they, Chris? I love you, Chris. Remember that. I love you. Yeah, sure. Sure you love me. You tighten, draw back into the shadows at the sound of a twig snapping. Then you see her, Catherine, approaching slowly towards you. Your eye catches something else, too. The glint of moonlight on the gun in her hand. Suddenly, your blood runs cold as you realize the real reason for that note. It was sent to lure either you or Simono here to his death. And you were certain the note was meant for Rene Simono. Now you wonder. Maybe it wasn't Catherine and Simono all the time. Who is it? Who's there? As Catherine's voice comes through the darkness, you know you've got to decide. 
You can answer with either voice, your own or Simono's. And your decision will mean life or death. Then, as suddenly as it came, the panic leaves you. Instantly, the whole thing seems clear to you. You were a fool to think otherwise. You are certain that the old man who gave you the note did not make a mistake. That the note was meant for you. And that the bullet in Catherine's gun is also meant for you. But you're sure there's still a way out, aren't you, Chris? Yes. You'll speak to her as Rene Simoneau. She'll come to you. Disarming her and taking the briefcase will be easy. You wait for her to speak again. Anthony. Who's there? Do not be afraid, Catherine. It is I, Rene Simoneau. The Whistler. Listen next week when, once again, the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. The Whistler has come to you through the world. The Whistler. I am the Whistler. And I know many things before I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Garvey's Folly. The opening night of the play, Bleak House Lights, was a gay and festive time for the Broadway first-nighters crowding the theater. But for Paul Garvey, the handsome and distinguished director-producer of the play, it was the most crucial night of his career. Yes, your last two plays have been dismal failures, haven't they, Paul? And you've sunk everything you have in tonight's production to try to make a comeback. You're tense as you talk to Jessica Marlin, your leading lady, before the curtain goes up. Remember now to take your hand from the mantelpiece before James tells you he's through. I will, darling. And after he leaves and slams the door, take a long look at the fireplace before you start to smile or make the slightest move. I know. Don't worry. And give the best performance of your life. I will, Paul. I hope it's a hit for both our sakes. We need it. It will be. I know it will be. I feel it, too. Like when we first met. Remember. <laughs> You were just a stage-struck kid. And how much in love we were. Were? And still are. Oh, it's wonderful to be back together again. This time, nothing will come between us. Except your wife. Mm. Go on, Miss Marlin. Good luck, Jessica. For both of us, darling. Come in. Hello, darling. Well, did you read them? The reviews? Yes, but the audience told me all I had to know. It was a turkey, Paul. No, I don't care what they say. This one has to go. Everything I have is sunk in it. It's a flop, Paul. Your third one in a row. Well, what happens to my career now? You can make a comeback, Jessica. How? Listen to Bryson's review in the world. Jessica Marlin has a pretty face, and that's all. She handles her lines like a high school girl in her first amateur play. Bryson is just a vicious fool. Don't pay any attention to him. What about the other critics? Would you like for me to quote them? No. Ignore the whole pack. Somehow we'll make another comeback together, darling. Do whatever you wish, Paul. I'm through. Thanks to your excellent direction. My direction? Now, that's a fine thing to say. I expected the playwright to blame me and my backers, too, but not you, Jessica. What do you want? Praise? No. Just consideration. Then why didn't you listen to people occasionally instead of being so stubborn? As a director, I had to call it the way I saw it. How noble. All right. This one was a flop. The next one will be a hit. That's show business. That's just why I'm getting out. Oh, don't be silly, Jessica. You're bitten. You can't get out. What about us, darling? I'm going back to Cleveland. I'm sorry. And marry the department store owner? What's his name? Jim Daniels? Yes, at least he's not just using me. Jessica, you're not made to be an ordinary housefrau. You belong in the theater and you belong with me. Darling, don't do anything you'd be sorry for for the rest of your life. 
I'll never be sorry I quit this jungle. And if you take my advice, you'll do the same and go home. Live the kind of life your wife wants you to. Your play closes after a two-week run. But you still don't take Jessica's advice. You can't accept defeat, Paul. Your one thought is to prove you're still the brilliant Broadway producer-director of yesterday and to bring Jessica back to you. But it looks hopeless, Paul. And then a few days later, as you sit alone in your office reading the morning paper, you notice a small news item on the bottom of the drama page. Elliot Forbes, prize-winning playwright, told reporters at his suite in the Atlantic Hotel that producers have turned down his latest play, Island Night, as being too unusual and too tragic for public taste. Well, just what I've been waiting for. Nice of you to drop by, Mr. Forbes. Now, what'll you have? Mm, brandy will be fine. Brandy it is. I like scotch over ice myself. Hmm. Here. Here you are. Thank you. Now then, about Island Night. It's your greatest play, Elliot, if you don't mind the first name. Of course not. I, uh, I'm sure it's an artistic success, but nobody will touch it. Everyone says it's Poor box office. O'Neill and Ibsen managed to fill the theater. I don't see why we can't do it with this one. You're seriously interested in putting it on? I wouldn't have asked you to come and see me if I weren't interested. Where are you going to find financial backing? This thing has been turned down by every angel in New York. It won't be easy, Elliot. But if you'll give me a 90-day option on the play, I'll do my best. Hmm? I've got nothing to lose. Go right ahead. And good luck. <laughs> Your option on Elliot Forbes' play gives you the fighting chance you've been looking for. You phone Jessica, but she's not at home to you. Finally, in desperation, you go straight to her apartment. Oh, it's you. Yes. Aren't you going to ask me in? I suppose so. Thanks. What brings you here, Paul? I want your opinion on a play, Jessica. I might have known. The answer is no. This play is going to make theater history. You're wasting your time. I'm leaving for Cleveland Friday morning. I'm only asking you to read the play. If you want to leave after that, I won't say another word. Fair enough. Who wrote this new masterpiece? Elliot Forbes. The Elliot Forbes? Exactly. And he's letting you produce and direct it? There are some people who still have faith in me, Jessica, who don't judge a man by his failures alone. Meaning me, I guess you're right. All right, Paul, I'll read the play. Do it soon, Jessica. Any number of actresses are after the lead. I can't put them off forever. <laughs> me three times this morning. Oh, I'm here now. Did you read the play? Oh, yes. It's breathtaking. You're right. It will be an American classic. And the way I'm going to handle it, it's going to be a smash at the box office, too. The part of Diane. You are thinking of me, aren't you, Paul? What about Cleveland? Jim Daniels? I don't want you walking out on me, Jessica. I've put Cleveland on ice. Then the part's yours. It always was, really. Oh, darling, I can't wait to get in rehearsal. I'm in love with you all over again. I guess I never learn. So far, it's been easy, Paul. You have Jessica back, and you have a great play to star her in. All you need now is the money. But that proves more difficult. You try all your old backers, but they won't have any part of the play, or you. But you still hold an ace in reserve. Your wealthy wife, Dorothy. You feel sure you still know the way to her heart. You don't even go into the city for several days. Stay at the modest house out on Staten Island, which Dorothy insisted on buying shortly after your marriage. A house you despise. Situated a mile from the main road and almost a half mile from the little traveled side road leading to your driveway, seems to you like the end of nowhere. But it's Dorothy's idea of perfection. For the next few days, you even pretend to like it. And a few evenings later, as you and Dorothy are sitting on the veranda. It's lovely out here, isn't it, Paul? Yes, it is. I've never realized before how nice it is. Oh, why can't it always be this way, Paul? Uh, let's not dwell on the past. I can't help it. What happened to us, Paul? 
What happened to our marriage? I don't know. Well, surely you must have thought about it. I have. To be honest, I never felt you cared about me or my problems. Why, what do you mean? Well, right now, for instance, I'm having trouble raising money for my next production. If I thought you cared at all... How much do you need this time? Fifty thousand. Oh? Is that why you've been so nice to me? <laughs> you know that's not true. Yes, it is. It's always the same thing. The theater. The theater. All right, Dorothy, I'm stage-struck. That's the way it is. Oh, Paul, isn't it time you grew up? No. You know what they call your last wonderful production? Garvey's Folly. When Island Night opens, those words will stick in their throats. It's a great play. They're always great plays, Paul. I thought you were interested in saving our marriage, not running me down. I want you to come to your senses. All right. Finance Island Night. And if it fails, I'll leave the theater forever. I'm not interested. Well, you should be. This play will put me back on top. Then why don't you get the money from Jessica Marlin? I know all about her, Paul. I'm not as blind as you think I am. Believe me, there's nothing between us. Oh, I wish I could believe you. You can. And honestly, Dorothy, I'm desperate, or I wouldn't have asked you. I can't help it, Paul. I'm not financing your stage door romances any longer. With your wife Dorothy's refusal to back your production of Island Night, all your plans go up in smoke. You stall Jessica as long as you can. But as the weeks pass, she becomes suspicious and begins putting on more and more pressure. You're desperate, Paul, ready to clutch at any straw. And then one evening, you're walking into your old friend Chip Edwards' bar. Remember me? Hey, Paul! What do you know, fellas? Gee, it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. What do you have? It's on the house. A uh, scotch coming up. Couple of scotches, Jack. Hey, you're looking beat, Paul. I am. What's new out this way? No, just a local political campaign. Mm. We're going to have an election to get us a new mayor. The old one passed away. I'm backing one candidate pretty heavily. I wish I could worry about local elections for a change. What's bothering you, Paul? Money. I need $50,000 or I'm finished, Chip. Oh, if I had it... You don't, so forget it. But I sure wish I knew where I could get my hands on it. I wish there was some way I could help, Paul. Mm. If I live to be a million years old, I'll never forget the way you risked your life to save me from drowning last summer. Forget it, Chip. If I'd stopped to think, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> anyway, you did it. Guy just don't forget a thing like that. <laughs> I'll do anything to help you, Paul, if I could. Anything. I know you would, Chip. And I won't forget that, either. That evening, when you return home, you find a note from Dorothy saying she'd gone to attend a meeting of the District Property Owners Association and will return around 10.30. As you pace the floor and nervously smoke one cigarette after another, an idea suddenly hits you. An idea that could be the solution to your problem. You open the wall safe in your living room. Remove several of Dorothy's most valuable pieces of jewelry. Take them to the attic. Then you open an old theater trunk that no one has touched for years. Shuffle through its contents. Finally, you find exactly what you want. A large jar of makeup cream. You carefully embed the jewelry into the makeup cream and then place the jar on the bottom of the trunk. Cover it with old costumes and close the lid. You're sure the police will not suspect you. And even if they do, you're certain your hiding place will never be discovered. When you return to the living room, you leave the wall safe open, overturn a few chairs, set the scene to look like a burglary. Then you pick up the phone and call the police. This is Paul Garvey. 21 Kenter Road. I just returned home and found my wall safe broken into. All our valuables missing. Well, we checked everything. Thank you for your cooperation. Oh, I'm so glad I wasn't here when it happened, officer. I just got home a few moments ago. Nothing to worry about now, Mrs. Garvey. But I always felt that we were... Well, so safe out here. Didn't you, Paul? Yes, I did. Well, thank heavens they didn't get our antique silver in the main vases. Those could never be replaced. Mr. Garvey probably scared them off when he came home. Hope your jewels were insured. Oh, yes. We've been paying premiums for years. Just file your claim there, Mr. Garvey, and I'm sure you won't have any trouble. Thank you, officer. I'll do that first thing in the morning. <laughs> Oh, 
When the check for $47,000 arrives from the insurance company a month later, made out to Mr. and Mrs. Paul Garvey, you get your wife, Dorothy, to endorse it. But instead of depositing it in the bank to her account, you conveniently put it in your own. And then you start rolling on the production of Island Night. The storm breaks a few nights later. You arrive home from a late rehearsal when Dorothy meets you at the door. Hello, Paul. Hello, my dear. Uh, a little late for you to be up, isn't it? I've been waiting for you. Oh? Nothing the matter, I hope. I went to the bank today, Paul. I want to know what you did with that check from the insurance company. I... I thought it over carefully, Dorothy, and... And... And, and what? I... I decided to use the money. That was my money, Paul. Ours, darling. The insurance check was made out to both of us. I won't permit you to throw away $47,000 on that Jessica Marlin and that ridiculous play. I'll report you to the insurance company. You might cause trouble, but I don't think so, Dorothy. It's our money, not yours. I'm the head of the house, and I consider it a wise investment in our future. Do you? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there isn't going to be any future, Paul. I'm filing for a divorce. You're secretly pleased with Dorothy's decision ending your marriage. You pack a bag and take a hotel room near the theater until you can move all your belongings to larger quarters. Meanwhile, you work around the clock getting Elliot's play into shape. You don't mind it, Paul, because it brings you and Jessica closer together. And then one afternoon, the unexpected happens. You're at the theater giving the cast last-minute instructions before taking the play for the usual out-of-town tryout. Quiet, cast. Quiet. Quiet, please. The run-through was fine. Uh, we need a little more voice projection on the quiet scenes. Um, on the lights. We still have too much pink in the big spotlight. Jessica, nice job. Never saw so much tenderness in the love scenes before. Thanks, darling. Okay, take the afternoon off. But remember, we all catch the six o'clock train to New Haven. We'll have a dress rehearsal tonight at the theater so we can rest tomorrow for the opening night tomorrow night. I'll see you all at six. Okay. <laughs> no, I'll get it. So long, everybody. Hello? Paul? Yes? I must see you immediately. I'm busy, Dorothy. I have a train to catch at six. It's a matter of considerable urgency, Paul. What is it? I shall discuss it with you in person. If you can tear yourself away long enough to drive out here. And you'd better, Paul... If not, I'm warning you, you'll be sorry. And you'd better hurry. Now, what was so urgent, Dorothy? Only these. How did you find that jewelry? I decided to clear out the attic of all that old junk of yours... And when I emptied the contents of that old trunk, a big makeup jar dropped and broke. Well, it fell all to pieces. What do you propose to do about it? Well, that's up to you, Paul. What do you mean by that? If you're ready to give up the theater and Jessica Marlin, I'm willing to tell the insurance company that we found the jewelry. I will refund the $47,000 and forget the whole thing. And I'll start over again with you. And if I'm not ready... And I shall have to tell the insurance people the true story. Why not be sensible, Dorothy? The theater's my life. I can't... You're a up. failure in the theater, Paul. I've given you five years to prove yourself. I'm sorry, Paul, but you have exactly two choices. Oh, no. There's one more. Paul! No! You go completely out of your mind, don't you, Paul? For several seconds, you stand stunned as you realize the blow you struck with the heavy bookend in your blind anger was fatal to your wife, Dorothy. But there's no turning back the clock now. You realize you must cover yourself, make the whole thing appear as a robbery and murder by outsiders. You open a window, quickly gather up the silverware, a valuable Ming vase, and several highly expensive antiques. Then you put them in a suitcase. For the first time, you're grateful that the house Dorothy insisted on buying is off the beaten path, away from even the side roads. You're certain no one saw you arrive, and equally certain no one will see you leave. You decide to take the Staten Island Ferry to Manhattan. A few moments after the ferry is underway, the suitcase has been tossed overboard. 
Once in Manhattan, you park your car as usual, hurry to the station, and join the cast for the trip to New Haven. And that evening, as you start the dress rehearsal... Places. Places, please. Let's, uh... Let's uh, take it through from the beginning and make it good. Now, let's go. Excuse me, Paul. There's someone outside who wants to see you. He says it's urgent. Oh, thanks, Reggie. Okay, sorry. Hold it, everyone. Keep your places. I'll be back in a few minutes. Hello. Mr. Garvey? Yes? I'm Detective Sergeant Anderson. What is it? Uh, your wife was found murdered this afternoon in your home on Staten Island. Dorothy? Dead? Well, I can't believe it. Who would want to harm Dorothy? Well, apparently she was killed during a robbery. The place seems to have been pretty well ransacked. Well, it just seems impossible. You and your wife were separated recently, weren't you? Yes. But it wasn't really serious. No, I see. Were you home any time this afternoon, say between two and four? No, no, I, I wasn't. Ah. Then where were you? Can you tell us? Well, uh... After the rehearsal this morning, I, I had lunch, uh, gave the script a final going over. Oh. I went over to Chip Edwards' bar in Brookhurst, had a few drinks. That's uh, Chip Edwards' bar in Brookhurst? Yes, yes, I, I was there all afternoon. Chip Edwards himself will tell you so. We had a couple of drinks together. Oh. But why all the questions? Surely you don't suspect me. No, no, of course not, Mr. Garvey. It's just routine. Oh, well, naturally, we'll have to drop in on Mr. Edwards and check your story. Well, naturally. I want you to, if you have the slightest suspicion. We haven't. As I say, this is just routine. I thank you for your cooperation, Mr. Garvey. You smile as the police leave, for you're certain that Chip Edwards, the man whose life you once saved, will give you an alibi the police won't be able to break, even though he has to lie to do it. You put in a long-distance call to his place in Brookhurst. And breathe a sigh of relief as you hear his voice on the other end of the line. Chip Edwards Bar. Hello, Chip. This is Paul. I want you to do me a big favor. It's very important. Anything, Paul. You know that. The police are on their way to your place. The, the police? What for? They want to ask you some questions. I just want to refresh your memory. I was at your bar today before 2 and stayed there all afternoon till about 4.30. You do remember that, don't you? Yeah, wait a minute, Paul. I can't talk now, Chip. You understand me? No, Paul, I can't do it. What do you mean you can't do it? You said you'd do anything for me. I would, but what you're asking is not possible. Why not? Because we had a special election for mayor in Brookhurst today. All the bars were closed. We didn't open until the polling places were shut down at 7 tonight. I'm sorry, Paul. The Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Dance Team. The floor show at the nightclub in Los Angeles was nothing special. And Paul Fennelly, half owner of a small but successful nightclub in Nevada, was watching it closely. Tall, good-looking, but hard-eyed and cynical. He sat alone at a ringside table, staring down at his glass, torn between his thoughts and the breathtaking beauty of the girl partner of the Spanish dance team, just finishing their number. You have things on your mind, haven't you, Paul? Yes. You'd come to Los Angeles to be alone for a few days. Alone to think. 
think of a way to persuade your Nevada partner, Frank Wilson, to see things as you do, or a way to eliminate him before your first and possibly last real chance to get into the big money is lost. Well, well, look who's here, Paul Fenley. Oh, hello, Baxter. Just enjoying your floor show. Ah, uh, good. Haven't seen you around town in quite a while. Well, I'm over in Nevada now. Come into L.A. once in a while to look for acts. I've got my own club over there. So you finally promoted yourself into something good. Well, you might call it that. It's just a small place. I've got a partner, Frank Wilson, a retired grocer. He put up the money, and I run the club. Sounds pretty sore. Yeah, we're doing okay. You seem to be doing all right here, too. Oh, fair. What did you think of that act? Are the dancers? The girls, great. Who are they? Ramon and Rita. They got a lot of class, especially the girl. <laughs> She's beautiful, huh? Yeah, beautiful. Hey, what's going on? Yeah, it sounds like a fight backstage. I think I'll go see. I'll go with you. It's that Ramon, that Spanish dancer. He's done nothing but cause trouble ever since the act opened here. Oh, well, what's the matter with him? He's crazy jealous of his wife, Rita. Makes a big fuss if anyone even speaks to her. Always oh, threatening to kill somebody. Kill somebody? Yeah. Oh, he won't, but... I'll kill him. Someday I'm going to kill you, too. Well, this is it for me. They're finished here. I'm going to call the cops and have that idiot thrown into jail. It'll do him good. The argument between the dancers gives you the germ of an idea, doesn't it, Paul? You're not certain just how you can use them, but you have a feeling that somehow a beautiful dancer and a madly jealous husband might fit in with your plans to get your Nevada nightclub away from your partner, Frank Wilson. After the excitement subsides and Ramon is taken away by the police, you have your friend Baxter take you to their dressing room and introduce you to the girl. I do not wish to talk about it, Mr. Fennelly. This is the end, the finish. But Ramon is in jail and we are fired. Are there are other jobs? Not for us. No manager will book us now because of Ramon's jealousy. He is too jealous for this business. He accuses all men of being in love with me. Well, I'm willing to take a chance on him. A chance? How do you mean? Book you into my club in Nevada. Ramon and me? Sure. Same salary you're getting here. Ah, uh, you've got a fine act. Just the type we need. I'll get Baxter to withdraw charges against your husband. I'm driving back to Nevada tomorrow. The two of you can ride over with me if you like. You open on Monday. Oh, it, it seems like a dream. I, I do not know how to thank you. Well, don't try. There's nothing to thank me for. I'm uh, acting in my own interest, too. <laughs> Of our new act. Oh, it's beautiful, Paul. Very beautiful. I'm glad you like it. You never get tired of watching the floor show, do you? Never. Our club is my whole life. I watch every show from beginning to end. Yeah, I know. And the funny part of it is, I'm making money while I'm enjoying myself, thanks to your ability. Oh, thanks, Frank. For my money, there's nothing nicer than a nice little nightclub. <laughs> oh, that's a great dance team. Make them feel welcome, huh, Paul? Get fruit, flowers, candy for their dressing room. Spend plenty. Let them know we're glad they're here. You know what to do. Take care of everything, will you? Yeah, sure, Frank, I will. I'll take care of everything. You just watch the show. I'm going to the office for a while. i got some thinking to do. Yes, you do have some thinking to do, don't you, Paul? And a few minutes after you're seated at your desk, a long-distance phone call brings you to a decision. Yeah, hello. New York, calling Mr. Paul Fenley. This is Mr. Fenley. Just a moment. Go ahead, New York. Your party is ready. Fenley? Yes? This is Daniel. What about that half-interest in your club? Well, I haven't been able to sell my partner on it yet, Mr. Daniels. He, uh, sort of has a sentimental attachment to it. Well, you better sell him fatally and fast. If you don't, we're going to take over another club. You'll be out of business in two months. Oh, I'll sell him, Mr. Daniels. Don't worry. Uh, you've got exactly two weeks to do it in. Oh, uh, that's time enough. 
I'll guarantee you, Mr. Daniels, two weeks from today, we'll be partners. Yes, Paul, you've made up your mind, haven't you? You're not going to let this opportunity to become a really big operator pass, are you? You decide to make one more attempt to persuade your partner, Frank Wilson, to listen to reason. If he refuses, you'll use other means to remove him. And you know exactly what you're going to do, don't you? The jealous Ramon is the answer to your problem. For the next few evenings, you make certain that Rita receives little tokens of esteem from your partner. And three nights later, you drop into their dressing room. How oh, lovely. I can hardly believe it. White roses. Compliments of Mr. Wilson. Oh, and here's a basket of fruit for you. Oh, and candy. And... I have never had such lovely presents. Say, what is the idea of all of these stars? Oh, my partner, Mr. Wilson, is very generous, Ramon. When he likes an act, he shows his appreciation. But is it the act he likes or my wife? I'm on <laughs> Both, Ramon, both. Now, look, kid, you've got to get used to people admiring your wife. Yes, yes, I suppose so. And Wilson not only admires your act, he wants to know both of you. He wants you both to come to his table tomorrow night. Oh, that will be nice. Nothing doing. We are here for business, not social life. Ramon, we can't afford to offend Mr. Wilson. No, of course not. Then he wouldn't send you any more gifts. Now, look here, Ramon. You keep out of this, Fennelly. How dare you speak to Mr. Fennelly like that, Ramon? After all he has done for us. You keep on with your crazy jealousy and we will have troubles here like we did in Los Angeles in every place we ever work. Perhaps if I am given the same provocation... One of these days I will be driven too far. Oh, forget it, Ramon. Mr. Wilson was just being friendly, trying to make you feel at home. One more jealous feet and I leave you, Ramon. Ah, you forget it too, Rita. Ramon isn't going to be jealous anymore. Are you, Ramon? Not unless I have reason. Hey, see, Rita? Now forget it like I told you. I've got big plans for you two. And I think they're going to turn out very well indeed. <laughs> You do have big plans, don't you, Paul? You're sure you can promote a situation where Ramon's jealousy will prompt him to such furious anger against your partner that Ramon will publicly threaten him. Then, if anything should happen to Frank, suspicion will fall on Ramon, not you. But first of all, you must make a friend of Ramon, win his confidence. Next day in town, passing a jewelry store, you see the ideal gift for him, an opening wedge in your campaign of friendship. Two evenings later, you knock on the door of his dressing room. Oh, Mr. Fennelly, come in. Hello, Ramon. Oh, uh, Rita isn't here yet, hmm? No, she's having her hair done. Well, that uh, gives us a chance to have a little talk. I've got a new contract for you to sign. A new contract? Yes, for an indefinite stay. You're going to be here for a long time. But we're planning to leave. I was going to give you our notice tonight. Leave? But why? I want to get out of this business. Settle down somewhere. I'm afraid if we continue, something will happen. I might lose my temper once too often. Oh, that's ridiculous. No, it is not. People are always giving presents to my wife. Candy and flowers. You don't want your wife to have flowers? When I see them, I'm furious. Not because she has them, but because I did not buy them for her myself. I have done so little for my wife. I, I never remember to get her things... I would like to give her the most beautiful present in the world, especially next week on her birthday. Her birthday? Say, I'm glad you told me. We'll have a big party for Rita here at the club. Uh, oh, uh, speaking of presents, I uh, picked up a little thing I thought you'd like, Ramon. A present for me? Yeah, sure. You're part of the act, too. No reason why the women should get all the gifts. Yeah, take it. A gold cigarette case. With my initial R in rubies. Well, it's beautiful. The R is especially beautiful. I, I, I like that letter. Perhaps because it is also the initial of my wife. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Fennelly. Oh, forget it, Ramon. You've got it coming to you. You know, you're beginning to pack this place. Then we shall stay on. Under the circumstances, we could not do otherwise. <laughs> Oh, Paul, 
Oh, come here. Hello, Frank. This is a surprise. You don't get out here to the house very often. Look, I've got to talk to you, Frank, right away. Yeah, well, come on. Let's sit over here by the window, huh? All right. Yeah. Now, what's on your mind, Paul? That, uh, half interest in our club for those people in New York. We don't have to talk, Paul. You know how I feel about that. But we can't afford to let any opportunity to get rich like this slip by. This is our last chance, Frank, our last chance. They want our answer by a week from Saturday. Unless we say yes, they're going to buy into another club. Let them. Let them take over any club they want, but not ours. This club means a lot to me, Paul. Sure, sure, I know. It means a lot to me, Listen, too. Paul, I'm a lonely man. Our club is, well, my family. The only family I've got. Sure, I know. When I come home from the club at night, I just sit here in this chair by the window and go over the whole thing again in my mind until I fall asleep. You do? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, sometimes I sleep three or four hours, sometimes all night. The club means that much to you? Even more, Paul. Well, Frank, if you feel that strongly about it, I guess we'd better keep it for ourselves. Good. But uh, what do you say to putting on a bigger floor show Mm -hmm. with a line of girls? You mean a a chorus? Yeah, we'll feature Rita. Yeah. Let her do some good, fast Spanish numbers with the girls behind her. Have her work without her husband, huh? Oh, she can do her specialty with him, too, but we'll make her the star of the show. Will uh, Ramon like that? Sure. If I put it to him just right. Oh, but I uh, want to talk to him about it alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we got to get his okay first. Uh, tell you, Frank, you invite Rita to your table after the last show tonight. You think she'll accept? Oh, I'll see that she does. That'll give me a chance to talk to Ramon alone in the dressing room. Oh, hello, Paul. How do we go tonight? Oh, never better. Rita looked particularly lovely. Yes, yeah, she did, didn't she? I wonder where she is. Oh, she'll be here soon. She's out at Wilson's table. At Wilson's table? What is she doing there? Now, don't get excited. Just wants to talk to her about something that concerns just her, not you. Strictly business. Any business that concerns my wife concerns me, I will see about it. Ramon, sit down and keep quiet. It's just a little idea Wilson has to star Rita in a single act. Star Rita? But if he wanted such a thing, he should have spoken to me first. I am the head of the family. Where is my coat? Never mind. It does not matter. Uh, you can't go out to Wilson's table looking like Who that. Who says I cannot? I will fix that, Wilson. Get out of my way. Calm yourself, will you? You'll make a scene. I never liked him anyway. The first night we came here, candy and flowers. He will send no more flowers. Get out of my way. And kill him. I'll kill him. You don't follow Ramon immediately, do you, Paul? No, you must give him a little time. You glance at the makeup table. Yes, there it is. The jeweled cigarette case you gave him. You felt sure he wouldn't be carrying it in his dancing clothes. You carefully wrap it in your handkerchief and slip it into your inside pocket. And then go on out. Oh, Ramon, do not... Uh, let me through, please. Uh, what's going on it here? Ramon, he's roaring here like a madman and threatened Mr. Wilson. Said he would kill him. I am through with you, Ramon, and I mean it this time. Let go of my arms, you fool. Just wait till I get my hands on Wilson. I'll kill him. Juicy, you heard that, Mr. Fennelly. Uh, where is Mr. Wilson? He's gone and no wonder. Ramon said the most awful things to him. Oh, this is just a little misunderstanding. Now, go on back to your tables, everybody. This is only a family argument. This is a matter of honor. Honor, caramba. You have no honor, no decency. I hate now you. stop at you two. You know, you didn't mean that, Rita. You two go on home quietly and make up. Go home? I will never go home with him. Uh, maybe you're right as far as tonight's concerned. I tell you what, Rita, you spend the night with Kitty. The cigarette girl? Yes, she's a nice girl. She'd be glad to have you when you explain things to her. Tell her it was my idea. Uh, whatever you say, Mr. Fennelly. Ah, uh, you get a good night's sleep. Ramon and I are going to have a nice long talk. All right. I guess that is the best way. No, it is not the best way. Yes, it is, Ramon. You run along, Rita. Come on, Ramon. We'll have a couple of drinks and go to the office for a nice long talk. Yeah, sit down, Ramon. You uh, feeling better? 
I am the world's greatest fool. I lose my temper and make a big noise. But it is only words. I would not harm a fly. Oh, I'm sure you wouldn't. But other people don't know that. It's pretty dangerous business talking like you did. I love Rita very much. What I want most is to make her happy. Instead, I cause her nothing but sorrow. Well, she'll forgive you tomorrow. I know she will. She always does. She'll come in the morning and everything will be all right. And you haven't got anything to worry about. No, except Mr. Wilson. I must go find him and apologize. No, no. Not tonight. He's going on home. Just wait till tomorrow. Oh, here. Have a cigarette. No, no, thanks. Well, then let me fix us another drink. Well, just one more. Then I better go on home. Why, what for? Rita won't be there. The place would just depress you. Why don't you stay here at the club? You can sleep on the couch in Mr. Wilson's office. He never comes in till afternoon. But after my actions tonight... Oh, don't you worry about that. Wilson likes both of you. I'll phone him and tell him you're sleeping in his office tonight. It'll make him feel good. Why, he sleeps here lots of times himself. Keeps blankets and pajamas here. Well, if you are certain, he won't mind. I am certain. Now, I'll fix those drinks, and then we go over to Frank's office. You are very understanding, Mr. Fennelly. Thank you. After finishing your drink, you walk with Ramon to your partner's office. You smile as he yawns and arranges Frank's blankets on the couch. You made sure he'll sleep at least a few hours by dropping a mild sleeping tablet, one of your own, into the drink you made. Under the pretense of looking for a blank contract, you go through your partner's desk, remove his revolver from the drawer, unobtrusively slip it into your inside pocket. You're certain that this is your master move. Ramon slept in Frank's office, and the gun will be found near Frank's home, as well as the jeweled cigarette case you gave Ramon. After you say goodnight to Ramon, you drive out to your partner's home on the outskirts of town. An hour later, you're back in your own apartment. Next morning, the phone awakens you. Uh, hello? Uh, Mr. Fennelly? Yes? Something terrible has happened. Oh, Rita, what's the matter? What's wrong? Poor Mr. Wilson. He has been shot. Killed, I guess. My partner, Frank? Yes, I am at police headquarters. Police headquarters? But they couldn't think you... Oh, never mind, Rita. And don't worry, I'll be right down. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fennelly. And please hurry. You see, they have arrested Ramon for the crime. Well, Paul, things have worked out exactly as you planned, haven't they? You're certain that with your partner out of the way, you'll be able to close the deal you're sure will make you a big operator. You're sure, too, you'll never be suspected of any connection with his death. No. Ramon has already been arrested, and the shooting was done with a gun taken from your partner's office, where Ramon spent the night. And above all, Ramon's cigarette case was dropped just outside the window where Frank was sitting asleep when you shot him. When you reach the police station... You're taken immediately to the office of the captain. Oh, this has been a terrible shock to me, Captain. Wilson and I were not only partners. We were very close friends. So we understand. Anything I can do to help, don't hesitate to ask. Can you uh, identify this? Yes, it's Frank's revolver. I noticed it in his desk last night while Ramon was... It's all right. We already know Ramon slept in Wilson's office in the club. This gun was found a short distance from the Wilson home in the outskirts of town, wiped clean of fingerprints. Now, uh, can you identify this? Hey, yes, it's the cigarette case I gave Ramon. It was lying on the ground outside the window where Mr. Wilson was sitting when he was shot. A perfect target. Oh, but surely you don't think Ramon killed Frank? Nobody killed him. Whoever fired that gun was a pretty poor shot. Wilson was less than three feet away and he was hit. Well, he's going to be okay. Oh, I'm glad. Especially for Ramon's sake. Ramon had nothing to do with it. But whoever did is going up for a nice long stretch for attempted murder. If it wasn't Ramon, then who was it? You, Fennelly. Me? You must be out of your mind. What motive would I have? You might have had several. 
Wilson were out of the way, the club would have been yours. Everybody knows you've been trying to make a deal with some eastern operators, and your partner wouldn't go for it. It was either you or Ramon, Fenley. And you were the only one who had access to Wilson's gun and the cigarette case. Then it was Ramon. He was jealous of Frank. I gave him that case last week. He's had it ever since. Now, what more do you want? He left that case on his makeup table last night when he left his dressing room. You were standing right beside it. Ramon told us himself. Well, that's his story. Ramon doesn't need a story. He was sound asleep in Wilson's office most of the night. He can't prove that. Kitty Henderson, your cigarette girl, has already proved it. She came back to the club last night looking for that cigarette case just about the time Wilson was shot at his home four miles away. The door to Wilson's office was open and she saw Ramon on the couch sound asleep. Kitty? Oh, that's preposterous. Why would Kitty be looking for Ramon's cigarette case? Ramon's wife, Rita, asked her to come back for it. Ramon had given it to her. That's an outright lie. Rita doesn't even smoke. No, 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 she doesn't. That's why we're certain you shot your partner and tried to frame Ramon. <laughs> Here, open the case, Henry. Oh, for heaven's sake. The, the woman's compact. Yeah, the woman's compact. Rita liked that case so well, Ramon had it made into a compact for her. He didn't tell you because he uh, didn't want to hurt your feelings. The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. <laughs> And now, The Whistler's strange story, Man from Calais. Night, and a thick gray blanket of fog had descended over the city. As Laura Ames, former American, now of London, hurried along the deserted residential street... She stopped occasionally, glanced over her shoulder and listened, and then hurried on again, certain that the unseen footsteps she'd been hearing in the gray fog behind her were those of someone deliberately following her. As she turned into Devon Square and broke into a half run, Laura was trembling with fright. And you have good reason to be frightened, haven't you, Laura? You have had it for two days. When you finally reach the steps of your room house... You fumble frantically in your purse. House keys, Laura. You couldn't have lost them. But you don't seem to have them. Back there in the fog, the footsteps coming closer and closer. Laura, dearie. Oh, Mrs. Reeves. Thank goodness. Oh, you're so late coming home from the office. Oh, yes. There were some last-minute letters to get out. Dear me, I was becoming quite worried. All this fog and what with that killer wandering around the streets? Why, dearie, you're shivering. Oh, I'll, I'll be all right. Here, let me fix you some tea. Oh, no, don't bother. You're going out? Yes, but not alone, mind you. My son Frank and his wife are taking me to the cinema. Only take me a moment to fix your tea. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Reeves. I, I'll manage. Oh, that must be Frank now. Yes, there's his car. Well... You run along. Well, ta-ta. 
Yes, Laura. There's a killer loose somewhere in the city of London. And the police are certain he's already claimed three lives. The last victim being young Mr. Pomeroy, a boarder in this very house, who met his death only two nights ago on a quiet side street, close to where you live. You hurry into the kitchen, turn the gas on under the kettle, and place the tea things on a tray and carry them back into the parlor. <gasps> then suddenly you stop and the tray slips in your hand. A man, Laura, standing in the hallway. A stranger. Oh, I'm dreadfully sorry. I didn't mean to startle you. Who? Who are you? What? Name's Follett. C.J. Follett. How did you get in here? Key. I'm a new boarder. I moved in this afternoon. Oh. Oh, I feel much better now. Nothing like a brisk cup of tea after an evening stroll. Oh, I agree. Funny, I never cared much for tea until I came to England. Wouldn't have anything else now. You're American, aren't you? Yes. From upstate New York. Been in England long? Since the war, and I love it. Especially London and this house. Yes. Too bad about Mr. Pomeroy, wasn't it? Yes. It was quite a shock to all of us. Yes, I dare say it. Happened close by, as I understand. In St. Margaret's Mews. Naturally, we've all been a bit on edge. When are they going to catch this fiend? Oh, but they have, haven't you heard? What? Yes, came over the BBC about an hour ago. Police caught the chap in a hotel over in the West End. Oh, oh thank goodness. Are they certain he's the one? Oh, quite. He confessed to the crimes. That is, except the last. He denies killing your Mr. Pomeroy. Oh, but surely the police don't believe that. Oh, yes, they do. You see, they've definite proof he was holed up in the hotel over the past four days and nights. And Mr. Pomeroy was killed only two nights ago. I see. Now it seems someone else killed Mr. Pomeroy. Oh, is that uh, the front door, isn't it? Yes, uh, shall I? Oh, oh, no, I'll answer. Well, darling, this is a pleasant surprise. Come on in. I was just having a pleasant chat with Mr. Follett, one of our new boarders. He moved in this afternoon. Oh, Mr. Follett. Yes? I'd like you to meet Charles Ainsley, my fiancé. Mr. Ainsley? How do you do, Mr. Follett? Oh, darling, I didn't get back from the office until quite late. Haven't had a thing except tea. Why don't we drive over to Armand's, have supper? Oh, uh, of course. Would you two sit down and get ready to... I'll run up to my room and change. <laughs> Well, Charlie, you were saying something about Pomeroy. Yes. Why did you do it, Laura? Why? Do what, darling? Stop fooling with me, Laura. This is serious. You killed him, didn't you? Didn't you? What are you talking about? Oh, come off it. You've been playing up to Pomeroy for months, trying to find out what he was up to, where he got his money. Yeah, and I found out, too. He told me why he took a trip to Dover every week. He did? Yes. He always met a man there. He was working with a mysterious man from Calais. I never found out his name, but I did find out why Pomeroy met him each week. You must have become very friendly with Pomeroy. Of course I did. I wanted to know what he was up to. And what do you think, Charlie? Our Mr. Pomeroy was involved in a flourishing little racket. Forged passports. Forged passports? Yes. After his meeting in Dover every Friday with this man from Calais... Pomeroy always came back with a lot of money. So that's why you waited for him in St. Margaret's Mews. That's why you killed him. I killed Pomeroy? Yes, you know very well, Judith. Oh, all right, Charlie. I didn't mean to. Honestly, I didn't. I only wanted to knock him out. Oh, I guess I hit him too hard. I wanted the money, don't you see? I had to have it for us. So now you have the money. Pomeroy's money. And it's all changed. Nothing's changed, Charlie. I don't have the money. What? Something went wrong the other night. Pomeroy must not have established contact with the man from Calais. He didn't have any money with him. All I found on him were the passports. You didn't take them? Of course I did. A dozen of them. 
Laura, for heaven's sakes. If the police catch you with... Oh, they won't. I've hidden them away. But, Laura, don't... Stop worrying. The police aren't concerned about me. They don't suspect a thing. Don't they? And what's he doing back there at the boarding house? That Mr. Follett. What? What do you mean? I recognized him the moment I saw him. Your Mr. Follett has to be Inspector Follett of Scotland Yard. It comes as a shock, doesn't it, Laura? The sudden knowledge that the new boarder at Mrs. Reeves, the man who calls himself Mr. Follett, is actually an inspector from Scotland Yard. His coming there has something to do with Tom Pomeroy's death. Yes, you're certain of that. But you're not certain how much the inspector knows, suspects. Because of plans you've made, his appearance complicates matters, doesn't it? And then there's your boyfriend, Charles Ainsley. In the restaurant that evening, he's not at all happy with what you've done. He's angry and frightened. I tell you, Laura, you're a fool to go on with this. Am I, darling? Why? True, there's a police inspector staying at the boarding house. He can't possibly know I killed Conway, can he? No one knows except the two of us. And you won't say anything, will you? I should. But feeling as I do about you, I don't suppose I will. Especially since you say it was really an accident. That you only meant to knock him out. It was an accident, Charlie, honestly. I wouldn't have tried to kill him for anything. Oh, you do believe me, don't you? I suppose so. But you've got to give up this wild scheme. Get rid of those passports. Sorry, I don't intend to. But what good are they to you? I can convert them into cash. They'll bring a very good price on the continent. After all, that's how Pomroy was making his money, the can't I? For one thing, you don't know who his contact was. This man from Kelly. Ah, but I do know they met at the Ram's Head Inn at Dover. Laura, you can't possibly hope to find this man. Give it up. I beg you, Laura, give it up. It's no use, Charlie. I won't. I'm just going to sit tight and keep my eye on Inspector Follett. Let him do his investigating. He can't prove a thing. And when this affair cools down, I'll find a way of getting rid of the passport. Laura, for the last time... Shall we look at the menu, darling? I'm starving. Oh, Miss Ames. Why, Mr. Follett, still off? Yes, I was waiting for you to return. Do you have a nice supper? Very. Miss Ames, might we have a private chat? Of course. In here, in the parlor. And we can shut the door. As you wish. Uh, do, do sit down. Thank you. Well, Mr. Follett? That young man of yours... Charlie? Yes. You know him long? Several months, why? What does he do for his livelihood, I mean? Oh, he's a salesman... Right now, he's selling cars, mostly used cars. Oh, yes, of course. He uh, he represents uh, Berwick and Sloan, doesn't he? That's right. Uh, oh, that's where I've seen him. I knew I'd seen him somewhere before. I was out there several times about six weeks ago when Berwick and Sloan were having a difficult time with a very clever car thief. I recall now, I chatted with your young man for a few moments. He was quite helpful. He, um, he recognized me, I suppose. As a matter of fact, he did, Inspector. Hmm. I was afraid of that. Well, there's no great harm done, though. Miss Ames, I'd like to ask you a favor. What is it, Inspector? Uh, uh, Mr. Follett. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd rather the others in the house didn't know. Oh, anything you say, of course, but... I do see you'd like some sort of an explanation. Your being here has something to do with Mr. Pomeroy's death, perhaps. Yes. You see, we've suspected for some time that he was involved in a forged passport operation. Forged passports? Mr. Pomeroy? Why, I can't believe it. Nevertheless, it's true. Actually, he was only a runner, a courier, you might call him, working for a master forger. What? Yes. Yeah. We think one of this forger's top aides resides here in this house. Here? Why, that's incredible. But surely you can't suspect old Mr. Montrose or, or Amos Swinton. Oh, I've been rather frank with you, Miss Ames, but I'm sure you understand that I can't tell you the name of our suspect. I'd much prefer you didn't even try to guess. And I must also ask you that you keep this little chat of ours highly confidential. Why, 
Yes, of course, Inspector. Mr. Follett. Of course. You breathe a sigh of relief, don't you, Laura, as you hurry up to your room? The police don't suspect you of a thing. No, it's someone else they're interested in. Someone in the house they think Pomeroy worked for. And it's easy for you to venture a guess as to whom that someone is. Yes, quiet, mild-mannered Mr. Farnsgate, who runs the tobacco shop on the corner. He and Pomeroy were very friendly, weren't they? And Pomeroy spent a great deal of time at the shop. He could be the man in Vector Follett's watching, couldn't he? You're determined to find out for certain. The following morning after breakfast, you try to see Farnsgate alone before he leaves for his tobacco shop. And as you hoped, he follows his usual custom and goes into the parlor to glance over the morning paper. Mr. Farnsgate? Yes, my dear? I'm just bursting to tell someone. And I know I can trust you. Of course, you won't breathe a word of this. Uh, not a word. <laughs> it's about Mr. Follett. What do you suppose he's doing here? Follett? Well, just what the rest of us are doing, I suppose. Enjoying Mrs. Reeves' hospitality. I mean, he really isn't Mr. Follett at all. Oh, what's this? My boyfriend recognized him last night. He's really Inspector Follett of Scotland Yard. What? Imagine it. Living right here in the house. Oh, dear me, dear me. An Inspector of the Yard, eh? Must have something to do with the dreadful thing that happened to Mr. Pomeroy, don't you think? Yes, yes, I should imagine that's it. Well, what do you suppose he's up to? Well, it's hard to say. No need for us to become alarmed, however. The police work in strange ways, my dear. Strange ways. You watch Mr. Farnsgate lean back in his chair, pretend to go on reading paper. But you know his mind is working furiously. Yes, you're certain the news you've confided to him has come as a definite shock. A few minutes later, you go up to him and then tiptoe back along the hall to the head of the stairs and wait. Finally, you see Farnsgate step out of the parlor, look around cautiously, and then dart back inside. You slip quietly down the stairs and listen just outside the parlor door as he places a phone call. Yes, Ramsgate in, in Dover. It was a shot in the dark, wasn't it, Laura? You're certain it's hit its mark. Yes, Farnsgate is frightened. And you're positive he's calling the one man you want to find. Hello? Mr. Vincent, please. Yes, Vincent. He isn't registered, but he's expected sometime this evening. Uh, uh, No, no message. Thank you. Uh, I'll call him this evening. It's you, Laura. My, my. Not a very warm reception, I must say. Come in. Sorry if I disturbed your slumber. But it's time you were up that way. Didn't sleep very well last night, I'm afraid. Mm Hmm? Conscience bothering you? As a matter of fact, yes. Oh, shouldn't let it, you know. Easier, I suppose, for you to say. My, aren't you in a mood this morning? Well, a nice long drive will change all that. Do you good to get out. Get out of this musty old flat. Drive? I wasn't aware we'd planned anything. Well, sometimes it's come rather suddenly, darling. You said I'd never find the man from Calais. Well, I have. What? Yes. A wonderful stroke of luck. Well, I won't go into all the boring details, but I found him. I know who he is, where he is, and I intend to leave. You want me to ride out over, is that it? Oh, be a darling. No, Laura. I don't want any part of this. Mm. I was afraid you'd say that. Give this whole thing up, Laura, please. And if I don't? If you don't, well... I know, as you said, you don't want any part of this. And I suppose that pollutes me. I'm afraid it does. All right. If that's the way it's got to be. Laura, if you'll only listen to real... Save your breath, darling. 
I won't change my mind. Either you're in with me or you're not. And since you're not, well, we simply call it quits right here and now. That afternoon, you're aboard the train speeding toward Dover. Certain you'll have no difficulty in making a satisfactory deal with Miss Vincent, the man from Calais. You're sure he'll buy the passport you took from Mr. Pomeroy, if only to avoid later complications with you. And you're really not sorry about Charlie, are you? No. He seems a nice young man, but weak. Too weak for you, isn't he, Laura? And you're glad that's all over. It's early afternoon when you arrive in Dover and register at a small hotel. When you're settled in your room, you phone the Ramsgate Inn. Ramsgate Inn? I'd like to speak to Mr. Vincent, please. Vincent? Yes. I'm sorry, miss, but Mr. Vincent hasn't arrived. He's a reservation and we're expecting him quite soon. Oh? When he comes in, will you please have him call Miss Ames? Ames? Yes, Laura Ames. I'm at the Dover Inn. I'll tell him, Miss Ames. Tell Mr. Vincent to phone as soon as he arrives, will you please? It's rather important. Just as soon as he arrives, Miss Ames. Yes? Miss Ames? That's right. Hi, Mr. Vincent. You left word for me to phone you as soon as I arrive. Yes. I was rather anxious to talk to you, Mr. Vincent, on a business matter. What sort of business? It concerns a package I received from Mr. Pomeroy. Pomeroy? Yes. It isn't worth a great deal to me. I thought perhaps you'd be interested in buying it. Just what kind of a package is it, Miss Ames? Well, if you're interested, I'd, I'd prefer to discuss it with you personally rather than over the phone. Perhaps that would be better. Shall we say at uh, dinner? I don't see why not. Very well, I'll pick you up in an hour. We'll drive out in the country somewhere. I know several charming spots. Sounds very nice. I'll expect you in an hour. Questioning was over now, and the captured criminals stared blankly at the group of police authorities surrounding them. Only a few details remained before the case could be marked closed, because Mr. Vincent had been apprehended at the scene a moment after the crime had taken place. Yes, it was all over, and Scotland Yard Inspector Follett's manner was relaxed as he summed up the results of his investigation. That's strange. We shadow Fansgate. Follow him to Dover and find you. Tell me, Fansgate, were you aware we were watching you? Yes. I came to Dover to warn Vincent you were on our trail. And what about the girl? Where did she fit in? Laura Ames? I, I don't know. I had no idea she'd left London. Seems you had no idea of a number of things. Especially the true identity of Mr. Vincent. No, no, I didn't. He always used a French accent. I'm sure Miss Ames didn't know either. If she had, she wouldn't have come all the way over here to Dover. Well, that's probably true. All right, Mr. Vincent, or should I say Charlie, you want to tell us why you shot Miss Ames? She wouldn't stop. Insisted on getting directly to Vincent. That must have been quite a surprise, a young man turning out to be the mysterious man from Calais. Quite a surprise. And once she knew you were Mr. Vincent, you had to eliminate him. Is that right? That's right. There was a lot of way to stop a Galagora. I rather cared for her, too. The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler.
Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I'm the Whistler, and I know many things for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Members of the United States Air Force offering a hint of things to look for in the ever-developing story of the United States Air Force. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Feature story. hot and clear as Darrow and Hazel Martin drove into the Southern California town of Matson, not far from the Mexican border. They were youngish, well-dressed, and prosperous looking as they parked their new brightly polished sedan in front of the Star Cafe. And there's a sound reason for this appearance of prosperity, isn't there, Darrow? Yes, selling worthless stock in barren mines requires a successful front. And you and Hazel have been doing quite well, haven't you? After a leisurely meal, you glance through the local paper, looking for likely prospects. And then suddenly you notice an item of far greater interest. You read the story quickly, then reread it slowly and carefully. Hmm. Well, what's so interesting, Daryl? I wonder if it could be. Nah, probably not. What are you reading? Hmm? Oh, here. Look at this, Hazel. Uh, Joe Gibson, funeral today. Who's he? Well, you wouldn't know him, but there was a Joe Gibson in the pen when I was serving that term for forgery. He'd embezzled a lot of money, hid it somewhere, and nobody could find it. Oh? How much? $75,000. $75,000? Waiting for him when he got out of prison? Yeah. At least we... (laughs) Pardon me. At least we figured he did. Never told anybody about it. He denied it all. He's quite a guy. What do you mean? Well, we called him the Baron. He could always get anything he wanted. Started out working as a prison mechanic, but finished his term writing articles for the prison paper when I worked on the staff. Do you think this is the same fellow? Well, the item says he's from Hartley, Connecticut. Joe is from somewhere around there. Says he was 52, and that was about Joe's age. Well, you can't exactly call this a success story. It could be, baby, for us. Don't you see, honey? He's only been out for a couple of years. Not enough time to spend 75000 Especially if he didn't want the police to locate the money he wasn't supposed to have. Yeah. And it's my guess that he'd be mighty careful about depositing it in banks. Probably keeps it close at hand in cash. And? If that cash is around these parts, ho oh, ho. I'd like to recover it for us. How? Maybe it would be a good idea for us to pay our respects, huh? Oh, uh, waiter. Uh, yes, sir. How much do I owe you? Oh, let's see. That'll be three twenty. Three twenty, huh? Here you are. Thank you, sir. Oh, by the way, where is the Matson Mortuary? Uh, just a block down. You'll see a sign. It's on this side of the street. Mm-hmm. Thanks. I think we can find it. <laughs> We came to pay our respects to Joe Gibson. Friend? Yes. Mm -hmm. This way, please. Mm -hmm. Not many people here, huh? There are no relatives. And Mr. Gibson wasn't in Matson long. Oh, we just drove into town noticing the paper about his death. The services will be at 3 o'clock. That's about two hours from now. In here, please. Thank you. If you'll excuse me, I'll greet these people just coming in. Suddenly you find yourself staring at the profile of a tall, gray-haired man standing on the other side of the room. 
talking to a man wearing a sheriff's badge. Your eyes seem glued on him. And then you notice Hazel pulling at your arm. Come on, Darrow. Don't just stand there. Okay. Let's go over to the casket. Let's get out of here, Hazel, quick. The man in the casket is not Joe Gibson. Southern California town, hundreds of miles from the prison where you first knew Joe Gibson. You intended to pay your respects at the local funeral home, hoping to find some clue to the recovery of the money he embezzled. But the man you see in the casket is not Gibson. You're excited as you and Hazel walk back toward the cafe. What's the matter, Darrow? We barge in on some stranger's funeral? Not at all. I knew the deceased, too. He was there at the pen when Gibson and I were, but what puzzles me is that Joe Gibson himself was there in that room. Do you remember that tall, gray-haired man? Well, yeah, you kept staring at him. That was Joe Gibson. Do you think he saw you? No. It wouldn't make any difference. You'll learn I'm in town sooner or later. Now that I know Joe's pretending he's somebody else. I wonder how he managed to switch an identification. That's what I intend to find out. Oh, here's a cafe. Let's go in and see what we can learn, huh? Folks back? Couldn't you find the mortuary? Oh, we didn't care to stay too long. Wow, it's hot, huh? What do you have that's good and cold to drink? How about some iced tea? Yeah, sounds great. How about it, Hazel? That'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Say, my name's Martin, D.L. Martin. What's yours? Sam. Sam Bates. Glad to know you, Sam. This is Mrs. Martin. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. How do you do? Here's your tea. Thanks. I understand that fellow Joe Gibson didn't have any relatives. No, but poor Mr. Telford has taken it hard. Telford? Who's he? Uh, you probably saw him at the funeral home. Gray-haired man, tall, well-dressed. Oh, yes. Yes, I believe I did. Well, he's a mighty nice fellow. Yeah, he looked to be. Native of Matson? No, a matter of fact, it hasn't been here more than six or eight months, but he's one fellow the whole town knows and likes. Ah. Uh-huh. How did he become so attached to Joe Gibson? Uh, well, um, this just shows how Mr. Telford goes out of his way to be nice to people. Oh. He met this Gibson when he was making a trip back east. Gibson's health was bad, and Mr. Telford felt sorry for him. I see. Seems like Gibson had had some trouble with the law, had been in prison or something, so he took Mr. Telford up on the offer and came out here to make a new start. Yeah, I thought I remembered reading about Joe Gibson. That's why I was so interested when I saw his funeral notice. You'd... You'd heard about him back east? Feature that. You know, Sam, you're right. I think I will feature that. It would make a good feature story. I think I can sell it. <coughs> oh, well, now, don't be so surprised, Hazel. I think I can write a good article on Helm and Telford Joe Gibson in this fine little town of Matson. Oh, I know. I promised I'd take a complete vacation just once, but a story like this... Well, you know best, honey. Now there, huh? That's an understanding wife for you, Sam. You see, I sell articles now and then to magazines, and this story could help us have our vacation with pay. Think so? Sure. Say, tell me, where would be a good place for us to stay a day or so, huh? The best place around here is the Desert Motel. Uh, just at the edge of town, right next to that big signal station. Uh-huh. Hank Holland runs it. Tell Hank I recommended it. Mr. Holland? Yep. Sam Bates at the Star Cafe. Said I that... know. Sam just called me. Said you was writing a story about Madsen and Mr. Telford. News travels fast. That's right. Mighty fine man, Mr. Telford. Rich, too. Oh? Yeah, always has big bills. Fifties, mainly. Gets a big kick out of it when we can't change him. Now, you know him then, huh? Sure, everybody in town knows Mr. Telford. Our paper's always saying something about him. Newspaper, huh? I should get plenty of information from my story from the newspaper files. Where'll I find the office? On Main Street. Right next to the Star Cafe. A fella named Dan Brady owns it. Just tell him I sent you. Yes? 
like to see Mr. Brady, please. I'm Brady. How do you do? My name's Mark. Oh, oh, yes. Sam told me about you writing a story on Matson and the Gibson case. Oh, that Sam's a good publicity agent. <laughs> well, I was hoping I could use your newspaper files for some background. Be glad to help. Got copies all the way back to 1911 when I first bought this really? paper. <laughs> Changed the name to the Clarion. Haven't missed a weekly issue since. Oh, it's a remarkable record. Should mention that in my story, huh? I find Matson's a very interesting place. I like the people here, too. Oh, thanks, thanks. Well, since you're writing about Mr. Telford, you'll find he's been making headlines in our paper ever since he came to Matson. Fine man. Generous, too. <laughs> Sammy. Oh, hello, Mr. Martin. Uh, how's it going? Oh, fine, fine. Mr. Brady's newspaper file gave me a lot of background material. Well, and there's someone here you'll want to meet. Oh? Oh, uh, Sheriff. Yes? What is it, Sam? Sheriff Roberts, this is Mr. Martin. Uh, I was telling you about him. Oh, how do you do? Hello, Mr. Martin. So you're writing a story on the Gibson case? Yes. Yes, I think it'll sell. You heard of Gibson in the East? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the same person. I, uh... Well, I was working in Connecticut, and I read about his editorials while he was on the prison newspaper staff. That's so? Yeah. I believe he got out with minimum sentence because of good behavior. Mm-hmm. Mm. Of course, I'll check all the details when I get back to New York before I send the article for publication. I'll check with you, too, Sheriff, when I know more about the case. Well, I'll be glad to help, too, you know, Mr. Martin. Oh, you've been a big help already, Sam. I tell you... There is one thing. I, I just can't seem to get to see Mr. Telford. You want me to call him for you? Would you do that, Sam? Now, that oh, would be fine. Oh. 678 J. Uh, Miss Telford, uh, this is Sam. There's a, a Mr. Martin here who'd like to talk to you. Here he is, Mr. Martin. Thanks, Sam. Hello, Mr. Telford. Hello, Mr. Martin. I'm uh, interested in doing a feature on uh, Joe Gibson. I've heard. Just what did you have in mind? Oh, well, it, it seemed unusual that he was coming out here to make a new start in life, and he died just as he was turning a new leaf, so to speak, huh? Yes, it was too bad. Yeah, but I think, I think there's a lot of human interest in your giving him a helping hand. I'd appreciate having your picture, Mr. Telford. Uh, Mr. I... Martin, hmm? I wish you would give up this idea. Why? I think it has great possibilities. Well, then, I'd appreciate your leaving me out of your story. It was difficult enough having this sad experience without publicity, too. Oh, well, I understand, Mr. Telford. I, I think we can't arrange to leave your name out of it. But I would like to talk to you. How about dinner this evening? Very well. You'll be my guest. Oh, no, no, no. You'll be my guest. You see, I have my wife with me. She's my secretary also. Then you'll both be my guests. At the Hilltop Inn? Hilltop Inn. Huh? Yes, it's quite a spot. Do you know how to get there? No, but I'll find out. See you at eight, Mr. Telford. <laughs> Coming, Daryl. Well, it's 10.20. We'll give him another 10 minutes. If he doesn't show, we'll chalk up a point for Mr. Telford. Good thing he'd call to say he'd be late and for us to go ahead and eat. I'd have starved by this time. The food's been excellent. <laughs> Hope it hasn't been poisoned. Though. Oh, it was too delicious for that. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Martin. Huh? Mr. Telford just called. Said he's awful sorry, but... Now he finds he won't be able to come out at all. He just telephoned? Yeah, he, he's taking care of the bill, sir. Says for you to have some more drinks and stay and enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're sorry Mr. Telford couldn't get here, but it has been a delightful meal. This view over the countryside is lovely. The lights on the highway and the town below. Thank you. We're real proud of this view. Would you like another drink now? Oh, no, no, thanks. We've had more now than we usually do. Mr. Telford isn't coming. We better get back to town, huh? All right. So Mr. Telford sends his regrets, eh? Well, I guess we'll just have to see Mr. Telford at his home late tomorrow evening. Real late. 
seeing Telford may not be so easy. He might refuse to let us in. He won't refuse. I'll make certain he doesn't. Take it easy, Daryl. This is a steep grade. Quit worrying. The new car handles great. These turns are plenty sharp, Daryl. Slow down, please. What's wrong? No brakes. What's fully emergency? Doesn't work. Oh, look out. We'll never make this turn. Hold on. I'm doing my best. How much longer? I think we're just about down. Thank you. We're safe now. Daryl, do you know what I'm thinking? I know what I'm thinking. I think Joe Gibson, alias Mr. Harmon Telford, try to kill us. It was sheer luck that you were able to round those dangerous curves without plunging to your death, wasn't it, Daryl? At the garage the next day, examination of the car proved that someone had deliberately put your brakes out of working order. Now you're certain it was Telford. He's probably seen you, recognized you, and knows exactly why you're here. You know now that you must have a showdown with him, and soon. Next day, you learn he lives in an apartment above his office. That evening, after the car is repaired, you and Hazel check out of the motel, and then pay Mr. Harmon Telford a visit. Yes? Hello, Mr. Telford. I'm Darrell Martin. This is Mrs. Martin. I believe we've met before... Some years ago, Darrow. Yes, matter of fact, that's right. Some years ago. Well, aren't you going to invite us in, or do we have our conversation here in the hallway? Well, of course. Come on in. Yeah. We uh, came to thank you for the wonderful dinner last night. Too bad you couldn't have joined us inside. Yes, I, I was sorry. I couldn't keep my appointment. Well, no matter now. Last night gave me the final touch for my feature story concerning Joe Gibson, alias Harmon Telford. What are you after, Darrow? Oh, I thought you might like to buy my story. Why should I? Put that gun away, Darrow. Hazel, while I talk to Mr. Telford, why don't you look around the apartment? Hmm? Okay, I will. I uh, have a copy of my story right here. I think you'll find it very interesting, Mr. Mm -hmm. Telford. It tells how Joe Gibson came to this little out-of-the-way place and established himself in the hearts of the townspeople as a moderately wealthy, well-educated, and community-minded Harmon Telford. But then he ran into Nick Sanders. No. Oh, yes, who recognized him and followed him to Matson. Nick tried to blackmail Gibson, and on the now well-established Mr. Telford's testimony, Nick's murder was cataloged as accidental or self-inflicted fatal wounds without question. You couldn't prove otherwise. I continue the quote. Joe Gibson's wallet and identification papers were all placed in Nick's clothing, so it looked authentic. And the Joe Gibson identity was to be buried forever. Go on. All right. Life would have been more pleasant for Harmon Telford thereafter, but Darrow and Hazel Martin happened to appear on the scene. And? Mr. and Mrs. Martin will now take $50,000 of the embezzled money and leave town. Mr. Telford can continue being the good fellow. Or? The feature story will go into print. But I don't have any money. You're all wrong. Yeah, that's always been your story. Hazel, will find anything? Nothing. I didn't think you'd have it here, Telford. I've got a hunch it's in your office. And we'd like you to open your safe for us. Why, you... Save your comments. Just come along downstairs to your office and don't try anything. I'm keeping this gun in my coat pocket pointed at you. Now stand back, Gibson. Hazel, look and see if the money's there. It's here, Darrell. Thousands and thousands of dollars. I thought so. 
Now let's find something to put it in. How about this briefcase? Oh, fine. Oh, well. You know, Joe, we all wondered how it would be to have 75000 waiting for us when we got out. You won't get away with this. I'll... You'll what? Tell the people of the town that we've stolen the money you embezzled, that you're really Joe Gibson? I don't think so. All right, put our feature story inside the briefcase, Hazel. Okay. Now, in case Mr. Telford decides to go to the police and they find the briefcase filled with money, they will also find the feature story of his true crime. Look out, Darrow. Rats! So you want to play rough? Don't shoot him, Darrow. No need for that. I don't intend to, but... Go ahead and shoot. People will be in here in a minute. You're asking for it? You didn't kill him. Of course not. I'll come out of it in an hour. I just knocked him out. Come on, honey. It's Mexico for us for a while. We'll stay there till the heat's off and then come back to the U.S. and spend this loot. There's Sam with Sheriff Roberts. Motioning for us to come over. Might as well stop and say so long to him, huh? Mr. Martin, how's your story coming along? Fine, just fine, Sam. Evening, Sheriff. Evening, Mr. Martin. I'll put the finishing touches on it when I get back to New York. Send it to my editor. That's swell, Mr. Martin. We'll want copies, won't we, Sheriff? Of course. Oh, don't worry. I won't forget you people. I certainly appreciated the cooperation everyone in Matson gave me. My stay here has been uh, most rewarding. <laughs> It's been a most rewarding stay for you and Matson, hasn't it, Darrow? You're almost rich, and within an hour you plan to be in Mexico, free to spend your riches. It's ironic that you should leave the town with the well wishes of Sam the waiter and the sheriff himself, who supplied most of the information you needed for your success. Yes, sir, Mr. Martin. It's going to make Matson real proud to have this story about Joe Gibson published. Well, I promise to send you autographed copies. Good. I'll post him in our window along with the Matson Clarion's account of this Gibson hoax. Hoax? What do you mean? Joe Gibson isn't dead, Mr. Martin. Not dead? What are you talking about? Joe Gibson has been masquerading as one of our leading citizens, Harmon Telford. Harmon Telford? What about the corpse at the funeral parlor? That was another ex-convict named Nick Sanders. You see, we've been suspicious of Telford for some time. All those uh, big bills he carried... So we decided to do a little investigating. It wasn't any trick to get his fingerprints. We got him off a cocktail glass and sent him to Washington. We did the same thing with Sanders' prints. So Harmon Telford is really Joe Gibson, ex-convict. <laughs> There's no doubt about it, huh, Sam? No, sure. The sheriff showed me the letter from Washington. And my men are on the way up to Telford's office right now to pick him up. Uh, if you don't mind, you can drive me over to Telford's office, and then you can get the payoff for your feature story firsthand. Oh, uh, well, of course, sure, sure. Uh, is there room for three here in the front seat? Certainly. Here, Mr. Martin, I'll put your briefcase in the back. Uh... Oh. H.T. These aren't your initials, Mr. Martin. And his name tag, Harmon Telford, Matson, California. What are you doing with this briefcase? Well, you see, I... I can... Fifties, hundreds, all big bills. And the true story of ex-convict Joe Gibson, alias Harmon Telford. Did Joe go for your blackmail, or did you rob him? Now, look, Sheriff, I... Never mind. Find out all about it when we pick up Joe Gibson. If I find out what I think I will, you can write another story. About the conviction and imprisonment of Darrow and Hazel Martin. The Whistler. Listen next week when, once again, the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler.
Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Hudson Bay Incident. It all began at a secret international business conference at the exclusive Hudson Bay Hunting Lodge between two important men, Elliot Bradley of the Bradley Metal Processing Company and Bernardo Nagashi of the Middle Eastern Metals Limited. A conference which also included handsome, suave Charles Reeves, personal secretary to Elliot Bradley. Yes, you've been present at many important conferences with your employer, haven't you, Charles? And you've learned many important facts. Facts you expect to turn to your own advantage very soon. With the assistance of your employer's attractive wife, Pauline Bradley. Yes, Pauline can be a big help to you, can't she, Charles? You smile as you complete the final arrangements for the conference between your employer and the important Bernardo Nagashi, a conference you're certain will change the course of your life. Uh, give me the lodge guard's office, will you, please? Chief of Guards, Kincaid speaking. Oh, Kincaid, this is Reeves here. Uh, look, there's been a change of plans. Mr. Nagashi is not coming up by car. You see, we heard that he hated to fly, but uh, he just wired that he's coming in from Washington on a chartered plane anyway. Better send the limousine to the airport right away. Yes, Mr. Reeves. Uh, what about the reporters? Reporters? Yes, sir. Several of them are here. Oh, but this conference was supposed to be a well-kept secret. Well, how do you suppose they found out? I wouldn't know, Mr. Reeves. Mr. Bradley's arranged for a few hours of hunting with Nagashi before the business conference. Right, Mr. Reeves. Well, I'm tired of being kept in the dark. What's this all about anyway, Charles? Well, I'm sworn to secrecy, Mrs. Bradley. You better ask your husband. Yes, I can tell you now, Pauline. Britannium. Oh, the rare metal, Elliot. Yes, we need it desperately for our defense production. And where does Mr. Nagashi fit in? Uh, his outfit, Middle Eastern Metals, controls most of the world's production, and they're selling it behind the Iron Curtain. And we've got to stop it. That's why I'm meeting Nagashi. And just what are you supposed to do? Get the Britannium for ourselves. Nagashi wants certain patents that we control. So I'll put it on the line. The patents, in return for all of Middle Eastern Metals' Britannium. Well, what are all the guards for? Somebody might just try to get Nagashi and pin it on me. That would kill our chances of ever getting the Britannium. Well, with all this going on, you're quite the man of the hour, Mr. Bradley. Mm. Oh, uh, may I suggest that you'd better go on down to the main lounge and talk with the reporters before Nagashi arrives? I'd certainly like to know how they found out about this meeting. Are you coming along, Reeves? Oh, why don't you let Charles stay here and keep me company? Very well. I'll be back in a few minutes. I thought he'd never leave, Charles. I know, darling. Well, tell me, is it good news? Are you going to get away? Yes, I've arranged it with Elliot. Uh, I'm leaving tomorrow for a vacation. I'm staying at my sister's in Upper New York. That won't be too far away, will it? No, of course not. We'll have a wonderful time together. Oh, there are a hundred out-of-the-way places I want to show you. I wish we were there now. Me too. Elliot means well, but... Oh, I'm so tired of his everlasting committees, business meetings, receptions. I, I just can't take it anymore. I'm going to buy a whole new wardrobe. I'm beginning to feel 16 again. <laughs> Say, you don't think Elliot suspects anything, do you? Well, I don't care if he does. I want him to know. No, no, we have to be sensible, Pauline. My promotion papers are in Elliot's briefcase. All they need now is his signature. Is that so important? It means my whole career. Besides, if he knows about us, you'll never get a cash settlement out of him when you file for divorce. I don't want one. I've decided I'm not touching Elliot's money. I think you're making a mistake, Pauline. Why, Elliot owes you something for all those years of drudgery. I'm leaving him, Charles. He owes me nothing. He's done his best to make me happy. 
He just doesn't understand that it takes more than success to make a woman happy. But, Pauline, all our future plans... Look, we might as well face it now, Charles. Which comes first, your career, cash settlements, or me? Well, you do, darling, of course. Well, then, I'm going to tell him. Oh, look, let's not quarrel, Pauline. There's no hurry. Oh, come here, darling. Oh, Charles. I want to be as honest as I can to Elliot. I know. You do understand. Of course I do. Now, we'll we'll discuss it later. Now, let's be careful. Elliot's due back any moment. Now, you won't do anything till then, will you, darling? Well, I won't promise that, Charles. It's my decision. Oh, uh... Well, uh, how's the press briefing, Mr. Bradley? Short and to the point. We better get ready. The limousine is coming up the drive with Mr. Nagashi now. A drink, Mr. Nagashi? Uh, no, thank you, please. Afterwards, yes. But now I am most anxious to begin the hunt which your husband arranges for me. Well, then why don't we get it started? Here's our gun rack, Mr. Nagashi. You just take your pick. Thank you. I I like this gun, Mr. Bradley. Hmm? It's the same model as my own. Well, I'm glad you like it. So, shall we get started? The jeep's out and back, sir. Then lead the way, Mr. Reeves. I, I understand you Americans are great marksmen. I am most anxious to see for myself. <laughs> You certainly got Nagashi in a good humor. He's nailed a half a dozen rabbits. Now he wants a deer. Yeah. He seems to enjoy hunting immensely. Lucky he does. You're still going to find him a tough man to deal with, I'm afraid. <clears throat> well, uh, where to now, Mr. Bradley? Oh, Reeves, Reeves. Drive over to that clump of trees and brush. I'd swear I spotted a deer. Yes, sir. Something for heaven's sake. Nagashi's dead. Huh? Oh, no. No, he can't be. Reeves, you don't know what that means. Yes, Mr. Bradley. I know exactly what it means. This is a stroke of luck you hadn't expected, isn't it, Charles? And as you help Elliot Bradley carry Nagashi's body into the jeep, you see a way to speed the completion of your own plans. Bradley's accidental shooting of Nagashi can be turned immediately to your advantage, can't it, Charles? Outwardly, of course, you still remain the obedient and sympathetic personal secretary as you follow Bradley's instructions to the letter. <laughs> You have all his personal effects? Pistol, handkerchief, wallet, and passport, all here. All right. Leave them on my desk when you get back. And now remember, we can't let any of the reporters get wind of what's happened. Not yet. Right. I uh, don't think they can see us from the main lodge. And I hope not. I'll drive the body back to one of the rear guest houses. You walk back to the house. Phone Kincaid and have him meet me there as soon as possible. Yes, Mr. Brad. <laughs> Kincaid, this is Reeves speaking. Mr. Bradley wants you over here right away. It's an emergency. What's happening, Charles? Elliot killed Nagashi what? while we were hunting. Oh, no. Yes. And Elliot's shot is going to be heard around the world. Where is Elliot now? He's on his way here. Oh, I'd better get the note I wrote him. He mustn't read it at a time like this. What note? About us. I just couldn't face him and tell him you and I were in love. I thought it would be easier if I wrote him a note. But I told you to wait, Pauline. Oh, never mind that now. I left the note on his desk. I bet... Oh, Elliot. 
Hello, Pauline. Oh, Elliot, I'm so sorry. I know how you must feel. How I feel doesn't matter. It's the consequences that count. I'm a hated word to most of Nagashi's company as it is. There are plenty of enemy agents working inside his company ready to blow this whole thing up into a sinister plot. And there goes Britannium. That's what I'm afraid of, Reeves. I put through a call to Kingston in Washington while I was at the main lodge. No, oh, that's probably Kingston now. Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Bradley. Oh, Mr. Kingston's not in, huh? Well, uh, keep trying, operator. Yes, this is urgent. Who's expected soon? Thank you. Thank you. Well? He's flying in from a conference in Bermuda. Won't be back till six. We'll just have to wait. Would you like, uh, like a drink, Elliot? Yes, yes, I could use one. Hmm. What's this note here on my desk? Oh, uh, I forgot to give it to you this morning. It's not important. Well, I might as well read it. Keep my mind from the gashy and no, titanium. No, please don't bother. You can read it later. Here's your drink. Thanks. Here's the door, Reeves. Yes, Mr. Bradley. Oh, this way, Mr. Kincaid. Mr. Bradley, you sent for me? Yes, Kincaid. We're faced with an emergency. While we were hunting, Nagashi was accidentally shot, killed. I won't go into details, but we're sitting on a powder keg and we just can't let it go off. Now, I want you to keep the road from the lodge under constant guard and be sure that none of the reporters leave, understand? I'll, I'll take full responsibility. All right, Mr. Bradley. Thanks, and, uh, oh, just to be safe, you better have the press phones uh, go out of order. If you say so, Mr. Bradley. And arrange to have dinner served the reporters at 6.30. Tell them it's important for them to remain and... Oh, never mind, I'll tell them that myself. Yes, that's all, Kincaid. Right, Mr. Bradley. Well, what now? I don't know, Reeves. I don't know. You can't keep the secrecy up very long, you we'll know. Keep it up until we hear from Washington. And what can they do? I don't know that either. But there must be some way out. I can't let thousands of pounds of britannium get into the wrong hands because of my stupidity. Well, it's not your fault, yes, Elliot. Yes, it is. Oh, if I could only think. Maybe... What about suicide? You'd stand behind me, Reeves, wouldn't you? It's not for myself, you understand that. No, suicide won't work. Why not? If the bullet went through his back. It'd be impossible for Nagashi to shoot himself in the back. Yes, you're right. Well... I better go out and stall those reporters. Forget then that's wasting time, Bradley. Mm -hmm. There is one person who can get you out of this. Oh, who's that? Me. What? Well, I'm in no mood for games. I'm not playing any. All right, then. What do you have in mind? There were only two of us with Nagashi. Yeah, I know that, I know that. Get to the point. All right. I could say I shot him. Nagashi's company never heard of me. Yes. Yes, that's it. At least it, it would give us a fighting chance. Your name means nothing to them. They couldn't blow you up into an international incident and make it stick. Exactly. And it would save your reputation. Well, I don't care a snap about that now. Oh, no, of course not. You're only concerned with Britain. Charles, I don't want to argue. If you go through with this, I'll be eternally grateful. Let's leave it there. Well, that's not quite enough. What do you mean? My promotion, for one thing. We've gone through that before, Charles. Uh, that was before. And the same reason still hold you don't have the maturity or the experience to be a division chief. Now, in time... In time, the time is now, Bradley. Ah, I see. No, not quite. I'm not finished yet. You just bought 5,000 shares of preferred stock in the company. You'll sign that stock over to me. Charles, how can Keep you... out of this, Paulie. Now I'm warning you. You don't know what you're saying, Reed. Oh, don't I? What's that quotation? Power falls to the man who has the courage to be merciless. In other words, blackmail. Why, Don't I'll... start anything, Bradley. Remember, I'm your only witness, and if necessary, I'm prepared to swear you lost your temper and killed Nagashi deliberately. Oh, you don't, Elliot. That's just what he wants. You're right. I have to keep my head. I'll answer it. Hello? Yes, just a moment. It's Kincaid for you, Elliot. All right. Yes, Kincaid. Huh? All right. Well, I'll be right over. What was it, darling? The reporters are climbing all over Kincaid. I have to go out and talk to them. In the meantime, Reeves, you'll have a chance to change your mind. Thank you, Bradley. But don't count on it. As Elliot leaves to see the reporters, you casually walk over to the bar and mix yourself a scotch and soda. You're in a perfect position, aren't you, Charles? You know Elliot is growing more desperate and that he'll soon have no choice but to accept your terms. You'll have the position and wealth you've always wanted. You're not at all worried about Pauline now, are you, Charles? You're sure you don't need her anymore? 
and you're almost amused as she comes toward you, her eyes blazing with anger. That was low and vicious, Charles. No matter how we feel, Elliot is a fine man. He doesn't deserve that kind of treatment, especially from you. Well, the loyal little wife. Charles. Charles what? You're a great one to be preaching sermons to me. Don't talk that way. Uh, why not? What did you do the minute your husband's back was turned? That's a nasty thing to say. I was in love with you, you know that. Was? Yes. Past tense. Oh, I see. I wonder how many times you've played this little game before. Why, you... <laughs> oh, that slap won't help. You don't like the truth, do you? It was a lie. A despicable lie. Oh, was it? I suppose you really believed I wanted to marry you. What? Oh, I see. I was just a pawn in your little game. First, you wanted to become Elliot's personal secretary. And then you wanted the promotion and the cash settlement. You were just using me, weren't you, Charles? What a fool I've been. Well, you don't have to keep on being one. Hey, look, Polly. Oh, forget it. How did it go, Elliot? Not good, not good. The reporters are getting suspicious. They want to see Nagashi. Well, you don't have much time, Bradley. I didn't ask for your advice. You're really. waiting for Washington, aren't you? They can't save you from a murder charge. I'm the only one that can do that. I don't do business with a knife at my throat. But it's there all the same, Bradley. I prefer to ignore that fact. Pauline. Yes, darling. What, what did I do with that note I found on my desk? Oh, oh here it is in my overcoat. Oh, please, Elliot. I'd rather you didn't read it now. <laughs> Why not, Pauline? It's so amusing. Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. It's all right with me if you never read the note, Bradley. <laughs> No, you're not worried, are you, Charles? You're certain that once Elliot Bradley talks with Washington, he'll have no choice. He'll be forced to accede to your demands and say nothing. As Elliot and Pauline make a half-hearted attempt at conversation, you sit smoking cigarettes, waiting for the phone call from Washington you're certain will come through at any moment. After about 20 minutes... As Elliot quickly reaches for the phone, you silently lift the extension phone, open your notebook, prepare to make your usual notes of the conversation. Elliot Bradley speaking. Washington, calling Mr. Bradley. Yeah, put them on. Hello, Mr. Bradley. Yes. This is Lester Shaw, manager of Mr. Nagashi's American office. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Shaw. I'd, uh, I'd like to speak to Mr. Nagashi, if you don't mind. Uh, well, he is, uh, not available at the moment. He, uh... He went hunting. Oh, I see. Mm. Well, then, would you tell him that we received a coded cable from our board of directors this afternoon? A special messenger is on his way to the lodge to deliver to him personally. He should be there any time now. Yes, I'll tell him. Thank you. Good day. Good day. What is it, Elliot? Bad news. A messenger's on his way up here to see Nagashi. Well, Bradley? All right, Reeves. All right, you win. No, don't do it, Elliot. Don't do it. I have no choice, Pauline. I can't risk our whole defense production to stop one cheap little crook. <laughs> Here's your briefcase, Bradley. Sign the necessary papers and be quick about it before I change my mind. You get the door, Pauline. No, no, no. Sit still, both of you. Let me answer it. It'll be my last official act as your private secretary, Bradley. <laughs> certain now that you've won, aren't you, Charles? That in a few minutes, you'll have 5,000 shares of the valuable metals company's stock, and also get your promotion to division chief. As soon as the messenger from Nagashi's Middle East Metals Company arrives, and learns that Nagashi has been killed, Elliot Bradley will quickly sign the papers necessary to complete the deal that you forced him into. And the beauty of it is that Bradley can never reveal the fact that he was blackmailed without also revealing that he killed Nagashi. You smile smugly to yourself as you answer the doorbell. Oh, hello, Kincaid. What can I do for you? I have to see Mr. Bradley right away. Well, Mr. Bradley's busy at the moment. I'll speak for myself, Reeves. What is it, Kincaid? Well, frankly, sir, I don't know what to make of it. Here, see for yourself. Bring him in, man. Get your hands away from me. Who is Mr. Bradley? I am. Are you the special messenger? Messenger? 
I have never been subjected to such outrageous treatment in my entire career. First, you canceled our engagement this morning and asked me to arrive at six this evening. And now this. But you must be mistaken. I am not mistaken. What kind of bungling is this? I have your telegram in my correspondence file. I am holding you and your company responsible. Just who are you? Oh, the final insult. I am Binardo Nagashi, here at your invitation, Mr. Bradley. It's impossible. Get out of his mind, Bradley. Keep quiet, Reeves. Uh, your passport, please. Oh, dear, you... I, I suppose you, you'll search my luggage next, huh? I, I'm sorry, but I must insist on seeing your passport. Very well, but I give it to you under protest. Here. Now are you convinced who I am? Well... No, not yet. Uh, Pauline, hand me that other passport. It's on the desk next to the gun and the handkerchief. Yes. Here it is, Elliot. Thank you. Well, this passport has your name in it, too. And look at the identification photo. Huh? A forgery. It is Kim Son Konoye. Where is this man now, huh? Dead. He was shot day by accident while we were out hunting. Thank heavens. Forgive me, Mr. Bradley. But we were almost the victims of a daring and clever plot. Yes, yes, I see it now. He sent you a telegram to delay your arrival, then wired us he was coming in by plane. This Konoye was one of the Middle East's cleverest agents. He was here for more than information, Mr. Bradley. He didn't want me to return alive. The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present the Whistler. The Whistler has come to you through the world. The Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The Whistler's strange story, Escape to Doom. The morning is brilliant and warm as the SS Lalani moves slowly toward the small primitive harbor of Kaluka. The passengers stand anxiously along the dock, taking in the picturesque South Pacific Island. It's all there, the blue lagoon blending into the blue mountains. But the enchanting island doesn't capture everyone's eye. No. Something interests Paul Wilson much more, doesn't it, Paul? Yes. She's standing at the rail a few yards away, unaware of your stare. But Jane Gilkey, standing beside you, has noticed your focused attention. Paul. Hmm? That's enough. Enough? Mrs. Diane Kimberly. You haven't taken your eyes off her since we came out on deck. Hmm. Trying to catch her eye. Why? So she'll stop and speak to us. Speak to us? You've had her in a corner chattering all the way from San Pedro. Jane, my sweet, gaining the lovely lady's confidence is the most important part of our groundwork. You enjoy it too much to suit me. I'll be silly. Once I've got her necklace, it'll be just you and me again. I don't like any part of this. When you asked me to stake you to this big deal, I didn't realize it was anything like this. I've never done anything outside the law before. You're not doing anything now. I am. You're merely, merely investing in my business venture for 50% of a certain $60,000 profit. Forget it, Jane. It'll only take a few more days and we'll be on our way back to the States. Well, you better move fast. I'm practically out of money. It won't take long. 
I hope not. I'm really fed up watching you romance with Mrs. Diane Kimberly. Uh, you just might look forward to your half of that $60,000 we'll get from Mrs. Kimberly's necklace. Oh, she seen us. Oh, goody, good, Dick. She's coming over. Charm, Jane, charm. Yes, darling. Oh, good morning, Mr. Wilson. Hello, Jane. Good morning. Lovely morning, isn't it? Oh, it's perfect. What do you think of Kaluka? I had no idea it would look so primitive. Well, it looks okay to me. There's quite a few ships anchored in that harbor there, huh? Yes, most of them are naval vessels, aren't they? Quite a few of them. Fleets in, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope the island isn't too crowded. It'll spoil the atmosphere. Are you and your sister staying at the Lorelei house, Mr. Wilson? Yes, we are. Oh, wonderful. Then we'll see you ashore later on. Of course. We'll phone you as soon as we're settled. Then we'll see you later. Bye. 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 Jane, if you're not careful, you'll ruin everything with that nasty disposition of yours. Well, I'd like to throw that dame over this side. Keep your voice down. I know exactly what you're about to say, so just don't bother. Anything you say, mister. Let's go ashore, shall we? Ashore on Kaluka. The pattern is nearly the same, isn't it, Paul? Next day, you phone Diane Kimberly and invite both Diane and her aunt to dinner at the Lorelei house. And Diane accepts with apparent pleasure. In the dining room that evening, you and Jane catch your first glimpse of the diamond necklace that you followed halfway across the Pacific. And you notice some other things, too, don't you, Paul? Diane's breathtaking beauty, her simple, direct manner, her obvious interest in you. By the time you've had coffee, another thought has entered your mind, hasn't it, Paul? An idea that makes your original plan, the theft of the necklace, seem trivial by comparison. You manage to maneuver things so cleverly that a few minutes after dinner, you find yourself alone with Diane on the moonlit hotel terrace. I never imagined anything could be as lovely as this. There's nothing like this in the little towns I've lived in. Little towns? Yes. From Alaska to Uruguay. Oh. Your husband was a traveling man, huh? Of a kind. He always wanted to strike it rich. Even the report of a gold strike drew him like a magnet. After we were married, I went with him, at least to the nearest towns. Real grub staker, huh? Uh, And an investor. Practically every penny we could scrape together went into mining stocks. Nearly all of them proved worthless. Oh, that's usually the story, you know. He was killed in an accident three years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. At the time of the accident, we had nothing. I went to live with my Aunt Emily in Longview. We had to take in boarders for a while. But Joe did leave me 5,000 shares in a gold mine in Uruguay. And it paid off, huh? Yes. Six months later, Joe's mine proved to be one of the richest in the world. It brings in more money every year than Aunt Emily and I could spend in three lifetimes. Paul, I I think we know each other well enough now to drop the Mrs. Kimberly, don't you? That suits me, Diane. But you don't know very much about me yet. Very little. All I know is you have a sister. Both of you come from San Francisco. And you're both very pleasant company. Well, that isn't enough. So, what do you say? Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I'll pick you up and and we'll explore Kaluka together, huh? The whole island, just the two of us. Oh, it sounds fascinating. shaping themselves very nicely for you, don't they, Paul? Even before Diane Kimberly told you her own story of her heavy mining interests, you were aware she was one of America's wealthiest young women. And you're sure she's more than ordinarily interested in you. That if you're careful, under the tropical skies and magic spell of Kaluka, you might marry her before you leave the island. 
Next day's trip around the island is followed by dinner and dancing. And three days later, with the help of a well-tipped native bellboy, you arrange for a guide to take you and Diane in a secret trip to a well-hidden spot in the mountains where the two of you are able to view the seldom-seen native religious ceremonies. You hear? We stop. We get out now. Paul, listen. And look at that bonfire. Ah, this good place to watch. You stay here. Yes, we'll stay here. Uh, good, good. No trouble, you stay here. I come back soon. Okay? Okay, okay. Remember, I come back soon. Is he leaving us here alone? Oh, we'll be all right. I am luck there by the fire. Now just watch. Very few people get to see this. I, I think, think this is known as Teura Itirai. I've read the story. You see that native girl dancing? Oh, yes, she's in charge. Well, if I recall the legend, she represents a girl who was in love with a Polynesian king. The king was in love with her, too, but he couldn't marry her without giving up his throne. So, out of her love for him, the girl threw herself into a volcano. Oh. Watching this, I can believe that legend. I've never seen anything so primitively beautiful. I almost wish I could stay here like this. Always. Like this. Hmm? With me beside you. Well, I... Look at me, Diane. Yes, Paul. Oh, we better call the guy and start back. Why? Because you're the most beautiful thing in the world. We stay here one more minute. You what? This isn't just a vacation romance. That it isn't the iron, the native drums, the music. Is... Is that what happened to you? No. I'm sure it wasn't, but I... I don't have to say it, Diane. I realize I don't have the right to ask you to marry me. What do you mean? You know what I mean. You've got all the money in the world. I have nothing except... Except a little I earn. Oh, I wasn't thinking of money. I have more than enough for both of us. I'd just like to be sure you meant what you said about loving me. You're not a child, Diane. Couldn't you tell? Don't you know? I think I do. Yes. I know. I know, darling. Enough ceremony? Are we uh, ready to go back now? Yes. We're ready, Helena. Yes, you are ready, aren't you, Paul? Ready to start planning your life with Diane. Your only worry is Jane. And you wish now you'd never brought her into the picture. But you're certain you can handle her. As you and Diane return to the Lorelei, and you walk Diane to her bungalow, you're certain the evening with Diane has been the most profitable evening you've ever spent. Well, darling, I guess this is good night. Good night, Paul. Luncheon tomorrow? No. I promised to spend the day with Aunt Emily at the beach, but I'll meet you for dinner. For sure, now. For sure. Good night, darling. Good night. What a performance. Almost as good as the one you put on for me when you talked me into this deal. What are you doing here? 
spying. How long did you expect to string me along? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about that doll from Texas. I've been paying the bills so you could romance her out of her diamond necklace. Keep your voice down. But you got a better idea. Why take the necklace when you can have her and all of her money? Not so loud. Why you? not? I hope she hears me. She should know what a heel you really are. I think I'll tell her anyway. Jane, if you go anywhere near Diane, I'll kill you. Now, for the next few days, you stay out of sight of both of us. You remember that. I'll remember. Precious. <laughs> Jane spying on you, seeing you kiss Diane and her angry jealousy was very upsetting, wasn't it, Paul? You decide to avoid her until your understanding with Diane is a little more definite. So next morning, after a restless night, you leave the hotel early and spend the day at the beach. And a little after six that evening, you knock on the door of Diane's bungalow and then smile as you see her coming up the gravel walk. You hurry forward to greet her. Oh, honey, honey, it's been a long day. I thought for a minute you'd forgotten our dinner date. I went over to the main lobby to get some cigarettes. I don't care where you were as long as you're here. You ready to leave? I I, I heard about a swell little spot we I'm could... dining with Aunt Emily, Paul. But last night you said... I said a lot of things last night. Foolish things. I guess the drums and the moon went to my head. But, Diane... There's we... no sense in talking about it, Paul. You see, Jane Gilkey... The lady you call your sister came to see me this morning. We had quite a talk. Oh, Diane, I can explain. I'm afraid not. Jane explained everything very clearly. Especially how you planned to make love to me and steal my necklace. She left this note for you. Note? Where is she? Gone. She took the four o'clock plane home. And now I'm saying goodbye, Paul. And thanks for the little ride. Paul, I'm going home. Even before I saw you with Diane last night, I had decided to call it quits. I've been thinking about it for several days, and now that I'm face to face with it, I cannot bring myself to go through with any part of this deal. In telling Diane, I believe I've done you a favor, too. Hope you can find a way to get back to the States. Jane. Don't worry, baby, I will. It looks like the end, doesn't it, Paul? Any hope of a romance with Diane is over. But you're still not ready to forget your plans for the necklace, are you? And you know you must do something quickly. You leave the hotel grounds and walk rapidly to the beach. You need a little time to think. And when you reach the waterfront, you enter a small cafe, patronized almost exclusively by men of the sea. And you walk straight to the bar. Scotch and water, double. Right. Uh, You mind if this one's on me, friend? Why should you buy me a drink? I just want it, that's all. Let me buy it, and then I'll tell you why I want it. Okay. Ah, uh, sure, it's okay. Hey, bartender, make mine the same as my friend here. They're on me. You got it? Got it. Look. Uh, now I'll tell you why I won't have a drink with you. Because I was supposed to have a drink with my pal, and we had a definite engagement. And he didn't show up, huh? <laughs> That's right, because he had to go to a party. Uh, uh, you know what I did? No, no, you tell me. I thought I... Well, I thought he might be stolen, you see. So what I did, I, I rode out to the panda two miles. Hey, you just got back about 20 minutes ago. The panda? Yeah, yeah, my pal's on the panda. She's a freighter. An old scow has been running between here and Hong Kong. Hey, you ever been to Hong Kong? No, no, I haven't. Here you are, man. Yeah, hey, thanks. It, it, uh, take it out of there and, and, and keep the change. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, well... Yeah, here, here's to you. Yeah, here's to you, too. And like I was saying, I row out to the panda and I climb the ladder, go aboard, and you know what? No, oh, what? My pal wasn't stolen at all. Not a soul aboard. Everybody going to a big party. Just, uh, just like 
my pal left word with the bartender. We... Yeah, well, maybe the party will break oh, up. Oh, not to midnight. Big party. Last night, the panda's pulling out at four in the morning. Uh, uh you, you say that panda goes to Hong Kong? He's been running between here and Hong Kong for the last ten years. It's pulling out at four in the morning. Yeah, that's what you said. So you rode out to the panda, huh? Why not? You got your own private robo? Oh, no, no. I just borrowed one. There's 50 of them along the road. To the panda, about two miles. You can't miss it. Only about four ships left in the harbor. The, the panda's the furthest. You have to row. It's uh, too far to swim. Oh, yeah. Yes, I guess it is. Your uh, pal wasn't there, though, huh? <laughs> Nobody there. We'll be there till midnight. It's a big party. Oh, I'll take your word for it. Huh? Bartender, another round. Right. You no, know, pal, you've just solved a problem for me. Yes, you're certain you see a solution, aren't you, Paul? You're certain you're going to get the Kimberly necklace, that you'll stop at nothing to get it. Once you have it, you'll row out to the panda and stow away until you're safely out at sea. By then, you're certain a diamond or two in the right hands will get you to Hong Kong where you're sure you could turn the necklace into cash more easily and with less embarrassing inquiry than you could in the United States. And you know you'll never again have the opportunity for almost certain escape that you have now. But first, you have two important details to attend to. You leave the cafe and hurry to the Lorelei Hotel. So you're leaving us too, Mr. Wilson. That's right, checking on. Sorry to see you go. When your sister left yesterday, she said she expected you to stay on for some time. Oh, yes. Well, I did intend to, but an old friend of mine came in unexpectedly yesterday. He wants me to go on a three-week fishing expedition with him. You have my bill ready now? It's only two days, Mr. Wilson. Your sister paid through Friday, remember? Oh, yes. So she did. I'd forgotten. Is there an air freight express office here in this building? Uh, not an office, but the porter can take care of anything you want to ship. Uh, right across the lobby. Where do you wish this luggage shipped, Mr. Wilson? The street address? Uh, Paul Wilson, uh, Crest Hotel, San Francisco Market. Hold till arrival, will you please? Yes, sir. You're certain now that you've erased any possible leads to your getaway, aren't you, Paul? Only one obstacle remains. The transfer of the necklace from Diane to you. And at a little after 11, you're quietly raising the rear window to Diane's darkened bungalow. The moonlight provides enough light for you to make your way to the bedroom, where Diane seems to be sleeping soundly. You reach the dresser... Find the necklace in a leather case. And then as you're about to slip it into your pocket, the sudden light almost blinds you. Drop it, Paul. Diane. <laughs> with a gun. It's a habit I got into when I was prospecting with my husband. <laughs> I haven't forgotten how to use it. So you'd better hand me that necklace, Paul. Oh, yes, whatever you say, Diane. Here. <laughs> Oh, my arm. Not till I get this gun. Oh, you'll never get away with this. Come on. Oh, yeah. Let go of me. Or I'll scream for help. No, you won't, baby. Oh. So long, baby. When you wake up, I'll be on the panda. Bound for Hong Kong. After Paul Wilson had successfully escaped from the island of Kaluga and climbed aboard the Panda, a formation of planes was streaking through the chill upper air with a special mission to perform. 
Suddenly, the leader dipped his wings. There she is, boys. Follow me at ten second intervals. Okay, Skipper. On your toes. I'm peeling off now. removed before we start a target practice? Yeah, I sure did, Skipper. Why? Well, there's a man on deck waving his arms. Hold your bombs. Not too late, Skipper. I let mine go. The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Days of Fear. Roseanne Wixon's suppressed anger increased in her fury as she sat in the law office of Ralph Hamilton, listening to the terms of her late father's will. Mixed with her bitterness was suspicion and a trace of fear. She was certain her father had been unduly influenced by Marla Wixon, her attractive and efficient stepmother, who had practically taken over the operation of the Wixon chain of restaurants a few months after her marriage to Jane Wixon, Roseanne's father. Though his sudden passing had been a great shock, Roseanne had accepted her stepmother's story of a heart attack without question. But now as attorney Ralph Hamilton finishes reading the will, the feeling of uneasiness you've known recently becomes something more, doesn't it, Roseanne? Yes. A conviction that your father's uh, heart attack was a convenient explanation of a far more sinister situation. Any questions, Roseanne? Several, Mr. Hamilton. When did my father give Marla the Wixen restaurants? Now, the actual transfer of title occurred about, uh, oh, three months before his death. Why did he do it? Well, he thought it best for everyone. Including me? I would say so. I'm sorry the will seems to have upset you so, Roseanne. Well, why wouldn't it upset me? Two weeks after his heart attack, I learn that he's given my stepmother our restaurant. And then he leaves me half the remainder of his estate. What remainder? Everything he had was tied up in those restaurants. Your father had a few other holdings, Roseanne. Yes. Enough to leave me, leave me $300 a month for the next eight months until my 21st birthday. Then I get half of the remainder of the estate. That means half of this house. Marla will see that you never want for anything, Roseanne. The restaurants are doing better than ever, and... And they belong to Marla. On top of practically disinheriting me for her... He's named her my guardian. Only until you're 21, Roseanne. You'll be away at college until then. I'm not going back to college. Of course you are, Roseanne. I promised your father. I didn't. But his greatest wish was for you to graduate. And look, dear, you're sort of mixed up. Eight months from now, when you graduate, you'll see things more clearly. You're right, Marla. On both counts, I am mixed up. And I will see things more clearly. That's a promise. As you leave Ralph Hamilton's office, you're certain something is wrong with the whole picture. You've nothing tangible to sustain you, but you're determined to investigate every detail of your father's final months. Your first visit is to Dr. Wells, the physician who attended your father. 
Oh, yes, Miss Wixon. We met briefly the day of your father's funeral, I believe. Yes, we did. That's why I'm here. I wanted to ask you a few things about my father. Doctor, how long had my father's heart been bad? I couldn't say, really. It was bad when Marla, Mrs. Wixon, that is, called me in. You called my father's wife by her first name? Well, yes, I did. I knew Marla in the East before either of us came out here. As a matter of fact, I've known her since we were both quite young. When I came out here, I naturally looked her up. And Marla called you in to attend my father? A year after they were married, as I recall. Just what are you getting at, Miss Wixon? Just information. You're absolutely certain my father's heart was bad. Of course I'm certain. Look here, Miss Wixon, are you questioning my professional ability? The autopsy verified your diagnosis? There was no call for an autopsy. Marla didn't want one. My signature as attending physician was all that was necessary. Dr. Wells' attitude was far from reassuring, wasn't it, Roseanne? You're more certain than ever your father's passing was due to other than natural causes. And you're certain that Marla, with her powers as guardian, will insist that you return to college immediately. But you've still time to see the chief of police and request an exhumation. I know something's wrong, Chief Branton. I know it. But we must have proof, Miss Wixon. I can understand your disappointment, even your resentment, but we can't take action on the basis of a disappointed, uh, not to say prejudiced But daughter. my father's heart was all right, I tell the you. The evidence doesn't bear that out. And Dr. Wells has been treating your father for more than a year. Mrs. Wixon was practically running the business. She made certain of that. I sympathize with your feelings, but... Well, you've been thinking about this so much, you're a little overwrought. Uh, would you mind a word of advice from me, Miss Wixon? Well... No. You're in your last year at college. Why don't you go back, finish up? Maybe by then something will happen to uh, clarify the picture. Uh, guess I haven't much choice, Mr. Branton. And something does happen to clarify the picture, doesn't it, Roseanne? Not immediately, no. Not for several months. But when it happens, all doubts of your stepmother's guilt vanish. And you're certain your father's uh, heart attack was murder. A few days before your graduation at midterm, you, you pass the newsstand and pick up a hometown paper. When you reach the society page, your own heart almost ceases to beat. Marla Wixon, wealthy restaurant owner, and Ralph Hamilton, well-known attorney, board plane for Honolulu on a two-month honeymoon trip. Following their marriage in Mexico yesterday... The full pattern is obvious, isn't it, Roseanne? Beautiful, youthful Marla, your middle-aged father, his chain of successful small-town restaurants, his handsome young attorney, both ably assisted by Dr. Wells, another of Marla's admirers. Yes, Marla's been very clever, but her two months honeymoon with Ralph Hamilton provides an opportunity for you to search for evidence, evidence you're certain exists. Immediately after your graduation, you return home, and the following day, you persuade Bob Gordon, Marla's general manager, to let you work in the main office so that you can learn the business. That afternoon, while Bob is busy dictating, you look through a file cabinet marked Marla Wixon, confidential. Marla, darling, the Wixon restaurants are now in your name. I had the final papers recorded this morning. They're all permanently and legally yours. Always Ralph. And it's dated April 10th, 1953. Three months before my father's heart attack. You were sure you'd find something like this, weren't you, Roseanne? And a few evenings later at home, you search Marla's room thoroughly. In a lower bureau drawer, carefully hidden under the paper lining, you find an envelope containing four capsules. Take only as directed, Dr. D.J. Wells. <laughs> Why do you wish 
wish these tablets analyzed, Miss Witchin. I want to know the basic ingredients. I'd rather not discuss my reasons. Oh, this is merely a drugstore. We have no facilities here for chemical analysis. Well, you can send them to a chemical laboratory in Los Angeles for me, can't you? Oh, yes, I suppose so. Oh, would you? Of course, if you insist. We should have the report within a week. Well, would you mail it to me at my home special delivery as soon as you get it? I'm very anxious to see it. Just as soon as I receive it. Thank you. Hello, Roseanne. Hey, Roseanne. Ma. Ma. Hello. Surprised to see you? Oh, yes, I, I thought you expected to be gone a couple of months. Well, Ralph has to be in court day after tomorrow. I see. Well, you sound disappointed that we're back. Oh, no, just surprised. Bob wrote us that you were working every day in the main office. Why? Yes, I was wondering about that myself, Roseanne. Well, I find the restaurant business very interesting. I've learned a lot. I'd like to keep on, if you don't mind. Why should I mind? If you're not going out this evening, Roseanne, I'd like to talk with you a few minutes. Ralph's working late at the office, and we won't be disturbed. All right, Marla. What do you want to talk about? Oh, I'll get it. And never mind, I will. I'm expecting a call. Suit yourself. As Marla leaves the living room... You hurry to the kitchen and carefully lift the receiver of the extension. That's right. Brady renewed Roseanne's insurance policies. Good. She's going to be in for a big surprise, isn't she? I'm afraid so. See you in a couple of hours, honey. Was that the call you expected? It was Ralph. Uh, tell me something, Roseanne. Why did you go to the chief of police last year? Talk a lot of nonsense about your father. Was it nonsense, Marla? Utter nonsense. Chief Branton thought so, too. He told you of my visit? Yes. And I found out some other things for myself. You went through my personal files at the office and removed a letter. That's true, Marla. And you searched my room, too? Yes, I did. Did you find what you were looking for? Perhaps. And what did you do with those capsules you found in the envelope? I'll tell you later, Marla. Maybe next week. You little idiot. What are you trying to do? Make the whole town think I'm a murderess. Uh, look, Roseanne... You're making yourself sick trying to convince yourself there was something wrong about your father's death. There wasn't. Believe me. I've told you I loved your father. He had the finest of medical care. Well? I'm listening, Marla. You're impossible, Rosanna. I'll see you at breakfast. Ralph and I had a long talk about you last night, Roseanne. He seems to think that if he were in your position, he might feel the way you do about things. Really? Yes. Uh, he thinks if we saw more of each other, became better acquainted, uh, things would clear up for all of us. Huh? How did he suggest we accomplish this family circle? Well, we're going skiing over the weekend. Uh, we'd both enjoy having you with us, truly. But I don't ski. Well... I don't either very well, but Ralph is an expert. He'll teach both of us. Why don't you come along, dear? Very well. I will. Good. We'll leave early Saturday morning. Good girl, Rosanne. Uh, You've got the makings of a good skier. Oh, thanks. But I seem awfully clumsy. I wish Marla could have seen you then. You went back to the lodge too soon. Oh, I still need a lot of practice. Well, this is a real good place for it. It's away from the regular ski runs. You can practice all you choose. You mean alone? Well, sure. Practice on those small slopes for a little while. I want to take the big hill. I'll come back up the rope toe. Now, you just try to keep your balance, that's all. Then we'll, um, we'll go over that ridge and try some other hills. But what if I fall? Or hit those trees? Oh, I'll be back soon. You won't have enough speed to go over to those trees. See you in a few minutes. Back so soon, Roseanne. Where's Ralph? He, he wanted to try the big hill. He left me in a spot sort of off the beaten path to practice. Where do you suppose the spot was? Why don't you tell me? about a hundred yards from a 500-foot precipice. You'd never know it was there until you got right to it. How I missed falling over it, I'll never know. Oh, how awful. I'm sure Ralph didn't know it was there. I'm sure of it. 
The last thing in the world he would want would be for something to happen to me. Now, please, Rosette. Forget it. I didn't fall, and that's all that matters. Well, there's Ralph now. Uh, here we are, Ralph, over here. What? Oh, what's the matter? Rosanne, I, when I got back from the rope, too, I didn't see you. I was afraid that you'd... Fallen over a precipice? I could have easily enough. It was only a hundred yards or so from where you left me. The precipice? I didn't know. There was, I, I thought you came up here rather often. Well, I do, but I seldom get away from the main drag. Oh, my dear child, you surely don't think that I... Wanted something to happen to me? Of course not, Ralph. Why would I ever think a thing like that? You'd better order some coffee, Ralph. You look as if you could use some. Now you're certain, aren't you, Roseanne? Certain that Ralph and Marla will stop at nothing to get you out of the way. Eliminate forever any possibility of an investigation into your late father's death. For the next few days, you watch every move you make. And then the Saturday before Easter, after a late afternoon shopping trip, on your way home, you run into Bob Gordon, Marla's assistant at the office. How about having dinner with me? I have a better idea. You come on home with me. Chloe, she's our cook, is fixing a special Easter dinner just for me. You're sure it'll be all right? Of course it will. Besides, I, I'd like to have you with me this evening. I, I sort of have the jitters. Well, come on in. Let's go. Love this drive home. Pretty, isn't it? Yeah, but these turns are sure tricky. There's never much traffic, and I like to swing around those turns. Makes the tires squeal. Personally, I'm not a speed demon like you, and I don't know this road or your car. Bob, look out! What happened? There was no light. I didn't see that roadblock until we were right on it. I had to either swerve into this hill or go over that cliff. Funny there were no lights. Lucky I swerved the other way. Real lucky. You don't know how lucky. You and Bob were surely fortunate. If he'd swerved the other way... That would have been the end of me, wouldn't it, Marla? Like at the ski lodge last week. I can't understand about the lanterns. Oh, look. Here comes the gardener with a couple of lanterns. Evening, folks. Oh, wait a minute, Si. Where did you get those lanterns? From the roadblock. The roadblock? Well, then, why do you have them up here? Mr. Ralph told me I did no such thing. That's a job with the highway department. I told you the lanterns weren't very bright, that I was going to report it to the highway patrol. I suggested you go down and brighten them up in the meantime. But you said... I said exactly what I just said. I guess you did, if you say so. But I sure thought you said to get them. Forget it, Si. Just hurry and put them back. Before someone gets killed. You're really frightened now, aren't you, Roseanne? All evening long, Marlon and Ralph hover near you so that you can't tell Bob of your fears. When he leaves, you say you have a headache and go to your room to escape their constant attention. You know the danger you're in, trapped in your own home. When you hear the phone ring, you open your bedroom door and listen. But, Doctor, even if you do have an emergency at the hospital, I want you to come over afterwards. We've got to do something about Roseanne right away. She just can't be handled any longer without your help. Well, I think you'd better come by tonight. She's liable to do anything. The sooner she's taken care of, the better. You lock and bolt your bedroom door. Go to your desk and write a letter to Chief of Police Branton, outlining in detail the reasons for your fears and suspicions. Place it behind your mirror. The night seems endless, and you don't even close your eyes. But at last, the Easter dawn breaks, and a little before eight, the front doorbell rings. You hurry to your window and see a special delivery messenger leaving by the front walk. Messenger. Yes, ma'am. Did you bring a special delivery letter? Yes, ma'am. For me? Roseanne Wixon? That's right. Good. Will you take this letter to the address on the envelope? Well, that depends. Here, catch. This ten spot should cover your trouble. It's a very important letter. It must be. I'll deliver it personally right away. Thank you. Yes? Marla sent up a breakfast tray for you, Roseanne. Well, I, 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 I'm dressing, Ralph. Okay. I'll take it back to the kitchen, keep it warm for you. We'll be in the dining room. I'll join you in a few minutes. Ralph? Yes? Wasn't that a special delivery messenger at the door just now? Yes. The letter was for me, wasn't it? 
I don't know. Marla signed for it. Took it to the living room. You can ask her about it when you come down. But you're not going to ask Marla about it, are you, Roseanne? You're not even going to see her or Ralph either if you can avoid it. You're certain that Dr. Wells' failure to arrive last night was due to his emergency call to the hospital. And you're sure your safety depends on your getting away before he arrives. Once outside, you'll go straight to the police. And this time, you're sure Chief Branton will take action. You throw a few things into an overnight bag, quietly open your door, walk softly downstairs, past the dining room where Ralph and Marla are talking in subdued tones across the breakfast table. Safely past them, you move quickly to the front door and quietly turn the knob. Dr. Wells. Good morning, Miss Wixon. I'm glad I got here before you left. But I, I'm leaving right now. Not until we have a little talk. Your stepmother wanted me to come by last night. Dr. Wells. Roseanne, I didn't hear you come down. Did you, Well, I'm leaving right now, Marla. Get away from that door, Dr. Wells. Now, look here, Roseanne. Take your hands off me. Roseanne, come back here. Get away from that window, you little... Oh, no, Roseanne, be quiet. You'd better quiet her, Doctor. She's almost hysterical. She's fainted. Out like a light. Or maybe it'll make things easier. Put her on the divan. For a moment after you open your eyes, you wonder where you are. Then as you recognize Dr. Wells bending over you, it all comes back to you. Marla telling the doctor to quiet you. His quick movement towards you. And then sudden, empty darkness. You start to scream and then recognize Police Chief Branton a few feet away. Oh, you... You got my letter, Chief. Yes. I got it. You feel better now, Roseanne? I, I'm all right, Doctor. She's okay, Marla. Good. Now listen to me for a few minutes, Roseanne. As I've told you before, I loved your father very much. He had the finest of medical care. During the last six months of his life, Dr. Wells saw him almost daily. I'm sure he did. Dr. Wells called in three other well-known heart specialists for consultation. The diagnosis was unanimous. Hmm? Why didn't you tell me this before? Well, neither Ralph nor I had the slightest idea you suspected us of complicity in your father's death. Until Chief Branton told us after our return from Honolulu. Since then, we've kept in constant touch with him. He knows everything that's happened, including the ski lodge and the missing lanterns at the roadblock. All right. Go on, Marla. That letter from Ralph that you took from my files confirming the transfer of the restaurants to me. I bought those restaurants from your father several months before we were married, Roseanne. But why? Because your father didn't want you to be worried with trying to run the business. He left the money in my care. You'll get it on your 21st birthday, as I promised him. That's just two weeks away. But why did... Your father asked me to tell you nothing until you were 21. But after what happened this morning, I decided to tell you immediately. Ralph and I also reinstated some endowment policies that were allowed to lapse. Those were the policies you... Oh, uh, and here's a special delivery letter that came for you a little while ago. Oh. Dear Miss Wixon, the chemical report you requested advises that the capsules involved were a harmless mixture of ingredients frequently prescribed for headaches. Cordially, R.W. Tunney. Those capsules were for me, Roseanne. Marla, I... I... I just don't know what to say. Don't say anything, Roseanne. Just forget the whole thing. I realize now what you've gone through. Happy Easter. The Whistler. The Whistler. The Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The Whistler will return in just a moment. First, this message from the United States Air Forces in Europe. Swimming can be fun. Swimming can also be deadly. 
With the summer months coming on, most of us here in Yusei will be doing a great deal of swimming in pools and lakes, as well as at the beaches throughout Europe. Therefore, it might be worth repeating the following rules of caution put out by the Yusei Ground Safety Office. First of all, learn to swim. Your base probably conducts swimming classes. If not, virtually every swimming area has an instructor. Never swim alone. Swim in a safe, authorized area. The presence of lifeguards usually indicates the place is safe for swimming. Before diving, make sure the water is deep enough and that there are no hidden objects. Recognize your limitations. Don't try to overswim your ability or condition. Wait at least an hour after eating before going into the water. Don't swim when overheated or tired. Don't depend upon an inflated tube to hold you up. It can slip away. Don't run or horseplay around pools. If in trouble in the water, try to remain calm. Assume the face-up floating position. If your boat capsizes, don't swim away from it. Most small craft will float, even when filled with water. If you think about swimming accidents you've heard of, chances are you'll find one or more of these rules were broken. Observe the rules, and you'll have a happy and safe summer. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Gentlemen from Oxford. On his return to America from Oxford University, Hugo Hayden expected to step into a top-level business position. But after several months, Hugo dwindled to almost nothing. Hugo began to wonder. And it does seem strange, doesn't it, Hugo? You're certain you have as much as most and more than many. Yet no one has even approached you with a type of proposition you consider on a par with your background and personality. And then one day an idea strikes you. You decide to gain fame and fortune by writing a novel. You put everything else aside, and to your own surprise, finish it in little more than four months' time. Next day, you take the manuscript to an old classmate, Michael Baldwin, president of Michael Baldwin Publishing Company. Three weeks later, you're back again. Well, come in, Hugo. Hello, Michael. How do you stand it in this stuffy place all day? It doesn't seem stuffy to me. I like it. You do? To each his own. Well, shall we? Yes, of course. Sit down. Sit down. Thank you. Well, what about Etched Light? Oh, yes. Your novel. Well, as you know, I read it very carefully. You certainly handle words brilliantly, Hugo. Thank you. Thank you. That leaves us with only one question. How much? Well, I don't think we... Well, I, I, I mean, I don't... You can't give me as much as I expect. Well, I can be reasonable... Uh, shall we start with a thousand dollar advance and work from there? Hugo, I was trying to say that I don't think we can possibly publish your novel. What did you say? It is, it's good, the first try, but brilliant words just aren't enough. You need real feeling, good characters, and something worth saying. And just where do you get off in five? I don't want to argue, Hugo. You have my opinion, and you're free to try another publishing house if you want That's to. precisely what I intend to do. All right. But for old time's sake, I think I'd better set you straight. You'll only make a fool of yourself if you submit that novel anywhere else. Believe me, Hugo, I'm telling you the truth. Good afternoon, Mr. Hayden. What will it be? I see the Footlights Club welcomes me with open arms. Glass of beer. Can you cover the purchase price? George, tell me, did you marry the boss's daughter... Or do you like torturing starving writers, miserable little actresses, and insane painters? I do my job. Your beer, and that'll be 20 cents, please. Uh, here you are. Excuse me, please. These bar stools are rather close together. Yeah, they don't waste a square inch. It's uh, also friendlier that way. Uh, bartender, martini, please. Yes, ma'am. You seem to be looking for someone. Just a familiar face or two. Oh? You're an old habitué of this bohemian den? I was. Many years ago. It's your martini, ma'am. I'll take care of it, George. Charge it to my account. You may have graduated from Oxford, Aiden, but as far as this place goes, you're just another guy. Thanks, George. That's all right. I'll pay. 
I'm sorry. I guess I better be shoving along. You don't have to. I understand. I've been broke, too. Tell me, are you really an Oxford man? Yeah. Yeah, man of letters, philosopher, raconteur, and bum. <laughs> what do you do? Not really. really. Novelist. Oh. Unpublished. You? Singer. Oh, must be good. Mm, I'm afraid not. Uh, what's your secret, then? That's real mink you're wearing. I'd rather not go into it. Oh. What about your name? Can you reveal that? Just Babs. Babs. Mm. Working in San Francisco? No, and please don't ask me where. All right, I won't. I, uh... I'd like to invite you to dinner in the theater afterwards, but as you know, my cash is low and my credit poor. Well, let me invite you, then. Oh, but I... Uh... I'd like to. And you can return the favor someday. When your ship comes in. Well, in that case, I accept gratefully. That cabby would slow down. We're almost at your hotel. Hugo, I want you to know that I enjoyed this evening very much. So did I, Babs. Tomorrow? I shouldn't. Uh, don't say no. All right, Hugo. Tomorrow. <laughs> morning. We've been walking around this park for hours. Have you minded? <laughs> no. No, not at all. But it is time I crossed the street and went inside the hotel. When will we see each other again? Not for a long time, I'm afraid. I'm leaving today. Well, you can't. I, I know I've only known you for two days, but I'm in love with you, Babs. Honestly, I've never felt this way before. I know. I know how you feel. I feel the same way. But it will fade. It has to. Why? Why does it have to? Remember, no questions from either of us. We promised. What shall I say? A meteor streaked across my sky and died? Yes. A meteor. Well, if it isn't Hugo Hayden, gentleman and scholar, where you been all night? To bet. Where else? I hope the llama loaned you an extra million. You're supposed to pay me Saturday. Six months back, rent, phone, and electric bill. The novel didn't sell, Judd. Oh. Now what? I don't know. I better think of something quick. I'm low in dough myself. Now look, Hugo, you don't have much of a chance around here with your bills and your reputation. Why don't you blow this town? Yeah. Maybe you're right. Tell me something, Judd. You cover the nightclub beat for that yellow sheet you work for. Ever come across a girl named Babs, a singer? Uh, what does she look like? Oh, long, dark hair, trim figure, small scar on her forehead below the hairline. Oh, Babs Wixton. Yeah, I know her. You did? Not much of a singer, but real nice to look at. I heard she hooked up with a nightclub outside of some small town a hundred miles or so down the coast. What town, do you remember? Wait a minute. Uh, Ocean View. Yeah, Ocean View, that's it. Uh, why? You're early, but... Hello, Babs. Your apartment's lovely. Mind if I come in? What are you doing here, Hugo? Chasing that meteor across the sky? I told you to forget about me. Take my advice. Get out of town before you get yourself killed. You stand there blinking foolishly, don't you, Hugo? Babs Wixton, the girl you were so certain was thinking of you as you were thinking of her, stands staring at you, cold and hard, threatening you with death. You just can't believe it, can you? Finally, you recover your wits and try to appear casual as you slip into an easy chair and light a cigarette. Now, 
What's this all about, Babs? I told you I don't want any questions. Please leave, Hugo. I've come a long way to see you. I think I deserve an explanation. I'll write to you. Hugo, please. Who's this man, Bert, you've been expecting? All right. You asked for it. Did you ever hear of Bert Morgan? You mean the big guy behind the rackets? Yes. The big guy behind the rackets. What's he to you? I sing at his club. He considers me his girl. Put that in the past tense. You're my girl from now on. You go to you know you don't know what you're talking about. Bert expects to marry me. I told him I would. If he even suspected I was interested in you, something would happen to you within a week. Did you ever read T. S. Eliot's poem? This is no time to quote poetry. Hugo, please listen to Fine. I'd like to meet the gentleman. Bert, so <laughs> I got something for you, baby. Here, put them in the vase of the piano. Oh, Bert, they're beautiful. I never saw so many roses at one time in my whole life. Hell, when old Bert does anything, he does it right. Who's this guy? Oh, Bert, this is Hugo Hayden, an old friend of mine. We went to school together when we were kids. Glad to meet you, Bert. Same here. Uh, Hugo's been away in England, studying at Oxford University. Oh, yeah, I heard of the place. What are you doing here in town, Mr. Hayden? Bert, he's just passing through. To where? Oh, L.A., maybe. Wherever I find a job. The fact is, I'm flat broke. Oh, that's too bad. What's your racket? Hugo's a writer. Mm, sounds interesting. And Babs tells me you're a pretty big man. You wouldn't need anyone, would you? A private secretary, maybe? <laughs> well, that might hand some of the boys a laugh at that. Me having an Oxford man doing odd jobs for me. You know how much schooling I had? I couldn't guess. I got kicked out in the sixth grade. Is that the secret of your success? Maybe. One thing for sure. I got plenty of sugar. Huh? You had me there. What about the job? I don't know. Is he, uh, is he all right, Babs? Yes. He's all right, Bert. Okay, you're on, Hayden. See me at the club first thing in the morning. Well, much obliged. Well, in that case, I'd better find a place to stay. I got you figured as a pretty Navy guy. I like Navy guys. But don't push it too far. Get me? Yeah. Yeah, Bert. I get you. <laughs> Yes, you understand him perfectly, don't you, Hugo? And you're certain he wouldn't hesitate to kill you if he knew your real reason for being in town. But as the weeks pass, you see Babs as often as possible. Try to persuade her to leave town with you, marry you, and gamble on the future. But while she risks Bert's jealous anger by continuing to see you secretly, she refuses to break off with him, and each meeting ends with her urging you to forget her. And then late one evening, while Bert is away on one of his frequent uh, business trips, you drop by Babs' apartment. Another martini? No, thanks. I... Babs, I'd like to talk to you. All right, Hugo. What about? About you and me. Haven't we been over that often enough? But we're in love. We can't keep away from each other. Not as long as we're in the same town, maybe. That's why I keep telling you to leave here and forget about me. Is, is that all I mean to you? Hugo, you forget. We can't just wish and have things the way we'd like them. We live in a real world, not a dream world. What's the real world? Bert Morgan, gangster? It's my real world. But it doesn't have to be. Listen, darling, why don't we just pick up and leave here? Get married and... And live on the royalties of your unpublished novel? I could get another job. Oh, Hugo, Hugo, you're sweet. And if I were 18, I'd probably listen to you. Even now, if you'd proven yourself as a writer or, or I was a top singer, I'd be willing to gamble. But I won't deliberately walk back into certain poverty because of a romantic feeling toward you. But a man like Bert Morgan... Don't sell Bert too short. I like him. He's good to me. And when we became engaged, he made me his sole heir. If anything ever happens to him, and in his business it can any time, I inherit his string of nightclubs. Everything he's got. I intend to marry him this summer. But Babs continues to see you at every opportunity, doesn't she, Hugo? And as the weeks pass, 
You're certain that sooner or later she'll see things your way. Break off her engagement to Bert Morgan. Then one night, the thing you've been dreading all these months happens. As you're about to start for Bab's apartment, your phone rings. Hello. Hugo, is that you? Yes. Oh, thank heavens you're still there. Don't come over tonight. Well, why not? I've been counting on you. We're being watched. Are you sure? Yes. Now, meet me tomorrow at the club. Be at my dressing room before the first show. We'll talk then. Goodbye, Hugo. Bye. <laughs> Me, Hugo. Look, Fabs, are you sure you're not imagining things? I never imagine things. Bert's chauffeur, Roy, was parked a half a block from my apartment all night last night. Then Bert knows about us. No. No, if he knew, you wouldn't be around. He only suspects. Then what are we waiting for? Let's, let's get in your car and leave all this. We'd never even make it to the state line. Why not? Roy has been on my heels all day. He has that limousine parked outside the club right now, watching and waiting. All right, I'll phone the police and demand protection. Protection? Protection for the rest of our lives? Not for me. I don't want to live that way. Well, it's suicide to stay here. Not for me, it isn't. For you. What do you mean? I mean we're finished, Hugo. I'm going to ask Bert to transfer you to another one of his clubs, down south. Babs carries out her threat, doesn't she, Hugo? He urges Bert to send you to another city. But strangely, Bert refuses. He explains that you've become very valuable to him. A day after an out-of-town trip, Bert himself unknowingly gives you the answer to your problem. Hello, Hugo. Hello, Bert. Anything happened while I was gone? Yeah, the man with a load of new slot machines came by. He wouldn't unload without your signature. I told him to come back in the afternoon. At all? Well, three or four phone messages. What kept you so long? Oh, that dumb Chief Martin hauled me at the headquarters for questioning this morning. Oh, about what? Somebody's trying to move in here with an extortion racket, and Martin figures I'm behind it. Extortion racket? Well, didn't you see it in the papers? I don't read the local paper. Well, here, take a look. Mm -hmm. Now you have the answer, don't you, Hugo? If Bert Morgan were out of the way, everything else would fall into place. Babs would not only marry you, but she'd also inherit Bert's nightclubs, cash, and everything he owned. And now you know the way to eliminate him, don't you? You carefully study the photograph of the ransom note appearing in the paper. It's made up of printed words cut from newspapers and magazines, pasted together on a sheet of plain paper. It takes you less than half an hour to cut the necessary words from some of your own magazines to compose a note of your own to Bert Morgan. If you want to live, give me five grand in small bills. Put them in a shoebox and leave it at the old shack near the railroad station. Don't go to the cops. That's a warning. X. <laughs> that does it. Then in the same way, you address an envelope to Bert. Walk to the post office. Slip your note into the mail slot. Next morning, when you arrive at the office, you find Bert pacing the floor talking with Police Chief Martin. Chief Martin, this murder note came in the morning mail, and I want to know what you're going to do about oh, it. Excuse me, am I interrupting anything? Now, come on in. You're Mr. Morgan's secretary? Correct, Chief. Hugo Hayden's the name. You're an Oxford man, I hear. Ah, right again. Forget him. I'm a taxpayer, and I want whoever's writing these idiotic extortion notes picked up and put away. Makes you kind of nervous when it's somebody out to get you for a change, huh, Bert? Oh, don't worry. We'll land him. We'll land them all. Sooner or later. The first step worked perfectly, didn't it, Hugo? The police now believe that Bert's life has been threatened by an unknown extortionist. And you're certain your next step will be equally effective. You compose another note. The words again cut from your magazine. I saw the police chief go into your club. I told you I'd kill you if you went to the law. I meant it. Stay away from the law. This is my last warning. You realize that you must move before the real extortionist is discovered, don't you, Hugo? And you decide on the following Tuesday night. 
The night when the cook and Roy, Bert's chauffeur and bodyguard, are off duty. You're sure Bert will be alone until he leaves the house to pick up baths sometime around midnight. At a little past 11, you slip another printed note into your coat pocket and walk rapidly to the house of Bert Morgan and press the doorbell. Who's there? It's me, Hugo. What's the matter, Hayden? I have to see you for a few minutes, Bert. Sure, sure. Come on. Now, well, what's on your mind, Hayden? Just one thing, Bert. This. Everything worked out exactly as you'd planned, didn't it, Hugo? The police found the extortion note you had planted next to Bert's body, as you were sure they would do. They request your presence at headquarters, ask a few routine questions, and allow you to return to your work. You hear nothing further from them, and within three weeks, you're running the club for Bath, the recognized owner since the reading of Bert's will. Then one morning, Police Chief Martin drops in to see you. Excuse me, Mr. Hayden. I want to see you for a minute. Uh, certainly, Chief Martin. Come in. What can I do for you? Well, I've got a right unpleasant job to do, I'm afraid. Oh, what's that? Arrest you for murder, Mr. Hayden. Murder? That's right. I got the report back from the crime laboratory down to the state capitol late yesterday. What report? The report that proves you killed Bert Morgan. You remember that note we found next to Bert's body? Yes. Well, at first, that note looked just like the other extortion notes people were receiving. We figured for a while the other extortionist killed Bert. Well, of course he did. Oh, no. No, he couldn't have. Oh, why not? Because Bert was the other extortionist. What? Oh, he put on a great act, especially with you, but we were pretty sure it was him all along. We found the papers and magazines he'd cut the words from in his briefcase and overnight bag. Bert. That's right. Now, getting back to the crime laboratory. They found out that the words in the notes that Bert got, including the one we found by his body, were all cut from four different magazines. The Literary Quarterly, a magazine called Modernistic Poetry, International Philosophy, and Newest Novel Review. So what? That doesn't prove anything. The local newsstands don't carry those magazines, Mr. Hayden. And there's only one person in town who subscribes to them. The killer of Bert Morgan. You, Mr. Hayden. <laughs> Join us again next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe presents The Whistler. This is Air Force Sergeant Don Cormay speaking. The Whistler has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. This is the American Forces Network, Europe. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The Whistler will return in just a moment. But first, this message from the United States Air Forces in Europe. Do you handle firearms as well as fireworks? If so, here are some rules of safety which you must follow if you expect to avoid trouble. Regard all firearms as being loaded. Know and use the safety devices of weapons. Never point a firearm at anything you don't intend to shoot. 
identify your target and ensure a clear field of fire before discharging a firearm. Be especially cautious when loading or unloading. Above all, never play tricks, games, quick draw, or engage in any other form of horseplay with a firearm. Obey these warnings and set a good example. As the saying goes, the life you save may be your own. And now, the Whistler's strange story. She wanted too much. Ruth Walker looked beautiful standing there by the window. Part of it was because Ruth knew how to look beautiful. And more important, when to look beautiful. Yes, you realized the importance of your appearance when you were very young, didn't you, Ruth? And now, at this rather late hour, your employer, Charles Verdon, seems especially susceptible to your wistful, seemingly innocent beauty. And as Charles smiles at you, and you smile in return, the relationship of employer and secretary seems to change. Here at your apartment, Charles seems to forget his jewelry store, his troubles at home, everything but his immediate surroundings. I think you'll find this just right, Charles. Oh, thanks, Ruth. I'm sure I will. Everything you do is just right. <laughs> you know, if you keep saying that, you might convince me, and then I'd be unbearable, darling. Here, drink your thing. Mm. Thanks. Good? Oh, perfect. <laughs> All right, Ruth. What day is it? Exactly five months ago, I walked into your jewelry store, asked for a job. There wasn't any until... Until I walked in and saw... And, and then, then there, there was. was. <laughs> <laughs> Five months ago today. Hmm? Mm, yes, Charles. It's all been wonderful. Only one thing missing. For me, anyway. Yes? Not having you always, darling. 365 days a year. Ruth? I thought we'd agreed not to discuss that. I, I'm sorry. It's just that I... Let's not spoil what we have, Ruth. There's no chains. Nothing holding either of us. Except that I've fallen in love with you. You'll get over it when you meet some nice young man. I won't. I don't even want to, ever. I'm still married, Ruth. My wife isn't well. I couldn't leave her after 20 years. The shock would be too much. I've asked nothing of you except the pleasure of your company from time to time. If you'd rather not see me anymore... Oh, please, Charles. I... I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said anything. No, Ruth, you really shouldn't have. I wish you hadn't. Well, Ruth. Even after five months, you're moving too fast, aren't you? Charles Verdon, your employer and friend, is still cautious, on guard. You're not even sure that you haven't spoiled your original plan. You're still wondering about it after Charles leaves, when... Fred, you shouldn't have come here like this. Easy, baby. I saw him leave. Close the door. I want to talk to you. It, it's late. Ah, relax. Sit down. All right, Fred, what's bothering you? When do we go to work on your boyfriend? You got enough on him right now for me to approach him? We have nothing on him so far. He's simply been friendly and kind. He's given you quite a few expensive doodads, hasn't he? Well... He's been up here plenty of times. That's enough for me. Besides, you can always exaggerate a little. You have before. Now, when do I go to see him and threaten to tell his wife? I'll tell you when. You told me that three months ago. Hey, you wouldn't have something else in your mind, would you? Like what? Like deciding to sell Mr. Big and getting a divorce and marrying him? Cutting me out of the deal? <laughs> That's ridiculous. He's old enough to be my father. That don't bother a lot of women. I'm as anxious for some of the verdant money as you are. All right, then figure out something. Well, I... I think I have. But it'll take a little nerve. I don't like the blackmail idea, Fred. It's too risky. Charles might not go for it either. You thought of a better idea? I think so. You can hold him up. Hold him up? Your boss? Yes, it'll be easy, Fred. Oh, you're out of your mind. Besides, I'm not interested in small change. You call 20 or 30,000 small change? You telling me he carries... Listen, Fred, tomorrow night Charles is taking some diamond rings and bracelets to the Blue Hills Hotel to show a woman customer from out of town, an older woman. She didn't want to come to the store, so Charles agreed to bring them over. Now, he's due there at 9 o'clock. Mm, he's a little reckless for a man of his age, isn't he? Not particularly. It's not unusual. He lives within five minutes' drive of the Blue Hills. He can carry them in a case in his inside pocket, and no one but me knows anything about it. Uh, I still don't like it. Well, you will when I tell you how I've worked it out. Let me get you a cup of coffee already. Here, Fred. Oh, what's the idea of going through my desk drawer? I'm not going through it. I'm looking for some cigarettes. Oh. 
Well, there's some in that box on the television set. Okay. Here's your coffee. Look, Fred, this is so simple a child could do it. Charles will get to the Blue Hills about nine. You'll park on the lot. Now, there's only one attendant. You can get in the car while he's in the hotel. Hide in the back seat. I'll give you a key to the car. Oh, you got a key to his car, hmm? Yes, he forgets and locks his keys in the car every now and then when he comes over, so he had an extra one made for me. The license number is Q248Y13. It's a big blue sedan. Yeah, I know the car. I've seen it parked outside this place often enough. Well, it was your idea that I'd get the job with Charles and play up to okay, him. Okay, okay. You know, you might have an idea at that. It's as foolproof as anything can be. It's worth a try, I guess. Tomorrow night, huh? Yes. Now, listen, Fred, all you have to remember... Fred reacted exactly as you hoped. And you're certain that after the holdup, Fred will be out of your life for many years at least, aren't you, Ruth? Next evening, you return home immediately after the store closes. Wait impatiently until 20 minutes before 9. Then leave your apartment. Speak pleasantly to the desk clerk in the lobby as you carefully explain you'll be back in a few minutes. You're certain Fred will do exactly as you've told him. And you know what you're going to do, too, don't you, Ruth? Yes, you know exactly what you're going to do. And you smile grimly as you enter the corner drugstore, walk quickly to the phone booth, and dial the police. Fourth Precinct Station, Sergeant Gray. There's going to be a hold-up about 9.30. Just a minute. Who's talking? It doesn't matter, and you needn't try to trace this call. I'm talking from a public phone. If you're interested, someone is planning to hold up Charles Verdon in his car at 9.30 on the parking lot of the Blue Hills Hotel. It's a blue sedan, license number Q248Y13. The hold-up man will be hiding in the car. Well, Ruth, it's done, isn't it? And you're certain that within the hour, you will be well rid of Fred Markle, your former sweetheart and partner in more than one shady activity. When you return to the apartment building, you chat idly for 20 minutes or so with the desk clerk. Then take the elevator to your apartment. As you're about to turn on your radio and perhaps hear a news flash of the holdup... Fred! What's the matter, pal? Looking at me like you surprised them still around? Well, no. no. Come in. I'm just surprised you got back so soon. I don't see how you had time. I didn't wait for him to park at the Blue Hills. What? I drove by his house about 8.30. His car was parked outside. What? It was dark, so I decided to take him before he went to the Blue Hills. You did? I parked and got in the back of his car okay. In about five minutes, Burden came out, got behind the wheel. Somebody saw you? No. Your boss got a little rough. He's a pretty big guy. It wasn't easy. And I... Well, I had to shoot him. Do you mean you killed him? Yeah, I'm afraid so. You fool. I told you not to get rough. Burden's the boy that got rough. What else could I do? It was him or me. Well, did you get the jewels? No, I didn't get the jewels. I barely got away as it was. What I want to know is who tipped him off. You think he was tipped off? Well, he acted like it. He had a gun. Sit down, Fred. I... I'll get you a drink. Then you can tell me all about it. Okay, I I can use one. Here, Fred. I told you last night the cigarettes are in that box on the TV set. That desk drawer seems to fascinate you. I wasn't looking for cigarettes this time, baby. I was looking for this gun of yours. Noticed it last night when I opened this drawer. Lucky for you, it's still here. What do you mean? I mean that gun your friend Verdon was carrying tonight looked a lot like this one. Good thing it's still here. I'd have figured you tipped him off and loaned him this gun to rub me out. See, where'd you get this gun? You never told me you had a rod. Charles gave it to me. Sometimes when he went out on deals like tonight, he asked me to go with him. Bodyguard, huh? Well, it's still here, so let me have my drink. We'll forget it. Yeah. What's the matter? Your hands are shaking. Oh, why wouldn't they be shaking after what you've just done to Charles of all the stupid, unnecessary... You really thought a lot of him, didn't you? Skip it. Point is, our plans are out the window, and if you're caught, you'll be faced with a charge of murder. We'll be faced with a charge of murder. Uh, if you think I'll take this rap alone, you're crazy. Wait a minute. That's yeah, a police siren. Coming this way. You better go, Fred, out the back way and, and get out of town for a while. What with? You know I'm down to nothing. Well, I, I can let you have 200 here. I cashed a check today. This will take you quite a distance and keep you for a couple of weeks. But for heaven's sake, get going. All right, but I'll be back, baby, in a couple of months. This 
Walker? Yes? I'm Lieutenant Wilson, homicide. I'm sorry to disturb you at this hour. What's wrong, Lieutenant? I'm afraid I have some bad news for you about your employer, Mr. Verdon. Mr. Verdon? Yes. I'll make it brief. There was an attempted holdup. He was killed. Mr. Verdon? Here. Get... You better sit down, Miss Walker. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, tell me, you were here all evening? Well, yes, except for about five minutes when I walked down to the drugstore. Mm -hmm. The desk clerk saw me leave and return. You may ask him if you like. Oh, no, that won't be necessary. Just a routine question. Well, I guess oh. that's all for now. Good night, Miss Walker. Good night, Lieutenant. You feel better after the officer leaves. But you're still nervous and upset, aren't you, Ruth? You're sure Fred has left town. And you're glad he's gone. But without Charles Verdon, a man you'd plan to marry or compromise, your future seems darkly uncertain. You're not even sure you'll be retained at the Verdon Jewelry Company, are you? Next day, the store is closed. But the following day, you return to work. And a week later, when you enter the private office, formerly occupied by your late employer... Good morning. Oh, oh excuse me, I didn't know. Well, that's quite all right. Come on in. You're Miss Walker, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm Bob Paxford, Mrs. Burden's nephew. Won't you sit down? Thank you. My aunt has asked me to uh, uh, sort of run the business for her, <laughs> at least for a while, until she can find someone capable of it. <laughs> I see. Uh, I wasn't very anxious to take it, but she and Uncle Charles have always been so nice to me, I thought I ought to give it a try, at least. Well, I'm sure you'll do very well. Oh, I'm afraid not. Unless I get a lot of help from a lot of you people here in the store. And that brings me to the, um, uh, big question. The big question? Yes. My aunt says Uncle Charles thought a great deal of you, your ability. Uh, she says he often remarked he didn't know how he got along before you became his personal secretary. <laughs> well, that's nice to hear, but I'm afraid it's more than I deserve. Oh, not according to Aunt Alice. Anyway, would you mind staying on as my secretary uh, till I uh, sort of get on to things? Why, no, I, I'll be glad to. Oh, good. Well, that's a big load off my mind. I, I'll i do my best to show my appreciation. Oh, don't worry about it, Mr. Pax, but I'm glad you offered me the position. I think I'm going to enjoy working with you. Yes, you're certain of it, aren't you, Ruth? Bob Paxford is handsome, young, wealthy, and single. You're careful in everything you do and say. And within a few days, you're certain Bob is almost as impressed as was his late uncle. It isn't long until he invites you to lunch. And this is followed by an invitation to the theater. Many other dates follow. And at the end of two months, you're certain he's in love with you. That it's only a question of time until he asks you to marry him. Then late one evening, Bob parks at a quiet spot on a high cliff overlooking the sea and turns on the car radio. I'm crazy about this little spot. It's the first place we ever stopped and parked, isn't it, Bob? Yeah. That's why I'm crazy about it, I guess. I'd like to believe that. You can. That's why I parked in this particular spot this particular evening. What's so particular about this evening, Mr. Baxter? Well, I had something sort of particular to say. Something I've always been wanting to say since the first time I saw you. Almost. Well? I love you, Ruth. I want you to marry me. Just like that? Just like that. No questions about who I am, my past, no boyfriends, anything? Nothing. I don't care who you were or what you did before you knew me. I don't even want to know. Well, how about it? Bob. Yes? Don't you think a gal could answer that question better if the guy who asked that... Had his arms around her. Oh, Ruth, darling. Fred. Yeah, Fred. Told you I'd be back in a couple of months. Well, even so, you didn't have to come here. Oh, why not? Mr. Paxford's gone for the evening. I watched him drive away ten minutes ago. Hey, what a ring you're wearing. Axford, give it to you, huh? Yes, he did. So you're going to marry him? 
Bill, why shouldn't I? Everything between you and me died a long time ago. Oh, relax. I don't blame you. I'm the last guy in the world to try to keep an old pal from marrying Doe. You won't believe it, but I happen to love him. Sure, I believe it. But I bet you wouldn't if he was broke, like uh, I am, for instance. What are you getting at, Fred? Oh, just a little loan for old time's sake. Nice, friendly blackmail. Hmm? How much? I'll go easy on you. Two thousand. I couldn't possibly raise that much, and you know it. Okay, I'm a reasonable guy. One thousand. Until when? Until never. Let me have a grand. You'll never hear from me again. You and Casanova can live happily ever after. That's a promise. All right, Fred. I, I'll take your word this time. Yeah, now you're being smart, baby. I'm out of your hair from now on. Honest. We'll take all my savings. I'll have to pawn my necklace. But meet me at the Mid City National Bank at ten thirty in the morning. I'll have it for you. Next morning, you give Fred the $1,000. And as the weeks pass, you hear nothing further from him. Then one day, when you and Bob attend the opening day of the races... And approaching the finish line, it's a baby star by a... Come on, baby star! Come on, baby star! Come on, baby star. And at the wire, it's baby star. Oh, Close in oh, and stand oh, the man. Oh, oh, oh. Well, we're sure picking him today, honey. Oh, we will this time. Well, the payoffs are being posted right now. Let's see, uh... Uh, 2280, 228 bucks. Oh, that's our fourth winner. Yeah, and I got two of those winners from a friend of mine. If you'll excuse me for a minute, honey, I think I'll go to the bar and see what he likes in the next place. Oh, run well, along. He's been a perfect picker so far. I won't be gone five minutes. A seat taken, lady? Now, these are reserved. Fred, you see... I know what I said, and I meant it. But I lost most of that grand in Nevada. Just let me have one more thousand, huh? You're crazy. Where do you think I'm going to get it? You've been doing okay today. I've been watching Paxford collect for you. You get away from here, Fred, before you ruin everything. Call me at my apartment around 11.30 tonight. No use in calling you, Ruth. I'll be there. Then come in through the rear entrance and walk up. I can't afford for you to be seen. Okay. I'll be seeing you. I got the answer, Ruthie. Homicide. What? Our bet in the next race. Homicide. Homicide, hmm? You know, I think that's a real hunch, darling. Homicide. Come on in, Fred. Did you come in the back way? I said I would, didn't I? You have the thousand? Yes, I have it. Good. Figured you'd decide to play it safe. I've got to play it safe, Fred. Okay, let's have it. And this is the last time, Ruth, on the level. All right, I'll get it for you. And you're right, Fred. This is the last time. What's the idea of the gun? You'll see. Now, you stay where you are. Who are you phoning? Switchboard downstairs. The clerk's testimony will be very helpful. Yes, clerk speaking. What is it, Miss Walker? Get me the police quickly. Hey, There's me... a burglar in my apartment. Help give me. Give me the phone. Stay away from me. Stay away from me. <laughs> Miss Walker. Miss Walker, are you all right? I... I'm all right. But I shot the man that forced his way into my apartment. I think I killed him. Do you feel well enough to talk now, Miss Walker? Yes, Lieutenant. I'm I'm all right. Have you ever seen this man before? Not before today. I saw him at the racetrack this afternoon. Oh? Well, uh, how did you happen to notice him? He kept looking at me. Did you have a uh, good day at the track, Miss Walker? What? Well, why, yes, very good. Mr. Paxford was with me. Uh-huh. This man saw you winning and followed you home. Oh, but I had dinner with Mr. Paxford after the races. It was after 11 when this man knocked on my door and forced his way in. He asked for money, didn't he? He demanded $1,000. I didn't think of it before, but that's just about what I won, Lieutenant. Yeah, he spotted you with the track, all right. Well, that wraps it up. Try to get a good night's rest. Forget the whole thing. And I've just killed a man? But you killed him in self-defense. He might have killed you, you know. Yes, but still... Forget I... it, Miss Walker. No one could possibly blame you for this. You haven't a thing to worry about, believe me. It was even easier than you thought it would be. The police didn't seem to doubt your story for a moment, did they? No, your timing was perfect. Phoning the desk clerk at just the right moment. Making certain he'd hear your frantic call for help. Your plea for the police. Then the shots. 
Now Fred Markle is out of your life forever. And you're certain there's nothing left to stop your marriage to wealthy Bob Paxford. You're certain, too, that the last link between you and the murder of Charles Verdon has been eliminated. Late the following morning, you're having coffee in your apartment when... Oh, good morning, Lieutenant. Well, come in. Well, sit down, won't you? I, uh... I brought your gun back, Miss Walker. My gun? I didn't know you had it. I took it when I left you last night. You were probably too upset to notice. Just normal routine. I see. You uh, always keep this revolver in your own personal possession, do you, Miss Walker? Except when I was with Mr. Verdon when he was carrying unusually valuable jewelry. I uh, I keep it there in the desk drawer. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I have it to me. I know. We looked that up. Ever loan it to anyone? I never... What's this all about, Lieutenant? I'm afraid I'm going to have to charge you with murder, Miss Walker. Murder? Well, last night you said it was self-defense. I'm not talking about last night. I'm talking about the murder of Charles Burden in that attempted holdup a few months ago. I wasn't anywhere near there. How could you possibly... The gun you used in Fred Marker last night, your gun, Miss Walker, is the same gun that killed Charles Burden. My gun? Ballistics prove it beyond a doubt. We couldn't have been. I got... Fred. Fred who? Fred Marker. That's the man you shot last night, isn't it? Yes, but, but he's the one who killed Mr. Verdon, Lieutenant. I, I, I remember now he was at my apartment the night before Mr. Verdon was killed. He opened the desk drawer where I kept the gun looking for cigarettes. That's when he took it. It had to be. And then the night he killed Charles, he opened the drawer again and, and put it back. I know he did. Now, wait a minute. Are you saying that Fred Markle came to see you at your apartment the night before Mr. Verdon was killed and again the following night after Mr. Verdon was killed? Yes, but I can explain that. Last you night see, you said you'd never seen him before. Well, I know, but I lied. I, I, I didn't want to get mixed up in anything, but Fred had been blackmailing me. So you killed I, Markle I, before he could get to young Bob Paxford to tell him about you and wreck your marriage, huh? Oh, no, no. Fred threatened to kill me last night. It's no go, Miss Walker. You're under arrest. But I didn't do it, I tell you. You'll I... have to tell that to the jury, Miss Walker. I'm afraid they'll never believe that your gun killed two different men you knew and that you were innocent in both killings. Join us again next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe presents The Whistler. This is Air Force Sergeant Don Cormay speaking. The Whistler has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. This is the American Forces Network, Europe. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, that Cutlerville affair. The night train from Los Angeles, shattering the stillness of the countryside, had just raced over the North River Bridge and now began to wind serpent-like along its mountain roadbed as David Talbot, sitting in the club car, folded the evening newspaper in his lap and looked at his watch. Then he leaned back in his chair and sighed a happy, contented sigh. But suddenly he tensed and stared as a slender, attractive blonde and her male companion entered the car quickly he picked up the newspaper again to shield his face. But he was too late. Dave! Uh, Dave Talbot, of all people. Uh, Nora! 
Well, this is a surprise. Well, imagine running into you again after all these years. How are you, Dave? Oh, just fine, Nora, fine. You're still looking as handsome as ever. Oh, you've never met my husband, Frank Williams. Frankie, this is Dave Talbot, an old friend. Yeah, well, how are you, Dave? Nice to know you. Mr. Williams? Yeah, <laughs> make that Frankie, huh? Everybody calls me Frank. Dave and I used to work for Jack Skelly years ago, darling. Skelly, huh? Private eye? That's right. Jack used to say that we were the best operatives he'd ever had. That's so. Well, what do you know? You, uh, you mind if we join you, Dave? No, please do. Oh, here you are, Nora. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is simply wonderful, Dave, running into you again. Simply wonderful. Buy a round of drinks, Frankie. You hadn't expected ever to see Nora again, had you, David? But now that you have, it's brought back a flood of memories. Unpleasant memories. Yes, your past has caught up with you, hasn't it? And you're disturbed, uneasy. Hardly listen to her as she goes on chatting about the uh, good old days when the two of you worked for Skelly's Detective Agency. Remember the time, Dave, that Skelly put us on the Cosgrove case? Cosgrove? You know, the old gentleman looking for his daughter. Surely you remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was a funny little guy, Frankie. But loaded with dough. That so? Mm-hmm. His wife had divorced him years before, taking their child out west with her. Somehow he lost track of them while he was in Mexico. What'd he do? Find a nice juicy gold mine? No. No, he and a partner had gone into some sort of business. Do you remember what it was, Dave? No. No, not exactly. He had his fingers in several different things. Anyway, Frankie, he came back with around 200 grand. Wanted to find his daughter so he could leave the money to her when he passed on. Oh, lucky gal. Maybe she wasn't. You see, we never did find her. Did we, Dave? No. No, we didn't. Too bad. Let me see. Anne Cosgrove would be about 25 or 26 by now. That was her name, wasn't it, David? Anne? Yeah, that's right, Anne. Uh, look, you two, I'm sorry to have to break away, but my stop is coming up. So, uh, Nora, Frankie, I guess I'll say goodbye. Oh, not goodbye, Dave. We'll all see one another again, won't we? Why, sure, sure. When you're over from the city, why, just give us a plot. We're in the Los Angeles phone book. Do that. Dave? Yes, of course I will, Nora. Of course. <laughs> Darling. Train was late. One whole minute. Well, never mind that. How have you been feeling? I'm better. Yes. Well, how'd the deal go? Oh, just fine. I sewed it up. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, darling, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I'm sort of proud of myself, the way I handled it. That property sale will net us a nice little commission. The company bought the entire seven acres? Uh-huh. Going to start building as soon as possible. You know, Cutlerville should be mighty proud of you, too. Well... It isn't every day a big chemical company decides to build a million-dollar plant. David, you've been doing wonderfully well in the few years you've been in the real estate business. Oh, just been lucky, I guess. No, darling, it's more than that. you worked hard. You like what you're doing. And people like you. Well, I like Cutlerville. And now, Mrs. Talbot, how about feeding your husband, huh? I'm famished. Of course, darling. Dinner's already in waiting. <laughs> Honey, you sure you don't need any help? No. I'll clear the things off the table. You go on in the den and relax. We'll have a coffee in there. Okay. Oh, who could that be? Expecting anyone to... Mrs. Chambers, to pick up some sewing I have for her. But she couldn't be this early. See who it is, David. I'll take the dishes into the kitchen. All right. Hello, Dave. Nora. Well, hiya, boy. Couldn't help noticing the town woman when you got off the train, darling. It was so friendly and warm, so after you left the train, we decided to get off, too. Who is it, darling? And what a charming little home. Cozy. Yes, real cozy. Yes, sir. Always thought I'd like to settle down in a nest like this someday. 
White picket fence out in front, roses around the door. You know, the works. Oh, this must be the little woman, eh? Hello. Oh, uh, darling, I'd like you to meet some old friends of mine, uh, Nora and Frank Williams. Hello, Anne. It is Anne, isn't it? Yes, that's right, Mrs. Williams. Oh, make that Nora. And this is Frankie. Well, hi. As I was telling Dave, we were just passing through. We decided to drop by and say hello. I hope we're not intruding. Oh, no, of course not. We were about to have our coffee in the den. Won't you join us? Well, fine, fine. Well, this way, Mr. Frankie. Ha <laughs> ha, that's the ticket, Anne. Yes, sir. Well, Dave, it looks like my hunch was right. Nora, what's the idea? We always were a pretty good private eye, Dave. That's the way I figured it. You not only found Ann Cosgrove, the missing heiress, but you married her, too. What you feared most has happened, hasn't it, David? That someday someone would learn the truth about your coming to Cutterville. And now Nora Williams, an old acquaintance, has guessed the reason. Knows why you married Anne. You're on edge and tense. Take little part in the conversation as you sit in the den with your wife Anne, Nora, and her husband Frank. Fortunately, Nora says nothing of your past association with Skelly's detective agency. Or of your part in the search launched by Anne's father in an effort to locate her. Finally, you breathe a sigh of relief as Frank gets to his feet and glances at his watch. Well, Nora, baby, if we're going to catch the train... Oh, is it that time already? Since we just got here. Must you rush off this soon? Yeah, afraid so. Got to be in Farmington by morning. Oh, really, Anne, darling? We'd love to stay, but we can't. Some other time, though. We've so much to chat about. Haven't we, David? Yeah, that's right, Nora. Oh, uh, Dave, you mind if I use your phone? I'd like to call a cab. Oh, don't bother. David will drive you down to the depot. No, yeah, wouldn't want to put you out, Dave. No trouble. Now, you three run along. I'm expecting my sewing woman, so I'd better stay here. I've so enjoyed meeting you, Nora. Frank? Mm, thank you, darling. And we've looked forward to the pleasure of meeting you for such a long time. Haven't we, Frank? Yeah, that's right, Nora, baby. We sure have. <laughs> You're being rather quiet, Dave. Am I? Well, he's probably got a lot on his mind, Nora. Puzzled, maybe. Well, I'm sort of puzzled myself, David. Here you are driving a three-year-old car, residing in a modest little cottage. Oh, it's nice enough, but hardly what I expected. I thought we'd find you living in style and keeping with that nice fat bank account. Yeah, that's right. How come, Dave? I just don't happen to have a nice fat bank account, that's all. Oh, David, come now. Anne's father died over a year ago. Surely you must have arranged for his lawyer to find her. No, I haven't arranged anything. Really? Tell me more. Sure, I'll tell you the whole story. I had a plan all worked out when I came to Cutlerville, and I carried it out. I met and married Anne Cosgrove in what the locals called a whirlwind courtship. Go on, David. This is interesting. And I figured I'd wait six months or so and then fix it so that Anne would learn about her father and the money. I just never got around to it. And why not? Because something went wrong with my fine plan within a few months of the marriage. Anne became ill, very ill, almost died. That's when I realized how much I really loved her. <laughs> oh, no. Did you hear that, Frankie? The man is telling us he fell in love with a girl. I don't expect you to believe me, Nora, but it's true. Anne is different from any girl I've ever met. The clinging vine, fragile, the helpless type. <laughs> they can really get their hooks into a man, can't they, Frankie? Yeah, well, not like you can, Nora. You're my kind. Oh, thank you, darling. Go on, David. Tell us more. I'm afraid there's nothing more to tell. Now, here's the depot. If you people are going to catch oh, a train... Oh, we've got a few minutes yet. Go on, David. Tell us how you began to feel like a heel about the whole thing. Marrying the little doll for her money. I felt exactly like a heel. Now you've done nothing about the inheritance, eh? Just tossed it out the window. All for love, huh? My, my, my. Well, now I've heard everything. You've heard the truth. Every word of it. Would Anne believe you? I think she would. But you're not certain, are you? I wonder how she'd react to that affair in Seattle you were mixed up in a few years ago. 
Remember, David? The little widow, Marsha? Marsha Winston? Uh Uh-huh. A skeleton in the lad's family closet, eh? Something I don't know about? The widow and David were engaged to be married, Frankie. They made a charming couple. Dave with his looks and the widow with her money. Now, of course, she had to have money. All Dave's girlfriends have money. Oh, naturally. It made her so attractive to David. And she was so smitten, she even went as far as to change her will. Leaving everything to Davy here, eh? Right. Just as David planned. Now, look, Nora. And then a terrible thing happened, Frankie. Before the wedding could take place, the widow accidentally took an overdose of sleeping pills. Died. Also according to plan, Dave? You know I had nothing to do with that, Nora. Well, the courts decided that way, but the newspaper seemed to feel that your acquittal was a travesty on justice. Yeah, got off the hook and got the cash, too, eh? Well, unfortunately, Dave didn't get a cent, Frankie. Uh, what? What's that? No. No, you see, it turned out that the widow had had a change of heart. A week before she died, she changed her will again. But Dave didn't know about that when she accidentally took the overdose of sleeping pills. Did you, Dave? You mean that Davy here didn't collect a single sou? Not one. After all that trouble? My, my, what a staggering blow. Makes an interesting story, doesn't it, Frankie? Oh, very. Uh, That must be our train, baby. Don't want to miss it. Thanks for the lift, Frankie. Yes, thanks for everything, Dave. Just forget it. I'll be seeing you. Yes, We'll be seeing you again. Real soon. You're uneasy, jittery in the days that follow, aren't you, David? Everything you told Nora is the truth, isn't it? But you wonder how your wife, Anne, would react to the story of the Seattle affair, especially the news stories of your trial. New stories you're sure Nora has. Stories you're certain would shatter Anne's belief in your integrity and sincerity. And shock her so severely, the strain might be too great. Fragile and sensitive, Anne's well on the road to recovery now, isn't she? And you don't want anything to interfere. Then as several weeks go by, and there's no word from Nora, you begin to breathe a lot easier. One afternoon, as you return home from the office, Anne comes down the walk to meet you. Well, hello, darling. I thought I'd close the office up early and... Anne, is something wrong? David, I've... I've just had a visitor. Oh? A Mr. Berwin. An attorney representing my father's estate. Your father? You remember I told you I hadn't seen him since I was a child? I didn't know where he was? Yes. Well, Mr. Berwin brought me the news, David. Father's dead. He died last year. Oh, Anne, honey, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I knew so very little about him, David. Somehow I wish I I could have seen him again. I know, darling. I'll have to go up to the city tomorrow. Mr. Berwin is anxious to settle things. It seems Father left a considerable amount of money. He's willed everything to me. It's all Nora's doing, isn't it, David? Yes. She's told Mr. Berwin of Anne's identity and whereabouts because she's anxious for you to share Anne's inheritance. And you know why. Yes. Nora has plans, hasn't she? Plans to blackmail you because of what she knows. The following day, you and Anne drive up to the lawyer's office in the city. The meeting is brief. The formalities over quickly. And as the two of you leave the office... David, is something wrong? Has it to do with the money? Uh. You're a wealthy woman, darling. The money is as much yours as it is mine. No, 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 it isn't that. It's yours, all yours. But, Dave... When we get back to Cutleville, I want you to open a separate account at the bank. Darling, that's silly. No, dear, it isn't. But I thought we could invest the money. And listen to me. If you want to invest, why don't you have a talk with Carter down at the bank? Let him handle the matter for you. But, David, I don't understand why. Because it's your money. I don't want any part of it. David. No, I... I... And I'm sorry, but please do as I ask. Won't you? Well, all right. If that's the way you want it. Yes, David, that's exactly the way you want it, isn't it? It's a move on your part to block Nora and her plans. 
to keep the money out of reach, and you're certain it'll work. You're certain of something else, too, aren't you? Yes. And it happens a few days later as you walk down Cutlerville's main street. A yellow David. convertible pulls up at the curb. David! Well, Nora, just passing through again? Yes, I dropped by to see Anne, and she informed me of her recent inheritance. I was thrilled, of course, weren't you? Did Anne tell you what she plans to do with the money? Oh, it seems that it's all tied up by some friend at the bank. He's going to see that she invests it properly. That's right. And I don't have a thing to do with it. Really? Your idea, of course. Did Anne say it was? No, but I have a hunch. How clever of you, David. Subtle. What does that mean? Well, it's like the affair in Seattle. Same thing all over again. And certain Anne's made out her will to you, leaving everything to you. The lawyer told you? No, Dave, Anne did. A few minutes ago. And now that you stand to inherit her money, I hope for your sake she doesn't take an overdose of sleeping pills. After that Seattle situation, it would look bad for you. Real bad. Nora isn't going to give up, is she, David? No, you're certain she's going to do something, and you're sure she'll give the matter some very careful thought before deciding what. The weeks go by. Tense, anxious weeks of waiting and wondering what Nora has planned. Then one night as you return home, you find the house in darkness. You remember that Anne had a late afternoon appointment at the doctor's office in the city. You settle down in the den with a highball and look through the evening paper. Hello. David, this is Sheriff Ames. Oh, yes. What is it, Sheriff? I'm phoning from the hospital, David. There's been an accident. An accident? Yes. It's, it's Anne. You better come right over. Now, take it easy, David. Well, but Forrester said she's had a close call, but she'll be all right. How did it happen, Sheriff? Where? Oh, on the old Crown Hill Road. Another car sideswiped hers. And lost control, ran off the bank. Some youngsters out on a hayride saw the whole thing happen. They claimed the other car ran Ann off the road deliberately. What? It just, just kept right on going. It was a yellow convertible. A yellow convertible, David. Yes. Nora Williams drives the yellow convertible, doesn't she? Inside the hospital room, you stand at Ann's bedside. Look down at her lying still and quiet. They've done this to her, haven't they, David? Nora and Frank. They tried to kill Anne because they felt certain that with her death, you would inherit everything and then pay them liberally for their silence. A rushing, seething wave of cold rage engulfs you. And you're trembling with wild hatred as you turn and hurry out of the hospital. Back at the house, you make up your mind. You decide to make certain neither Frank nor Nora will ever hurt Anne or anyone else again. You take the forty-five automatic out of your dresser drawer. Slip it into your pocket. Then you pick up the phone. Call the depot. Depot? Jess Sloan talking. Oh, Jess, this is Dave Talbot. Oh, hello, Mr. Talbot. Now, listen, Jess, I've got to get to Los Angeles right away. Isn't there a train due shortly? Yep. There's one due at 820. But it don't stop here unless I flag her down. At 820? I can just make it. Jess, flag it down, will you? Sure thing, Mr. Thomas. A moment later, you rush out of the house. The night air is cool and crisp. And as you walk the six blocks toward the depot, you're thinking things out more and more clearly now. The anger, the hatred you felt back at the hospital subsides a little as your thoughts turn to Anne. And you begin to realize that what you plan to do is all wrong. Even though you're sure you'll lose Anne's love, her belief in you, and your reputation and career in Cutlerville, if the story of your previous situation in Seattle is made public, you still can't take the law in your own hands, can you, David? No. You've got to give Anne the best protection you can, and you're sure that she'll suffer less in the long run from learning all about you than she would if you went into Los Angeles and took care of Nora and Frank in the manner you feel they deserve. You're only a short distance from the depot when you reach a decision. You turn into the main street and hurry into the sheriff's office. Well, David, 
What are you doing here? Sheriff, I'd like a word with you. Well, oh, sure. Have a chair, David. And tell me what's on your mind. You've made your decision, haven't you, David? Yes, you're going to tell the sheriff everything. Why you came to Cutlerville and married Anne. And you'll explain how later you changed your mind about the money. How Nora Williams forced your hand. How she tried to kill Anne. Yes, David. You've got to tell the whole story, even if it means losing Anne's love. It's a chance you have to take to protect her from any further harm. But before you can tell the sheriff anything, he's interrupted by a rather lengthy phone call. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Uh Uh-huh. All right, Sergeant, I'll be right over. I'm sorry, Dave, I'm going to have to leave. Something's happened. You remember that yellow convertible I was talking about? Oh, yes, of course. Well, he put out a bulletin on the car right after Ann's accident. That was a state trooper I was talking to. Spotted the car about 30 miles up the highway and chased it back in this direction. Oh, well, go on, sir. When the convertible reached Cutterville here, it left the main highway, turned up into the cliff road. If they were really hitting it up, the car skidded on a curve, crashed into the ravine. Oh? Uh-huh. Both occupants of the car were killed instantly. Killed? Mm-hmm. Both been identified as uh, Nora and Frank Williams. That's too bad. They'd probably be alive and in police custody by this time if they hadn't been forced off the main highway. What do you mean, forced off? Well, the main highway was blocked off at the depot here by the 820 train, waiting to pick up some passengers. The 820? I was the one who called just to have the train stopped. I I was the one. What? What's that, Dave? Nothing, sir. No? Well, I'll be back shortly, Dave, if you care to wait here. No. No, I guess I won't wait, Sheriff. What I wanted to tell you about, well, uh, it isn't important anymore. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Larry Dobkin, Michael Ann Barrett, Julie Dennis. Michael Ann Barrett, Julie Dennis, Eddie. Michael Ann Barrett, Julie Dennis, Eddie. Michael Ann Barrett. Now, Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Borrowed Future. The late afternoon sun, a red ball of fire, lingered on the rim of the distant mountain, and long shadows were creeping across the valley floor as Phil Hodges stood at the window of the construction company office, watched the approach of the car along the narrow, dusty roadway, leading up to the newly erected, almost completed dam. He had no way of knowing, of course, that because of that car, its occupant, a new and never-to-be-forgotten chapter in his life was about to be written. Hiya, fella. Well, what do you know? Jim. Jim Welch. How are you, Phil? (laughs) Say, this is a surprise. What what brings you around? Business, my boy. Stop by your rooming house over at Willow Pass. A doll told me I'd find you here, and oh, boy, what a doll. Yeah, that'll be Claudia. Hey, what's she doing in a hick town like Willow Pass? Don't tell me she runs a boarding house. Her mother does. Mrs. Hackett. Uh, w- w- wouldn't care to put in a good word for an old pal, would you? With Mrs. Hackett? Sure. <laughs> the doll, Buster. Never mind Mrs. Hackett. <laughs> hey, lay off. That's my territory. Oh. <laughs> so that's it, huh? I figured. You want to look around? See some of the old gang? Yeah, yeah. Later. Is Pop Dunnigan still your night watchman? Yeah, he sure is. 
that boss of yours around? No, Mr. Grayson's up in Portland on business. Won't be back for another week. Uh, so, uh, speaking of business, uh, can we go inside and talk? Sure. Come on. How you been doing, Jim? Ah, uh, so-so. I knew the going would be a little rough when I left this outfit. Started in business for myself, but I've managed. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. Made a lot of contacts, too, Phil. One of them's about to pay off big. Good, good. Yeah, I got a bid in on a job in Nevada. A big one. Chance I've been waiting for. I'm sure I can land it, only I'm going to have to get some heavy equipment. Swell. Remember old man Faraday? Yeah, sure. He's still in business? Yeah, the old warhouse is going to retire, though, and I can pick up a lot of his stuff for a song. Mm -hmm. How much? (laughs) 20,000. You're whistling quite a tune, pal. I can manage about half of it. I'm looking for a guy who can put up the rest. That's why I came to see you, Phil. Me? (laughs) You're kidding. Well, I'm sure I can get the financing elsewhere, but I wanted to give you a crack at it first. Well, thanks, Jim. I know you felt for a long time wanting to get out on your own. Remember how we used to talk about it in the old days? Yeah, just pipe dream. For me, at least. Doesn't have to be. I'm offering you a chance to come in with me. A partnership. A partnership? Yeah, be your own boss. I'm going to set up an office in San Francisco want you to take over. Look, Phil, no more long road trips, staying in crummy hotels, cheap food, hick town. Oh, stop. You're killing me. Listen, Jim, you know I'd go for it in a minute, only I just don't have the money. Well, couldn't you borrow it? Uh, how about that uncle of yours? Your old Uncle Fred. <laughs> Remember the last time I hit him for a few bucks? Well, sure, but that was to pay off a gambling debt. You've been a pretty steady boy since then. This time it's different. It's a chance for you to go into business for yourself. Yeah. You know, Jim, maybe you're right. He might come through. How soon would you need the money? Well, I'm on my way over to the coast. Should be passing back this way in a couple of days. All right, Jim. I'll see what I can do. It's the opportunity you've long been waiting for, isn't it, Phil? And more important, it would mean the end of the dull, boring field trip. Instead, you'd have a comfortable air-cooled office in the city. A fine apartment, good food, and good time. It's what you've always wanted, isn't it? That evening, you're at the boarding house, pacing back and forth along the front porch. Look, Phil, it's getting late. What are we going to the dance? Everybody's there by now. I told you, Claudia, as soon as I get that phone call. Mm, fine thing. Maybe I should have gone with Johnny when he asked me. Okay, maybe you should have. Or with Ralph, or Frank. Oh, or... darling, I really didn't mean that. I know there are a dozen guys in this town who'd fall all over themselves for a chance to take you out. Small time Romeo is not for me. You <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm... I'm sorry I barked at you like that, baby. You're just jittery about something, that's all. Phone call have anything to do with it? Has everything to do with it. Mm-hmm. Look, I was going to keep this as a surprise, but... Well, the call I'm expecting is from my uncle in San Francisco. Yeah. I phoned him earlier today, offered him a proposition. He said he'd think it over and let me know tonight. No, oh, so that's it. It's going to mean a lot to both of us, baby. You'd like to get out of this hick town, wouldn't you? Would I? You can have all the things you've always wanted. An apartment in the city, smart clothes, nightclubs. Uh Uh-oh, that could be Uncle Fred now. Wait here, baby. And keep your fingers crossed. Well, darling, what did he... We're in, baby. The old boy is going to let me have the money. He's sending me a check in the morning. You're on your way now, aren't you, Phil? Yes, the realization of a dream. And the future looks bright for you. For two days, you wait eagerly for your uncle's check. But it doesn't come. And then on the morning of the third day, Jim Welch returns from his trip to the coast and stops at the boarding house. Well, look, Phil, maybe the old gent changed his mind. No, no, he gave me his word, Jim. I know Uncle Fred. He'll send it. Okay, but I've got to get up to Medford and close that deal with Faraday. Look, I've been trying to get my uncle on the phone, but there's no answer. Can you give me till this afternoon? Sure. Sure, Phil. I'll check it at the hotel. I could use some shut eye. Trip to the coast pushed me. Call me when you get some word, huh? I will, Jim. Morning, darling. 
Hello, baby. I thought I heard you talking to somebody. Yeah, the fellow I was telling you about. Huh? Jim Welch. Oh. He asked for the money? Yeah. Mailman's been here and gone. No check. Oh, Phil. That was such a wonderful chance for both of us. Yeah. But there's nothing to do now but forget about it. But you can't forget about it. You can't let an opportunity like this slip by. The check's been delayed, that's all. Probably over at the main post office in Twin Falls right now. Yeah, I, I thought of that. I got to run over there anyway. I'll ask. Well, that's right. You have to drive over to the bank there, don't you? Yeah. Pick up the company payroll. Phil, when are you leaving for Twin Falls? In a few minutes. Why? Oh, thought I'd ride over with you. Well, sure. I just feel like going for a drive, and besides, I have an idea I'd like to talk over with you. Hello? Jim, this is Phil. Look, I'm phoning from Twin Falls. Leaving right away. I should be back in Willow Pass by 2 this afternoon. Wait for me. Yeah, you get the check from No, your... no, but I've made some other uh, uh, arrangements. I, I have the money for you, Jim. All of it. Ten grand. In cash. It's done, isn't it, Phil? You've uh, borrowed $10,000 of the company payroll money. Turned it over to your new partner, Jim Welsh. It was a risky move, but you're certain everything will work out. As soon as your uncle's check arrives, and you're certain it will, you'll replace the money you took from the Grayson Construction Company and be in the clear. But that evening, as you're having dinner with Claudia... Look, Phil... I thought this was supposed to be a celebration. Why so glum? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Something on your mind? Yeah. The payroll money. That's it, isn't it? I've been thinking about it all day. I wish I hadn't used it. What? I started regretting it the moment Jim left town. I shouldn't have touched it. Well, why not? Because it's wrong, that's why. Take it easy. You want the whole world to know. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, what are you worried about? You're going to pay it back, aren't you? When your uncle's check arrives? Yes. So you've only borrowed Grayson's 10000 for a little while, that's all. It still isn't right. Well, maybe not, but it's done. Yeah, yeah, it's done. Oh, look, darling. Maybe if I told Grayson... What? Explain why I did it. Bill, what's wrong with you? Are you out of your mind? What good would that do? I could make him understand. Oh, sure. Get a great big laugh over it. Now you've been dipping into the till, huh? Tut, tut, my boy. Help yourself any time. Feel free. Oh, come off it, Phil. Anyway, you can't tell Grayson. He's in Portland. So he'll be back in a few days. And by that time, this whole thing will be cleared up. Your uncle's check will surely arrive tomorrow. You'll replace Grayson's money, and that'll be the end of it. Uh, I, I hope it will be. Oh, come on, Phil. Snap out of it. Things will work out. You'll see. As soon as you get your uncle's check, you'll feel different about all of it. Yes, perhaps Claudia is right again, Phil. But the following morning, you're shocked to discover there's still no check in the mail. Something's wrong, Phil. Very wrong. And when you reach the construction company office, you're in for another shock. Hello, Phil. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Grayson. I, I thought you were still up in Portland. Yeah, well, I finished my affairs a little earlier than I expected. Say, I phoned you yesterday, but the boys said that you'd gone over to Twin Falls to pick up the payroll money. Uh, yes, that, that's right. Well, how's everything going? Oh, fine. Just just fine, sir. Oh, good. I think we'll be out of here by the end of this week, Phil. Uh, I, I'm sure of it. <laughs> uh, excellent. Right on schedule, huh? You really know how to run an outfit, my boy. Mm. Thanks. Well, I think I'll run up to the dam and have a look around. See you later, eh, Phil? Hey, sure, Mr. Grayson. Sure. You stand there trembling, don't you, Phil? Watch Grayson as he walks out of the office, starts up toward the dam. 
only the two of you have access to the company safe. And if, for some reason or other, he has occasion to look into the safe, find the $10,000 missing, you're going to be in for real trouble, aren't you? Quickly, you reach for the telephone. Put in another call to your uncle in San Francisco. You're relieved when finally you hear his housekeeper's voice at the other end of the line. Hello, Mr. Hodges' residence. Miss Kelly, this is Phil. Oh, Mr. Philip, I'm so glad you called. Look, I've been trying to reach Uncle Fred for days. There's been no answer. I know, I've been away for a few days visiting my sister. Rushed back as soon as I heard about the accident. Accident? Your uncle, Mr. Philip. He was in an automobile crash three nights ago. What? Happened the same night he talked with you on the telephone, about an hour later. Oh, no. No. Well, now you needn't worry, Mr. Phillips. Though his condition's serious, the doctor says you'll pull through. Of course, they're not allowing visitors yet. All right, Phil, all right. So it's my fault. I didn't say that, Claudia. I just wish I hadn't listened to you, that's all. I'm in a real jam. Well, I would have suggested you use the payroll money. Only you were so certain your uncle would send that check. Sure, sure. But how was I to know he'd get himself banged up in a car crash? I don't suppose there's a chance he did mail that check. Before the accident, I mean. If he had, I'd have gotten it by now. No, let's face it, Claudia, the check isn't coming. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I just don't know. But we just can't spend the rest of the night driving around going nowhere. Maybe we should be going somewhere. What do you mean? Just keep going. As far away from Willow Pass as possible. Run away? What else can I do? Tomorrow is payday. What's Grayson going to say and do when he opens the safe and finds $10,000 missing? I've got to leave. Well, then you'll have to leave alone, Phil. You're a nice, great, big, handsome boy. I like you. But no running from the law for me. Hey, wait a minute, Phil. This pal of yours, Jim Welch. He has the money you gave him, hasn't he? Sure, but he's up in Medford. Well, call him up. Tell him the whole deal's off. You want the money back. We can drive up there in a few hours and pick it up. Don't you think I'd follow that? I don't know where he's staying. Besides, he's probably closed the deal by now. Maybe, maybe not. Doesn't Jim have any friends around there? People he might be staying with? Oh, uh, I don't know. We were on a job there a couple of years ago and... Hey, wait a minute. You think of someone? Yeah. One of the boys in our outfit married a gal in Medford stayed on when we finished the job. Ben Adams. Yeah. Jim's sure to look him up. Okay, so it's worth a try. Well, there's a signal station up ahead. You can call him from there. Hello? Jim, this is Phil. Well, hiya, boy. Hey, how'd you know where to reach me? I just talked with Ben Adams. He told me where you were staying. Look, did you close the deal with Faraday? Yep, an hour ago, all signed and sealed. We'll get it unsealed. I want out, Jim. I've changed my mind. Wait, wait a minute. What's wrong? I can't explain it now. I want that money back, Jim. All of it. Hold on, Phil. It's too late. I told you I closed the deal with Faraday. And I told you I got to have the money back. That's impossible. I can't do that. You got to. Tell Faraday the deal's off. Tell him anything. Look, I don't know what this is all about, but I'm sorry, Phil. The, the deal is set, closed, and there isn't a thing I can do. Uh, Phil... Hello? Hello, Phil. Do you hear me? Phil, do you... What's on your mind, Phil? You've been pretty quiet since we left that gas station back there. I've been thinking things out, Claudia. i got to find a way to gain time to get that money from my uncle. And I think I figured it out. <laughs> Funny. Hadn't occurred to me before. You better tell me all about it. I'll tell you all the details later. Oh, your mother is still up. Yeah. You run on in the house like a good girl and keep her company, huh? Well, aren't you coming in? No. I have a, an errand to do. But Phil, what are you up to? Never mind. Phil, tell me. All right. It's very simple. Somebody is going to rob the safe at the office. What? I'll set the whole thing up. Make it look like a robber took that money. What about the night watchman, Pop Dunnigan? He'll be around, won't he? Probably in the office. So how do you handle him? Oh, I have to get him out of the way. Oh, now, wait a minute. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to hurt him. I'll slip up from behind, tap him easy, just knock him out for a little while. Think you can get away with it? i got to take the chance. It'll give me the time I need to repay that money. I don't follow. 
In a week or so, I'll drive down to San Francisco, get the check from Uncle Fred. I'll cash it there and bring the money back. And then what? You intend to simply return the money to the safe? Look, that one. No, I'll figure something else. Arrange for the money to be found somewhere. A, a locker at the bus depot, maybe. An anonymous phone call to the police. It'll work, Claudia. You no, know, it sounds crazy enough to... You're really worried about what you've done, aren't you, Phil? Taking Grayson's money. Yes. I wish I hadn't done it. But he'll get it back every cent. And I'll be out of this mess. Okay. I hope you know what you're doing. Ten minutes later, you park your car in the shadows not far from the construction company office and hurry toward the small building. You press back against the wall, tip over a gas tin to attract Pop's attention. There's only one thing that worries you, Phil. Pop Dunnigan is an old man, and you must be careful not to hit him too hard. A thousand confused thoughts race through your mind. Your knees are trembling, your heart pounds furiously as Pop comes out of the office. Who's that? Your hand tightens around the wrench. But suddenly you're unable to move, to think, to do anything but stare. And then Pop turns towards you. Hello, Pop. Oh, hello, Mr. Hodgins. What you doing around here this time of night? I, uh, I had an important matter to attend to. Uh, forgot it this afternoon when I left. What you got in your hand? Oh, well, this. Uh, a wrench. I, I, I found it on the ground over there. Somebody's getting kind of careless. I'll take it, Mr. Hodges. Yeah. Here you are. You couldn't do it, could you, Phil? At the last split second, you discovered you couldn't bring the wrench down on the back of the old man's head. Inside the office, you sit at your desk, pretend to work, cast sidelong glances at Pop, sitting across the room reading his paper. You've still time to carry out your plan. But it would mean hitting old Pop. And you just can't do it, can you, Phil? Hey, you're really putting in some overtime, Mr. Hodges. Uh, what, what time is it? Almost 2.30. All through? Yeah. Through? Yeah, Pop. I'm all through. Finished. Good night. Phil, mister? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm sure glad you dropped in. Don't get many customers this time, right? You uh, heading on a trip? No. Coming back, maybe? I uh, just sort of been driving around, that's all. Oh. Good problems. A problem. Well, things have a way of working themselves out. This problem. A woman, maybe? She's part of it. Just walk away from it, pal. There are some other things you can't walk away from. You just have to face the music. Is that what you're going to do? Yeah. Yeah, that's... That's what I'm going to do. Face the music. It's all over, isn't it, Phil? You've made up your mind to that. You've decided to return to Willow Pass. Tell Mr. Grayson everything. How you uh, borrowed the $10,000 from the company safe and gave it to Jim Welch. It's early morning when you arrive at the construction office. The work crews are making ready to move on up the hill to the dam. Oh, good morning, Phil. Morning, Mr. Grayson. Hey, there was a phone call for you a few minutes ago. A woman who runs the boarding house, uh, Mrs. Hackett. Oh? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you were here. She seemed concerned because you hadn't been to the boarding house all night. Well, I guess you better get the money out of the safe, Phil. Start in the payroll, huh? Uh, Mr. Grayson, I, I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, sure, sure. But, uh, look, can it wait five or ten minutes? I want to catch Thorgerson's crew before they go on up to the dam. But, Mr. Grayson... Ah, no, I, I won't be long. Yes? Hello? That you, Phil? Jim? 
I'm on my way back to San Francisco. Just wanted to make sure you got the package I left for you. The package? Yeah, I stopped at your rooming house around 6 this morning, but you hadn't been in all night, so I took it up to your office. Gave it to Pop Dunnigan. He said he'd put it in your desk. Yeah. Yeah, there's a package here. But you sounded so worried on the phone last night, and, well, I got to thinking, so... I went back to Faraday and made another deal. <laughs> what do you know, Phil? The old war horse isn't retiring after all. He's my new partner. You mean... Wait a minute. The money. Yeah, your ten grand. You wanted it back, didn't you? Oh, I sure did. Hey, what was all the panic about? I'll... I'll tell you some other time, Jim. Right now, I, I have to make up the payroll. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Les Tremaine, Gene Bates, Hi Aberback, Bill Boucher, and Britt Wood. The Whistler, directed by George W. Allen, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is produced under the supervision of Ed Bloodworth and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This evening's story was by Adrian Jean Doe. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Whistler has just brought you another of his strange tales. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. I'm the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Traveling Companion. Standing in the lobby of the Hotel Continental in Pisa, Italy, with a group of some 20 other tourists, Clara Marshall, age 25, and attractive enough to draw attention anywhere, was smiling quietly to herself, and with good reason. Yes, Clara, for the past eight months you've handled things perfectly, haven't you? Wanted by the Chicago police for your part in a series of minor swindles, you slipped out of town and covered your track so successfully they lost all trace of you. Some weeks later, in a Los Angeles bookstore, you casually made the acquaintance of elderly, wealthy Harriet Wilson and took full advantage of this chance meeting, didn't you, Clara? Yes. Now you're not only her trusted employee, 
but her secretary and traveling companion on a tour of Europe and waiting on a foggy Italian morning to accompany her on a guided tour of Pisa. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm forced to cancel today's tour. Too foggy. Oh, but Guy, the streetcars are running. You needn't drive the bus. Sorry, Miss Marshall, it would be impossible to take a group this size through the foggy city on streetcars. Too dangerous. But we don't plan to come through this city again, and Miss Wilson had so counted on seeing the Leaning Tower. Isn't that right, Harriet? Well, yes, I had looked forward to but it. You know we're leaving this afternoon. Please, Guide, won't you reconsider? Uh, Miss Marshall, in the interest of the group as a whole, I... Uh, I am sorry, really. Oh, really, I don't... Why? Pardon me, miss. What? I couldn't help overhearing. It seems a shame that fellow American visitors who are so interested in seeing historical places should not see them. <laughs> it looks as if not much is going to be done about it. Well, that. I was just going to suggest... Oh? ...that I'd be glad to take you to the Leaning Tower. It really isn't far from here. Oh, would you? Well, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it, Harriet? Well, uh, why, yes, it would. Good. Let's lose no time, then. This way, ladies. <laughs> You smile, don't you, Clara? Leaving the hotel and boarding the crowded streetcar. As you steal a glance at the stranger, you notice that he's studying you, too, very closely, as if memorizing every detail of your appearance. And Harriet is quite excited about the whole adventure as the car rattles along the street. Clara, just think about going through the streets of Pisa in the fog and on a streetcar. <laughs> it's so thrilling. <laughs> it was nice of you to offer to escort us. It means a lot to see places we've seen in pictures so often. I want to go to the top of the tower and look down. Yes, they say that's where Galileo proved his theory about weights falling at the same rate of speed, you know. Oh, yes. <laughs> I just love to try dropping something. <laughs> uh, ladies, I'm sorry, but I won't be able to take you to the tower today after after all. What? Well, you said it wasn't far. I'm sorry, but it's unavoidable. Come, let's get off at the next stop. It seems we have no choice. And in this fog. You'll be all right. Get off at the third stop in the returning car, and you'll be right at your hotel. We'll remember. I'm sorry. It's just that I have a most important engagement, and it's later than I realized. It just isn't my day. Thanks anyway, Mr. Hungate. Raymond Hungate. I'll try and see you later. Goodbye for now. <laughs> As the three of you step from the streetcar, Raymond slips something into your pocket and quickly puts his fingers to his lips to silence you, and suddenly he's gone into the fog. As you look around, you notice two men who left the streetcar just before it pulled away hurry off in the same direction Raymond took. You feel sure they're following him, don't you, Clara? Harriet seems concerned only with watching for a returning car and is relieved as it appears, and you're soon back at your hotel. Oh, at last. Oh, this hotel room looks good to me. My, now, why would he offer to take us to the Leaning Tower and then deliberately leave us stranded in the middle of this strange city in the fog? Well, I believe he meant to take us, but something he couldn't help caused him to leave. Mm, perhaps you're right. <laughs> now that we're back safe and sound, I'll admit it was a thrill. And he was nice looking, wasn't he? <laughs> yes. And it seemed he was going to be an interesting guide. Now, he was an American, but seemed to know his way around here in this foreign land. I wonder if... Harriet, I believe it's best not to discuss this with the others on the tour. Oh? Uh, well, maybe you're right. Well, they'd have the laugh on us if they knew the details. Yes. Let's admit we didn't get to the tower, but forget the rest. Hmm? You're right, my dear. Hmm. Well... I wonder what the others are doing now. Oh, probably playing bridge. Why don't you go down and see if they have enough for full tables? I believe I will. Uh, won't you come along? Uh, not right now. But let's keep this our secret. Hmm? Uh -huh. Between you and me, I believe we'll see Mr. Raymond Hungate again. Oh, I do hope so. <laughs> My, isn't this romantic? Wouldn't it be something if you met your future husband here in Italy? On a foggy day. Oh, Harriet, you're going overboard. <laughs> it's time you joined your friends. All right, but I like the idea anyway. <laughs> You'll join us soon, dear. In a little while, Harriet. Mm -hmm. Yes.
You feel relieved when the door finally closes, don't you, Clara? And you cross the room quickly. Get Raymond's package from the pocket of your coat. You unwrap it, open the box carefully, and gasp as you view its contents. A necklace, a diamond necklace. You're startled, aren't you, Clara? And you wonder if the diamonds of the necklace are real. It seems unlikely that a perfect stranger would entrust you with something so valuable. But after the tour moves on to the city of Rome, you manage to leave Harriet for a short time and seek out a reliable-looking jewelry store. I want to see if the clasp on a necklace is all right. I'll be glad to help you, miss. Now, uh, here it is. Oh, my, how very beautiful. It's so well-designed. Worth many thousands of American dollars, eh? I suppose. <laughs> ah, but it is, miss. I know. A very valuable piece. Uh, the clasps seem all right? Mm, one moment. Uh, yes. Yes, it seems in perfect order. But it is well to be careful. Oh, thank you so much. You see, my, uh, my aunt wanted to wear it tomorrow evening, but wanted to be sure that it would be safe. I understand. Um, could I show you anything while you're here? <laughs> Not now, thank you. But what you tell me about the necklace is most reassuring. Well, Clara, events have conspired to bring you luck, haven't they? Unexpectedly, a man named Raymond Hungate, escorting you to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, suddenly found a reason to leave you but left a valuable diamond necklace in your coat pocket. Now in Rome, you find yourself thinking about the two determined-looking men who were following Mr. Hungate. And you realize that if, by chance, they caught up with him, the necklace will remain yours. But shortly after leaving the jewelry shop, you suddenly become aware of someone walking at your side. You look up quickly and recognize the man you met in Pisa, Raymond Hungate. He speaks low as you near a small basement restaurant. Would you like some refreshments, Miss Marshall? After all, we have something important to discuss. All right. I think this should prove an interesting place. Table for two, please. This way. Now, how about that one back in the corner? Very good, sir. Oh, thank you. For now, we'd uh, just like some coffee. Perhaps something else later on. Very good, sir. Well, have you been enjoying your trip since you were so rudely left in the fog in Pisa? Yes, but no thanks to you. I apologize. It was unforgivable to leave you stranded, but believe me, it was most necessary. So I gathered that your two friends that followed you off the streetcar catch up with you. No. No, thanks to the fog, they didn't. And I want to know, I, I appreciate your cooperation. Oh, think nothing of it. Uh, your coffee, sir. Thank you. Uh, were you satisfied that the diamonds were real? I noticed you were having the jeweler look the necklace over. Just making sure the clasp was in good condition. You would have felt rather foolish if the clerk had recognized that necklace as a stolen one. Is it? Could be. Or hadn't you guessed? But if you had known, you would, of course, have taken it to the authorities. No. No, I've thought about it, and then I thought about something else. Uh -huh. How would you like a partner? Did you say, partner? Yes, don't be so overwhelmed. You already have one, you know. Otherwise, I'd have turned the necklace over to the police. You're right. You see, it could be a, a convenient setup. If you're interested in stolen or black market jewelry, you'll sooner or later be suspected. Perhaps your room and luggage searched. Eventually, you'll be caught. Yes, that isn't a very pretty picture, is I'm it? I'm serious. If someone were to take the jewels and keep them for you, someone who wouldn't be suspected, someone, say, who's just uh, on a sightseeing tour, wouldn't your work be easier? I'm beginning to see your point. However, what about your traveling companion? She seems quite a, a chatterbox. Harriet? <laughs> She'd be an asset. She's already set up a storybook romance for us. I'm sure she'd keep quiet about our seeing one another from time to time. Perhaps, given the story that you're on some dangerous secret mission. Oh. Well, the plan might have some advantages. And how do I know I can trust two women? Haven't you already found out? 
For my part, I can use some extra income. I'm getting somewhat fed up playing nursemaid to Harriet Wilson. Well, I'll have to give it some thought. Meanwhile, do you want me to keep the necklace for you? Why, yes. You might as well, partner. <laughs> I thought so. And don't worry about Harriet. I'll keep her happy. Clara, my dear, I can't tell you how glad it makes me to know that you found such an exciting and adventurous friend. <laughs> he is nice. Nice? Oh, he's wonderful. And to think he's in the Foreign Secret Service for our government. Oh, shh, not so loud. Oh, uh, sorry, dear. It could mean his life. You know, if people found out about that, he, he shouldn't even have told me. Oh, now, don't worry, Clara. I'll be careful. You can count on that. <laughs> Thanks. But imagine meeting such a thrilling man here in a foreign land. He falls in love with you, and eventually... Wedding bells. Harriet, <laughs> please. I'll admit Raymond is fascinating, and I'm pleased with his attentions, but... Well, he hasn't asked me yet. Oh, but he will. This young man's in love with you. And you're in love with him, too. I can tell. <laughs> I'm afraid you have spring fever, Harriet. <laughs> oh, you, you've been a changed person since you met him. You always were pleasant and nice to me. But, but now you seem to be uh, up in the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I am a little, but anyway, we keep this to ourselves. Oh, we? yes. You can count on me. <laughs> Things are going smoothly, aren't they, Clara? You've made Harriet believe you and Raymond are deeply in love, and you're sure she will never question any of your meetings with him. You and Harriet accompany the others on the various tours of Rome in the nearby country. But you also manage appointments with Raymond frequently. From time to time, he adds other pieces of jewelry to his uh, collection, and he seems pleased with the arrangement that you suggested. Then one day, as your stay in Rome is drawing to a close, you approach the back booth of a little cafe where you've made your last appointment with Raymond before leaving for Naples. Oh, oh, Clara, I, I didn't see you come in. You're slipping, Raymond. I thought you must always be on guard. I have no worries. Even if accused, I have no loot for anyone to find. Not today. Uh, you seem very absorbed in that letter you're reading. Is it from the folks back home? Hardly. But don't be so inquisitive. Partners have a right to share, remember? Besides, I noticed it's from the Rocco Jewelry Company in Naples. You're to meet someone. Fast reader, aren't you? I'm a smart kid. Perhaps. But don't get too smart for your own good. Could I, darling? Here. Read the letter if you're so interested. Hmm. An appointment in Naples day after tomorrow at 11 p.m. Isn't that a bit late? Not for a friend. Friend. The kind that exchanges gems for greenbacks? The lady is a genius. It adds up. Appointment at 11 at night in Naples. A friend. This man handles all of your merchandise, doesn't he? Well, you're giving the answers. But I'll give you credit, Clara. You're usually right. We haven't discussed shares. How do I come in? You'll get what's coming to you all right. 50-50? Ah, that'd be real nice, wouldn't it? There are some real nice jewels I've been carrying around. Now, how about my share, 50-50? That's a bit high. Partners, though. Well? You drive a hard bargain, Clara. But you do know the answers. I'll be on the same train for Naples that you are day after tomorrow. See you then. Interesting, isn't it, Clara? When you return to the United States, you'll be a rich woman. The jewels Raymond has accumulated are worth a small fortune. And it shouldn't be long until you receive your share. Raymond admits he has an appointment with a man named Rocco in Naples to make the exchange. The jewels for a sum of money beyond your dreams. Two days later, you're on the train en route to Naples. An hour or so before you're due to reach Naples, you knock softly on the door of Raymond Hungate's compartment. Oh, Clara, come in. Anyone see you? Of course not. Bring the stuff in your purse? Yes. <laughs> they laughed when I bought this purse that I didn't need any more luggage, but it has come in handy. 
Look at them sparkle. Yeah, pretty. Beautiful. Just think, how much would you say? Uh, $50,000 for little Clara? Well, Rocco will want a commission, but mm. they'll probably bring about 75000 Not bad for a few weeks' work. Not at all. And even 37500 slightly more than my usual income. Uh, Clara, we might as well understand each other. What? You've had some good ideas, and you've been very helpful. Oh, thank you, darling. You can get in the way, and you take too much for granted. Oh, come now, smile when you say that. Why? Clara, the, uh... Game is over. I'm about ready to cash in, and I don't need any excess baggage. You're joking. Look, you don't mean to... Can't you figure the picture this time, Clara? We're almost into Naples. Your body can be found by the railroad track. By the time you're identified, I'll be in Naples, have the dough, and be on the boat for the good old USA. Don't be ridiculous. You'd be caught in a minute. What about Harriet? Well, you've taken care of that. Harriet will only be able to tell them what she understands. The job I have is very dangerous. But somehow you must have been killed by the man I was tracking down, or perhaps by accident. <laughs> After all, she thinks we're so much in love. Don't be a fool, Raymond. Put that gun away. Stand near the window, Clara. When the next train whistle sounds... Put it away, I'll... You, you grab at Raymond's arm. Try to seize the guns. The two of you struggle. You look at Raymond Hungate, slumped on the seat. Try to realize that you have killed him. You listen, expecting to hear people come clamoring into the compartment, but no one does. You realize that your struggle and the gunshot occurred during the outside noise, and that even as Raymond planned it, no one heard a thing. You look around the compartment, open the window and toss the gun out. Then you get Raymond's letter into your purse, and of course, most important of all, you take all the gems. And now, certain that there's not a trace to suggest you're having been with Raymond... You quickly return to your own compartment. Oh, Clara, back so soon. I was just writing some postcards. Well, that's nice. Well, I'm surprised Mr. Hungett would let you leave so soon. Hmm. Oh, you seem quiet, dear. Is something wrong? I'd... I'd rather not talk about it. Oh, come now. Have you had a quarrel? Please, Harriet, let's not discuss it. But, Claire, I thought he was about to propose. There's not going to be any wedding. I can assure you I never want to see Raymond Hungate again. Oh, dear. Oh, now, now, you'll feel better tomorrow, Clara. No, uh, I'm through. In fact, Harriet, let's, let's get everything together so that when we get to Naples, we can get off the train right away. Take a cab right to the hotel and, and not wait for the rest of the tour. But, Clara... No, I mean it, Harriet. Like I said, I'm through with Raymond Hungate forever. Well, Clara, it's over, isn't it? Complete. As you hurry from the station, pretending that you want to avoid Raymond Hungate, knowing that his body is waiting to be discovered in his compartment. You're certain, too, that you left no trace of your having been there at all. But you do have the jewels, safely put away in your purse. And you know from the letter Raymond showed you, you can sell them in Naples for currency. A great deal of it. To Raymond's business connection. The jeweler named Rocco. And since you're to sail for the United States soon, your future looks very promising, doesn't it? Then there's a knock at the door of your hotel suite. Yes. Miss Marshall? Clara Marshall? Yes. I represent the American consulate, Miss Marshall. Oh, well, surely our passports are in order. Oh, yes. I'm here on another matter. This is Police Chief Antrini. Police? But why? May we come in? Well, yes, of course. Please do. Please, sit down. Who is it, Clara? A gentleman from the consulate and the chief of police, Harriet. Uh, this is my employer, Miss Wilson, gentlemen. How do you do? How do you do? Well, this visit is really quite flattering. You see, we are planning to leave for the States in a few days. Oh, we've had such a wonderful tour of the continent. Nice of you two gentlemen to drop in this way. I am afraid my business may prevent your departure, Miss Wilson. You see, there has been a murder. A murder? But who? A man named Raymond Hungate. Raymond Hungate? 
terrible. Well, surely that there's some mistake. The police still have some checking to do, Miss Marshall. But Chief Antrini would like you to come down to his office. Oh, this is hard to believe. It, it, it's such a shock. We knew Mr. Hungett's job was uh, with the Secret Service, and it was very dangerous. Harriet, there, there may be some mistake. Oh, I do hope so. Anyway, I, I'll go along to, to identify him if it is Raymond. Oh, Clara, you poor dear child. I'm sure you misunderstand, Miss Wilson. Chief Antrini is arresting Miss Marshall. On suspicion of murder. Well, that's preposterous. You've no reason whatsoever to suspect me. I think we have. Well, we found Hongate's body in a compartment of a train that had just arrived in Naples. It'd been shot, and the murder weapon is missing, as well as his own identification papers. It's very interesting, Chief Antrini, but I fail to see where it concerns me. Uh, perhaps it doesn't, Miss Marshall. All we are certain of is that Raymond Hungate had an appointment with a man named Rocco this evening to dispose of some stolen jewels. Hungate thought that Rocco was a fence. Actually, Rocco was working with the police. Well, I still don't understand what all this has to do with me. Uh, nothing. Unless you have the jewels. If you do, that is all we need for a conviction. If you do not, I'm sure you will not mind our searching your belongings. Uh, suppose we start with your purse? No, you have no right to search me. Well, I hardly knew this man, Hungate. Oh, but you did. You see, we found this card in his compartment. It'd been slipped under the door. Oh, read it, Miss Marshall. Dear Mr. Hungate, I'm sure you and Clara have just had a lover's quarrel and that everything will work out all right. We'll be staying at the Imperial Hotel in Naples, Harriet Wilson. Harriet, why? I couldn't help it, Clara. You were such a romantic couple. I just couldn't let you break up. Now, Miss Marshall, your purse, please. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the whistler... Betty Lou Gerson, John Stevenson, Norma Varden, Byron Kane, and Marvin Miller. The Whistler, directed by George W. Allen, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is produced under the supervision of Ed Bloodworth and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This evening's story was by Winifred Henson. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Whistler, whose strange story you have just heard, will be back next week with another tale from his never-ending farm. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The Whistler's Strange Story, Quadrangle. On the edge of Carter Town, a small aging community in Northern California, stands the equally aging structure known as Channing House. The house proper with its wide quandragon wall and flanking trees, has been the subject of many a budding artist's brush and oils. Jeffrey Channing in, interrupts his morning stroll through the grounds to listen to the conversation of the latest artist at work on a canvas of Channing House. A girl, slender, young, and attractive, talking with a young male companion. Both are too absorbed in work and conversation to notice Jeffrey, although he appears quite interested in what is being said. Now, if you think the place is different, Leah, you should see the inside. I'm quite satisfied here, Ned. The old house is a perfect subject. <laughs> old Agnes Channing is something of a subject herself. That means she's a character. Always having the place worked over. Remodeling, changing. The old girl really keeps Sam on the jump. Sam? Caretaker. Oh. oh. Yeah, jack of all trades. Been with the Channing family for years. Mrs. Channing. Uh, does she live in the big house alone, Ned? No, there's her nephew, Jeffrey. Friend of mine, by the way. Really devoted to the old girl. Stays pretty close. Does his best to keep her from brooding. About the colonel, you mean? Yeah. Mrs. Channing claims to want the hammer and saw going because it reminds her of the colonel. Keeps him alive in her heart. He was always putting around the place, you know, building one thing or another. Hello, Ned. Huh? Oh, Jeffrey. <laughs> going to order us off the property? Well, no, not if I can win an introduction by allowing you to stay. Certainly. Miss Munson, Jeffrey Channing. How do you Pleasure. do, Mr. Channing? Well, if you're an artist, Miss Munson, you must see the inside of Channing House sometimes. Quite picturesque. You'd enjoy it. I would. I really would. Well, we'll arrange it soon. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Channing. You turn, Jeffrey. Walk away along the path to the house. An attractive, exciting girl, isn't she? And you tell yourself you do want to see her again, soon. Suddenly, an odd sound reaches you. Not the sound of carpentry, is it, Jeffrey? No, the dull, frightening sound of a pick striking against stone. You break into a run. Finally, as you enter the garden, you slow down. And stare with an expression of relief on your face as you catch sight of Sam, the man of all work. He's only tearing down the old fountain. Not the wall. And there's no cause for alarm at all. You continue along the walk and then enter the house. Jeffrey? Good morning, Aunt Agnes. Didn't keep you waiting, did I? No, I slept late this morning. Breakfast is ready. Do sit down. Uh, are you out for your usual morning stroll? Uh-huh. Met a friend from town. He brought an artist out. I, I promised her a look inside. Oh, Jeffrey, I wish you hadn't. Well, now, what harm oh, could there Oh, please, find... I don't want gawking curiosity seekers wandering through the house. The memories here, they're too sacred. Uh, yes. All right, Aunt Agnes. Pass the marmalade, would you? Very decent of you to understand about my aunt, Miss Munson. <laughs> she can be quite stubborn. She isn't being stubborn. Well, She's entitled to privacy with her memories. How uh, how did her husband, uh, the colonel, die? Oh, uh, it was an accident. He was with me. It was a fishing trip. We were out farther than we should have been. A uh, squall came up, capsized our boat. He was drowned? Yes, yes, that's right. 
His body was never found. I, I guess I've always held myself to blame in a way. I suppose that's why I lean over backwards to make things easier for Aunt Agnes. Hello! Hello! Ned! Ned! Over. I've been looking all over for you, Liam. Oh, Jeffrey, that is, Mr. Channing just happened by. He was kind enough to show me the garden. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, Jeff, when is your aunt going to have the big wall around the place torn down? The wall? Yeah. <laughs> She's torn down everything else. Well, I rather hope she won't go that far, Ned. Quite a project, I'd say. Why, well, I've never seen a wall so thick, so massive. <laughs> Don't be fooled, Liam. It isn't as impressive as it looks. The wall's hollow. Right, Jeff? Yes. It, it is. You want to scream the words, don't you, Jeffrey? Because the wall has been on your mind so much the past five years. Yes, it's hollow, isn't it? And it's one landmark you'll do everything in your power to prevent your aunt from destroying. That's because of what the hollow wall contains. Colonel Channing didn't perish at sea, did he, Jeffrey? No, you killed him in a blind rage when he refused to loan you $5,000 you needed. In the dead of night, you placed his body inside the wall and sealed it up. Then you, uh invented the story of the drowning at sea. And everyone believed it. Everyone, that is, with one possible exception. You've often wondered about Aunt Agnes, haven't you, Jeffrey? Mr. Channing, are you all right? <laughs> He's dazed, Leah. Over you, I'd say. I just call him Jeffrey. He'll be all right. Uh, yes. Oh, yes, I'll be all right, Leah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. Got something else to think about, haven't you, Jeffrey? Something beside Aunt Agnes and this old house. Yes, Ned, I do have something else to think about. It's been five years, hasn't it, Jeffrey? Five years since you killed old Colonel Channing. Hid his body in the hollow wall surrounding Channing House. And you've never been able to leave, to stay away for any length of time because of your aunt, Agnes Channing. And her constant remodeling is a threat to your safety. If she ever wanted to have the wall torn down, your five-year-old story of the fishing accident, the colonel's death by drowning, would be proved a terrible, desperate lie. And that lie would send you to the gas chamber. You wonder now in the days that follow what you can do about it. Because you know that your interest in Leah Munson, the attractive young artist, is more than a passing one. Each day you'll meet outside the garden, walk together and talk. And she seems to be growing more fond of you day by day. Oh, oh Jeffrey, I don't know when I'm ever going to finish my painting. You won't let me work. Perhaps I don't want you to finish, Leah. I don't understand. Oh, don't you? Really? Well, I... Leah, you must know that I... I don't want to see you leave Carter Town. But I must leave someday. But why? Jeffrey, I've got a career to think about. I've painted nearly everything here that interests me. Leah, surely you know that I'm in love with you. I don't want you to leave ever. Jeffrey. <sighs> Leah. <sighs> Jeffrey, there, there's nothing to hold you here now. I mean, only your... Aunt Agnes? Why do you ask? You want me to stay. I want to. But I could never stay here long. My plans, my work, I must go abroad soon to study new techniques. And I want you to. I want to go with you. Do you, Jeffrey? Or more to the point, can you? You've made up your mind, haven't you, Jeffrey? You've got to free yourself of Channing House. And it must be done soon or you'll lose Leah. It's going to take a lot of thinking, isn't it? And then one evening, you're in the library, sitting across the chess table from your aunt. Well, that wasn't a very smart move, Jeffrey. Hmm? Look. Oh, you see? Oh, yes, I see, Aunt Agnes. You just haven't your mind on the game, that's all. Oh, I'm afraid not. It's that girl, isn't it? Leah Monson. Why don't you bring her here? I'd like to meet her. Well, I wanted to bring her around a long time ago, but you said... Never that... mind what I said. Ask her for tea tomorrow. Well... Excuse me, Miss Chang. Oh, yes, Sam. Come in, come in. The contractor's given me this uh, estimate you asked for. Good, good. Now, let me see here. 
Oh, mm -hmm. Jenkins gave us a better price. Yes, I was sure he would. I'll call him in the morning and give him the order. Yes, ma'am. Night, Miss Chen. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Now, let me see. Where were we? Uh, what, uh, what is it this time, Aunt Agnes? Oh, Sam's going to start tearing down the old wall. First thing in the morning. It's happened at last, hasn't it, Jeffrey? The wall. Aunt Agnes is going to have it torn down. And the secret that has remained hidden within it will be revealed. Somehow you manage to finish out the game of chess. And then hurry up to your room. You pace the floor well into the early morning hours, wondering what to do, how you can stop her. Dawn finds you stretched out of the bed, still fully clothed, staring at the ceiling. And then suddenly you're aware of a sound outside. You leap out of bed and hurry to the window. Rain. It's raining. Good morning, Aunt Agnes. It's a miserable morning. Absolutely miserable. I do so detest rain. It's so depressing. Oh, I don't know. I rather like it. You look rather tired this morning. Mm. Didn't you sleep well? No. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got very little sleep at all. Oh, it's the weather. We're in for a few more days of it, according to the paper. I'll let you have some of my sleeping powders. Now, if you don't mind, Aunt Agnes, I'd rather you didn't. Oh, nonsense. I'll put them on your night table. I uh, suppose the sudden change in weather has altered your plans about the wall. Yes, but I'll get around to it as soon as the rain's over. I've made up my mind to that, Jeffrey. Yes. I'm sure you have. Yes, Jeffrey. As soon as the storm is over, your aunt will have Sam begin tearing down the wall. It continues to rain all that day and the next. Gives you time to think things out and decide what you must do. And through it all, Sam isn't idle. Your aunt is put into work on the staircase. And the sound of the hammer and saw echoes throughout the house from morning till night. And then on the fourth day, the storm's still raging outside. You've made up your mind. And know for certain what you must do. But just how you're going to do it isn't quite clear, is it? No. That is until late in the evening. You're alone in the study when your aunt enters. Oh, there you are, Jeffrey. I wondered where you'd gone to. Well, you and Sam had your heads together in the library. I didn't want to disturb you. Making plans for the assault on the wall, were you? No. As a matter of fact, we didn't discuss it at all. Oh. When's Sam going to finish up with the stairway? He quit rather suddenly this afternoon. Oh, I had something more important for him to do. Well, I'm rather tired of having to pick my way through all that lumber, those loose steps and bits of torn carpeting every time I go up and down the stairs. He'll finish up in the morning. Mm -hmm. What are you doing, dear? Oh, I'm fixing some hot chocolate. Just the thing for a rainy evening. Hot chocolate. Mm. That sounds rather nice. <laughs> Want me to fix you one? Yes, I'd like to try it. I don't know why the idea didn't occur to me before. Perhaps that's just what I need to. Oh, and then I could throw away my sleeping powders. Yes, that's right. You probably could. <laughs> You'd like that, wouldn't you, dear? Well, now, you know I never really approved of your taking sleeping powders. Well, neither did anyone else. And accidents can happen. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. Now, about that hot chocolate. Well, I'll have to heat some more milk. Why don't you go on upstairs to your room? I'll bring it to you. Would you? Oh, that would be nice, Jeffrey. Very nice. You stand there, staring after her as she leaves the study. The way has suddenly become clear, Jeffrey. It's perfect, isn't it? All your aunt's friends are well aware of the fact that she takes sleeping powders. All have cautioned her about it. A few minutes later, you hurry upstairs with her hot chocolate in your hand. Step inside your room. And there on the nightstand, where she placed them for you a few days ago. The sleeping powders. You quickly empty all of them into the cup, then cross the hall and go into her room. You'll find her sitting in the big easy chair by the window. You're not going to turn in yet? Oh, no. I thought I'd sit up a while and read a bit. Oh. Uh, here's your hot chocolate, Aunt Agnes. Mm -hmm. What a delightful aroma. You better drink it while it's hot. Well, of course, Jeffrey. Good night, Aunt Agnes, and uh, sleep tight. <laughs> Oh, 
Back in the study downstairs, you sip your hot drink. An hour goes by. The house is still. You sit there listening to the storm outside and then step to the window and peer into the darkness. And as you do... You whirl. Race into the entry hall. Your Aunt Agnes is lying at the foot of the stairs. Aunt Agnes. Aunt Agnes! She's dead, isn't she, Jeffrey? The fall killed her instantly. She must have tripped over a loose board on the stairway. An accident, Jeffrey. And you had no part in it. Or did you? You've got to make certain. The cup of hot chocolate with the deadly sleeping powders you fixed for your aunt is on the nightstand next to her bed. But you see, she hasn't touched it. You sigh with relief. Your aunt's death really was accidental. Then you pick up the cup. The sound of the bell startles you. The cup slips from your fingers and spills the chocolate over the pillow on the bed. A dark stain begins to spread slowly over the pillowcases. With your aunt killed accidentally by a fall down the stairway, this could ruin things for you, couldn't it, Jeffrey? You can't afford to have any trace of the deadly drink containing the sleeping powders found. Quickly, you pick up the stained pillow and hurry back to your room. Pull out one of the drawers from the old bureau in the closet and stuff the pillow inside far to the back. Close the drawer. Judge Fuller. Oh, I'm glad you're here. Come in. Come in, come in. Why, Jeffrey, what's the matter? It's Aunt Agnes. Look. Over there. Good heavens. How did it happen? I don't know. I found her just now when I came down to answer the door. She's dead, Jeffrey. Yes, I know. She must have been coming down to answer your ring when she fell. And she tripped over a loose step. Sam's been working on the stairs for the past few days. Yes, yes, I see. Well, Jeffrey, I think we'd best call the police. The police? Well, yes. An accident, of course, but they'll have to be notified. Oh. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, Sheriff, what do you think? Uh, No doubt about it, I'd say. That's the way it happened, all right. Mrs. Channing tripped over those loose boards up there. Poor Aunt Agnes. I'm real sorry about this, Jeff. Real sorry. Uh, It's a great loss, my boy. For all of us. By the way, Judge, uh, what were you doing here tonight? Why, Mrs. Channing wanted to see me. As you know, I've been her attorney for years. Yes. She sent Sam around in the car to pick me up. What was on her mind? Well, when she called, she said she wanted to discuss a financial matter, but she didn't say what it was. She did make quite a point of my being here at 11, though. Well, that's odd. When she went upstairs, I thought she was going to retire for the night. Perhaps you did, my boy. I don't know that she considered our appointment a secret, but I can assure you she had no idea of going to sleep when she called me this evening. I I don't quite understand. Well, it's certainly not important now, Jeffrey. No, I suppose not. Can I be of any help to you, Sheriff? No, Judge, I don't think so. Jeffrey, I guess I don't have any more questions to ask you either. As far as I'm concerned, your aunt's death was accidental. Purely accidental. It's all over now, isn't it, Jeffrey? Aunt Agnes' death was an accidental one in the sheriff's own words. While you had planned to poison her with an overdose of sleeping powders, you had absolutely nothing to do with it. You're no longer a prisoner in Channing House. Now you're free to marry Leah Munson. Go wherever you please, aren't you? Sitting now in the study, the judge with you, you can hear the sheriff and his men moving about in the hall outside. Presently, the study door opens and the sheriff moves into the room. Oh, uh, Jeff. Yes, Sheriff? I've been having a... Rather interesting conversation with your caretaker, Sam Lewis. 
He seems to think your aunt's death wasn't accidental. What? What's that? He seems to think that she was pushed down the stairs and that you did it. And I... I pushed... Oh, now really, Sheriff, why would I want to do a thing like that? For the money? The $50,000 Sam found hidden in the stairway this afternoon? $50,000? In the stairway? Mm Mm-hmm. Sam turned it over to your aunt, Mrs. Channing, right after he found it. That's probably why she phoned me to come over this evening. She said nothing to me, Judge. But look, Sheriff, I According to I... Sam, Mrs. Channing told him the colonel had hidden a large sum of money somewhere in the house a short time before he died. Seems the colonel never got around to telling her where he'd hidden it. That's why she's been having the house torn apart these past five years, looking for it. Didn't know about that, huh? Sheriff, you've got to believe me. I didn't know. Sam seems to think you did. So did Mrs. Channing. She told Sam she was sure that was the only reason you'd been sticking around so close these past five years. Waiting for them to find the money so you could get your hands on it. It looks like she was right. What do you mean by that? We just found something, Jeff. Something I'm sure will convince any jury that you killed your aunt. Me kill Aunt Agnes? No. I'm going to have to arrest you, Jeff. We found all the money Sam turned over to your aunt. But I didn't... Oh, yes, you did. We found the whole $50,000 right where you put it. Stuffed in the back of a bureau drawer in your bedroom closet. Hidden in your Aunt Agnes's pillow. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Force is in Europe. For once again the United States Air Force is in Europe. For once again the United States Air Force is in Europe. For once again the Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The Whistler will continue in just a moment. The Whistler's Strange Story. Song Team. Ted Gray had music in his heart. He heard a melody in the rustle of every leaf, saw a song in the bend of every river. A few years ago, Ted teamed up with lyric writer Al Wilson. And now Ted Gray and Al Wilson formed one of the most successful songwriting combinations in the profession. And as Ted played for the hundredth time his latest composition, his mood was one of major harmony, except for one thing, his partner. For months, his dislike for Al Wilson had been growing. And now you almost hate him, don't you, Ted? Because you're almost certain he's captured the love of the only girl you've ever truly cared for, Corinne Mitchell. Yes, Corinne. Once your copyist and part-time secretarial helper. Now the head of her own publicity bureau. That's probably Al now, isn't it, Ted? Oh, hiya, Ted. Sorry I'm late. Uh, You're always late. Did you finish the lyrics? Yep, all but a couple of lines. You've been playing around with them for three weeks. Well, I know, but you've not got a great tune this time, kid. And I want to be sure the lyrics are just as good as the tune. That'll be a novelty. I don't know. You've done all right with me. Look, I know a couple of composers who have done just as well and paid a lot less. You're getting 50% of the royalties. Eddie Regan gets only 20% for the lyrics he writes for Joe Winslow's tunes. All right, then why don't you get Eddie Regan to write your lyrics? He's under contract to Winslow. Oh, is that so? Well, we got a contract, too. 50-50, remember? And it's that or nothing. But any time you want to call the whole thing off, all you have to do is say so. And incidentally, your mentioning our contract reminds me of a change that I want. 
What kind of change? That clause that if one of us dies, the other gets complete ownership of all our songs. How come you want that change all of a sudden? Neither one of us has any near relatives. Nobody close enough to leave anything to. Hell, <laughs> well, I expect to have a near relative soon. A very near relative. A wife. <laughs> Who's the lucky girl? Corrine. Corrine? Yes, Corrine. You're engaged? Well, not yet, but I'm going to ask her as soon as I see her. And you think she'll say yes? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh, you slay me, Al. What's so funny? I got news for you. Corrine's going to marry me. Well, that's funny. She didn't say anything to me about it last night before she left for Seattle. Not so funny. I asked her not to say anything until we got our new song, Front Porch Rolling. Oh. Well, I'll believe that when she tells me. She'll tell you, Al. She'll have a chance when she gets back. That's all right with me. Meantime, how about finishing those lyrics? With Corrine out of town, there's nothing to distract you. And Roberta Lynn promised she'd record it in time to get it on Peter Potter's jukebox jury program. That is, if we finish it in the next couple of days. Okay, Ted. I'll try to finish it. I wish you would. As the door closes behind your partner, you realize for the first time how easy things would be for you if something happened to Al. You would be sole owner of all the songs you now own jointly, wouldn't you, Ted? And with Al out of the way, you're certain Corrine would marry you in a minute. Then it hits you. Something must happen to Al before Kareen Mitchell returns and before your partnership contract is changed. You're startled as you realize you're thinking of murder. You've never even imagined yourself as a killer. You think about it for a couple of days and then phone Al. Hello? Al, it's Ted. Oh. How are you coming on front porch? I think I'll finish it tomorrow. Only need a couple of lines. I'm going to stick here all day if I have to. It won't even answer the phone. That's a good idea. Well, let's see. Tomorrow's Friday. I'll take it out to Lou late tomorrow afternoon. He'll get the lead sheet out Saturday morning. That'll give Roberta four days to get it in shape before her recording date. Oh, that's plenty of time. I think I'll have it tomorrow, Ted. Up to it, kid. Phone me when it's finished. When you hang up the phone, you realize that tomorrow is the day, don't you, Ted? You pace the floor of your apartment most of the night. And by morning, you've worked out a plan. A plan you're certain will succeed. At ten o'clock, you're on the phone again. Mid-Central Publishing. Hi, Gracie. Ted Gray. Oh, hello, Ted. Is the boss in? Mm, uh, yes. How about Frankie? No, there's nobody here but me. Uh, they're both tied up until after lunch. About three. Three it is. <laughs> You're certain now you can dispose of Al Wilson and get away with it, aren't you, Ted? Everyone believes you're Al's closest friend, and you'll make it look like an attempted robbery. You won't make the mistake most criminals make and prepare a perfect alibi. No, your alibi will actually be imperfect with just enough holes in it to make it seem natural. The simple audacity of your act will be your insurance of success. You'll uh, take care of Al around three o'clock, Go straight from his apartment to Mid-Central Publishing, where you'll wait your usual 20 minutes or more for Lou. When news of Al's death breaks, you will be as surprised and shocked as anyone. You finish dressing, eat a leisurely breakfast, and read the paper. Then take step one in your plan. You drive over to the drugstore next door to Al's apartment building around lunchtime, three hours before you plan to kill him. Hi. Hiya, Mr. Adamson. Oh, hello, Ted. You just missed your partner. Al? I was on my way to Al's. Well, he said he had to work all afternoon on the lyrics to your new number. Oh, then I guess I'll take him to lunch, give him strength for the job, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take this carton of cigarettes, too, Mr. Adamson. <laughs> oh, check. <laughs> now, Ted, you have at least one reputable witness who will testify you are on the way to Al's place to take him to lunch. You leave the drugstore, and in case the druggist is watching, you enter Al's apartment building. Walk through the downstairs hallway to the rear entrance. You hurry down the alleyway to the boulevard where you've parked your car, and drive aimlessly for an hour or so, and then return to your own apartment building, where you make certain another reputable witness will be able to testify 
that you were at home after your midday visit to Al. Come in. Good afternoon, Mr. Gray. Hello, Miss Carter. I, uh... I was wondering if you might have a larger apartment vacant, uh, one with an extra bedroom. And I will have on the first of the month. You have some friends? No, no. Al and I thought we might get more work done if we lived in the same place. I just had lunch with him. Oh, this will be perfect for you two gentlemen. I can't show it to you right now, but... Oh, that's all right. I'd want Al to see it anyway. Besides, I got a little copying to do, and then I got to get out the Mid-Central Publishing. I, I, I just want to make sure you had one. We'll take a look on Sunday. Your plans are complete, aren't they, Ted? You have two reputable witnesses as to your whereabouts at two highly important times. Back in your apartment, you pace the floor and watch the clock. Finally, the minute arrives, and at ten minutes before three, you walk down the alleyway in the rear of Al's apartment building and hurry upstairs to the second floor. Oh, hello, Ted. Come on in. How are you coming on those lines? I got them. Good. Let's hear them. Hey, y'all listen to this. Sure, it's useless to sigh and it's foolish to grieve. Cause what, go, cause what good are words that your heart won't believe? Hey, you like them? Yeah, yeah, I like them fine. I figured you would. Corinne would... I don't want to talk about Corinne now. But Corinne would... I said I didn't want to talk about Corinne. What's the matter with you, Ted? What are you... No, Ted. No. Wait a minute! It's done, isn't it, Ted? And you're sure you made it look like a fatal assault during an attempted robbery. Now you must be careful to establish the one important time factor of your day's routine. You drive quickly to an outside phone booth, just a half a block from Mid-Central Publishing. Police headquarters, please. Just a moment. Police headquarters, Sergeant Quinn speaking. I think a man's been killed in apartment 203 in the Cheswell Apartments on Las Palmas. Who is this? Who's talking? That's something you'll never know, Sergeant. You timed things beautifully, didn't you, Ted? Within a minute after your call to the police, you're at the Mid-Central Publishing offices. You're confident as you stroll into the Mid-Central Publishing lobby, almost on time, for your three o'clock appointment. Hello, Angel. The boss here? Always on time, Teddy. (laughs) No, Lou's not here yet. Oh, that's all right. How about old Texas Frankie? Yeah, he's here. Wait a minute. Ted? Yeah? Yeah, Ted Gray's here. Be right out. Hi, Ted. Hi, you boy. What you got? Another money maker for Mid Central. Get out a lead sheet on it right away, will you, Frankie? Sure. You know those two lines Al was having so much trouble with? Yep. I put them in myself. I saw him just before lunch, and he was still having trouble, so I knocked him out myself. You? Yeah, me. So uh, I'll pick up the lead sheets tomorrow, huh? Okay. You want it on the phone, Ted. Hurry. Okay. Why all the excitement? It's, it's the police department. Come on. Okay, okay. Take it easy. I haven't robbed any banks. It's about Al. Al? Well, What's the matter with him? Oh, I don't know, but the officer found out you were Al's partner, and he wanted to know if you were here. Maybe he's had an accident. No, no, not Al. He's too careful. Hello? Yes? Yeah. What? Well, he couldn't be. Murder. You say you saw your partner this morning, Mr. Gray? Yeah, that, that's right, Lieutenant. I, I got over there about 11.45. He was all right? Fine. He was trying to finish the lyric to our latest number. We only needed two lines, so uh, we made a couple of sandwiches, ate there in the apartment, and worked on it. Can you prove you were there at that time? No, I, I can't prove it. But I did buy some cigarettes at the druggist next to Al's apartment building. I think Mr. Adamson, the proprietor, will verify that statement. How long were you in your partner's apartment? Not very long. The lines came to me while we were eating. I went home, typed out the complete lyric, and took it out to Mid-Central Publishing Company. 
That's a pretty fair alibi, but can you prove it? Well, no, Lieutenant. <laughs> After all, I wasn't planning on having to account for my time. But wait a minute. I can prove I came back to my apartment after I had lunch with Al. I talked with Mrs. Carter, the apartment manager, about a larger apartment. we we'll check on your statements. The important thing is, where were you at 3 o'clock? At Mid-Central Publishing. I, uh, I guess there's no way I can prove that either, unless the receptionist happens to remember. Well, we'll question her, of course. Well, you're not under suspicion, Mr. Gray, any more than anyone else. As a matter of fact, from what we learn, Al Wilson was a vital factor in your success. Oh, he was. Anyway, it looks like it was done on the impulse of the moment. He probably surprised someone in an attempted robbery. Someone entered and surprised him. Your partner was killed by a blow on the head. Bookend. Did your partner have much money in the house? Now that you mention it, Al's greatest weakness was displaying his wealth. He he always carried a thousand or so with him on his person. Then it was probably robbery. But we do have to investigate every angle. Well, thank you for your cooperation. If we have any more questions, we'll phone you. And if I think of anything important, I'll phone you. Anything I can do to help catch Al's killer will be a pleasure. You return to your apartment, certain you're beyond the slightest suspicion. Next day, you phone Mid-Central Publishing. Learn that the police have double-checked your statement. And smile when you realize that Gracie, the absent-minded little receptionist, has verified your statement that you were at Mid-Central Publishing at the time Al Wilson was killed. Just as you thought she would. Two days later, you receive a shock. You phone Corinne's office. Learn she returned from Seattle the morning Al was killed. That she tried to phone you and then left for San Diego the same evening. You get her San Diego address and send her a telegram. Tell her to be sure and be back in time to attend the Jukebox Jury radio program when Roberta's recording of Front Porch will be presented to the public for the first time. Corinne agrees. And a few days later, you're both sitting in the audience at Peter Potter's Jukebox Jury radio program. You know, Ted, it seems... Well, I don't know. It was only last week that Al... No, no, don't, don't think about it, honey. Al and I both promised Roberta she could have it the minute we finished it. He wouldn't have had it any other way, believe me. No, I suppose not. Look, Corinne, Al was the closest friend I ever had. We both agreed that if anything ever happened to either of us, the other one would go right ahead. I know. Sure you do. Now, naturally, you feel low, honey, being in love with Al. No, Ted. I was fond of Al, but... Well, I'm surprised you thought that. I thought you knew how I felt. You mean... You mean you love me, Corinne? Let's talk about it some other time. Oh, but I... Please, Ted. Of course, honey, only... Well, you've made me happier than I've ever been. Ted. Yes? When did you tell me you finished that lyric? Uh, just after lunch, the day Al was killed. The lines just just came to me. Sure, it's useless to sigh and it's foolish to grieve, because what good are words that your heart won't believe? <laughs> Can you imagine Al spending a week on a line like that? You did this right after you had lunch with him. Yeah, yeah, here's the original typewritten copy. Got it back from the publisher a couple of days ago. He sent Roberta a lead sheet a few days ago. Ted, I... I... Listen to me a minute. We'll talk later, honey. You're all excited now, and so am I. Look, you stay here. Catch things from out front. I'm going backstage and see Roberta for a minute before the show starts. Do you mind? No, Ted, I don't mind. Good, good. I'll be right back, right after the show's over, okay? Okay. (laughs) What's so amusing, Ted? (laughs) Oh, nothing's amusing, honey, only it's just like you said. Okay. After what you told me tonight about the way you felt about me, I'm sure everything's going to be okay from now on out. Well, Ted, you're certain you've won, aren't you? You have complete ownership of Front Porch and all the other songs fashioned by you and your late partner, Al Wilson. And you learned just a few moments ago that lovely Corinne Mitchell, the one woman you've ever really loved, feels the same way about you. Standing in the wings a few feet off the semi-dark stage, your pulse quickens as Peter Potter announces that I'm going out on the front porch and cry is coming up next on Jukebox Jury. 
Now, jury, let's weigh the merits of another of America's brand new records. I want you to listen carefully and tell us if you can, will it be a hit or a miss? My sweetheart just said it's goodbye. No reason he felt, just a note of farewell. So I'm going out on the front porch and cry. That was the new one, I'm Going Out on the Front Porch and Cry, by Roberta Lynn. Now, I want you to mark your ballots whether you think the record will be a hit or a miss. Then we'll start the discussion. Corrine? Yes, Ted? Where have you been? I've been looking for you for the last ten minutes. I went outside for a few minutes. Well, I told you I'd be back as soon as the program was over. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't realize you had a friend with you. That's all right. This is Lieutenant Roberts, homicide. Homicide? Well, I knew Roberta was going to slay him tonight, but I didn't think she'd be arrested for it. She won't be. (laughs) I called the police, Ted, right after Pete finished playing the racket. You? But why? Because you killed Al Wilson. Me? Well, you're crazy, Corinne. Al was... It had to be you, Ted. Now, look, Those Corinne... Those new lines you said you wrote. Sure, it's useless to sigh and it's foolish to grieve. Because what good are words that your heart won't believe? They were the tip-off, Ted. You said a little while ago you wrote those lines right after lunch, the day Al was killed. Well, that's right, I did. You're lying, Ted. When you handed me this typewritten copy a few minutes ago, you told me the whole story. Those lines weren't your lines. Or even Al's. Or mine. They came to me about two o'clock the day Al was killed. More than an hour after you said you saw Al for the last time. I typed it on my portable, and then I took it over to Al. And you did go to Al's apartment. Well, he, yes. I, I called you earlier. I couldn't get you, so I drove over to Al's. Well, maybe I did lie about those lines. That doesn't prove it that I... It proves enough that I'm arresting you for the murder of Al Wilson, Mr. Gray. You see, Ted, I typed those lines on Al's portable, as I'm certain the police will be able to prove... 
I reached Al's apartment about 2.30 and left about a quarter of three. The coroner says Al was killed around three. Well, maybe he was. At three o'clock... You had I... just finished killing Al in his apartment. It couldn't have been anyone else, Ted. Only two people besides me could have possibly known those lines. Al Wilson and the man who killed him. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. This is in Europe present The Whistler. This is in Europe present The Whistler. This is in Europe. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Stolen Letter. As Susan Hayes, ambitious but none too successful young actress, approached the old-fashioned Iron Gate entrance to the home of an uncle she'd never seen, its appearance gave her a feeling of foreboding. She shivered slightly, and instead of entering the gates, Susan drove a hundred feet or so past the gate, stopped beside one of the few electric light posts lining the lonely road, and reread the strange letter from her uncle she'd received a few days earlier. My dear niece Susan, since I have only a few weeks left to live, I should like very much to see a little of you before I go. Poor darling. My last will names you and my nephew, your cousin Hillary Weston, as equal beneficiaries. But in recent months, Hillary has proven not only unworthy, but dishonest as well. I've decided, therefore, to create a new will naming you as sole beneficiary or dividing my estate equally between you and some worthy charity. However, before writing a new will, I should like to know a little more about you. Of course. I would therefore appreciate it if you could arrange to spend two or three weeks as my house guest, arriving as soon as possible. Affectionately, Louis Denton. You place the letter in your purse. Decide you owe it to your uncle to spend at least a few days in his home. Then you enter the ground. But after meeting your cousin Hillary, being shown to your room and dining, you begin to regret your decision. For your presence in the house is obviously distasteful to your cousin and your uncle's secretary, Patricia Meadows. Why can't I see Uncle Lewis this evening, Hillary? At least tell him I've arrived. I'm sorry, Susan, but I have orders from the doctor to give Uncle his sedatives. I gave him one at seven, and it's past nine now. Uh, furthermore, he's not to be disturbed. It might make him restless. <sighs> I see. Well, tomorrow morning will do just as well, I suppose. Uh, Patricia will take you to see him in the morning. She's been Uncle's secretary for nearly a year now. Right, Patricia? Yes, but I couldn't make a go of it as an actress. I decided to become a secretary. <laughs> I may have to do the same thing. I'm an actress, too, but so far I haven't set any worlds on fire. I was planning on going to New York after leaving here. Sleepy? Oh, horribly. If you two will excuse me, I, I think I'll retire. I'm awfully tired. <laughs> You retire to your room, but you're unable to sleep, aren't you, Susan? You have a feeling of uneasiness, almost fright. You get up and take your last two sleeping tablets, but you're still restless. Finally, at a little past two in the morning, you fall into a light sleep. In what seems like a few moments, you wake with a start. Certain you heard someone leave your room and close the door. Sit up in bed. Wait a few minutes. Decide you're mistaken that it was merely the curtains blowing in the breeze. Next morning, at a little past eight, you're awakened by a knock on your door. Yes? May I come in, Miss Hayes? Oh, Miss Meadows? Yes. Of course. Come in. Mr. 
Miss Hayes. I'm afraid I have bad news for you. Yes? Your uncle died in the night. Oh, no. His heart... Well, the doctor seems to think that... Well, that he may have died from an overdose of sleeping tablets. Over... But I thought Hillary... Well, Hillary gave him his one nightly sedative at 7 o'clock. But the doctor says his appearance definitely indicates that... Well, that someone must have given him some more later on. More? But who? Well, that's what the sheriff wants to find out. He's downstairs now. He wants to talk to you as soon as you get dressed. Miss Hayes, uh, Hillary here, Mr. Weston, that is, tells me you're an equal beneficiary with him under the terms of your uncle's will. That's what my uncle wrote me, Sheriff. He also tells me that your uncle was intending to write a new will, eliminating you and leaving everything to Hillary. What's going on here? Hillary told you that? Yes. Then he didn't tell you the truth. My uncle wrote a letter and asked me to come and visit him here for a few days. He also told me quite definitely that he was very disappointed in Hillary... That he decided to write a new will, naming me as sole beneficiary and eliminating Hillary. Uh, you have that letter? Yes, it's on the dressing table in my room. I'll go get it. Never mind. I'll go get it, Miss Hayes. You say you left the letter on your dressing table, Miss Hayes? Of course, Sheriff. I read it over last night just before I went to bed. There was no letter of any kind in your room, Miss Hayes. But I did find something else. Empty bottle marked sedative. Take only as prescribed. An overdose might prove dangerous. You're certain of one of two facts. Aren't you, Susan? Either your uncle died a natural death, or Hillary deliberately administered a fatal dosage of sleeping tablets to bring about his death before he had an opportunity to change his will. You tell your story to the sheriff over and over again, but he doesn't believe you, and you admit to yourself that in his position, you probably wouldn't either. Hillary has lived in your uncle's home since he was a small child and has known the sheriff since boyhood. Everyone in town knows Hillary. You are a stranger, an outsider. You're surprised when the Crenwood Sheriff leaves without placing you under arrest. There's just nothing else I can say, Sheriff. I had the letter and now it's gone. Well, I think I found out all I can this morning anyway. There's nothing to do now but wait for the medical report. If Mr. Denton died from an overdose of sleeping tablets, I'm afraid it... Looks rather bad for you, Miss Hayes. But look, I told you. I took the last two sleeping tablets in that bottle myself. Why should I want to kill my uncle? I've never even seen him. From what Hillary here says, your motive was pretty clear. But I tell you, I don't know anything about what my uncle had in mind. All I know about him was in the letter he wrote me, which has been destroyed by whoever killed my uncle if he was killed. Too bad you can't produce that letter you say your uncle wrote you. Might have helped your position a great deal. Whoever killed my uncle destroyed that letter. You're suggesting some specific person? Yes. Whoever had the most to gain from my uncle's death. From what Hillary says, you did. Anyway, you'll be hearing from us after we find the results of the medical report. I'll be back in three or four hours. Naturally, I expect all of you to remain in town. Of course. Bye, Sheriff. Bye, Hillary. Miss Meadows. He's seeing you, Miss Hayes. We'll all be here, of course. Naturally. Well, I think I'll ride with you, Sheriff. I've got a lot of things to do in town. I'll be back in three hours or so, Patricia. Uh, take care of Susan. Of course, Hillary. You're in a bad spot, Miss Hayes. Hillary lied to the Sheriff, Patricia. Uncle Lewis wasn't planning on cutting me out of his will. He was planning on making me his sole heir, cutting Hillary out. Hillary says your uncle told him just the opposite. He was lying. It was all in that letter my uncle wrote. But you can't find that letter. No, of course not. Because it was stolen from my room last night so Hillary could build this horrible frame against me. After he took the letter, he gave Uncle Lewis the sedatives that killed him. I know he did. I don't know what happened, Miss Hayes. 
But I do know that if I were you, I certainly wouldn't be here when the results of that autopsy are known. You... You mean run away? Run away, yes. But that would be the same as a confession of guilt. Well, not necessarily. At least you'd have some time on your side. As things stand now, if your uncle really was murdered, you have it a chance. Everyone will believe Hillary. The police, the judge, the jury, everyone. That's why I want to help you. What do you mean? How would you help me? Well, look, you wouldn't dare to drive your own car. You'd be picked up in an hour. But I could drive you to the station, and you could take a bus to San Diego. And then you could take a plane to New York. And if you need money... I have enough I... money. Look, why are you doing this? Because I think it's the only sure way to keep you out of the gas chamber. You really believe it's that bad? As it looks now, yes. Of course, in time, I have a hunch you'll get a break. Oh, but... I hate uh... to run out. But I guess you're right. All right, I'll be ready to leave in ten minutes. Good. Now, no matter what happens, I'll manage to stall them until you're on your way to New York. And in New York, no one will ever even know what happened out here. Uh, Karen Layton, Sandusky, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Were you expecting any mail preceding your arrival, Miss Layton? Uh, no, no. Uh, let's see. We have a small single on the 12th floor. Oh, that'll be fine. I'll only be here a few days. All right. Here you are, 12.02. Boy, show Miss Layton to 12.02. Thank you. Oh, uh, is there a beauty parlor close by? Uh, right across the street. Madame Dana's. After being shown to your room, you phone Madame Dana's beauty parlor and make an appointment for an hour later. Then you return to the lobby, buy an afternoon paper, buried in an obscure spot on the fifth page. A small headline startles you. West Coast actress sought in death of wealthy uncle. It's a brief column. But as you read on, your certain Patricia Meadows, whatever her motive, gave you sound advice when she urged you to disappear. The autopsy proved your uncle was killed by an overdose of sleeping tablets. And the case Hillary built against you was perfect. And you're certain you would have been tried and found guilty had you remained in Cranbourne. Now you must make certain that Susan Hayes is never found again. And your visit to the beauty parlor is an important step in that direction, where a brunette hair dye marks the end of Susan Hayes and the real beginning of Karen Layton, doesn't it? No recent pictures of you are out. You've never met a New York agent. So you decide to try and begin a new career as an actress. The change in your appearance seems to bring about a change in your luck, doesn't it? You call on dramatic producer Brad Williams, where you're hired as an understudy to the star of his current show, Eight months later, you're the star of a new Brad Williams production. A smash hit after six weeks on Broadway. It's the realization of all your dreams, isn't it? For days at a time, you forget Cranwood, your uncle, that you were ever Susan Hayes. Then one Wednesday, you're sitting in your dressing room following the midweek matinee. Yes? A lady to see you, Miss Lake. Oh, tell her to come in. Hello, Miss Layton. Oh, how do you do? I'm afraid I don't know you. I'm Patricia Meadows. And I do know you, Miss Hayes. Miss Hayes? Susan Hayes. You know, Susan, you shouldn't have appeared on that television show last week. I recognized you instantly, even with the black hair. <laughs> well, you were all mixed up, uh, Miss Meadows, is it? Patricia Meadows. Remember? secretary to your late uncle, Louis Denton. And you're still Susan Hayes. Well, I'd recognize you anywhere. Oh, really, I, I don't know what this is all about, but Karen Layton is not only my professional name, it's my real name. Have it your way. 
But I'm wiring the sheriff of Cranwood County that I'm certain I've found the missing Susan Hayes wanted on suspicion of murder. Goodbye, Miss Hayes. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah? What is it you want from me? Very little, really. Just get me established in show business. You're a big star now, and I've always wanted to be one. Well, naturally, I'll... I'd be glad to help in any way I can, but... Well, you can manage what I want very easily. I just want to be your understudy. My understudy? Yes. I could learn a lot watching you. I see. And then in a few months, I'll become ill, and you'll take over the part. That is a possibility, isn't it? What makes you think you could play the part? I can play the part. You'll have to audition. Brad Williams, the producer, isn't easy to please. Neither am I. Can you arrange an audition soon? I think so. In fact, I'm sure I can. And you will? Yes, I will. Good. I'll be grateful to you forever, Miss Layton. Patricia. Yes? Why are you bringing your thing to my dressing room? Well, it'll be my dressing room next week, won't it? Next week? Well, you've only been understudying me for a month. But I know the part backwards. No, Patricia, it's too early. Maybe another month or two. You know, Karen... Well, lately you haven't been looking very well. Even Brad's noticed it. He mentioned it to me only yesterday. After a subtle hint from you. Perhaps. How can I possibly explain to Brad that I'm ill? He'd insist on his own doctor examining me. Oh, you'll think of something. Unless, of course, you'd prefer to have me notify the Crenwood police that I found Susan Hayes. Oh, I guess you will. And you're right. I'll think of something. And you do think of something, don't you, Susan? You're certain now that Patricia Meadows was Hillary's accomplice in the death of your uncle. And you know that as long as she is alive, your career, perhaps your life, is in jeopardy. So you make your decision, don't you, Susan? As soon as you're certain Patricia has left the theater, you walk directly to the office of Brad Williams. Hi, Karen. Hello, Brad. What have you got on your mind? Everything okay? Mm, Yes and no. Uh Uh-oh. What does that mean? Brad... Would you mind too much if I left the show for a couple of weeks? Oh. Let Patricia Meadows play the part. But why? Oh, I, I don't know. I haven't been feeling well. I, I don't know what's the matter, but I'm just tired, that's all. If I don't rest for a couple of weeks, I'm honestly afraid I'll become ill. Well, have you seen a doctor? Oh, of course. There's nothing wrong with me, but I know how I feel, Brad. I've, I've just got to rest for a couple of weeks. Well, of course, honey. You mean a lot more to me than the show... You mean more to me than anything. I do. You know you do. This isn't a very romantic place to tell you, but... I love you, Karen. You're sure? Of course. I've loved you for months. I want you to marry me. Oh, Brad. Darling. You still want to leave the show for two weeks? Oh, yes. More than ever now. I'd like to have Patricia take over Monday. But I'll make a deal with you. What kind of a deal? If you would just let me have your Mountain Lodge Sunday, I'll take Patricia up there and rehearse her all day. It's a deal. I'll call her right away. No. No, let me call her. I'll phone her this evening. Hello? Hello, Patricia. Uh, Like I told you, you win. I told Brad right after you left. You're taking over the part Monday. I thought you'd think of something. Uh, Brad wants me to rehearse you all day Sunday. He suggested we drive up to his mountain lodge and work all day, okay? Suits me. I'll be ready about 8 Sunday morning. I'll pick you up. Now, you've not only your career to think about, your freedom. There's Brad, too. And whatever happens to Patricia Meadows, she brought it on herself, didn't she? 
Yes, you're calm as you work out your plans for Sunday afternoon. When you're sure Patricia will have a uh, fatal accident and be out of your life forever. Sunday afternoon, a few hundred feet from Brad's Lodge on a grassy knoll overlooking a cliff, with a sheer drop of 200 feet, you and Patricia are working hard on stage business as Patricia goes through line after line of dialogue. Perfect. Was my walk all right that time? Yes, but when you read that line, I I love him, I can't do without him, I just can't, you should take about five steps forward and speak more slowly. Oh, uh, you ought to be holding his picture, too. Okay, I'll hold my purse for a prop. Uh, I'll do it perfectly this time. And now you watch. I love him. I can't do it, honey. I just can't. It's going exactly as you planned, isn't it, Susan? She's only 10 or 12 feet away from the cliff. A quick run forward, a hard push. Two at the most while she's off balance. And your worries are over. You drop your script and start forward. Then stop. You can't do it, can you, Susan? No, you can't kill. Patricia turns back towards you. Was I all right? You were excellent. I thought when you came over so quickly, I did something wrong. You're lucky, Patricia. I was going to push you off the cliff, kill you. I'd planned it ever since I'd arranged to bring you up here. I didn't think you had it in you. I haven't. But the game's over, Patricia. I'm going to the police and tell them everything. You'll be charged with murder. Maybe. Maybe not. When I tell them you've been protecting me all this time... And they start questioning you and Hillary. I have an idea things might turn out a little differently than you think. Now, wait a minute. What can you gain by going to the police? I'm the only one who knows who you are. Now, look. Now, just forget about leaving this show. I'll I'll just stay on as your understudy. And sooner or later, I'll get a break. You've gotten your last break as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to the police and tell them everything. Oh, no, you're not... I'm not going to lose after getting this far. With you out of the way, I'll be a star in a year. You're going over that cliff. No, Patricia, be careful. Patricia, give me your hand. You remember trying to seize the hand of Patricia Meadows. A feeling of falling into space, then black emptiness. And now, as you slowly open your eyes, you hear a voice. Karen? The voice of Brad Williams. At first, as though it were thousands of miles away. Karen? Then it comes closer. Closer. Karen? It's Brad. Brad? How... Where am I? You're in the living room of the lodge, and you're all right. Well, it's a miracle you didn't fall over that cliff. You were only a few inches from the edge when you fainted. Lucky thing I decided to run up and see how you girls were getting along. Otherwise, you might have rolled over. But I didn't fall. You merely fainted, darling. We had quite a time bringing you around. You were out for nearly an hour. A type of shock, according to the doctor. Patricia, did she... I'm afraid she did, darling. Over the cliff. Oh, Brad, I, I tried to save her. Honestly, I tried to grab her hand even at the last. Well, that was obvious to the police from the way you were holding her purse. It was in your hand when we found you. I have to tell you this, Brad. I had planned to kill her. But when the time came, I just couldn't. Of course you couldn't. You couldn't kill anyone. Don't even talk about it. I... She slipped while she was trying to push me. I said not to talk about it. There now. Feeling better? I'm all right. Karen, why didn't you tell me the police were looking for you? You knew. Not till just now. Patricia left the whole story in her purse. Lucky you held on to it when you tried to save her. You mean she left a confession? A newspaper clipping. Six months old. 
Your cousin, Hillary Weston, confessed to killing your uncle in an audit of his book showed thefts that only your cousin could have committed. Weston broke down, told everything. He gave Patricia 5000 to persuade you to run away, make it look as though you'd done it. Later, she decided to capitalize on your success. You mean I've been hiding from nothing? Well, not exactly. The police have been looking for you so that the money your uncle left you can be turned over to you. Incidentally, darling, I didn't realize I was marrying an heiress. Listen next week when, once again, the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. (laughs) Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline invite you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, The Jackson Street Affair. She paced nervously, anxiously, back and forth across the thin carpeting of the parlor in the house on Upper Jackson Street. A rooming house now, the ancient three-story structure had seen far better days, standing as it had through so much of the history and lore of old San Francisco. But this was present-day San Francisco, and Catherine Marley, 30-ish, dark hair, wasn't thinking of the distant past. Rather, she was worrying about the immediate future. She was worrying so much that when she sat down to light a cigarette, her hand shook. And when the doorbell sounded, she almost leaped from the chair and then hurried to answer the ring. I'm coming. The trunk is right here in the hall. You can just... Oh, you're not... Rawlings is the name, ma'am. Fred Rawlings. I just saw your vacancy sign here. Oh, oh yes, yes, of course. <laughs> I thought you were from the transfer company. Oh, no, no, no. I'm from the Brisbane Star out of Australia. Merchant Marine, ma'am. Radio operator. Uh, now, uh, about the room. Oh, uh, come in. Well, I, uh, I hadn't hoped to be so lucky, ma'am. I mean, finding a room vacant here. You see, I'll only be in town a few days. I wanted to visit my old friend, Carl Pennell. Carl Pennell? Yes. He lives here, doesn't he? Well, he did live here, Mr. Rawlings. Did live here? I don't understand. I uh, don't... Mr. Pennell moved out just two days ago. Oh, it's odd. You see, I'd written to him. I told him I was coming. Oh, very odd. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. He didn't even leave a forwarding address. Oh. Of course, it shouldn't be too difficult to trace him down, eh? Uh, his trunk here. Uh, where are you supposed to send it? His trunk? Oh, well, that doesn't belong to Mr. Pennell. It's, it's my trunk. Oh, indeed. Well, then it is going to be hard to locate Carl. Uh, no address. I don't know where to start. I, uh, I don't suppose you'll be wanting to stay here, then. I mean, since Mr. Pennell's moved out. Huh? Oh, well, I don't know where else I'd stay, ma'am. Uh, might as well be here. We're getting tired of toting this sea bag about. Um, could you show me to the room? Well, if you wish, I... Uh... All right. This way, Mr. Rawlings. It's this floor in the back. Oh. Matter of fact, it's the same room Mr. Pennell had. <laughs> That's a nice room, Miss Marley. Very nice. I'm sorry the view isn't more inspiring. Oh, the neighbor's laundry? Oh, that's all right. That's a homey touch, ma'am. 
something on this on shipboard. So, yes, I'll take it. I'll pay in advance. Um, now, is this the closet? Uh, no, no, the closet's over here. Oh. That leads to Mrs. Finch's room. It's bolted. Oh, that's a shame. Mrs. Finch, Emma, is the cleaning woman. <laughs> The maid, eh? Uh, uh, keeps everything uh, shipshape, does she? That's the idea. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. I just... Oh, uh, uh, come uh, in, Mrs. Finch. Sorry to bother. I hadn't quite finished dusting. This is Mr. Rawlings, Mrs. Finch. He's thinking about taking this room. Oh, how do you do, I'm sure. Well, Mrs. Finch, I understand that should I take the room, you and I would be uh, neighbors. Yes, sir. My room's right next to yours. You can tend to the dusting later, Mrs. Finch. Yes, ma'am. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Rawlings. Goodbye, Mrs. Finch. She's a colorless sort, isn't she? She's neat, unobtrusive. That's all we ask of her. Mm -hmm. Um, how is it, miss, if you'll excuse me asking, how is it such a pretty young woman as yourself is running a rooming house? Oh, it's temporary. I plan to sell the place soon. This was my mother's house. She oh. died a few years ago. Uh, so you've just been carrying on until... Uh... Yes, until I can make other arrangements. Well, I hope you'll enjoy your stay, Mr. Rollins. Oh, I'm certain I will, ma'am. Certain. And, uh, thanks to you. You don't like this, do you, Captain? This unexpected arrival of Mr. Fred Rawling. You don't like it at all. And so you hurry quickly down the hall and tap so softly on the door of another room. Captain, what's wrong? You look... Come into my room, Alex. I must talk to you right away. I don't see what we've got to worry about. This Rawlings is just a friend of Carl. Don't he say is. we've nothing to worry about. We killed a man, didn't we? A man who recently came into quite a sum of money. Don't forget that, Captain. And Carl was even thoughtful enough to keep his money on him in a money belt. I'm not forgetting anything, Alex. Oh, how simple it looked. Carl Pennell was lonely, we told ourselves. Lonely and rich after his uncle died. No relatives, no friends. Until this Fred Rawling showed up from nowhere. Oh, Catherine, Catherine, you're all on edge. We've got what we wanted, the money. Uh, how do we know Fred Rawlings doesn't know about Carl's money? Suppose he does. Oh, Alex, I'm sorry. I'd like to share your calm, cool manner. But the fact remains, he did notice the trunk. And that trunk contains Carl Pennell's body right at this moment. I won't breathe safely until it's out of this house. Hey, wait a minute. Looking for something? Hey. Oh, I was just having a look at this old trunk here. Alex, uh, this is our new guest, Fred Rawlings. He's in the Merchant Marine. How do you do, Alex? Hello. Oh, I could have sworn that trunk belonged to my friend Carl, that's all. It doesn't. It's Catherine, uh, Miss Marley's. Uh -huh. Well, it's just got Carl Pennell on my mind, I suppose. Uh, you folks hear about Carl coming into a bit of money? Why, no. No, as a matter of fact, we often wondered how he got by. Oh, it was nice for Carl. Nice for anybody to have a rich relative leave him an unexpected windfall. Couldn't have happened to a nicer chap. Well, I'll, uh, I'll be getting back to my room. Sit down. What do you think? I don't know, Catherine. I don't know. Alex. What's the matter? It's drunk. Those blurred initials on the side. I, I never noticed them before. Blurred initials? Well, F R. For me. Not so funny, not so funny at all. F.R., they could stand for Fred Rawlings, Alex. They could, it but... It could the... have been his trunk, and he let Carl Pennell use it. Alex, he knows we're lying. Engine wear. Engine wear. It's one of the principal reasons drivers have to spend big sums of money having their motors overhauled. Engine wear. It's one of the principal reasons motors lose pep and power, get fewer miles per gallon of gas. Engine wear. It's one of the principal reasons cars gradually use more and more oil until eventually they become oil eaters. No wonder automotive and petroleum engineers for years have sought ways to reduce engine wear. And now at last, Signal reports startling success with an amazing new motor oil 
that reduces by 50% engine wear due to lubrication. That means your car can now keep its light new pep and power twice as long. It means you can now enjoy low oil consumption twice as long if your car isn't already an oil eater. So if you want to be good to your car and your pocketbook too, drain out that lazy old motor oil. Have a signal dealer refill your crankcase this week with Signal Premium, the amazing new heavy-duty type oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. Engine wear, engine wear, engine wear. Shares your worry now, doesn't he, Captain? Alex, who was so cool, so calm up to a few minutes ago. Yes, he senses the terrible peril you've both been placed in with the arrival of Fred Rawlings looking for his friend, Carl Pennell. It was a most unexpected arrival, wasn't it? Especially with Carl Pennell lying dead inside the trunk, which you think Rawlings has already recognized as one belonging to him. He knows you've lied, doesn't he, Captain? You're certain of that. The only uncertain thing is what to do about it. Finally, Alex makes a practical suggestion. The only thing left for you to do. We've got to get that trunk out of here as fast as possible. It's as simple as that, Catherine. Well, the devil's holding up that transfer company. They should have been here an hour ago. Oh, Alex, I can't stand this waiting. I mean, with Fred Rawlings snooping around. Well, he can't see you like this. You've got to get a hold. Look, we'll change the plan. You go on over to Mill Valley, the cottage. I'll wait here and see that the trunk gets on the truck. Yes, yes, it might be safer, Alex. At least till I get hold of my nerves. If... I know. Go on, now drive over to the cottage and wait for him to deliver the trunk. Tonight we'll bury it where it will never be found. I'll stay here, keep an eye on things. Particularly on Mr. Fred Rawlings. <laughs> Driving across the Golden Gate Bridge, you're still wondering if Alex is right, aren't you, Captain? Alex. Yes, his assurance that everything will work out. At the little cottage where you hope to live after selling the old boarding house, you sit down to wait. The hours drag by like years, don't they, Catherine? And then at last you see the transfer truck pull up in front and unload the trunk. Where do you want us to put this trunk, lady? Oh, in the garage. And now how much do I owe you? It's all taken care of, lady. Tell it the other end. Oh, yes, Alex. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> we were wondering if you'd forgotten us. Been busy, lady. Bigger stuff. These routine hauls just have to wait. Yes, I suppose so. The routine hauls have to wait, Catherine. You can't help thinking about the casual, unknowing words of the transfer man. As you lock up the cottage, Get into your car and start back toward San Francisco. You feel relaxed now, secure. You'll meet Alex, have dinner with him, and then leave the remainder of the grim plan in his hands. In Mill Valley, you stop for a leisurely lunch before driving back across the bridge. After lunch, you get back into your car, and as you glance out the window, you see a cab passing, coming from the direction of the cottage, a cab bearing a single passenger, Fred Rawlings. Shocked and nervous, you drive quickly back to the cottage and run to the garage. The trunk! It's been opened! Yes, Captain. The trunk has been opened. Undoubtedly by Fred Rawlings. You feel the panic sweep through you as you realize that Fred probably knows everything now. All about the murder of his friend, Kyle Pennell. You look inside the trunk, straightened up, startled. There's only a few odds and ends of clothing inside, Captain. Kyle Pennell's body has disappeared. It's almost 8 o'clock that evening when you arrive back in town. Rush into the rooming house. Find Alex waiting for you in the front parlor. A grin on his face. Alex. Alex. I know. I know. Don't tell me. Rawlings followed the trunk out to Mill Valley, didn't he? Yes, and he forced it open. But Alex, the body... No, no, it wasn't in the trunk. I had a hunch our Mr. Rawlings would do exactly as he did, so I made a little switch. But 
Pennell's body, what did you do with it? In the basement, in the small room behind the furnace. What? Now, relax. No one ever goes in there. Besides, I moved half a dozen trunks and crates. Pile them up in front of the door. Mrs. Finch could never move them in a million years. Oh, Alex, I don't like this. We've got to get rid of that body. All right, all right. We'll get rid of the body late tonight. But it's going to be risky as long as Rawlings is around. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Suppose our fine Mr. Rawlings wasn't around. Mm-hmm. The same thing that happened to Pennell could happen to Rawlings, too. Why not, Alex? Why not? Now, this is more like my old Catherine. We wait till he's in bed, asleep. Turn on the gas. Look, we better get moving fast. He's not in the room now, is he? No, he went out a little while ago for cigarettes. He'll be back soon. Well, I'll go down to the cellar, turn off the gas. You go to his room... Take the valve out of the gas line and the heater. Hurry. Down in the cellar, you turn off the gas. No one will notice it, Captain. You're certain of that. Because the only other gas outlet in the entire house, beside the one in the kitchen, is in Rawlings' room. You hurry back upstairs. And as you start into the parlor, the front door opens. Evening, Miss Marley. Rawlings. He's back, Catherine, isn't he? And a little too soon. Alex is still in Rawlings' room. You've got to stall Rawlings off long enough for Alex to come back. Oh, uh, good evening, Mr. Rawlings. It's getting a bit cooler out. Uh, yes, yes, it is. Uh, come on into the parlor. I was going to fix a highball. Perhaps you'll join me? Um, thanks, no. Well, uh, keep me company, then. Of course. Charming room, this. I love these old-fashioned parlors, don't you, Miss Marley? It was Mother's favorite room. I've left it just the way she liked it. Uh, sit down, won't you? Thanks. You, uh, have a big day, Mr. Rowling? Yes. Rather a busy one, at that. Uh, so many things to do, you know. So many old friends to visit and all. Any of those old friends know the whereabouts of your Mr. Pinnell? No. I'm afraid not. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, I have a feeling I'll find the lead soon, Miss Marley. All set, baby. Uh, Mr. Rawlings, you've met Alex, haven't you? Of course. How are you, old man? Fine, just fine. Drink, Alex? I don't care if I do. Are you sure you won't change your mind, Mr. Rawlings? Well, uh, by George, I will have one. Um, plain water, eh? <laughs> As the three of you sit sipping your drink, Rawling seems to monopolize most of the conversation, doesn't he, Captain? Yes, he's in a talkative mood, enjoying himself. And you chat for almost an hour. Finally, he announces he's going to retire for the evening. And after he's gone, you and Alex sit quietly and wait for an hour or so. And then the two of you slip out into the backyard. He ought to be asleep by now, the way you slug his drinks. I have a hunch it takes more than a few shots of bourbon to put him to sleep. I hope he doesn't decide to sit up half the night and read. Oh, no, look. His room's dark. And the windows are all down. That's good. Must be asleep. All right. You know what to do. Sure, I know. And, Alex, when you turn the gas on... I know. Just a little at a time to start with. Will you just leave it to me? Back upstairs in the parlor, you pace the floor. And finally, Alex returns from the cellar, drops into the chair by the fireplace, and grins at you. Then he picks up a magazine, leans back, starts to read. You continue to pace the room, glancing occasionally at the clock. Relax, huh? Nothing's going to go wrong. Gas has been pouring into that room for almost three hours now. Mr. Rawlings is well on his way. Oh, I know, I know. Come on, have a drink and stop thinking about everything. Alex, wait. What's the matter? Someone's coming down the hall. Hello, you chap. What? Oh, I didn't mean to startle you, Miss Marley. I'm sorry, are you still up? Yes, yes, we're still up. I thought you'd... Uh... Gone to bed, Mr. Rowan. Oh, I've started to, but I got to chatting with a fellow across the hall, McGill. I've been in his room all this time, uh, shooting the breeze, I believe you call it. I see. 
It seems I've developed a bit of an appetite. Any night eateries about? Oh, oh yes. on Geary Street, you'll find several. Oh, thanks. Uh, can I bring anything back for you, chat? A uh, sandwich or something? No, no, thank you. Oh, well. Good night. So, nothing to go wrong, Alex. Nothing could go okay, wrong. Okay, how was I to know? Oh, you'd better air out that room before he gets back. And replace the valve on the gas line. Hurry. <laughs> Your little plan didn't work this time, did it, Captain? No, Mr. Rawlings is still very much alive, very much a threat. Down in the cellar, you turn off the gas. Wait a few minutes. Give Alex enough time to put the valve back in the line in Rawlings' room. Then you turn the gas on again. So the gas in the kitchen will function normally. And you go back up to the parlor. Alex joins you a moment later. How was it? Pretty bad, but I left the windows open. Most of the gas order will be gone by the time he gets back. Well, what now, sweetheart? Do we try again? Uh, no. There's bound to be some trace of gas left in that room. He'd notice it. Check the gas heater. No, we can't try that stunt again, Alex. Then what? We'll have to think of something else. Figure out some other way. And it isn't going to be easy, Alex. <laughs> It's on your mind all night long, isn't it, Captain? You rack your brain for some simple way, something that doesn't involve too many risks, a way to rid yourself of Mr. Rowland. And by morning, you still haven't found the answer you're looking for. You're having a cup of coffee when he comes in, and you're surprised to see the suitcase in his hand. Why, good morning, Mr. Rowland. Morning. Just popped in to say goodbye. You're leaving us? I'm afraid so. The ship's going out a day early. Oh, didn't I tell you? Well, no, you didn't. <laughs> it must have slipped my mind. We're, we're sailing at noon. Oh, I see. Well, I'm awfully sorry to have you leave us so soon. As a matter of fact, I'd like very much to stay on a bit, but, uh, well, you know how it is. Uh, oh, by the way, I've, uh, I have a confession to make, Miss Marley. Oh? A confession? Yes, I feel you ought to know about it. You see, uh, well, I thought you were trying to put something over on me. What do you mean? About Pennell, his sudden departure and all that. I I thought you were covering up for him. Covering up? Why should I do that? Oh, that, uh, that business about the trunk. It did look rather suspicious, you see. I recognized the trunk immediately. I'd given it to Pennell several years ago. Oh, I see. And when I said it was my trunk, <laughs> you were certain that I... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, actually, it might have been Mr. Pennell's at that. There's so many old trunks in the basement, I just suppose they all belong to Mother. Well, Pennell probably had no further use for it. He left it down there when he moved in. And he certainly didn't mention it when he moved away. Well, anyway, I I do want to apologize, Miss Marley. Well, don't give it another thought. Goodbye, Mr. Rowling. And the next time you're in port... Right. I'll pop in. Say hello. <laughs> You almost laugh out loud with relief, don't you, Captain? As you hurry upstairs to tell Alex the good news. But his reaction isn't quite what you expected. So he's leaving, huh? Pulling out just like that. Of course. That's what he just told me. Yeah, that's what he just told you. What? You mean he's lying? He isn't going at all? It's a trick? I think we'd better go down to the docks, baby, make sure the Brisbane Star pulls out and that Mr. Rawlings is aboard when she does. You better tell Emma we're going out. Oh, I will. Oh, Emma! Uh, yes, Miss Molly. Oh, we're going out for a while. Take care of things, will you, Emma? But, Miss Molly... We're going out for a while. It's a 20-minute drive to the Embarcadero. Alex parks his car near the pier where the Brisbane Star is docked. The hours go by, and the two of you watch the loading of the boat. And then, a few minutes before 12... <laughs> She's pulling out all right, baby. Yes, and look up there, Alex. On the deck. Yeah, Mr. Rawlings, big as life. Goodbye, Mr. Rawlings. Bon voyage. <laughs> well, honey, I'd say we don't have a thing to worry about anymore. Not a thing.
engine wear, engine wear, engine wear. Is engine wear causing your expensive motor to wear out twice as fast as necessary? It is if you're still using lazy motor oils that merely lubricate. Here's what I mean. In amazing new Signal Premium motor oil, special properties are engineered into the oil through the marvels of modern chemistry. As a result, new Signal Premium not only reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%, it also protects your motor in all these important extra ways. One, keeps oil rings clean and free. Two, controls and reduces harmful engine deposits such as carbon, gum, and varnish. Three, prevents sticking of hydraulic valve lifters. Four, stops acid corrosion and rust. Best of all, Signal's new heavy-duty type oil gives you all this extra protection at no increase in price. Good reason to get your next oil change at a Signal service station. Change this week to amazing new Signal Premium Motor Oil that reduces engine wear due to lubrication 50%. Engine wear, engine wear, engine wear. It's all over now, isn't it, Captain? The threat is gone. Sailed aboard the Brisbane Star. Now all that remains is for you and Alex to return to the rooming house and, at the first opportunity, get rid of Pennell's body now hidden in the small cellar room behind the furnace. Then the cottage in Mill Valley and a comfortable life thanks to Mr. Pennell's money. The two of you drive back to the house and as you step into the parlor, you find a tall, heavy-set man there waiting for you. Hello? You uh, must be Miss Marley. Yes, yes, that's right. I'm Lieutenant Kincaid, Police Department. I'd like to ask you a few questions. What? What's wrong? You had a roomie here named Pennell, Carl Pennell? Yes, but he moved away several days ago. Are you sure? Of course she is. Matter of fact, Alex and I saw him leave in a taxi. He, he said something about having to catch a train, I think. I see. Now, Mrs. Finch, can you come in, please? Lieutenant, what's this all about? Oh, Miss Marley. Miss Marley. Emma, what's the matter? Well, it, it was about the gas. I tried to tell you this morning, but you and Mr. Alex were in such a hurry. What about the gas? Twice now. Two nights in one week. I smelled gas in my room. It worried me. I thought something should be done about it. Well, she called the gas company and they sent a couple of men over to check the house. Yes. My room being directly over the furnace, I thought maybe that's where the gas was coming from. And, and... <laughs> The gas company men checked the furnace and found nothing. And tracing the pipes to the exterior of the house, they had to go into that small room in the cellar. No. Yeah. That's when they called the police. Mrs. Finch identified the body as that of Carl Pennell. Now, Miss Marley, suppose you and your boyfriend here come along with me to headquarters. I think you got a lot of explaining to do. the Whistler each Sunday night at this same time. Signal has asked me to remind you that today the Red Cross, in addition to providing life-saving whole blood and other needed help for our GIs overseas, must now stockpile blood plasma for possible civilian needs, as well as be prepared to furnish emergency food, clothing, and shelter in case of disaster or enemy attack here. Good reason why this year the Red Cross needs more of us to help and more help from each of us. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Joe Gilbert, Larry Dobkin, Martha Wentworth, Ben Wright, and Herbert Lifton. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Adrian Jean Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs, because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. many things where I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Flee from Evil. <laughs> There was almost complete darkness around the parked car on the lonely road on the outskirts of Seattle. And the man at the wheel, heavy set and fiftyish, tried to peer through this darkness. He couldn't see, but he could imagine what was taking place some 50 yards further up the road. A raised gun, careful aim, and then... The shot that Bert Macklin was waiting to hear. Shot followed by the sound of running feet. A few moments later, Bert's nephew had run to the car, leaped inside, and Bert had the motor running, the car in gear, moving forward. Swing around, Uncle Bert. We'll, we'll go back the way we came. Right. You got him? Yes. Yes, I got him. Here, look out. You're, you're getting off the road. We'll get stuck. Yeah, I stuck. Oh, no. We've got to get out of here. You keep stepping on it, and I'll, I'll give her a push. Let up. Let up. One, two, three. That's it. She's free. Come on. Now, let's, let's go, Uncle Bert. Get us away from here. Fast. Ah, nothing to worry about now, Freddy. You're sure you took care of him? Uh, that's what I came here for. All the way from London. Yes, I, I took care of him, I'm sure. You didn't get a look at him? No, it was too dark, but he was sitting at the wheel of his car, and I, I, I slipped up alongside. I see. Well, maybe it's over. Really over. At last. Uh, there's no maybe about it. All right, but... Well, after a month of paying off, wondering when I'd be tapped again, it doesn't seem possible that I'm rid of him, Freddy. Huh? Inheriting money does have its drawbacks, hmm? Decidedly. Good thing the fellow was only getting started. Even my entire inheritance could go fast that way. Yeah. You better slow down, Uncle Bert. We're almost into town. We'll go directly back to the party. Give some excuse. And, Freddy, hmm? you've done me a great favor. Yes, and you're going to show your appreciation, of course, our uh, bargain, you know? I'll never forget this. Your help. What you just did back there. It'll be healthier for me if you do forget it right now. Killing a man, even a blackmailer, well, there's some sort of law, isn't there, Uncle Bert? I prefer the other law. The one you mentioned early this evening. An eye for an eye. Yes, you did say that, didn't you, Freddy? An eye for an eye. You were quite willing to lend a hand, so eager to cooperate. You feel a surge of confidence back at the house facing the others as Uncle Bert extends his apologies for being away. Oh, sorry, Lloyd. Veronica, we didn't intend to be gone so long, you know. Quite all right, old man. We went for a spin in Uncle Bert's new car. He, he's already imagining all sorts of things wrong with it. <laughs> oh, not at all. I, I just wanted Freddie to try it out. He's very handy with machines, you know. My, he is talented, isn't he? Oh, I don't know, Veronica. Uh, I say, where's, uh, 
Uncle Frank. Oh, uh, he left here shortly after you two did. Said he suddenly remembered a business appointment. Oh, a business appointment? Frank had a business appointment? Well, it uh, must have been rather important for him to walk out when so many drinks are being passed around. Uh, drinks? Uh, oh, now, look here, Freddy. If any drinks were passed, they were passed right by me. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry what we told Mrs. Fell to act as host until we got oh. back. Oh, your uncle's housekeeper made it quite clear to us that if we wanted any drinks while you two were gone, we'd have to fix them ourselves. Dinner, she said, is the only thing she'd attend to this evening. Oh, uh, did she? <laughs> well, I told her we'd only be gone a little while, the old gargoyle. Oh, 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 oh come now, Freddie. <laughs> Look, I'll attend to the drinks right away. Uh, why don't we all go into the bar? Uh, hmm? Wonderful yeah, idea. Yeah. Sure. Are uh, you coming, Uncle Bert? Uncle Bert? Huh? Oh, oh yes. Oh, Freddie. Just a minute. Uh, what's the matter? Frank. Freddie. You don't suppose Frank's the one? Uncle Frank. What? No, I never thought of that. It is funny, his having a business appointment just after we left the party to keep our appointment with your blackmailer. Could have been, you know. We'll find out soon enough. There's not much we can do now. No. Oh, I can't believe it, Uncle Frank. Frank's not really your uncle, Freddy. He's my half-brother. I wouldn't put it past him, sponging off me the way he's been doing those... Well, who could that be? Well, uh, let's see. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, let's see now. You'd be Mr. Bert Macklin, and you'd be Mr. Friend. Oh, well, what is it? My card. Uh, Sidney Harker, private investigator. I don't understand, Mr. Harker. You will. I'd like to come in for a little talk, if you don't mind. Oh, that, that's quite impossible. We have dinner guests. Oh, of course. Naturally, you wouldn't want them to hear what I had to say. Now, see here. What, what is the nature of your business? Hey, it all ties in rather neatly with that little display you and Freddy here put on a little while ago in the outskirts of town. Uh, Fred, I think we'd best step outside. Close the door. Now, Mr. Harker, if you'll get to the point. Well, that shooting a little while ago... That was me that Freddy Boy pumped those bullets into. Or rather, with my overcoat. Uh, you'll notice the holes. What's it? Yeah, I uh, rolled up a few blankets, put my overcoat around them, my hat on top, and left it slumped over the wheel of the car. Oh. I shot at a dummy. I see. Merely acting on behalf of my client. Client? That's right. These days, I'm forced to take anything that comes along. Uh, now to the business at hand, Jensen. As you know, my client has definite proof, Mr. Macklin, that the death of a former associate of yours was anything but accidental. Your uh, former associate's name was Edward Wilson. This information could be dropped into a mailbox to the police. Unless I pay. Uh, you see, Freddy, it isn't over. What do you want, Mr. Hawker? How much? Well, my client feels, in view of what's happened this evening, the attempted murder... That uh, this payment should be 5000 5000 Freddy, do you... Oh, take it easy, Uncle Bert. We haven't any choice. Uh, where do we deliver the money, Mr. Hawker? My office will do, Freddy boy. Say about uh, 9 tomorrow evening. Good night, gents. We're licked, Freddy. Beaten through. <laughs> it's funny. Funny? I fail to see the humor of it. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a murderer after all, am I? No, that's right. You're not. During dinner, you watch your Uncle Bert closely. His eyes wander about the table, settling on one guest and then another. And you know what he's thinking about, don't you? Uncle Frank could still be the blackmailer, couldn't he? You know that thought is going through your Uncle Bert's mind. Then there's Lloyd Gillis, an associate at the lumber mill. He could be Mr. Hawker's uh, client. Yes, either one of them could know about Bert's dead colleague, the one who was supposed to have committed suicide. And occasionally, Freddy, you feel Uncle Bert's eyes are on you, too. Dinner over, you take Veronica home. Then return to the house and find Uncle Bert has something on his mind. Freddy. Huh? This girl, Veronica. What do you know about her? Well, how much does one know about anyone? You 
meet on a boat trip. Why? I was just wondering about her. Oh, you mean you think that she could... <laughs> no, that's nonsense. She, she's just here visiting a sick sister, helping out for a bit, that's all. No, if you ask me, Uncle Frank's your blackmailer. It could be anybody, Freddy. Even you. Me? Oh, oh, now, really, isn't that a bit sick? Are you forgetting you asked me to come here all the way from London a month ago to help you out? Yes, I did ask you. We made a bargain. You were to help me get this blackmailer off my neck. In return, I was to make you my sole heir. Yes. And if I might point out, you had already been approached by the blackmailer while I was still in London. That's right. I had been approached, but through an intermediary. That's something else I've been thinking about. Why should a blackmailer share his good fortune with a go-between, eh? Because he doesn't wish to reveal his identity to me or because he doesn't happen to be on the scene at the moment. He could be anywhere. Even in London, Freddy. Oh, really, Uncle Bert? You're letting this thing get you. No, no, you, you better stick with Uncle Frank for your blackmailer. Well, I, I'm going to turn in, get some sleep. Um, you'll have the money tomorrow night, hmm? Yes. I'll see what I can do. Good night, Freddy. <laughs> You're worried, aren't you, Fred? Because the thing that brought you here from London, your Uncle Bert's money he promised to leave you in his will, is slowly slipping away. And you're powerless to prevent it. Yes, Uncle Bert's past is threatening your future. And you're even more certain of it the following evening as you sit in Sid Hocker's office and wait as he calls his client. Hello, this is Hocker. Yes, he's here now. But with only half the money. I know, but he says the rest is tied up at the moment. It'll be a week at least before he can manage the rest. He says he'll have the rest in another week. Right. What? Got it. My client isn't very happy, Freddy boy. But he is giving us more time. One hmm? week, Freddy boy. No more. It's while you're walking back to the house that an idea strikes you suddenly. You want to find Uncle Bert's blackmailer, don't you? Yes. But instead of getting rid of him, you wonder about joining forces with him. Then you could start collecting on Uncle Bert's money now, rather than wait years to inherit it. Inside the house, you hurry to the telephone, pick it up, and toy with the dial, counting the clicks. Interesting, isn't it, Fred? If you can learn to count the clicks perfectly and listen again when Sid Hocker calls his client and then remember the sound pattern, you'd have it, wouldn't you, Fred? The phone number of your uncle's blackmailer. Once you know that, Fred, you can contact the blackmailer directly. Offer him your valuable assistance in blackmailing Uncle Bert and split the money with him. One. Two. that, I'll have everyone just where I want them. Extra pep, extra pep, take those heels in high, put signal vessel in your car and it will really fly. <laughs> if you're surprised to hear me sing, just wait till you hear your car sing when you treat it to its first tank full of Signal Ethel. Yes, with the premium grade of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline in your tank, it'll be music to your ears when you touch the starter on cold mornings. Presto, your motor starts humming a tune quicker than you can turn on your radio. When it comes to acceleration, Signal Ethel will show you pep that makes even Dixieland jazz seem tame. And the knock-free power of Signal Ethel will send you up hills as smoothly and effortlessly as a coloratura from the Met soars to high C. And why not? After all, Signal Ethel is engineered to bring out the best in any car. 
So if it's best performance you want, just remember the famous last verse of that great shower room baritone Marvin Miller. Go farther and have fun, enjoy your every spin. To get more out of any car, put signal ethyl in. trial, hasn't it, Fred? From the beginning, when you first discovered that your Uncle Bert was being blackmailed and your own future fortune threatened. Yes, you were willing to commit murder to prevent it. But the attempted murder backfired and the blackmailer doubled his price. But now you feel you're in command again, that your little plan will pay off. A few days of practice and you can tell any phone number now when you hear it being dialed by counting the clicks, remembering the sound pattern. Yes, all you have to do is listen carefully the next time you're with Sid Hocker when he calls his client. Then a great idea hits you. True, it's a dangerous one. Something could go wrong. But it's worth considering carefully, isn't it? And it's constantly on your mind in the days that follow. Then on the evening of your appointment with Hocker to pay the rest of the money you promised, you step into the study, find Uncle Bert standing at the window, staring out into the night. It's almost eight, Uncle Bert. Uh, oh, Freddy. Well, hadn't I better be getting over to Hawker's? You don't have to be there till nine. Perhaps you won't get there at all. Well, you, you, you mean you didn't manage to get the rest of the money? Oh, I got it all right. It's just that I'm not certain I want to turn it over to Hawker's client. I've been trying to make up my mind all day. Oh, now look here, Uncle Bert. I know, I know. If I don't pay up, Mr. Hawker's client will expose me. Perhaps that's what I really want. Get it over with once and for all. Why should I go on paying and paying and paying... You bleed me white. But I thought we'd agreed the other day that you'd go on paying for a while at least and bide your time. He's bound to make a mistake. If I could be sure. No, I say pay off this chap. Pay as long as you're able. It, it's better than the noose. Hmm? I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it will take time and money, but it'll be worth it. Perhaps you're right, Freddy. We'll catch up to Mr. Hawker's clients. You'll see. All right. Bring the car around. I'll get the money out of the safe. <laughs> Uncle Bert had you worried for a moment, didn't he, Fred? Yes. You saw your entire plan collapse, and all that easy money slipping from your grasp. But suddenly, it was all right again. And Uncle Bert agreed to go on paying his blackmailer. Now, with the money tucked away in your coat pocket, you drive downtown to Hawker's office. Good evening, Mr. Hawker. Well, 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 Mr. Macklin. Johnny on the spot, eh? And with the money? Johnny on the spot, yes. With the money, no. Uh, what's this? No, you see, Mr. Hawker, Uncle's had a bit of difficulty raising the money. Now, see here, my no, client... All he asks is a few hours. I see. Uh, do you think that will be agreeable to your client, Mr. Hawker? It might be, and then again, it might not. Uh, why don't you ask your client? All right, I will. You sit at the edge of the desk. Try to appear calm as Hawker steps to the telephone and picks it up. You listen carefully as he dials. Hello, this is Sin Hawker. Right. Uh, there's been a delay. Mr. Macklin's having a bit of trouble raising the money. What? Oh, no, no. All he wants is a little more time. Huh? Right. Right, got it. Uh, let me talk to your client, Mr. Hawker. Yeah, no, 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 that. Well, I only wanted to, to... I'll answer any questions you have. Is that clear? No. As you wish. You'll just have to call your client again. I can afford it. Well? My uncle is ready to make a settlement. Tonight. He's willing to pay $20,000 if your client will turn over every shred of evidence he holds against my uncle and drop the matter once and for all. 20000 eh? Well, now... That sounds reasonable. Well, suppose you see if your client thinks so. Right. But mind you, no tricks. No tricks. You've got to make certain, don't you, Fred? And you listen carefully as he dials the number again. It's the same number he dialed before, isn't it? There's no mistake. 
And you're confident now you'll be able to dial that same number when the time comes. Well, Mr. Hawker? It's a grebel, but my client wants the money delivered here by 11 to 9. Good. I'll see you then, Mr. Hawker. You hurry out of the office, downstairs into your car. From the glove compartment, you remove a gun. You slip it into your pocket. As you start back, you see Hawker walk out of the building, head for the parking lot in the rear. Quickly, you move after him. Then in the darkness behind the building, you catch up to him as he slides in behind the wheel of his car. Oh, Hawker. Hey, uh... Oh, it's you. Hey, what's the idea of the gun? Move over, huh? What are you doing? I said move over. Oh, wait a minute. That's a good shot. Oh, uh, start up, Hawker. We're going for a bit of a spin. Uh, I think this will do, Hawker. A nice, dark, deserted road. Splendid place for a chap, hmm? What's the idea? Pull over, old man. All right. Now what? Well, first off, that, that, that business about Uncle wanting to make a settlement. That was a bit of a trick on my part, I'm afraid. What? Yes, you see, I, I was merely interested in having you dial that phone again. What are you talking about? I had to make certain I had the right number. You see, Harker, by simply listening to the dial as it spins, counting the number of you, clicks... You mean you can... Oh, yes, yes. I can dial that number again with very little difficulty. Now, are you going to tell me who the blackmailer is? Or must I find out for myself? You don't know yet? Would it be Frank Macklin, by any chance? Who's see. Or Lloyd Gillis, perhaps? Never heard of him. Hmm. I don't recognize the number at all. Of course, it could be a booth somewhere or a little hideaway, an apartment. I wouldn't know. I see. Well, if you won't cooperate, I shall have to find out by calling. I'm rather certain I'll recognize the voice, and I shall be most careful not to reveal my own identity, of course. Well, now that that's settled, what more do you want with me? I ain't no goody anymore. That's right. However, in as much as I intend to do business with your client, a sort of partnership arrangement in the near future... So that's it. You're going to be part of the scheme from now on, eh? Yes. And my plans do not include you, I'm afraid. <laughs> does that uh, upset you? Yes, I'm sure it does. Now, I shouldn't want you around, Mr. Hawker, to slip the word to dear Uncle Bert and tell him what I'm doing. Yes. Yeah. What do you mean? Oh, it's obvious, quite obvious, isn't it, old man? No, no, wait. No, I'm wait. sorry, Mr. Hawker. As you so aptly put it, you ain't no good to me anymore. While watching some Christmas shoppers, I couldn't help thinking, if folks shopped as carefully for automobile batteries as they do for Christmas gifts, Practically all drivers would decide on Signal Deluxe batteries. Just compare the power of various batteries. You'll find Signal Deluxe batteries give up to 35% more power for quicker starting and to take care of your radio and other electrical gadgets. That's because of Signal's microporous all-rubber separators, which have been called the greatest battery improvement in 20 years. Compare the life of various batteries you'll see that Signal Deluxe batteries are guaranteed up to two and one-half times as long as ordinary batteries, a full 30 months on a service basis, which also means that the cost per month is amazingly low, even lower when you deduct the trade and allowance signal dealers are giving for old batteries, and liberal credit terms are available. No wonder more and more shoppers, drivers who really compare batteries, are choosing Signal Deluxe batteries at Signal Service Stations. It's done, isn't it, Fred? Hawker is dead. The threat has been removed. And he lies buried in a shallow grave on the outskirts of town. Now all you have to do is call the blackmailer. And once you've learned his identity without revealing your own, you expect to approach him again later, cautiously, inform him of your plan for a partnership to continue to blackmail your uncle together. And you're certain he won't refuse, because you then reveal his identity to Uncle Bert. You drive back to town, park Hawker's car in the lot behind his office building, and then hurry upstairs. 
As you sit at Harker's desk, you glance at your watch and a smile covers your face. Yes. You're confident now that you've made the right decision, aren't you? Hello, Freddy. But, Uncle Bert, oh, what are you doing here? Looking for Sid Harker. I thought I might persuade him to tell me who the blackmailer is, confirm my suspicions with this. Oh, no, 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 Uncle Bert, you put that gun away. Harker's not here. So I see. Delivering the money to his client, I suppose. Uh, yes. I think you should know, Freddy, that I contacted the police tonight. What? Yes, I told the police why I was being blackmailed, that I killed a man some time ago. I was going to give myself up, but I was going to get the blackmailer first. That's why I came here. I was sure Harker could lead me to the blackmailer. But I, I, I thought that I was going to go on paying. No, I decided against that shortly after you left the house tonight. Oh, really? Well, that, uh, that wasn't very clever. No, and you're going to regret it, Freddy. Oh, what? Oh, I've suspected for a long time you were behind all this. Why, well, that, that, that's ridiculous. Is it? Let's see if my hunch is right. Empty your pockets. My, my pockets? I'll give you three. Oh, now, now, wait, wait. One, two. Uh, all right. All right. That's better. Well, well, you do have the money. My hunch was right. I, I can explain. So Harker paid off his client, eh? No. Uncle Bert, if, if, if you'll only listen... No, I could forgive you, stealing money from me, but not blackmailing me, Freddy. No, you, no, you don't understand this. I haven't blackmailed you. Look, I, 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 I'll find the blackmailer for you. None of your tricks. Put that phone down. Well, let me call a number. I swear you'll hear the blackmailer's voice with your own ears. I'm not that stupid. Me fall for a trick like that. And it is a trick, isn't it, Freddy? If you want to catch me off guard, get close enough to me so you can get this gun. No, it's not a trick. All right. We'll see. But you'd better not try any tricks. I'll listen in, yes. But on this extension phone over here. But remember, Freddy, I'll have this gun on you. I've already confessed one murder to the police. Another one won't matter much. Go ahead. Make your call. Everything depends on this phone call, doesn't it, Fred? Your hand is steady, sure, as you dial. You know there can't be any mistake. But this is the number Hocker called. You are certain it's the phone number of his client, the blackmailer. At the tone, the time will be 10, 9, and 40 seconds. <gasps> Hocker. Hocker was the blackmailer all the time. No. It was you, Freddy. That phone call you just made was a trick. And a very stupid one. Oh. No, Uncle Bert, wait! Shut! At the tone, the time will be ten. Ten, exactly. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you that there's an easy way we can all help to make this holiday season happier for ourselves and others. Drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Ben Wright, Ed Begley, Constance Cavendish, and Ted DeCorsia. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Adrian Jean Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. 
Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.